Section 0 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Schaefer. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 0. Advertisement. The following is the preface which Mr. Asbury prefixed to the first number of the second volume of his journal, which was printed during his lifetime. In the month of September, in the year of our Lord 1771, I embarked in England for America, at which time the memoirs I have written of my life commenced. As I considered my station on the American continent, in the order of divine providence, as a situation in which I should frequently be exposed to censure and jealousy, I thought it highly expedient, for my own satisfaction and the confirmation of my friends, to keep an impartial diary of my intentions, resolutions, and actions, as a Christian and a minister, that I might have, through this medium, a constant and reasonable answer for mine accusers. From the nature and design of the work, it must have in it many things both unpleasing and uninteresting to curious and critical readers, and perhaps some things exceptional even to those who enter into its spirit and read it with affection. In keeping a journal of my life, I have unavoidably labored under many embarrassments and inconveniences. My constant traveling, the want of places of retirement and conveniences to write, my frequent calls to the pulpit, my extensive epistolary correspondence, and my debility, and sometimes inability of body, have all been inseparable from my station in the church and so many impediments to the perfection of the account of my labors and sufferings in this country. The first volume of the extract of my journal was published many years after it was written under the management of others it being out of my power to attend the press, or even to read over the copy before it was printed. Footnote. This volume, now reprinted, was corrected by the author. End of footnote. Several inconveniences attending that volume will be avoided in this. For many years I did not determine to publish a second volume of the extract of my journal, but the advice of my friends and the prospects of my approaching dissolution have determined me on its publication. Footnote. This determination was not carried into effect except one small number, which is now republished with the corrections of the author. End of footnote. As I have no certain dwelling place in America, my manuscripts have frequently been exposed to be lost and destroyed, but... By the permission of divine providence, I have collected them together. The Methodists of late years have become a more numerous body, consequently more obnoxious to their enemies. The scripture is fulfilled even amongst us. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Some who were for a long time our confidential friends and fellow laborers, are now become our most inveterate foes, and have written and published books against our characters, government, and discipline. And as I am considered the most ostensible character in the Methodist Church in America, I have frequently to bear the greatest weight of their invectives. But impartial readers will not, I am persuaded, give an implicit assent to the asseverations of those who may be under personal resentment against the body or individuals without duly considering the possibility of their being influenced by self-interest, jealousy, or prejudice. And as I have been, under God and my brethren, the principal overseer of the work in America, and have constantly traveled from the center to the circumference of the connection, 
I flatter myself that reasonable men will acknowledge that I have always had an opportunity of obtaining better information relative to the true state of the whole work than any other man could possibly have. Would it not then be highly injudicious to prefer a history of Methodism, written by men of small and contracted information, and apostates from its principles, to such a history of its progress as will be presented to the public in my journals? And, if I may be credited, I can declare that in the critical and delicate circumstances that I have been necessitated to stand in relative to the characters of men, I have never knowingly deviated from the principles of that sacred charity which obligates us to treat each other with all possible tenderness. If I have injured the character of man, woman, or child in journal representation, I have done it inadvertently, and sincerely ask their pardon. In stationing the preachers I have known no man after the flesh, but have, to the utmost of my power, endeavored to keep an eye to the glory of God, the usefulness of the ministry, and the benefit of the people. I have attempted to give a simple narration of facts in the integrity of my heart, and in the fear of God. My intention is, as much as possible, to remove every hindrance out of the way, and to give no occasion for offense to any man. But if, after all, my attempts prove unsuccessful, I can, in the approbation of my own heart, and in the company of my old, faithful, and constant American friends and brethren, through the medium of my journal, look back upon what God has wrought, and say, Hitherto the Lord hath helped. We can thus comfort and console ourselves with the past loving kindness of the Lord, and the years in which his right hand hath been bare will thus to us be rendered more delightful. I had thoughts of leaving my manuscripts to the executors of my will, to be published by them after my death, but found, upon reconsideration, that their contents respecting persons and things were of such a nature that no person could do it so well as myself. Footnote. The greater part of the journal which follows was left in manuscript, but revised under the author's inspection as far down as the year 1807. See the transcriber's notice and page 454, volume 3, of the following journal. End of footnote. Should my life be spared, the volumes will be brought forward in course. As soon as one is disposed of, another will be put to press until the whole is published. Francis Asbury Notice of the Transcriber The name of the venerable author of the following journal will create for the work so deep and enduring an interest in the hearts and minds of those for whom it was more especially prepared that it becomes proper the transcriber should give some account of the manner in which he conducted the work of transcribing so that those who are concerned may have satisfactory assurances of its genuineness. The ill health by which Bishop Asbury was so much of his life a sufferer, the crowds in which he was too often compelled to live in the West and South, the succession of visitors he thought it his duty at all times of leisure to receive, his ministerial labors, and, above all, the constant occupation of mind which the important concerns of a church, so great in membership, so widely extended and rapidly increasing, necessarily occasioned, left the first superintendent of that church few means of rendering his journal more perfect. The transcriber has not attempted to improve it by giving his own for the author's. Some things in the original work he has taken the liberty of leaving out of the transcript, but there are not many of these, and they are, most of them, in that part of it which the bishop himself examined during his life. The transcriber not infrequently found a confusion of dates, and sometimes, as he thinks, a mistake in the names of persons and things. 
more especially in the author's geographical notices of the districts through which he made his annual tour. The emendations in this last particular are not, it is to be feared, always correct. In places where the author has left, by inadvertence, a sentence unfinished, a thing not uncommon, the transcriber has always tried to supply what was wanting. And where hurry has occasioned evident mistake, as in the case in a few instances, he has ventured upon correction. But he is not sure that in every attempt he has been successful. To those persons yet living who had, by habits of intimacy with Bishop Asbury, become acquainted with the peculiarity of his conversational and epistolary manner of expressing himself, the style of the present work may not be so pleasing, because it is not so exactly the style they expected, not so decidedly the bishop's. But they must recollect that the author's intention in keeping his journal was to make a faithful record for posterity, and the transcriber never forgot that its value, in this respect, would be better understood and more highly appreciated by those who can only know the author by his work. The abruptness of sentence in its beginning or its break, the sudden light flashed upon a subject by a suggestion conveyed in words few and strong, the names descriptive as painting he was wont to bestow upon persons and things. All these live only in the memory of his surviving friends, and with them must pass away. But that which is of more importance, the identity of Bishop Asbury in the commencement, the continuance, and wonderful increase of Methodism in this country, will give a perpetuity of interest in the record here offered, which nothing else can give. The transcriber would not, however, have it supposed that he has entirely departed from Bishop Asbury's style. On the contrary, he presumes he has been enough observant of this to satisfy most readers, inasmuch as the bishop himself, when he examined what had been transcribed up to 1807, altered but once, and then not much. The public may rest assured that the work is the author's, but here the transcriber must be permitted to speak in the first person. When I give this assurance, I must be understood to mean from the year 1780 to the end of the journal. The original manuscript of all that preceded that date I never saw. I only know that when printed it did not please the author. The journal of Bishop Asbury might have been better. I once ventured to express my unavailing wishes to him that he had left out many of the uninteresting incidents and traveling notices we find in it, and had put in more of the deep reflections and acute remarks on men, books, and passing events continually afloat in his powerful and observant mind, and that, for the sake of his brethren in the ministry who should follow him, he had made the skeletons of his sermons more perfect, and had added many more. His reply, uttered with such feeling, would have satisfied every candid mind that it was by no ordinary effort so much had been done. F. Hollingsworth, March 28, 1821 End of Section Zero Recording by Bill Schaefer Section One of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume One. August 7th through December 30th, 1771. On the 7th of August, 1771, the conference began at Bristol in England. Before this, I had felt for half a year strong intimations in my mind that I should visit America, which I laid before the Lord, being unwilling to do my own will or to run before I was sent. During this time my trials were very great, which the Lord, I believe, permitted to prove and try me in order to prepare me for future usefulness. At the conference, it was proposed that some preachers should go over to the American continent. 
I spoke my mind and made an offer of myself. It was accepted by Mr. Wesley and others, who judged I had a call. From Bristol I went home to acquaint my parents with my great undertaking, which I opened in as gentle a manner as possible. Though it was grievous to flesh and blood, they consented to let me go. My mother is one of the tenderest parents in the world, but I believe she was blessed in the present instance with divine assistance to part with me. I visited most of my friends in Staffordshire, Warwickshire, and Gloucestershire, and felt much life and power among them. Several of our meetings were indeed held in the spirit and life of God. Many of my friends were struck with wonder when they heard of my going, but none opened their mouths against it, hoping it was of God. Some wished that their situation would allow them to go with me. I returned to Bristol in the latter end of August, where Richard Wright was waiting for me, to sail in a few days for Philadelphia. When I came to Bristol I had not one penny of money, but the Lord soon opened the hearts of friends who supplied me with clothes and ten pounds. Thus I found by experience that the Lord will provide for those who trust in Him. On Wednesday, September 4th, we set sail from a port near Bristol, and having a good wind, soon passed the channel. For three days I was very ill with the seasickness, and no sickness I ever knew was equal to it. The captain behaved well to us. On the Lord's Day, September 8th, Brother W. preached a sermon on deck, and all the crew gave attention. Thursday, 12th. I will set down a few things that lie on my mind. Whither am I going? To the new world. What to do? To gain honor? No, if I know my own heart. To get money? No. I am going to live to God, and to bring others so to do. In America there has been a work of God. Some moving first among the friends, but in time it declined. Likewise by the Presbyterians, but amongst them also it declined. The people God owns in England are the Methodists. The doctrines they preach and the discipline they enforce are, I believe, the purest of any people now in the world. The Lord has greatly blessed these doctrines and this discipline in the three kingdoms. They must therefore be pleasing to Him. If God does not acknowledge me in America, I will soon return to England. I know my views are upright now. May they never be otherwise. On the Lord's Day, September 15th, I preached on Act 17.30. But God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. The sailors behaved with decency. My heart's desire and prayer for them was, and is, that they may be saved. But oh, the deep ignorance and insensibility of the human heart. The wind blowing a gale, the ship turned up and down, and from side to side, in a manner very painful to one that was not accustomed to sailing. But when Jesus is in the ship, all is well. Oh, what would not one do? What would he not suffer to be useful to souls and to the will of his great master? Lord, help me to give thee my heart now and forever. Our friends had forgotten our beds, or else did not know we should want such things. So I had two blankets for mine. I found it hard to lodge on little more than boards. I want faith, courage, patience, meekness, love. When others suffer so much for their temporal interests, surely I may suffer a little for the glory of God and the good of souls. May my Lord preserve me in an upright intention. I find I talk more than is profitable. Surely my soul is among lions. I feel my spirit bound to the new world, and my heart united to the people, though unknown, and have great cause to believe that I am not running before I am sent. The more troubles I meet with, the more convinced I am that I am doing the will of God. In the course of my passage, I read Selin's answer to Elisha Cole on the sovereignty of God, and I think no one that reads it deliberately can afterward be a Calvinist. On the Lord's Day, September 22nd, I preached to the ship's company on John 3, 23. But alas, they were insensible creatures. My heart has been much pained on their account. I spent my time chiefly in retirement, in prayer, and in reading the appeals, Mr. Durenti's life, part of Mr. Norris's works, Mr. Edwards on the work of God in New England, the Pilgrim's Progress, the Bible, and Mr. Wesley's sermons. I feel a strong desire to be given up to God, body, soul, time, and talents, far more than heretofore. September 29th. I preached to the ship's company again on these words. 
to you is the word of this salvation sent. I felt some drawings of soul towards them, but saw no fruit. Yet still I must go on. Whilst they will hear, I will preach, as I have opportunity. My judgment is with the Lord. I must keep in the path of duty. On the 6th of October, though it was very rough, I preached on deck to all our ship's company, from Hebrews 2, 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The Lord enabled me to speak plainly, and I had some hopes that the interesting truths of the gospel did enter into their minds. I remember the words of the wise man, In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thy hand. As to my own mind, I long and pray that I may be more spiritual. But in this I comfort myself that my intention is upright, and that I have the cause of God at heart. But I want to stand complete in all the will of God, holy as he that hath called me is holy, in all manner of conversation. At times I can retire and pour out my soul to God, and feel some meltings of heart. My spirit mourns and hungers and thirsts after entire devotion. October 13th Though it was very windy, I fixed my back against the mizzenmast and preached freely on those well-known words, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. I felt the power of truth on my own soul, but still, alas, saw no visible fruit. But my witness is in heaven, that I have not shunned to declare to them all the counsel of God. Many have been my trials in the course of this voyage. From the want of a proper bed and proper provisions, from sickness and from being surrounded with men and women ignorant of God and very wicked. But all this is nothing. If I cannot bear this, what have I learned? Oh, I have reason to be much ashamed of many things, which I speak and do before God and man. Lord, pardon my manifold defects and failures in duty. October 27th This day we landed in Philadelphia, where we were directed to the house of one Mr. Francis Harris, who kindly entertained us in the evening, and brought us to a large church, where we met with a considerable congregation. Brother Pilmore preached. The people looked on us with pleasure, hardly knowing how to show their love sufficiently, bidding us welcome with fervent affection, and receiving us as angels of God. Oh, that we may always walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called! When I came near the American shore, my very heart melted within me to think from whence I came where I was going, and what I was going about. But I felt my mind open to the people, and my tongue loose to speak. I feel that God is here, and find plenty of all we need. November 3rd. I find my mind drawn heavenward. The Lord hath helped me by his power, and my soul is in a paradise. May God Almighty keep me as the apple of his eye, till all the storms of life are past. Whatever I do, wherever I go. May I never sin against God, but always do those things that please Him. Philadelphia, November 4th. We held a watch night. It began at eight o'clock. Brother P. preached, and the people attended with great seriousness. Very few left the solemn place till the conclusion. Towards the end, a plain man spoke, who came out of the country, and his words went with great power to the souls of the people so that we may say, Who hath despised the day of small things? Not the Lord our God. Then why should self-important man? November 5th. I was sent for to visit two persons who were under conviction for sin. I spoke a word of consolation to them, and have hopes that God will set their souls at liberty. My own mind is fixed on God. He hath helped me. Glory be to him that liveth and abideth forever. Tuesday, November 6th. I preached at Philadelphia my last sermon before I set out for New York on Romans 8:32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? This also was a night of power to my own and many other souls. November 7th. I went to Burlington on my way to York and preached in the courthouse to a large, serious congregation. Here also I felt my heart much opened. In the way from thence to York, 
I met with one P. Van Pelt, who had heard me preach at Philadelphia. After some conversation, he invited me to his house on Staten Island, and as I was not engaged to be at York on any particular day, I went with him and preached in his house. Still, I believe God hath sent me to this country. All I seek is to be more spiritual and given up entirely to God, to be all devoted to him whom I love. On the Lord's Day, in the morning, November 11th, I preached again to a large company of people, with some enlargement of mind, at the house of my worthy friend Mr. P. In the afternoon preached to a still larger congregation, and was invited to preach in the evening at the house of Justice Wright, where I had a large company to hear me. Still, evidence grows upon me, and I trust I am in the order of God, and that there will be a willing people here. My soul has been much affected with them. My heart and mouth are open, only I am still sensible of my deep insufficiency, and that mostly with regard to holiness. It is true, God has given me some gifts, but what are they to holiness? It is for holiness my spirit mourns. I want to walk constantly before God without reproof. On Monday I set out for New York, and found Richard Boardman there in peace, but weak in body. Now I must apply myself to my old work, to watch and fight and pray. Lord, help. Tuesday, 13th. I preached at York to a large congregation on 1 Corinthians 2, 2. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. With some degree of freedom in my own mind, I approved much of the spirit of the people. They were loving and serious. There appeared also in some a love of discipline. Though I was unwilling to go to York so soon, I believe it is all well, and I still hope I am in the order of God. My friend B. is a kind, loving, worthy man, truly amiable and entertaining, and of a childlike temper. I purpose to be given up to God more and more, day by day. But, oh, I come short. Wednesday, 14th. I preached again at York. My heart is truly enlarged, and I know the life and power of religion is here. Oh, how I wish to spend all my time and talents for him who spilt his blood for me. The Lord's Day, 18th. I found a day of rest to my soul. In the morning I was much let out with a sacred desire. Lord, help me against the mighty. I feel a regard for the people, and I think the Americans are more ready to receive the word than the English and to see the poor Negroes so affected is pleasing, to see their sable countenances in our solemn assemblies, and to hear them sing with cheerful melody their dear Redeemer's praise, affected me much, and made me ready to say, Of a truth I perceive God is no respecter of persons. Tuesday, 20th. I remain in York, though unsatisfied with our being both in town together. I have not yet the thing which I seek, a circulation of preachers, to avoid partiality and popularity. However, I am fixed to the Methodist plan, and do what I do faithfully as to God. I expect trouble is at hand. This I expected when I left England, and I am willing to suffer, yea, to die, sooner than betray so good a cause by any means. It will be a hard matter to stand against all opposition, as an iron pillar strong and steadfast as a wall of brass. But through Christ strengthening me, I can do all things." Thursday, 22nd. At present, I am dissatisfied. I judge we are to be shut up in the cities this winter. My brethren seem unwilling to leave the cities, but I think I shall show them the way. I am in trouble, and more trouble is at hand, for I am determined to make a stand against all partiality. I have nothing to seek but the glory of God, nothing to fear but His displeasure. I am come over with an upright intention— and through the grace of God I will make it appear, and I am determined that no man shall bias me with soft words and fair speeches. Nor will I ever fear, the Lord helping me, the face of man, or know any man after the flesh, if I beg my bread from door to door. But whomsoever I please or displease, I will be faithful to God, to the people, and to my own soul. Saturday, November 24th. I went with Brother S. and Brother W. to Westchester, which is about twenty miles from New York. My friends waited on the mayor for the use of the courthouse, which was readily granted. On the Lord's Day morning, a considerable company being gathered together, I stood up in the Lord's power. 
yea, I felt the Holy One was nigh. I judged that my audience needed to be taught the first principles of religion. So I spoke from those words, Now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Seriousness sat on the faces of my hearers, and the power of God came both on me and them, while I labored to show them the nature and necessity of repentance, and the proper subjects and time for it. In the afternoon the congregation was increased, both in number and seriousness. Some of the chief men of the town, the mayor and others, were present. I delivered my thoughts on those words, This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son Jesus Christ, and love one another. I felt warmth in my soul while I set forth the nature and necessity of faith, and much enlargement towards my hearers. In the evening I preached at one M's, at a place called West Farms, to many persons on the love of God. The next day I preached at Westchester again to a large company, and felt a sense of God resting on my heart, and much love to the people. Being detained another day by the roughness of the weather, I preached another sermon on this text. Knowing therefore the terrors of the Lord, we persuade men. In the evening we went to the mayor's, where we lodged that night, and the next day at noon set out for York. The Lord's Day, December 2nd, I found a day of rest to my soul, and much liberty, both in the morning and evening, among the people. O oh, that I may live to God, and not to myself, and keep myself free from all worldly entanglements. Saturday, December 8th. As Brother B. was still at New York, I thought it best to make another visit to Westchester. I spent the evening and lodged at the house of one Dr. White, who appears to be an understanding man in the things of God. His wife is also of an amiable disposition, and is touched with a sense of her own state, and that of her neighbors. I spoke to her freely of the willingness of Christ to save now, but unbelief still prevailed. The next morning I went to the courthouse to preach, but the noise of the children and the ill behavior of the unhappy drunken keeper caused much confusion. In the afternoon my friend M. informed me that the door of the courthouse was shut against me. I felt myself at first a little troubled, but soon after a tavern-keeper gave me the offer of an upper room in his house, where I spoke on those words, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The power of God was with us, and many of the vilest of those present will, I trust, remember it as long as they live. In the evening I made another visit to West Farms and preached there, and my heart was there also touched with the power of God. I lodged that night at the house of Mr. O. Y. After supper, I asked the family if they would go to prayer. They looked at one another and said there was need enough. The next morning, when I asked a blessing before breakfast, they seemed amazed. I told them they wanted nothing but religion. The old father said it was not well to be too religious. The son said he thought we could not be too good. I soon afterwards took my leave of them and preached in the evening at Eastchester to a few who seemed willing to hear, on those words, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I found myself straightened and shut up, but the Lord knoweth what he hath to do with me. Tuesday, December 10th. I rode to New Rochelle, and was received with great kindness by Mr. DeVoe and his family, and preached there to a few. The next day also I preached to a large company and found liberty and I believe the power of God was among us. From thence I rode to Rye, where a few people were collected together to hear the word, and the next day preached to them again. On Sunday, 14th, I rode back to Eastchester, and preached to a large company, and found some satisfaction in speaking on the one thing needful. On the Lord's Day I preached at New Rochelle in the church. My text was, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I felt an opening and was satisfied. I published myself to preach again in the afternoon, and those who had most opposed me before came to hear and behaved well. In the evening I preached in the house of my friend Mr. D. The next day I preached again at Mr. D.'s, and on Tuesday went to Rye, where I had many to hear and felt some freedom of spirit. The next day I preached at Marnock to a company of people who at first took but little notice of the worship of God. But I trust some of them felt the power of truth in their hearts. On Thursday, I returned to York, 
and found my friends in peace. Lord's Day, December 22nd. I preached to a large company in the evening, and felt much power. I know that God was with us indeed, yea, was nigh to bless the people. On Christmas Day we had a very comfortable time. On Friday the 27th, I set off with two of my friends for Staten Island. On the 28th we arrived at Justice W.'s, where we were entertained with the best his house afforded. From thence I went to my old friend V. P.'s, who received me with his former kindness, and collected a congregation for the evening, to whom I preached, but had a violent pain in my head. After service I went to bed, and was very ill. However, the next day, being the Lord's Day, I preached in the morning, and also in the afternoon, with some freedom of mind. In the evening I returned and preached at Justice W.'s. Having received an invitation to preach at the house of one Mr. W. D., at the east end of the island, I visited that place on my return to New York, where I had a comfortable time. On Tuesday we arrived in New York. We have been favored here with a very solemn watch night. Many felt the power of God. End of section 1《ッシ Two of the Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume One, Section Two, January First to May Thirteenth, seventeen seventy two. January 1st, 1772. I find that the preachers have their friends in the cities, and care not to leave them. There is a strange party spirit. For my part, I desire to be faithful to God and man. On Thursday evening, I preached my last sermon for a time, on 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 6. Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. On Friday, Brother S. and myself set out for West Farms, and I preached in the evening. On the Lord's Day I preach at Brother M's, at half-past nine, in Westchester at three, and at West Farms at six in the evening. A person showed me much kindness at West Farms, favoring me with a man and horse all the time I was there, acknowledging the word came home to his heart, and that he was wicked. My friend Hunt, who was a Quaker, said he never was so affected." The next day I went to Westchester, but had only a few to hear me. On Wednesday I preached at H's, and felt much divine power in my soul, and an opening among the people. I have found many trials in my own mind, but feel determined to resist. I see traps set for my feet. Thursday I preached at D's, and had an attentive people to hear, and felt myself warm and zealous. On Friday I went to Mernock and had a large congregation, and felt the divine presence. Many of the people also felt the power of truth, and sunk under the word. It was laid home to the hearts of the people, but some contradicted and blasphemed. I believe God has a work to do among the people in this place. Lord, keep me faithful, watchful, humble, holy, and diligent to the end. Let me sooner choose to die than sin against thee, in thought, word, or deed." Saturday, 13. I preached at one friend B's, where many attended to the truth and showed a willingness to hear. On the Lord's Day I preached at D's at ten in the morning, and three in the afternoon, and at six in the evening. Many attended, but I fear few felt such deep concern as will induce them to leave their sins and flee from the wrath to come. At Brother H's on Monday evening the house would not hold the congregation— there I felt liberty and power. I hope God will visit them. I have had many trials from Satan, but hitherto the Lord hath helped me against them all. I stand a miracle of mercy. Oh, that I may always be found faithful in doing his will. On Tuesday the 14th I went to Rye, but the people here are insensible. They cry, The church, the church. There are few Presbyterians, but they have suffered their meeting-house to go to ruin, and have lost the power of religion, if they ever had it. I was not a welcome messenger to this people. 
On Wednesday the 15th I preached at two in the afternoon at Mernock with some power, and in the evening returned, preached at Rye, to a large company, and felt my master near. Thursday 16, I was taken ill with a cold and chill. The next morning I rode to New City, but the cold pinched me much. On New City Island, a congregation was assembled to receive me. I spoke to them with some liberty, and they wished me to come again. A wise old Calvinist said he might experience all I mentioned and go to hell. I said, Satan experienced more than I mentioned, and yet has gone to hell. After preaching, I rode to Mr. B.'s, though in much pain. When I had preached there, I went to bed. During the whole night I was very ill. My friends behaved very kindly, and endeavored to prevail upon me to stay there till I was restored. But my appointment required me to set off for Eastchester, where I preached, and rode near eight miles in the evening to New Rochelle. On the nineteenth, the Lord's Day, I preached three times, though very ill. Many attended, and I could not think of disappointing them. Monday the 20th, I rode to P's Manor and preached there at noon, and at six in the evening at P.B.'s in Rochelle. The next day I rode to D's, but the day was extremely cold. In the night I had a sore throat, but through the help of God I go on, and cannot think of sparing myself. No cross, no suffering I decline, only let all my heart be thine. Tuesday the 21st I preached at my friend D's for the last time on... These things that ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. The people seemed deeply affected under the word. In the morning of the 22nd I set out for the new city and preached there in much weakness and pain of body, and in the evening I went to my friend Pease. That night I had no rest, and when I arose in the morning the pain in my throat was worse. On the 23rd I came in a covered sleigh to my friend Bees where I took up my lodging, being unable to go any farther. I then applied to a physician, who made applications to my ears, throat, and palate, which were all swelled and inflamed exceedingly. For six or seven days I could neither eat nor drink without great pain. The physician feared I should be strangled before a discharge took place, but my God ordered all things well. I am raised up again, and cannot help remarking the kindness with which my friends treated me, as if I had been their own brother." The parents and children attended me day and night with the greatest attention. Thus, though a stranger in a strange land, God has taken care of me. May the Lord remember them that have remembered me, and grant to this family life for evermore. February 5. Still, I feel myself weak. It is near a fortnight since I came to my friend B's. Dr. W. has attended me in all my illness, and did all he could for me gratis. Yesterday was the first day of my going out. I went to Westchester to hear a friend preach. My kind friends, S. and W., brought up a sleigh from York on Monday last, but my friends at this place would not suffer me to go with them. In the course of my recovery, I have read much in my Bible, and Hammond's notes on the New Testament. I have also met with a spirit of peace against predestination. I did not expect to find such an advocate for general redemption in America. This day I ventured to preach at Mr. A. B.'s to his family and a few other people, in the evening returned home, and found Mr. D. L., the former governor's son, there, who lives in the woods near Salem, and invited me to his house. We spent the evening comfortably together. On Thursday, February 7, I preached as I had appointed, the man of the house being in a consumption. Though I had not many people to hear me, yet I have reason to hope that my sermon did good to the poor invalid. I felt effective for my friends in this place— who had in some measure been moved by the word on my former visits, but they are now returned to their old ways and company. I found myself weak and unfit to preach, but believe there were some who felt the word come close to their hearts. May God help them to profit by it. On February the 8th, I set out for York in a sleigh, and my friends seemed glad to see me. I want to be less concerned about anything except my own work, the salvation of souls, at present I seem determined to consecrate my all to God, body, soul, time, and talents. On the Lord's Day, found myself weak, but Brother P., being ill, I preached in the morning and found life. Stayed at home on Monday, and read in Mr. Wesley's notes on the Old Testament. On Monday the 11th, I went to the jail and visited a condemned criminal, and preached to him and others with some tender feelings of mind 
on these words, Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Tuesday the twelfth. This day I have visited many of my friends from house to house, and did not find much evil or much good stirring among them. Now I retire to hold communion with God and feel his power. In the evening my strength increased, and I preached with some freedom. On Wednesday I walked out, but caught cold and returned home chilled and very ill. In the evening when I went into the pulpit, my every limb shook, and afterward went to bed with violent pains in my bones. The sickness continued for three days and kept me at home for above a week. On Thursday the 20th I gave an exhortation in public. Having a desire to visit my friends on Staten Island, I set off in the afternoon of the 21st, contrary to the persuasion of my friends in York. S.S., who was tender towards me in my illness, and took care of me as if I had been his father, accompanied me. Justice W. received us and entertained us kindly, and, though weak and weary, I preached at P.V.P.'s to a few persons, with much satisfaction. Mr. D. invited me to preach in his house, to which I consented, and Justice W. sent us there on the Lord's Day with several of his family. I preached twice at that gentleman's house to a large company. Some, it appeared, had not heard a sermon for half a year. Such a famine there is of the word in these parts, and a still greater one of the pure word. I returned in the evening to Justice W.'s and preached to a numerous congregation with comfort. Surely God sent me to these people at the first, and I trust he will continue to bless them, and pour out his Spirit upon them, and receive them at last to himself. February 23, I preached again at Justice W.'s to many people, and the Lord was with me. My labors increase, and my strength is renewed. Though I came here weak, yet after preaching three times I felt myself strong. Thanks be to God, who hath raised me up from so low a state." On the 24th I preached at A.W.'s at two in the afternoon to a large company and had an invitation to go to the south part of the island. In the evening also I preached at the same place. On the 26th I preached at the ferry on my way to New York to a few people, though some came two miles on foot. After preaching I visited a young man who seemed to be at the point of death. He was full of unbelief, and I fear it was through his Calvinistic notions." Thursday, the 27th, we arrived in York. I found Brother P. had set off for Philadelphia in the morning. In the evening I met the Society, and felt myself assisted and enlarged. At night I slept with holy thoughts of God, and awoke with the same. Thanks be to God. After having preached in a large upper room at Mr. T.'s in Amboy, where many came to hear, and I was much favored in my own soul, an innkeeper invited me to his house, and kindly desired that I would call on him when I came again. Friday, 27. I set off on a rough-gated horse for Burlington, and after being much shaken, breakfasted at Spotswood, fed my horse again at Crosswick's, and then thought to push on to Burlington. But the roads being bad, and myself and horse weary, I lodged with a Quaker, on whom I called to inquire the way. He not only invited me to tarry all night, but also treated me with great kindness. The next day I rode to town very weary, and on the Lord's Day preached in the courthouse to many hearers. Monday, 30. After riding to New Mills, in company with some friends in a wagon, I preached in a Baptist meeting house and was kindly received. Tuesday, 31. Finding the people were divided among themselves, I preached from these words. This is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, and humbly hope my labor was not in vain. The same night we came to Burlington. April 2. I came to Philadelphia, and finding Brother B. and Brother W. there, was much comforted. Brother B.'s plan was that he should go to Boston, Brother P. to Virginia, Brother W. to York, and that I should stay three months in Philadelphia. With this I was well pleased. Friday, 4. We dined with Mr. R., who cannot keep Negroes for conscience's sake, and this was a topic of our conversation. Saturday, 5. This morning my mind was composed and serene. April 7. In the evening I preached to a very large audience in the church, after preaching in the day to many poor mortals in the bettering house. April 8. We set out for Bohemia to find Mr. W., who had been at his own discretion, 
that he might wait upon Mr. B. in order to go to York for five months. Stopping at Mrs. Withy's in Chester, footnote, she kept the best inn on the continent and always received the Methodist preachers, end footnote. To feed myself and my horse, I inquired about preaching in that town, and found this to be the house where Mr. B. and Mr. P. put up, and that the people were pleased with Methodist preaching. After leaving word that I would call to preach there on my return, I set off for Wilmington, expecting to meet Mr. W. there, but we accidentally met just as he was turning off to Mr. T.'s for lodging, about four miles from the town. He seemed glad to see me, and willing to be subject to order. The next morning Mr. W. went on his way to Philadelphia. Having a desire to go and see, and hear how things went, I desired him to call and preach at Chester, and I proceeded to the house of Mr. S., a friend of the Methodists, and then rode on to Newcastle, and stopped at the house of Brother F., a tavern-keeper, but a good man. Preached there to a few people, but met with opposition, and found the Methodists had done no great good. The courthouse here is shut against us, but it is open for dances and balls, and Brother F. has lost his company by receiving us. However, we were comforted together. April 10. Set out for Bohemia, where I found that some mischievous opposers had thrown the people into confusion. I have had serious thoughts of going to Baltimore, but the distance, which is ninety miles, seems too much at present. April 11. Found an inattention to study, an unsettled frame of mind, much insensibility of soul, and a backwardness to prayer. Lord, help me with an active warmth to move, and with a vigorous soul to rise. Visited an old man who was sick, with whom I had some conversation, though not much, but came away without prayer, and was justly blamed both by my friends and myself. I would have prayed with him, but two men came in, whose countenances I did not like, and therefore neglected my duty, through the fear of man. I have nothing to plead to palliate my omission. It is true that to introduce prayer among prayerless people is not an easy matter, yet there is no excuse for me. Lord, forgive both my secret and open faults, my failings of omission and commission. Help me to have respect for all thy commandments, and to be blameless before thee in all things. Lord's Day, 11. Preached today at my friend H.'s, as also the evening before. The house was filled both before and after dinner. The Lord gave me great liberty and power, and I humbly believe that some trembled under the word. Oh, that it may not wear off! I preached from these words. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. After describing the wicked and showing wherein they forget God, I attempted to prove the torments to be real and eternal, from the real joys and duration of heaven. Monday, 12. Visited E.T. and saw his father, who is a hundred years old or more. He had lately lost his wife, who was younger than he, and in her he lost his nurse and earthly comfort. Tuesday, 13. Was advised and invited to preach at Wilmington, which I did, though there were but few to hear. Wednesday, 14. Rode to Chester and preached in the courthouse. The church minister and many Quakers were present, but the congregation appeared to be the wildest I had seen in America. But I humbly hope the labor was not all in vain. In the morning I visited and spoke with great freedom to four men who were under the sentence of death. Thursday, 15. I rode through a heavy rain to Philadelphia and preached the next morning with some freedom. Tuesday, 20. My mind is quiet and serene. I am now free from company, which is very pleasing to me, having found that much company is both disagreeable and dangerous. Wednesday, 21. Met the society, and found both life and liberty among the people. This night Brother W. came in from Virginia. He gives a flaming account of the work there. Many of the people seem to be ripe for the gospel and ready to receive us. I humbly hope, before long, about seven preachers of us will spread seven or eight hundred miles and preach in as many places as we are able to attend. Lord, make us humble, watchful, and useful to the end of our lives. April 23. Brother W. set off for New York. April 24. I preached in Philadelphia with freedom and power. April 25. Preached the people with some sharpness. In the evening I kept the door, met the society, and read Mr. Wesley's epistle to them. Tuesday, 28. 
I intended to go out of town, but could not get a horse, so I stayed for Brother W., and heard that many were offended at my shouting them out of society meeting, as they had been greatly indulged before. But this does not trouble me. While I stay, the rules must be attended to, and I cannot suffer myself to be guided by half-hearted Methodists. An elderly friend told me very gravely that the opinion of the people was much changed within a few days about Methodism, and that the Quakers and other dissenters had laxed their discipline, that none but the Roman Catholics kept it up with strictness. But these things do not move me. Wednesday, 29. Set out for Burlington, where I met with Brother W. and Brother K., and found the people there very lively. Two persons have obtained justification under Brother W., and a certain Dr. T., a man of dissipation, was touched under Brother W.'s preaching last night. I admire the kindness of my friends to such a poor worm as I. Oh, my God, remember them. Remember me. Thursday, 30. I humbly hope the word was blessed to a large number of people who attended while I preached at the courthouse. Set out for Philadelphia, but about a mile from the city found that the bridge could not be crossed on horseback, so I left my horse and walked to the ferry. Brother W. took the horse and went to Burlington, on his way to York, was desired to attend the execution of the prisoners at Chester, and J. K. went with me. We found them penitent, and two of the four obtained peace with God and seemed very thankful. I preached with liberty to a great number of people under the jail wall. The sheriff was friendly and very kind. J. K. preached at the gallows to a vast multitude, after which I prayed with them. The executioner pretended to tie them all up, but only tied one, and let the rest fall. One of them was a young man, about fifteen. We saw them all afterward, and exhorted them to be careful. We returned to Philadelphia the same night, and I gave an exhortation. Tuesday, May 5. Set out for Burlington again, and preached to a serious people. But how is my soul troubled that I am not more devoted? Oh, my God! My soul groans and longs for this. May 6. My heart was much humbled, but the Lord enabled me to preach with power in my soul. Thursday, 7. Visited some prisoners, and one of them, who is to be tried for his life, seemed much affected. In the evening I preached, and felt my heart much united to this people. Next morning set off for Philadelphia, and got in time enough for intercession. After which I visited a sick friend, who rested her soul on God, and then I preached in the evening. Sunday, 10. Preached in the morning, attended two places of worship in the day, preached again at night, and had a comfortable time in meeting the society. Monday, 11. Was much stirred up and found an increase of life in visiting the society, and then preached in the evening. Tuesday, 12. Set off for the jerseys. My mind enjoys sweet peace and the love of God, it is my desire to be entirely devoted to God who opens the hearts of people to receive me, and my heart to deliver his counsel to them. Wednesday, 13. Preached at three o'clock on, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Oh, what a time of satisfaction and power was this for my own soul! When afterward to Mr. T's, and many friends came at eight o'clock, when I was enabled to preach with life. End of section two. Section 3 of The Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. Section 3. May 14th to September 5th, 1772. Thursday, 14. Went to the new church. Surely the power of God is amongst this people. After preaching with great assistance, I lodged at I. J.'s, and in the morning he conducted me to Gloucester, and thence we went by water to Philadelphia. Here I found a change. Brother Pilmore was come, and the house was given up, which pleased me well, as it was a burden to the people. Brother P. went to Mr. W.'s, and I went to Mr. W. R.'s. On Friday night I was heavily afflicted, and dear sister W. R., took great care of me. The next morning, through the mercy of God, I was something better, and preached in the evening. Lord's Day, 17. 
After preaching in the morning, I went to see G.H., who was near to eternity. He had peace in his soul. Some slight me in this place on account of my attention to discipline, and some drop off, but my work is to please God. Tuesday, 19. Went about sixteen miles into the country, and preached at eleven o'clock with energy of soul. A Presbyterian minister, who attended my preaching this morning, accompanied me part of the way back. We conversed by the way on the evidences of religion, the work of God, and sending out preachers. This morning I arose with more spiritual strength, and felt a great desire to do the will of God with all purity of intention, desire, and thought, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Wednesday, 20. Went to Trenton, but as the court was sitting, I was obliged to preach in a schoolhouse to but a few people, and as there were soldiers in the town, I could hardly procure lodging. Thursday, 21. Preached on the other side of the river to a few simple people, and in the evening at Burlington, where the congregation was also small on account of the fair. Friday, 22. In the morning I rode home in great pain, but after dinner went ten miles down the river. Sunday, 24. We rode down to Greenwich, where I preached at ten o'clock to near three hundred people, collected from different parts. We then rode back to Friend P's, where we dined, and thence to Gloucester, which made near fifteen miles. I preached there at three o'clock to about two hundred people, and then went up the river in a boat to Philadelphia, where I preached at seven o'clock. Monday, 25. Was unwell, but went to Burlington, and preached in the evening, though very sick. Tuesday, 26. Found myself very unwell in the morning, but visited a prisoner under sentence of death, and strove much to fasten conviction on his heart. Through the mercy of God, I hope the poor man was humbled. Wednesday, 27. Went to New Mills, where I preached at four o'clock, and again at ten o'clock the next morning. Friday, 29. I preached under the jail wall, and for the benefit of the prisoner, attended him to the place of execution. When he came forth, he roared like a bull in a net. He looked on every side and shrieked for help, but all in vain. Oh, how awful! Die he must, I fear, unprepared. I prayed with him and for him. How difficult it is, if I may use the term, to drench a hardened sinner with religion. I saw him tied up, and then, stepping on a wagon, I spoke a word in season and warned the people to flee from the wrath to come and improve the day of their gracious visitation. No more grieving the Spirit of God lest a day should come in which they may cry, and God may refuse to hear them. We then rode home to Philadelphia, where I exhorted in the evening, and found myself much more drawn out than I expected. Lord's Day, 31. Preached morning and evening with some life, but found that offenses increased. However, I cannot help it. My way is to go straight forward, and aim at what is right. June 1. Preached this morning at five o'clock. And this day I wrote to Mr. Wesley, and experienced a great deal of purity in my soul. Tuesday, 2. Rose this morning between 4 and 5, and was much quickened in preaching. Then went to Haddonfield at noon. Satan assaulted me this day, but the Lord helped and delivered me, for his mercy and truth's sake, and granted me life in my soul. Wednesday, 3. Preaching at 5 at Manta Creek, I was favored with an opening and great power. After preaching there, about one hundred people went to Mr. T's, one and a half mile off, and there I also preached with life. Thursday, 5. At Greenwich I was weak in body, but had some liberty in preaching to about two hundred willing people, but at Gloucester I preached only to a few dead souls, from this striking passage. The word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. I must observe that in this journey I have been kept in peace and had more freedom, life, and power than I ever experienced in the city. Saturday, 6. Sailing four miles up the river, I came to Philadelphia in great comfort. Lord's Day, June 7. After preaching in the morning, I was at the table with Mr. S., and many felt the power of God, though I felt but little myself. We had a love feast today, and several could testify that God was with us, some of our Jersey friends spoke of the power of God with freedom. Monday, 8. With much disagreeable company, I set off for Trenton, where many felt the divine power accompanying the word preached. Wednesday, 10. After preaching on the other side of the river, I returned to Philadelphia and preached in the evening. Thursday, 11. 
set off in the stage for Bristol, and crossed the water to see a man suspected of murder, but found him very ignorant of things relating to his soul. I then returned to Philadelphia very unwell. Friday, 12. I was a little better, and rose to preach at five o'clock. The Lord was with me this day at intercession. Saturday, 13. Hitherto the Lord hath helped. Praised be his dear name. Lord's Day, June 14th. After preaching in the morning with some freedom of mind, I went to St. Paul's, and afterwards spent the afternoon in my room, then preached and met the society in the evening, but felt great dryness, and was grieved to see so much conformity to the world, in the article of dress, among our people. Tuesday, 16. Set off for Burlington, and though weak and infirm, I preached at night with liberty. Wednesday, 17. I bent my course for new mills, but still groan for more life, and want to be more holy. Thursday, 18. After preaching twice at New Mills with great liberty and life, I returned to Burlington, but was very ill that night, and though quite unwell the next morning, yet proceeded on my way to Philadelphia. Lord's Day, June 21. Finding myself much recovered, I preached with some animation. Monday, 22. This day my heart was in deep exercise. Tuesday, 23. Walked down to Gloucester Point, and then rode to Brother C's, and though very weak, weary, wet, and low, while it rained very hard, I preached with some power to many people from these words, As the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. Wednesday, 24. At Greenwich I met with Mr. S., who preached and baptized several people that seemed deeply affected. We then rode together and had some conversation on the insult which Mr. S. Y. had given Mr. W. Y. As Mr. S. knew that Mr. S. Y. had preached for Mr. W. Y. and was well acquainted with his doctrine, he was surprised at his conduct. He said that Mr. W. Y. was undoubtedly a good man and had been useful to thousands. Thursday, 25. Traveling back towards Gloucester, I called at Squire Pease and presented him with a petition for raising 150 pounds to discharge the debt on our preaching house at Philadelphia. He promised both to give himself and to propose it to others. Friday, 26. Returned to Philadelphia and preached at eight with some power. I find that Satan strives to sow discord among us, and this makes me desirous to leave the city. Saturday, 27. Felt a great desire to live more to the glory of God, and preached at night with some life. Received a letter from Mr. Pilmore, replete with accounts of his preaching abroad, in the church, to a large congregation, and the like. My heart is still distressed for want of more religion. I long to be wholly given up, to seek no favor but what cometh from God alone. I want to breathe after the Lord in every breath. Lord's Day 28 This was a day of sweet rest to my soul, and the Lord gave me power to speak with some affection. Monday, 29. Set out for Trenton with some loose and trifling company in the stage. After preaching in the evening with some life and energy, I went the next day to preach in the field, and then returned and preached with freedom to many people in the courthouse. July 1. Went over the ferry and preached to many people. Among them were some fine women who behaved with airs of great indifferency. Returning to Trenton, I preached at night and the next morning at five, after which I set off for Philadelphia with unprofitable company, among whom I sat still as a man dumb, and as one in whose mouth there was no reproof. They appeared so stupidly ignorant, skeptical, diastical, and antithestical, that I thought if there were no other hell, I should strive with all my might to shun that. Came home late and weary, but preached with some comfort. I have lately been blessed with much purity of intention and fervor of spirit, but greatly thirst after living more in God. Saturday, 4. Went to Burlington in order to attend the execution of one S., a murderer, and declared to a great number of people under the jail wall, He healeth the broken in heart. The poor criminal appeared penitent, behaved with great solidity, and expressed a desire to leave the world. Then returned to Philadelphia, gave an exhortation that night, and found the Lord's Day a day of sweet peace. Monday, 6. Set out for Burlington again, and spent three days laboring among them. Many seemed much stirred up to seek the kingdom of God. Thursday, 9. Returned and found some inward liberty in Philadelphia. 
Saturday, 11. Was a day of peace and love to my soul. Lord's Day, 12. Went through the usual exercises of the day and enjoyed some peace of mind. Our congregations here are small. They cannot bear the discipline and doctrine, but this does not move me. Monday morning I preached with life and longed to be as an even rising flame of fire. Tuesday, 14. Went to the Jerseys and preached at Friend T's to near 100 people, though in the time of harvest. And while preaching from these words, you were sometime darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Many felt the power of truth when the darkness and its properties were explained. After describing true religion to about 100 souls at J.C.'s, I went on Wednesday to Greenwich and felt much shut up while preaching to about the same number on Fear Not, Little Flock, etc. I then proceeded to Gloucester, which is one of the dullest places I have seen in this country. The same night went to Haddonfield, and on the next day preached at J.T.'s to a few attentive hearers, who seemed somewhat affected by the truths of God, especially one S.K., who was greatly concerned on account of his past life, as he had been much devoted to company and liquor. I felt afraid that his concern would not be permanent. However, he accompanied me to the ferry. Friday, 17. Returned to Philadelphia time enough for intercession, and found it a good time both then and at the evening preaching. Lord's Day, 19. After preaching in the morning, I set off in the afternoon for Trenton, came thither on Monday by noon, and found life in preaching at night. Monday, July 20. Met with Brother S. from New York, who informed me that I was to go to York, which was what I did not expect, but feel myself quite easy, not being fixed in any place. He gave me an account of Mr. W.'s good behavior, though I fear, after all, he will settle at Bohemia. Wednesday, July 22. In meeting the small society of about 19 persons, I gave them tickets, and found it a comfortable time. They are a serious people, and there is some prospect of much good being done in this place. After preaching on Tuesday morning over the ferry and in the evening at Trenton, I took leave of them on Wednesday morning and set off for Philadelphia. Left Philadelphia on the Lord's Day evening after preaching on these words, If I come again, I will not spare, and on Monday met with Brother B. Went thence to New Mills, where I preached on Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, and found the people there very affectionate. Then returned to Burlington and found many friends from Philadelphia. We had power among us at night, and the next morning at three I set off for Amboy, and on the way had some conversation with one of Jacob B.'s disciples. We came to the stage house through much rain and bad roads about seven o'clock. Thence we went to Amboy and took lodging at a tavern. Having been kept in peace through this journey, felt great courage in the work of God, and go towards York in faith. The congregation at Amboy was small, and they appeared to be such as cared but little for the gospel— so that my hope of that place is but slender. On Saturday evening, I preached with some power to a large congregation of rich and poor from these words, Even from the days of your fathers ye have gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you. After preaching with great liberty on the Lord's Day to many people at P.V.'s and Justice W.'s on Staten Island, I set off on Monday in a boat for New York, and arriving about five o'clock found Mr. W., who that night had preached his farewell sermon, and told the people that he did not expect to see them any more. I have always dealt honestly with him, but he has been spoiled by gifts. He has been pretty strict in the society, but ended all with a general love feast, which I think is undoing all he has done. However, none of these things move me. My mind is calm and my soul under a comfortable sense of God, and I am determined by His grace to keep on in the way of my duty, if it should be my lot to stand alone." August 4. My soul felt life and power and renewed courage. Discovering the unfaithfulness of some who first spoil a man and then condemn him, I intend to keep such at a proper distance. In the love feast this evening, I found that the living could not bear the dead. Mr. W. rose up and spake as well as he could, against speaking with severe reflections on his brother. But all this was mere talk. I know the man and his conversation. Wednesday, 6. Felt satisfaction and life in meeting the society last night, and spent this day in retirement. Thursday, 7. Preached in York from Philippians, chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. To abide in the flesh is more needful for you, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Found liberty in my mind while addressing the people, 
and am determined, in the strength of the Lord, to aim at promoting His glory and to seek nothing but Him. FRIDAY, 8. After preaching in the morning, I found the Lord near, and had great peace at intercession. It pleases me much to see the people diligent in attending the word, and find myself favored with liberty and the power of God in my labors among them, and humbly hope that God will make known His power among this people, and drive Satan from them, and that we shall yet see good days in this place. SATURDAY, 9. I found a degree of life in my soul, and on the Lord's day had power and light and life and love, in speaking on these words, You were sometime darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The congregations are steady, and we look for the power of God both in our own souls and among the people. Oh, my God, make bare thine arm. After preaching in the evening of the Lord's day, with some opening of heart and to a full house, I met the society, and then set out on Monday morning for New Rochelle, and preached the same night at Friend D's, about thirty miles from York. Tuesday, 12. My soul does not forget God, but my desire is still towards Him, and the remembrance of His name. On Wednesday I found my mind somewhat engaged, but on Thursday had some fears of coming short of eternal life. A cloud rested on my mind, which was occasioned by talking and jesting. I also feel at times tempted to impatience and pride of heart, but the Lord graciously blessed me with life and power in preaching at night, and I afterward found my mind fixed on God, and an earnest longing to be always holy in heart and life. After preaching on Friday at New Rochelle, from these words, We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. I set out for York on a bad horse, and met with indifferent fare on the road, but reached York on Saturday, and there received a letter from my father and friend, Mr. Mather, who informed me of the preacher's returning to England. Preached also this evening with some satisfaction, but found broken classes and a disordered society, so that my heart was sunk within me. But it is still my desire to commit myself to God. Lord's Day, 17. Preached in the morning, and then went to preach at Newton, about twelve miles distant, in the evening. Friend S. was in company with me, and we were obliged to lodge at a tavern, but we were more serious than usual, and spent our time in useful conversation. As it rained, we had but few people at preaching in the morning. We then returned to York about ten o'clock. In this journey I have found my soul comfortable and alive to God, a sacred nearness to God, and power to withstand temptations, though in the afternoon of the next day I had cause to blame myself for trifling conversation at noon. Monday, 18. This has been a day of distress to my soul. I was opposed for meeting the society, because one or two classes met at that time, which seemed to me a very weak objection, as those classes might meet at another time. August 21. Preached this morning with great life in my soul, and felt a strong desire to be devoted to God, and more and more engaged to promote His glory both in heart and life. Oh, that my soul could be more intimately and sweetly united to the Lord! In the evening I preached with power, but have found my soul troubled within me on account of a party spirit, which seems to prevail too much in this place. But they must answer for their own conduct. My business is, through the grace of God, to go straight forward, acting with honesty, prudence, and caution, and then to leave the event to Him. Lord's Day, August 24. Preached morning and evening, and had peace in my soul. In the evening I met the Society, and read Mr. Wesley's letter. Monday, 25. Early in the morning we crossed the North River in order to go to Staten Island. Many people attended the word, but I do not know what to make of them, for though they seem fond of hearing, yet they do not appear to be much affected. On Tuesday I went to Amboy and dined with a mixed company of assemblymen, churchmen, Quakers, etc. Many of them came to hear me in sport, but went away very still. On my return I preached at Mr. W.'s to many people. On Thursday I returned to York and preached in the evening with some life. Friday my soul was kept in peace and love, and while preaching at night both myself and others felt the power of God in our souls. Saturday, 30. I preached with liberty and can rejoice in God my salvation, finding an increasing desire to live to Him alone. Lord's Day, 31. Found life both morning and evening, and had many people. I also went to church and heard Dr. O preach on the divinity of Christ. Tuesday, September 2. My heart was fixed to seek the Lord, and found some nearness to Him, and life in my soul. I preached also in the evening with some comfort. Wednesday, 3. 
preached at five, and found my soul this day fixed to do the will of God. Thursday, four, preached in the morning and found this a blessed day. My soul was lively and my heart was filled with holy thoughts of God and felt a strong and pure desire to pray and mourn and long for God. In the evening I preached from these words, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Friday, five, found my soul grieved at the discovery of such parties among the people. Who can find a faithful man? End of section three. Section four of the Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Robinson. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, September 6 through November 14, 1772, Section 4. Saturday, September 6. Found peace in my soul, and held a meeting for the better ordering of the spiritual and temporal affairs of the society. In this meeting I propounded the following queries. 1. How often shall there be a public preaching? Agreed that it should be on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday nights besides the Lord's Day, and exhortation on Saturday night. 2. Shall we have morning preaching? This was agreed to. 3. Shall we have the society meetings private? This was doubted by some, but I insisted on it from our rules in Mr. Wesley's last letter. 4. Shall we make a weekly and quarterly collection? Agreed. 5. Can any other means be devised to lessen the debt? The debt was one thousand one hundred pounds, but no other means could be found to relieve it. 6. Ought we not to be more strict with disorderly persons? Very little was said in answer to this. 7. Shall we have the three stewards for the satisfaction of the society? The majority voted against it. 8. Are we as frugal as we can be? It was thought we were. 9. Will the stewards meet me once a week? Agreed. 10. Do we endeavor to avoid all partiality in the things of God? 11. Can we come at the balance of our accounts now or soon? It was thought we could. 12. Who will stand at the door? Not determined. 13. Shall we meet the society on Sunday nights? This was opposed by some, but I insisted upon its being the best time, and at last it was agreed to for a season. 14. Who shall be the collectors? This was not determined, though debated. 15. Can the preacher meet the children? Agreed. 16. Can we spread the books? There was but little said on this head, and it was left undetermined. Monday, September 7. R. S. C. W. and myself set off for New Rochelle. At night I felt myself unwell and my mind under a cloud, but gave an exhortation at Mr. D.'s in the evening. Tuesday 8. This was a day of heaviness, much trouble, sore temptation, and a sorrow of heart, but in the evening I was happy in God and spoke with power and feeling. On Wednesday my mind was warmly engaged, and I preached to many people, both at three o'clock and seven. Thursday 10. Mr. D. accompanied me as far as Kingsbridge on my way to York, where S. S. met me and rode with me the rest of the way. I preached in the evening, and rose to preach next morning at five. It appears to me that trouble is at hand, but I fear nothing, being conscious of having acted uprightly before them all, and having no by-ends in view. Whoever has, must answer for it. Whatever comes, I am determined, and while here by the grace of God to proceed according to the Methodist doctrine and discipline. Friday, 11. I met the people in the morning to discourse with them about their temporal matters, and appointed Mr. C. to take an account of the weekly and quarterly collections. But the other two stewards refused an exact entry of the money that is not settled. However, the people must have the same satisfaction concerning the other collections. Saturday morning I felt a strong desire to live to God and act with a single eye to His glory in all that I do. On Saturday evening we had a comfortable meeting. After preaching to many people on the Lord's Day at seven, I prepared to approach the table. There was a great drawing among the people while these words were enforced, quote, This do in remembrance of me, end quote. Lord, prepare my heart, my bleeding Lord, let my soul feel thy melting love. Lord, make all thy people glad together in thee, that thou mayest be glorified in and by us now and ever. 
At the table I was greatly affected by the sight of the poor negroes, seeing their sable faces at the table of the Lord. In the evening I had a full house and much divine assistance. Monday 14. I had liberty and love in preaching at five, and this day felt power to live to God. Tuesday 15. I spent great part of my time in company, and preached with some life to a small company at Bloomingdale. Preaching at five the next morning, I had many people, and a comfortable sense of God. Wednesday 16. I set off for Newtown, and found nearness to God, and more constancy of mind. Our journey was wet and troublesome. However, there was a small company of people, and I preached with courage, disregarding my fatigue, if any good can be done. We returned to York in the night, which was very dark, but he to whom the darkness is known conducted us in safety. Friday morning I found great peace. Lord, help me to be always guarded, and fly the very appearance of evil, so that in thy strength I may every moment conquer. Saturday 19. I felt comfortable in preaching this morning at five o'clock. Oh, my God, help me this day to eye thy glory. We had a melting power this evening also in public exhortation. Lord's Day 20. In the morning we had a good time, while I spoke from the latter part of the 81st Psalm, and in the evening we had a very full house, and the Lord favored me with warmth and power while I addressed the people from Romans six seventeen eighteen. After preaching on Monday morning, I went to Staten Island. Justice W. met me and informed me that the people were very busy at that time in court, so I went and preached to many attentive people at the ferry. Hitherto the Lord hath helped me. I will endeavor to praise Him with my whole heart and glorify Him more and more. Tuesday I crossed the bay and preached in the evening at York. Wednesday 23. In the morning I preached and felt a measure of peace and stronger confidence in my soul towards God. I am now twenty-seven years of age and have had a religious concern on my heart about fourteen years, though I felt something of God as early as the age of seven. Thursday 24. I preached in the morning from Psalm 86, 17, and found myself enlarged in the evening on the subject of the Good Samaritan. This day my soul has felt much love towards God, and my mind has been bent on doing His will. Friday 26. Attending the lecture today, I heard the doctor with much satisfaction. And in the evening preaching, I laid open the plague of the human heart as I had felt it. It was a solemn time. This day we received tidings from Philadelphia on their doing well, both in spiritual and temporal matters. Some have been much dissatisfied with private society meetings and collections in the classes. But in the midst of every trial, the Lord keeps me in peace. On Saturday morning, though it was cold, we had many people and a moving time at five o'clock, and a comfortable season in the evening exhortation. Lord's Day 27 Preaching this morning on, quote, building the tower, end quote, I had some assistance, but experienced some heavy exercises of mind this day. In the evening I was enabled to preach with power on the awful subject of the judgment, attempting, one, to prove that the judgment will be universal, two, to describe the person of the judge, three, to describe the awful events preceding and attending that period, four, to point out the business of the day, five, to show the decision and consequences. Monday, 28. Many people attended the preaching at five o'clock, and Brother S. and myself set off in the forenoon for New Rochelle. As we came unexpectedly on the people, I improved the occasion by preaching on these words, quote, In such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh, end quote. Tuesday 29. At Friend D's I preached with fervency from Ezekiel 33, 4. I have been much assaulted this day with temptations, but have been kept by the power of God. I find a degree of effeminacy cleaving to me, but abhor it from my heart. The reading of Mr. Wellesley's journal has been made a blessing to me. Wednesday 30. I was led to speak very closely at PB's to a congregation in which there were many old people, and then returned to Mr. D's, where I preached again and enforced the duty of meeting together among ourselves. October 1. I set off for York and preached to a small company at Kingsbridge on my way. This day I received a letter from my mother informing me she was weak in body, and had an earnest desire to see me once more before she dies. October 3. Though I preached with liberty last night, my mind was troubled today, but I earnestly desire to renew my covenant with God. Mr. W. received a letter from Mr. Wesley, enforcing our rules and discipline. My desire is to sit loose to every created object. Lord's Day 4. I felt divine assistance in preaching both morning and evening, but was grieved at society meeting to see the steward desirous to let strangers in. On Monday I wrote to Mr. Wesley and communicated the true sentiments of my mind. Tuesday 6. This was a day of peace and rest to my soul. 
After preaching at night with some power, I spoke to our steward, whose conduct did not altogether please me, frequently avoiding to speak to me, absenting himself from the meeting of the leaders, the appearance of dissimulation, opposing our rules, and consulting persons who were not members of our society. He appeared to be somewhat affected by the conversation. Thursday 8. In preaching both morning and evening, I had an opening of soul towards the people. I met the society this evening and told them plainly my mind relative to their state as a collective body. Friday 9. I met the leaders, and there were some sharp debates. After much had been said, I was charged with using Mr. N. ill in saying he opposed my meeting the society. Mr. L. told me I had already preached the people away, and intimated that the whole work would be destroyed by me. Perhaps this was because I spoke so freely to Mr. N., and desired him to take care what company he kept. Saturday, 10. I received a letter from Mr. Wesley, in which he required a strict attention to discipline, and appointed me to act as assistant. He also enjoined that Mr. W. might not print any more books without his consent. I likewise received a letter from Mr. W., informing me of the state of matters in Maryland, and that it was appointed for me to winter there. For this I intend to prepare. Lord's Day 11. Preached with power in the morning, and spoke freely to a large congregation in the evening. My soul is blessed with peace and love to God. Monday 12. Read one of Mr. Wesley's sermons to the people, and believe some felt it reproving them for evil speaking. My mind is serene and comfortable. Part of Monday was spent in meeting classes, and on Tuesday morning at five I had many people. My intention is to deal faithfully with all, and it is my real opinion that I am not so sensible of faults in any other person as in myself. Lord, help me to be faithful, and in all I do, to glorify Thee more than ever. Felt assistance this evening in preaching. Wednesday I went to Newtown, but was not expected. However, we collected many people to hear the word. I then returned to York, and after preaching in the morning was engaged in settling the classes, making up some bands, and meeting the children. I have reason to be thankful, though my trials have been great from many quarters, they have not moved me. Friday 16. I preached in the morning, and felt resigned to anything, having no choice, but am willing to go to the end of the world, if I can be holy and useful. Lord's Day 18. Preached in the morning with some sensibility, and then went to hear Mr. I, who delivered a profitable discourse on the education of children. He proved the necessity, antiquity, and human authority of catechizing, and made it evident that in the primitive church the best and ablest men were appointed for this work. He gave some account of the school in Alexandria, and told the audience that in this duty there should be both precept and example, and sometimes severity. In the evening I was enabled to speak plainly to a large congregation on Deuteronomy 30, 19. Quote, I call heaven and earth to record against you this day, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. End quote. This day we had a love fest. Many people spoke freely, but not long. This I have observed more here than in England, that the people speak short, but yet very full. Monday 19. Set off in the stage for Philadelphia. The company was all quiet except one young man who frequently profaned the name of the Lord. It was my intention to reprove him, but waiting for a proper time I found an opportunity when there was only one person with him, and then told him how he had grieved me. He received the admonition very well, and excused himself by saying he did not think of what he was doing. Afterward he seemed more careful. After dining at Brunswick, we came to Princeton, a place I had long wished to see for the sake of the pious Mr. D., late president of the college there. Here I met Mr. B., and we both agreed in judgment about the affairs of the society, and were comforted together. The next day I came to Trenton, but a drunken sailor had locked up the courthouse, so I was obliged to preach in a schoolhouse where we had a comfortable meeting, and also at five the next morning. Thursday, October 22. In the morning I preached over the river, and in the evening at Trenton with some assistance and many young people attended. Saturday, 24. Leaving my horse at Bristol, I went to Burlington, and on the Lord's Day my spirit was much dejected, though in preaching I felt greatly assisted, and divine truth reached the hearts of the people. Monday, 26. After preaching at five, I left them and preached in the evening at Philadelphia. All things considered, the people here seemed to be quiet and in good order. On Tuesday, preached both morning and evening. R.S. and myself set out on Wednesday for Bohemia and on our way we found a few friends from Newcastle that had not deserted the cause. In this journey I called at Chester Jail, and saw the prisoners who all seemed hardened to a man, and among them were the wretched three that I saw escape the gallows before. Two of these had behaved so badly, they were now in chains. Lord, what is man? And what am I without thy grace? 
Keep me, keep me, holy Lord, and never let me go. Let me die rather than live in sin against thee. I spoke freely to one of them, who was a murderer. Thursday, 29. We reached Bohemia, where we found Solomon Hershey, a man hearty in the cause and of good understanding, but his spirit is too warm and easily moved. On Friday I visited E. and R. T. and saw their father in his hundredth year, eating, drinking, smoking, and talking. He appeared as forgetful of eternity as if he had been at the most secure distance from its brink. I think he told me that his father lived to be a hundred and nine, and never used spectacles. Saturday, 31. Rose early this morning, and purposed through grace to devote this day to God. I have traveled since Monday week, one hundred and fifty miles. Lord's Day, November 1. After preaching at H's in the morning, I intended to preach in the schoolhouse in the afternoon, but it would not contain half the people, so I stood at the door and the people without. Went to bed very unwell this evening, but rose at five, and, feeling better, set off for Susquehanna. The next morning my soul longed for God. I felt a comfortable sense of His love in my heart, and can rejoice in Him as my all-sufficient portion. In the afternoon we rode in company to the bayside. A few people, who came straggling after the time at friend Nathaniel Giles's, felt themselves affected by the power of God. At friend G's, the family was called together in the evening, and R. W. gave a moving exhortation. One person seemed affected. The next morning I rose at five, my usual time, and spent one hour in solemn secret prayer. Friend G. treated me with great kindness and pressed me to call again. I then went to Rocky Run and preached with freedom to a number of people, among whom were many friends. For some days past my mind has been blessed with much peace, so that I experience a present salvation and hope to experience that which is eternal. Thanks be to God for what I feel. Glory, glory be given to my dear and gracious Savior. Wednesday 4. This evening I had a very solemn family meeting, and spoke separately and pointedly to every one, both black and white. On Thursday morning, rising at my usual time, I had a comfortable sense of God upon my heart. Glory be to Thee, O Lord! After breakfast, Mrs. G., her brother, and myself set out for Deer Creek. We called at a friend's meeting and heard two men and a woman speak. They all spoke to purpose. We then proceeded to Mr. M.'s, and unexpectedly found the people at two o'clock waiting to hear the word. I preached with liberty, and the power of God was felt in the hearts of many, though some of them were principal men. The man of the house looked very earnestly at me while I was preaching. I then published preaching at S.L.'s, where we had also a comfortable time. S.L. himself was deeply affected. He had been a ranting Quaker, and a rebellious man, but God hath touched his heart, and wrought a good work on him and several others here. The next day we proceeded to Henry Waters's, whose brother is an ex-hoarder and now gone with Mr. W. to Virginia. The Lord hath done great things for these people, notwithstanding the weakness of the instruments, and some little irregularities. Men who neither feared God nor regarded man, swearers, liars, cockfighters, card-players, horse-racers, drunkards, etc., are now so changed as to become new men, and they are filled with the praises of God. This is the Lord's work, and it is marvelous to our eyes. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name be all the glory. Saturday 7. We had a powerful meeting at H.W.'s. Several from Mr. M.'s followed me, and seemed to give good attention to the things of God. Here I met with Nicholas Waters, an exhorter who appears to be a serious and sensible man. After appointing to meet the exhorters at my return, I went to S.F.'s and preached to many people, then preached at a place about three miles on my way back, and came to H.W.'s again, where we had a very comfortable time. Lord's Day 8. We had a very melting time indeed, while I preached to about two hundred souls from Romans six seventeen eighteen. We also had many people at R.W.'s, while I preached with liberty in my soul from 1 Corinthians 6, 20. Quote, the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. End quote. This day I have been free from evil, happy and joyful in my God. At the widow bees there were many people, both black and white, rich and poor, who all exhorted to seek the Lord while he may be found. Some of the young women in this family are serious and thoughtful. Tuesday 10. I enjoy peace and love in my soul, and am determined through grace to love and seek nothing but God. Preached to many people both at CB's in the morning and IM's in the evening, and was favored with much freedom. Wednesday 11. Many people attended preaching at Mr. S.'s, among whom were some Baptists who went away displeased. The congregation was also large at Friend S.'s. I have read Dr. S. on the non-eternity of hell torments, but in his arguments we may as well prove the non-eternity of heavenly joys, for he calls it an Ionian life. Now if the Ionian life of saints arise from the principle of spiritual life derived from Christ, then the Ionian death of the wicked arises from a principle of spiritual death in them, 
and the one will come to an end as soon as the other. Thursday 12. Preached at Friend G's. There are some Baptists in this neighborhood who oppose the work under us and perplex and trouble our young beginners, though they let them alone. Then returning to Friend C's, the word flowed freely while I preached to many people at six o'clock from 2 Corinthians 5, 20. Quote, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, end quote spoke on God's being reconciled to sinners, and showed on what terms they might be reconciled to God, and that none but Christ could bring about the reconciliation. My mind was greatly enlarged while describing the character of gospel ministers. Friday morning my soul was happy in God. I rode about eight miles to meet J.K. Many people attended the word at Mr. G.'s, and after preaching J.K. came. We went together to town and stayed all night. The next morning I returned to J.C.'s, where the congregation was large at twelve o'clock. This man's friends have rejected him on account of his religion. The family seem very serious, and I hope there will be a great and good work here. Then rode to Richard Owings, where some people came to see me, with whom we sung and prayed. End of section 4 Section 5 of The Journal of the Rev. Francis Asbury Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Robinson Journal of the Rev. Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 5 Tuesday, 17. This morning I found some peace and life in my soul, but want more retirement. My desire is to be ever before the Lord. Many people attended the preaching, both in the forenoon and in the evening, when the congregation was much affected. The next morning I went to friend S.'s and found his family well. Here we had Dr. Warfold and several polite people to dine with us. I spoke to the ladies about headdresses, but the doctor vindicated them, observing that religion did not consist in dress. I quoted the words of St. Peter. I stayed about an hour and then departed. We then rode to Friend D's, and spent some time with his family. Thursday, 19. Friend D and I set off for Frederica. We came to G.S.'s where I expected to have preached, but there was a disappointment, so we pursued our way, though my little horse was unwell and very weary. A poor unhappy man abused me much on the road. He cursed, swore, and threw stones at me, but I found it my duty to talk to him and show him his danger. Frederica is a neat little town, having one main street and three cross streets. It contains about a thousand houses, and the inhabitants are chiefly Germans. There are two German churches, one Calvinist and one Lutheran. There is also one English church and one Roman chapel. Many people came to hear me in this town. Friday, 20. Found some peace of mind in the morning, but was thoroughly buffeted by Satan in the course of the day. I had but few people in the evening, and but little power. Saturday, 21. My mind was greatly depressed, not on account of any outward known sin, but partly from the state of my body, and partly from a deep sense of the great work in which I am employed. I do not know when I sunk into deeper distress, though thank God there was no condemnation. Lord's Day. After preaching in the morning, Brother J. H., Friend B., and myself set off to a place where I had to preach at two o'clock. Friend B. was awakened by the instrumentality of Friend S., and he told me that he had been much opposed. I heard him give an exhortation greatly to the purpose, and gave him a note of recommendation to do all the good he could. Happened in the company of an old stupid Quaker woman, who supposed me to be half Quaker, and thought the friends were the only people in the world, and that they were not fallen from their former lively and spiritual state. A man came twenty miles for me to go and preach a funeral sermon. I accordingly complied and had many people to hear me. Then went about two miles to preach at Mr. D's and met with the German minister, Mr. Benedict Swope, who heard me preach at both places. We had some conversation about the ordinances administered by Mr. S. He advanced some reasons to urge the necessity of them and said Mr. W. did not do well to hinder us from the administration of them. I told him they did not appear to me as essential to salvation. Thursday, 24. Preached at Winchester in an unfinished house, and while the rain beat in upon me, many people looked and wondered at the stranger. However, I delivered my message with some energy, and then rode three miles to Richard Owings, where the Lord enabled me to preach with much feeling to a great number of people. Wednesday, 25. We rode about twenty miles to my old friend Joshua Owings, the forest home of the Methodists at that time, and found a very agreeable house and family. The old man is, quote, an Israelite indeed, end quote. He was once a serious churchman, who sought for the truth, and now God has revealed it to him. The Lord has also begun to bless his family. 
He has one son a preacher, and the rest of his children are very thoughtful. Though it was a rainy day, there were many people, and my heart was greatly enlarged towards them in preaching. Thursday, 26. The congregation was also large at Mr. Samuel Merriman's, and the Lord was with me. But on Friday at Mr. E.'s, the congregation was small, and I was much straightened. The same evening I rode to Baltimore. Saturday, 28. Preached at the point the first time. Lord's Day 29. It was a rainy day, but I rode to the point, and after preaching to a large congregation, returned to town and dined at W.M.'s. I preached in town both at three and at six o'clock. Monday, November 30. Rode in company with Mrs. Rachel Hullings, Mrs. R., and the widow W. to Nathaniel Perrigs, and preached to a large number of people. Then I rode to William Lynch's, to whom I was introduced by Mrs. H., and had many to hear the word of truth. The next day at Joppa there were many people from the country, and some from the town, Thursday, December 3. Preached at James Presbury's to many people who could feel the word and with much power in my own soul. Then rode three miles into the neck and had a solemn heart-affecting time while preaching from Revelations 2.11, a passage which, it seems, just suited their case. Afterward returned to J.P.'s. Friday 4. After preaching, Joseph Dallam conducted me to his house and treated me with great kindness. Preached at his house at 3 o'clock and on Saturday at M.B.'s about three miles off. Lord's Day 6. Went about five miles to preach in our first preaching house. The house had no window or doors. The weather was very cold, so that my heart pitied the people when I saw them so exposed. Putting a handkerchief over my head, I preached, and after an hour's intermission, the people waiting all the time in the cold, I preached again. Monday 7. J.K. and I went about five miles to lodge, and the next morning set off for Bohemia. We passed through Charlestown and dined at the head of the Elk. We lodged at R.T.'s, where I spoke closely to the poor Negroes, who took some notice of what was said. Since I went from here last, my travels have been perhaps as much as three hundred miles in about six weeks, and, glory to God, I have been favored with the presence of the Lord and with zeal and power in my public exercises. Rode to B.'s Tavern for my trunk and box of books, and received a letter from Mr. P., which surpassed everything I ever had met with from a Methodist preacher the Lord judge between him and me. Then I went to S.H.'s, and after preaching to a few people, I spoke to them, one by one, concerning the state of their souls. Tuesday 8. I had intended to preach at Georgetown, but in my way found a large house belonging to a certain Mr. B., in which Mr. Whitefield had preached some years ago to some Hollanders who were eminent for religion. But the old people are now dead. Then I proceeded on my way to Georgetown, and lodged at the house of a Quaker. He treated me with great kindness and appeared to be an understanding man. His wife was somewhat tender in religious conversation. In the evening the Negroes were collected, and I spoke to them in exhortation. In the morning three or four white people also attended a prayer, to whom I spoke about their souls. The friend went with me in the morning, and when I asked him what satisfaction he required, he told me no more than what he had received. Wednesday 9 I preached to many people, rich and poor, at J.R.'s, and at another place in the evening. Friday, 11. Went twelve miles into Kent County, and had many great people to hear me. But before preaching, one Mr. R., a church minister, came to me and desired to know who I was and whether I was licensed. I told him who I was. He spoke great swelling words and told me he had authority over the people and was charged with the care of their souls. He also told me that I could not and should not preach and if I did, he would proceed against me according to law. I let him know that I came to preach, and preach I would, and further asked him if he had authority to bind the consciousnesses of the people, or if he was a justice of the peace, and told him I thought he had nothing to do with me. He charged me with making a schism. I told him that I did not draw the people from the church, and asked him if his church was then open. He told me that I hindered people from their work, and I asked him if fairs and horse races did not hinder them, and further told him that I came to help him. He said he had not hired me for an assistant, and did not want my help. I told him if there were no swearers or other sinners, he was sufficient. But, he said, what did you come for? I replied to turn sinners to God. He said, cannot I do that as well as you? I told him that I had authority from God. He then laughed at me and said, You are a fine fellow indeed. I told him I did not do this to invalidate his authority, and also gave him to understand that I did not wish to dispute with him. But he said he had business with me, 
and came into the house in a great rage. I began to preach, and urged people to repent, and turn from all their transgressions so iniquity would not prove their ruin. After preaching, the parson went out and told the people they did wrong in coming to hear me, and said I spoke against learning. Whereas I only spoke to this purpose, when a man turned from all sin, he would adorn every character in life, both in church and state. I left him, and preached at John R.'s at seven o'clock. Lord's Day 13. Preached twice with very little intermission to many people collected at a schoolhouse near our tees, and then rode to S.H.'s and found a comfortable time while preaching at six o'clock. On Monday I rode to Newcastle and preached to a large company. My soul has lately been much bowed down. Tuesday 15. There were but few people attended preaching at Mr. S.'s, and as the next day was wet, I stayed and had a family meeting. On Thursday I went to Mr. T.'s. My mind has been much affected lately. May the Lord support and teach me. After preaching at Mr. T.'s, I went to hear a new light minister, and found but little satisfaction. Lord's Day 20 Though it rained much, yet many people attended preaching at I.H.'s. Then I preached at a place about five miles off, and rode thence to Newcastle, where many people attended at night. The Lord favored me. My mind is now full of divine peace. Monday 21 I set out for Bohemia, and though my body was much fatigued with my ride, and my head ached violently, yet in the evening I enforced these words, quote, Be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, end quote, and endeavor to show them that in justification we have peace, in sanctification we are without spot, and in perfect love we are blameless, and then proceeded to show them wherein we must be diligent. Tuesday 22 on my way to Susquehanna, a person came for me to visit Mrs. T. in a dropsy. I then proceeded to J.D.'s, and the next day set off for J.P.'s to attend our quarterly meeting. Many people attended, and several friends came many miles. I preached from Acts 20:28, 20, quote, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, end quote, etc. After showing to whom the charge was given, I proceeded to enforce the subject thus. 1. Take heed to your spirits. 2. Take heed to your practice. 3. Take heed to your doctrine. 4. Take heed to the flock. 4. 1. Those that are under deep conviction. 4. 2. Those that are true believers. 4. 3. Those that are sorely tempted. 4. 4. Those that are groaning for full redemption. 4. 5. Those that have backslidden. I then urge the motives to this duty. We afterward proceeded to our temporal business and considered the following propositions. 1. What are our collections? We found them sufficient to defray our expenses. 2. How are the preachers stationed? Brother S. and Brother O. in Frederick County, Brother K., Brother W., and I. R. on the other side of the bay, and myself in Baltimore. 3. Shall we be strict in our society meetings and not admit strangers? Agreed. 4. Shall we drop preaching in the daytime through the week? Not agreed to. 5. Will the people be contented without our administering the sacrament? J.K. was neutral. Brother S. pleaded much for the ordinances, and so did the people who appeared to be much biased by him. I told them I would not agree to it at that time, and insisted on our abiding by our rules. But Mr. B. had given them their way at the quarterly meeting held here before, and I was obliged to connive at some things for the sake of peace. 6. Shall we make collections weekly to pay the preacher's board and expenses? This was not agreed to. We then inquired into the moral character of the preachers and exhorters. Only one exhorter was found anyway doubtful, and we have great hopes of him. Brother S. received eight pounds quarterage, Brother K. and myself six pounds each. Great love subsisted among us in the meeting, and we parted in peace. I then went to Joseph Dallam's, and on Christmas Day attended the church and heard Parson West preach a plain, useful sermon which contained much truth and afterward received the sacrament. Then rode five miles to Bush, but as Mr. S. did not give public notice, few people attended, and the preaching was late. The next day I rode to B.P.'s, where we had a large congregation and a very comfortable meeting. On the same day at the house of H.W., Nicholas Waters spoke with great care, but with little depth. He may improve, and make a useful preacher in time. Lord's Day 27 rode to the widow Bonds, and preached twice with very little intermission to a great number of people. According to a meeting in the evening, I had an opportunity of hearing Isaac Rawling exhort. 
His exhortation was coarse and loud enough, though with some depth. I gave him a little advice, which he seemed willing to take. Monday, 28. Many people of various kinds attended at A.S.'s, preached afterward at I.M.'s in the evening, and went thence to I.B.'s and met the class. Tuesday, 29. At Mr. S.'s I found great peace of mind and, thanks be to God, had power in preaching, though the people were dead and stupid. The next day at Mr. S.'s I had many people and preached with freedom, then went to G.'s where we had great consolation. January 1, 1773 My body has been weak for some time, but my mind has enjoyed a good degree of peace, and I have a strong desire to be kept in the meekness of Jesus Christ. My heart has been affected by reading lately part of Sewell's history of the Quakers. How great was the spirit of persecution in New England, when some were imprisoned, some had their ears cut off, and some were hanged. Oh, that our God would arise and bow the nations to himself. January 2 After preaching to several people at J.M.'s, a new place, I then rode back to Mr. C.'s and preached in the evening. January 3 Rode to Baltimore and had a large congregation at the house of Captain Patton at the point. Many of the principal people were there, and the Lord enabled me to speak with power. At night I preached in town. The house was well filled with people, and we have a comfortable hope the work of the Lord will revive in this place. Bless the Lord, O ye saints. Holiness is the element of my soul. My earnest prayer is that nothing contrary to holiness may live in me. Monday 4 Rode to S.S.'s and was much affected in preaching to the people. I then met and regulated the class. Tuesday 5. They were kind enough to offer me the courthouse in town, but judging it unfit, I preached in another house and then met the society and settled a class of men. Wednesday 6. We had a pretty good gathering at N. Perrigs, about six miles from town. I then rode back to town, and after preaching with comfort in the evening, I formed a class of women. Thursday 7. Rose with a determination to live more to God. Preached twice in the country, met two classes, and settled them as well as I could. The class at Mr. S.'s were lively and had the power of God among them. They were the fruit of N.P.'s labors, and many of them could give a good account of their experience. Friday 8. My mind is fixed on God. I both desire and purpose to exercise fasting, prayer, and faith. After some exercise of mind, the Lord enabled me to preach with warmth at Mr. M.'s from these words, quote, be not ye partakers with them. End quote. I showed, first, whom the words were spoken to, secondly, with whom they were not to be partakers, thirdly, how they were not to partake with them, namely, in spirit, in judgment, in practice. Lord's Day, January 10. Many people attended at J.P.'s to whom I preached twice with some life, and then went three miles into the neck, and felt much power while preaching on perfect love. The more I speak on this subject, the more my soul is filled and drawn out in love. This doctrine has a great tendency to prevent people from settling on their lees. Monday 11 Preached with great plainness to many people at D.R.'s, and then rode to Mr. D.'s. Tuesday 12 Rode to M.B.'s, but as they had no previous notice, we collected but few. However, I preached, and afterward returned to Mr. D.'s, and preached to his family. Thursday, 14. It was late before I reached S.L.'s, and as there was much rain and snow, the company was small. Young Dr. Andrews took me home with him. The young man and his sister and mother seemed tender, but his father appeared to be a stiff old man, and I did by no means like his spirit. Friday, 15. Many people attended preaching at S.F.'s. I was shut up in speaking, and afterward rode home with friend P. Saturday, 16. This morning I rose to glorify God with the determination to do His will and that only, to be wholly devoted to the Lord in spirit, soul, and body. Many people came to hear the word of life today, though it was very cold. Lord's Day 17 Preaching today at Friend P's on the barren fig tree, I first showed that it was applicable to the Jews, and secondly to the Protestant Church, at the same time described the barren fig tree as one without leaves, or one without blossoms, or one without fruit, or one that did not bear so much fruit as another might bear. I then rode to Joseph Dallam's and preached to his family with a few others. On Monday but few people attended at B's, and in the evening I preached at Mr. D's and was shut up. 
The next day many country people came to hear the word at Joppa, though but few came from the town. There are about forty houses in this town, and it stands on a neck of land near the water, but the people seem to be buried in trade, sensuality, and superstition. Wednesday 20. The weather being cold, there were but few at J.B.'s. Nevertheless, I preached. If Israel be not gathered, yet I hope to be the Lord's. Thursday 22. After preaching with liberty at Mr. C.'s, I went to A.G.'s and found life in preaching there. The next day at J.M.'s, I preached to a stupid company, and then rode to J.C.'s. I was favored with liberty in dispensing the blessed word in the evening at J. Owings. How pleasant and profitable it is to feel divine power in public exercises. Saturday I rode to Baltimore and had a large congregation. Lord's Day 24 I preached twice at the point and once in town. On Monday my heart felt great sorrow. This day I wrote to my mother, and in the evening found great consolation. End of Section 5 Section 6 of the Journal of the Rev. Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Robinson. Journal of the Rev. Francis Asbury, Volume 1. Section 6. Tuesday, 26. My mind was wholly given up to God, and I have a great hope that the gospel will yet spread in this town. On Wednesday there was a moving among the people while I preached at N.P.'s, and afterward returning to town, preached in the evening. On Thursday I felt power and life in my soul while preaching to a large number of people at Mr. G.'s. On Friday I preached in the Neck and at Joppa. Saturday 30. Perceiving the great wickedness of the people who were swearing and drinking in a tavern, Great struggles arose in my mind about preaching there. However, I broke through every difficulty, and felt both life and power in dispensing the word among them. Lord's Day 31 This was a day of power and comfort. I rode to Joseph Presbury's, preached three times, and met the classes. Many of the people, through grace, were able to give a good account of their experience. February 1 Was favored in preaching to a number of people at D.R.'s, and my mind has been kept by the grace of God. Tuesday 2 Was greatly assisted in preaching today, both at Swan Creek and Mr. Dollum's. This morning I breakfasted with Richard Dollum and found that he was very fond of Mr. Law's works. He treated me with great kindness. After preaching and meeting the society at the ferry, I went to Jacob Giles's, a man much talked of, but what he is I know not. In principle he appeared to be a Quaker. He was much troubled with the gout, which, he told me, his father had before him. He said his father cured himself of the gout by milk and moderate diet, but threw himself into a dropsy. On Thursday, after preaching at Deer Creek, I rode to P.B.'s. My present purpose is to put all the people who are fit for it into bands. Friday 5. Many people attended at F.'s, and my soul was enlarged in preaching to them. I then rode back to P.B.'s, and put the people into bands as I had designed. Saturday 6. My mind was calm and serene this morning. I preached with some power, and we had a comfortable meeting. W.D., a lad about sixteen or seventeen years of age, exhorted the people. He appeared to be a promising youth, and I gave him a license to exhort. Lord's Day 7. Some great critics attended at the preaching house today, but I preached twice and spoke freely. Monday 8. Though the weather was very cold, I went to W.B.'s and enforced on a dull congregation these awful words of our Lord, quote, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? End quote. I went afterward to the widow Bonds and spoke closely to the girls who appeared to be somewhat serious. Tuesday 9 After preaching to more people than usual at A.S.'s, I went to B.'s in the evening and both met the class and formed some bands. I also gave them a copy of the proper deed for securing their preaching house. Wednesday 10. I went to C's and preached. This will be perhaps for the last time, for it is a disorderly house. I then went to Aquila Galloway's and preached with some comfort. There is room to hope that the Lord will do something for the people there. Thursday 11. The congregation was large at J.M.'s, and I preached with plainness so that the sleepy people seemed to awake. I then went back to C's 
and preached with some satisfaction, but Satan was close at my heels. However, the Lord gave me power to resist him. Friday 12. The Lord enables me to stand fast in the midst of temptations. My soul possesses inward and spiritual power. Many people attended preaching today at J.O.'s. I afterward met the class and then gave an exhortation in the evening. Lord's Day 14. Many country people came to hear the word of God at the point. Some came twelve miles before those of the town had left their houses, perhaps before some of them had left their beds. I found some life and power in preaching both at the point and in Baltimore. Monday 15. Rose this morning with holy thoughts of God, and we had a good time in public worship. Wednesday 17. I preached and met the society, and employed Mr. M. to draw up a deed for the house in Gunpowder Neck. Thursday 18. Preached with power, both at N.P.'s and Mr. Galloway's. Friday 19. A few people attended at Mr. M.'s. Going afterward about four miles to Mr. D.'s, I preached and met the society. Most of them appeared to be under a good work of grace. Lord's Day 21. The weather was excessively severe, yet many people came to hear the word at J.P.'s. I rode about six or seven miles to preach in the neck, but never felt colder weather. The water froze as it ran from the horse's nostrils, and a friend said the water froze as it came from his eyes. However, after preaching to a few people, I returned. Monday 22. I had sixteen miles to ride to preach to a few people, and five more to J.D.'s to get my dinner. I have suffered a little by lodging in open houses this cold weather, but this is a very small thing when compared to what the dear Redeemer suffered for the salvation of precious souls. Tuesday 23. Glory to God! I had peace. Wednesday 24. After preaching with plainness to a considerable number of people, I then went to J.D.'s, where many people attended, and we had a comfortable time. My old opponent, Mr. E., met me here, but he did not appear to be so forward as he had been. I rode thence to Rocky Run, and preached there with satisfaction. Mr. G. and his wife treated me with great kindness. Thursday 25. I had a good time in many people at Mr. L.'s. Two letters came to hand today, one from York and one from Philadelphia. They entreat me to return, and inform me that trouble is at hand, but I cannot fear while my heart is upright with God. I seek nothing but Him, and fear nothing but His displeasure. Lord's Day 28. After preaching yesterday at S.F.'s, I returned to Friend P.'s and preached twice today, then rode to Mr. D.'s and spent the evening comfortably. Monday, March 1. Mr. D. and myself rode to B.'s where I spoke with great plainness of speech. There appears to be some reason to doubt of the people in general here, though the young women seem to be deeply serious and thoughtful. I then went to Captain S.'s, but found very little satisfaction. The man and his wife are, I fear, too fond of their own opinions. After preaching here, I went to B.'s again, and spent some time in serious conversation. I afterward prayed and gave an exhortation. I then rode to M.'s and preached, and returned to C.'s and preached there but found the old man too much of a Quaker in principle. He objects against prayer in his family and greatly discourages his daughter, who strives to live in the fear of God. Friday, March 5, went to J.O.'s, where we had a melting time, and the people seemed much affected both in the day and in the evening. Satan has assaulted me very much of late, but hitherto the Lord hath helped and delivered me. I came next to Baltimore, and had many to hear the word. Saturday 6, went to the point, but the people seemed very hard in their minds. In the evening at Baltimore, we had a moving, melting season. I humbly believe the labor was not in vain. Monday 8. Rose this morning with a determination to fight or die and spend an hour in earnest prayer. Lord, keep me ever watchful. I was also much comforted by a letter which I lately received from R.O., part of which is as follows. Quote, I know not what it will come to. Almost every person seems to be under a religious concern. There are about twenty-two persons already joined in society at Seneca. At Georgetown, four have been lately enabled to rejoice in God, and one at Rocky Creek. Blessed be to God, who hath not forgotten to be gracious. End quote. Thursday 9. This was a day of sweet peace to my soul. I went to dine with one Mr. L., and found him and his wife both serious, preached in the evening with power. Wednesday 10. I went to N.P.'s. It was a rainy morning, but a time of power to those who were present. In going thence to Mr. G.'s, it was with great difficulty we crossed the water. 
The next morning I set off for Gunpowder Neck, but found the Great Falls very high. However, I got there about one o'clock, and found it a good time while preaching the Word of God. Friday, 12. Preached a funeral sermon at J.W.'s from Isaiah 57, 1-2. Quote, The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. End quote. This was a solemn time indeed. What melting and weeping there appeared among the people! There was scarce a dry eye to be seen. Oh, that it may not be as seed sown by the wayside! After preaching, I rode to Mr. D.'s, and met with Brother K. and Brother W., and found myself abundantly comforted in their company. Lord's Day 14 Preached at Bohemia. There were but few people, though it was a melting time. Rode then to S.H.'s, but was much shut up in preaching. Monday 15 Found my mind this morning free to do the will of God, and was more than ever strengthened in prayer but set out for Wharton to-day, with my mind depressed in such a manner as I hardly ever felt it before. In my journey my heart sunk within me, and I knew not why. At a certain Mr. D.'s, at the crossroads, many people who appeared to be strangers to the truth were waiting to hear the word. I stood at the door and declared, quote, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, end quote. I spoke with great feeling and exerted myself much, but could not get my spirit free. They persuaded me to stay all night, but it was as if I had been bound in chains. Tuesday, 16. Went to R's and found myself delivered from my shackles. But still my spirit is not altogether at home. It longs for God. I do humbly and confidently hope to live more to God than ever. Lord, keep me every moment. Wednesday, 17. Went down to the lower church, but with some backwardness of mind. However, there were many people here who were still and attentive, and I felt a melting sense of God in my own soul. Friday 19. I spoke with power to many people at Newcastle, went thence to Wilmington, and spoke to a few people with great feeling. Lord's Day 21. But few attended at IH's because of the rain, but I felt myself greatly assisted, went thence through the rain to Newport, where many people attended in the evening. They appeared to have very little sense of religious things. Monday, 22. Being a rainy day, we set out late for Marlborough. There was, notwithstanding, a large congregation waiting. Though unwell, I gave them an exhortation at night, and I.R. preached. He has been of some use to the people here. Tuesday, 23. My mind was serene, and I felt a nearness to God, a determination to live to Him alone. Went to T.E.'s and felt much life while preaching to a large company there, but was afflicted with a violent pain in the head. Wednesday, 24. Many great people attended the preaching at W.'s, and we had a comfortable time. Rode thence to S.H.'s. Many Quakers were present, and it was a moving season. I then went about twenty miles, through wet weather and bad roads, to Mr. T.'s. The night was very dark. The road was through the woods, and it was late before we reached the place, but by the help of a good guide I got there safe at last. Quote, In all my ways thy hand I own, thy ruling providence I see. Assist me still my course to run, and still direct my paths to thee. End quote. I was somewhat troubled to hear of Mr. W., who had printed some of Mr. Wesley's books for the sake of gain. This will not do. It does by no means look well. Friday, 26. Many young people attended, among others, at Christine Bridge, while I preached from Ecclesiastes 11.9. Quote, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thy heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. End quote. Deep seriousness sat on the faces of all, and the mouths of many gainsayers were, in a great measure, stopped. Saturday, 29. Rode to Bohemia and lodged with a Presbyterian elder. The next day I preached in the schoolhouse. But these people, who profess religion, could scarce be serious during the time of preaching. Mr. B. and some other great opposers of our doctrine were present at S.H.'s at three o'clock. 
I therefore changed my purpose, and preached from 1 John 3, 23, quote, And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment, end quote. And I had a great hope that this was well received. Monday 29. Rode 20 miles to Susquehanna, and just got in, almost spent, time enough to preach at three o'clock. Hitherto the Lord hath helped me. Praised forever be his dear and blessed name. Tuesday 30. Our quarterly meeting began. After I had preached, we proceeded to business, and in our little conference, the following queries were propounded, namely, 1. Are there no disorderly persons in our classes? It was thought not. 2. Does not dram drinking too much prevail among our people? 3. Do none contract debts without due care to pay them? We found that this evil is much avoided among our people. 4. Are the banned meetings kept up? 5. Is there nothing immoral in any of our preachers? 6. What preachers travel now, and where are they stationed? It was then urged that none must break our rules under the penalty of being excluded from our connection. All was settled in the most amicable manner. Mr. S. preached a good and useful sermon from Joel 2.17. Quote, Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. End quote. Etc. Many people were present at our love feast, among whom were some strangers. But all were deeply serious, and the power of God was present indeed. Brother O. preached a very alarming sermon, and Brother S. gave a moving exhortation. The whole ended in great peace, and we all went, in the strength of the Lord, to our several appointments. Saturday 3. Preached at Baltimore, where we had a comfortable meeting. Lord's Day 4. I delivered a funeral discourse, but was much shut up in my mind. Went thence to the forest, and preached at seven o'clock with great comfort. Several rich people attended preaching the last three days, and did not seem displeased with the plain truths of the gospel. One or two persons here seem to be groaning for full redemption. My heart is grieved that I have not been entirely devoted to God, but have great reason to be thankful that I feel more and more desire after God. Thursday 8. I left Baltimore. J.K. and three exhorters being present, we held a watch night at Pease, and the Lord was powerfully with us. Friday 9. Preached at L's with power, but found it a heavy cross while preaching at Mr. G's. Lord's Day 11. Preached at Bohemia, but the people there seemed to be but little affected. Rode thence to S.H.'s, where many people attended, and I was enabled to speak with solemnity from Deuteronomy 30.19. Quote, I have set before you life and death, end quote, etc. Went thence to Newcastle, but found them out of order. Then rode to Red Clay Creek, where I preached with power. Thursday 19. Many people came to hear the word at Mount Pleasant. Wednesday 14. Came very weary to Philadelphia, but the sight of my friends greatly revived me, and all seemed to be in peace. Tuesday proved to be a day of peace to my soul, part of which I spent in visiting the people. The next day I was employed in writing to England, and after preaching in the evening with power, I went to rest in sweet peace, and awoke in the morning in the same frame of mind. May this day be spent to the glory of God, and may my soul yet praise Him more and more. On Wednesday, after spending part of the day in visiting, I preached in the evening from these words, quote, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief, end quote. And humbly hope it was not labor in vain, while unbelief, that destructive root of all other sin, was exposed to the people. On Thursday there was an appointment for me to preach in Newtown. Brother S. and myself crossed the East River, but it was with difficulty that we obtained horses. We then attempted to proceed on our way, but it was a severe morning, with much snow and wind. The snow came full in our faces, so that after riding a few miles we were lost in the storm and imperceptibly turned our course back toward New York, which we never discovered till we overtook some people on the road. We then crossed the river back to the city, where I continued till Monday. Friday, I preached at New York with these words, quote, The Lord is good, a strong hold in the day of trouble, end quote, and felt life and power in dispensing the word. 
On Saturday I visited the sick and gave an exhortation to the people. Lord's Day 4 After preaching in the morning on Hebrews 12.15, I went in the afternoon to church and heard Mr. E. preach a useful sermon. In the evening I preached with much freedom on Ecclesiastes 11.9. Quote, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, end quote, etc. The young people appeared deeply serious. May the blessing of the Lord attend it, and great fruit appear in the time to come. The next day I rode to Bloomingdale and preached with satisfaction, and then returned home, and found it a blessing to labor in the vineyard of the Lord, both in season and out of season. On Tuesday morning my mind was clear, my heart was fixed on God, and Christ was precious. Bless the Lord, O my soul. New York is a large city and well situated for trade, but the streets and buildings are very irregular. The inhabitants are of various denominations, but nevertheless of a courteous and sociable disposition. There are several places of divine worship. The Episcopalians have three, the High Dutch one, the Low Dutch three, the Lutherans two, the French Protestants one, the Presbyterians two, the Seceders one, the Baptists one, the Moravians one, the Methodists one, and the Jews one. The city abounds with inhabitants, but the exact number I could not ascertain. End of section 6 Section 7 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jordan Hazelrig Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1 Section 7 Wednesday, the 7th My soul enjoyed great peace, and the day was partly spent in religious visits. The next day my mind was in the same comfortable frame, and holy thoughts of God, with strong desires to do all the things with a single eye to his glory, as well as to follow his divine precepts, possessed my peaceful heart. Friday, the ninth. This day was, as yesterday, a day of peace, and it was with great satisfaction I preached in the evening, though cold, to a considerable number of people, on the much-neglected duty of self-denial. Lord's Day, the eleventh. I went through my morning exercises in church as usual, and in the afternoon heard Mr. C. preach a good sermon. But a more gay and undevout congregation I have seldom seen. They were talking, laughing, bowing, and trifling both with God and their minister, as well as with their own unawakened souls. On Tuesday, I took my leave of New York, after preaching from Philippians 1.9, with an intention to spend some time on Staten Island, on my way to Philadelphia. During my stay on the island, I preached several times, with power and satisfaction, but was sometimes greatly assaulted by Satan. Hitherto the Lord hath helped me. Glory to his name. He preserves and blesses my soul. He supplies me with all things necessary for the preservation and health of my body. May I be ever careful to please Him and devote all the powers of body and soul to His service. Thursday, the 15th. I preached for the first time on this visit in Philadelphia on Ruth 2-4. Many people attended, and the Lord filled my heart with holy gladness. All things are in peace here. From Saturday the 17th till Thursday the 22nd was spent in the Jerseys, where I preached at different places and often to large congregations. The Lord was frequently with me in mercy and power, and my heart was greatly enlarged. How I long to be more holy, to live more with God and for God. Troubles encompass me about but the Lord is my helper. Before my return to Philadelphia, I had the pleasure of seeing the foundation laid of a new preaching house, 35 feet by 30. 
Then I returned and preached on Thursday evening, the Lord being with me. Friday, the 23rd. This morning my mind was in a calm and even frame, sweetly fixed on God as its prime object. But I greatly long for more grace, to receive esteem or disesteem with equal cheerfulness, to be something or nothing, as God would have me to be. My heart was at liberty while employed in speaking for God this evening. Tuesday, the 27th. The Lord has graciously assisted me in preaching every day, and my desires to be entirely devoted do still increase. But alas, what cause have I to mourn the want of life and zeal, both in public and private duties? Nevertheless, it is my determination to offer all I have to God. May He give me more to offer, and graciously accept the offering made. Had much conversation with A.W., but found him unwilling to spend all his time in traveling. However, he agreed to take a part with I.K. So my intention is to send them to the upper part of the Jerseys, where they may labor alternately, a fortnight at a time. Thursday, the 29th. Mr. S. is just come from England with strange accounts of their Calvinistic disputes. My mind is rather low, but serene and spiritual, and determined to follow Christ. How greatly do I long to die to every object which does not lead me to God! Blessed Master, hasten the time when I shall love Thee according to the full extent of that desire which Thou hast given me. Saturday, the 31st This was a day of delightful rest to my soul. After preaching in the morning, I spent part of the day in visiting some souls in distress. In the evening, I preached again on these words, Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? My mind was much enlarged, perhaps to the offense of some, while showing the particular marks of such as do but cumber the ground in the Lord's vineyard. Lord's Day, May 2nd My soul was favored both yesterday and this morning, with delightful and intimate accesses to God. In preaching this morning from these words, Try the spirits whether they be of God, I took occasion to show, first, that this is the duty of all that profess religion, and secondly, that they should bring their experience and practice to the word of God, to know if they be genuine. After preaching to a large congregation in the evening, I met the society and thought it necessary to deal closely with the members. Thursday, the 6th. After spending a few days in a country tour, preaching to many people at Goshen, Marlboro, and other places, with some assistance, I returned and preached in Philadelphia this evening, on the subject of the stony ground hearers. Some perhaps were displeased with me, but I must declare the whole counsel of God and leave the event to him. This day a letter from Mr. Weasley came to hand, dated March 2nd, in which he informs me that the time of his coming over to America is not yet, being detained by the building of the new chapel. Lord's Day, the ninth. My heart was much affected last evening, while many of the people felt the power of God. And this day my soul was filled with sweet peace. I had also the pleasure of hearing Mr. T. preach with great sensibility. Monday, the 10th. Visiting several families today afforded me great comfort of mind, and in preaching this evening, with close application to those who pursue carefully more than heavenly pleasures, my soul was filled with peace. Traveling through the Jerseys, I met with W.B., a man who has a great regard for us but seems to be too much taken up with worldly cares. But speaking faithfully and closely to him, I showed him the deceitfulness of riches in producing a spirit of independence towards God, hardness of heart, and pride in its various forms, while they promise us safety and happiness. Thursday, the 13th. Through much rain I returned, wet and weary, to Philadelphia 
after having preached at several places in the Jerseys, and sometimes with much freedom and power. Many people attended this evening, while I described an honest and good heart, under the similitude of the good ground which received the seed and brought forth fruit. This was free from the hardness of the wayside, from the shallowness of the stony ground, and from the obstructions of the thorny ground. The honesty of the heart appears in its conduct towards God, towards all mankind, and towards itself. As our Lord is pleased to denominate such a heart good as well as honest, is it not very wrong for a Christian to say he has a bad heart? Is not all that the Holy Ghost produces good? And so far as that blessed spirit has changed the heart of a believer, is it not good? Through the unmerited grace of God, I have no desire to seek anything but Him, and that which may lead me to Him. Lord's Day, the 16th. In preaching this morning from Genesis 18:19, I strongly enforced the great necessity of relative duties and very pointedly pressed the same in meeting the society at night. Monday, the 17th. All this day I was very unwell with a sore throat and violent pain in my head, but I.K. providentially came in and supplied my place. My indisposition continued also on Tuesday, so that I had but little power to read or think. But on Wednesday I found myself, through mercy, much better. Although my body is weak, my soul is strong in the grace of God. May my heart, my lips, my hands, my life, my strength, my all, be constantly devoted to God. Monday, the 24th. Sweet peace pervaded my soul, and my whole heart desired, prayed, longed, and panted to live a more spiritual life by faith in the blessed Son of God. In the evening I preached from Isaiah 62, 6. I have set watchmen, etc., and took occasion, first, to show that the Lord calls, authorizes, and qualifies all faithful ministers. Secondly, delineated their character as watchmen. Thirdly, observed that they were to keep watch on the walls. Fourthly, the duties enjoined, they shall not hold their peace, Keep not silence. While opening this passage, the Lord greatly comforted my soul. The next morning I expatiated on Canticles 1-7 and considered, first, the address, Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth. Secondly, the request, Where thou feedest, etc. This denotes the sincere desire of a true believer in the time of division or persecution or general declension of true piety. Thirdly, the humble query, Why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? This indicates a fear of being exposed to false teachers, who name the name of Christ, but deny him in experience, doctrine, and practice. How fearful is a pious soul of turning aside as a forlorn, neglected creature! exposed to the malice and designs of devils and ungodly men. Glory to God! Notwithstanding all the assaults of Satan, my soul is preserved in peace, and my heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. My chief desire is to be found obedient and faithful at all times and all occasions. Thursday, the 27th. My text was Isaiah twenty-three sixteen. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munition of rocks, etc. First, I inquired to whom this promise is made. Secondly, how he shall dwell on high. High in faith, love, and church privileges, above the power of Satan, the world, and all dangers, so that none of them shall injure his soul. Thirdly, his defense shall be the munition of rocks, Christ shall be the rock of his defense, and the love, truth, faithfulness, mercy, and power of God shall enclose him on every side. Fourthly, his bread shall be given him. All things needful for life and godliness.
Friday, the 28th. It was a gracious season at intercession today. My soul was favored with love and power. Monday, the 31st. I went to Germantown and preached with the freedom and comfort to a large congregation assembled in the Dutch Presbyterian Church. I take God for my sufficient portion, and Christ is all in all to me. Tuesday, June 1st. This day my soul was under gracious exercises, and went out in ardent desires after God. He has engrossed all my affections, and my heart is taken up with Him. Thursday, the 3rd. To my great comfort arrived Mr. R., Mr. S., Mr. Y., and Captain W. Mr. R. preached a good sermon on these words. I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. He will not be admired as a preacher, but as a disciplinarian he will fill his place. Lord's Day, the 6th. After preaching both yesterday and this morning at Burlington, I went to church in order to receive the sacrament. But the parson gave us a strange discourse, full of inconsistency and raillery. Leaving him to answer for his own conduct, I took no further notice of it, but preached at night from these words, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, etc., and showed, first, what the things of the Spirit of God are, secondly, described the natural man, and thirdly, showed how they appear to be foolishness to him, and that he cannot know them by the strength of his natural or acquired abilities. The little society in Burlington appears to be in a comfortable and prosperous state. On my way to Trenton, I met A.W. on the road, we stopped at a house, and in the course of conversation, I found he was much dejected in his mind. But before we parted, he appeared to be somewhat comforted. Many people attending the preaching at Trenton, though the notice was but short. Thursday, the 10th. My soul has been much assaulted lately by Satan, but by the grace of God it is filled with divine peace. My heart thirsteth for God even for the living God. I wrote to Mr. Wesley today, and in the evening addressed my discourse chiefly to the young people. May the Lord apply it to their hearts. Friday, the 11th. Mr. R. came to Trenton. After dinner and prayer, we set off together for Princeton. On Saturday, we reached New York, and our friends there, having previous notice of our coming, kindly met us on the dock where we landed. The sight of Mr. W., with some other concurring circumstances, affected Mr. R. so that he appeared to be rather cast down in his mind. Lord's Day, the 13th. I preached this morning to a considerable number of people. Mr. R. found his spirits raised and was much comforted. In the afternoon, Mr. R., Captain W., Mr. W., and myself went to St. Paul's Church and received the sacrament. At night, Mr. R. dispensed the word of truth with power. It reached the hearts of many, and they appeared to be much quickened. Monday, the 14th. Many were present while I preached from Second John 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. The Lord favors me with great discoveries of my defects and unfaithfulness. But, blessed be God... My soul is humbled under these discoveries. My soul panteth for more of the divine nature. When shall I be fully conformed to his blessed will? I received a letter this day from that venerable father in Christ, Mr. Wesley. Wednesday, the 16th. Captain W. set out for Albany, and I for New Rochelle. On Thursday, Mr. L. preached at Mr. D.'s. On these words, To them that have obtained like precious faith with us. He spoke plainly and much to the purpose, though he did not show the necessity of assurance. We had some free and friendly conversation afterward, 
in which I gave him to understand how we hold this point, that as assurance is suspended on an evangelical act of faith by which we apply the merits of Jesus Christ for the removal of our guilt, and that we then receive the testimony of the Spirit. Romans 8.16 Lord's Day, the 20th Satan, that malicious enemy of mankind, is frequently striving to break my peace. And the Lord graciously shows me all my involuntary defects, so that my soul is bowed down as in the dust. But Christ is precious, and the Spirit of all grace comforts my heart. This day I preached three times at Mr. D's. The word reached the hearts of many with divine power. Our labors here have not been in vain. Many have a relish for religious exercises and experience the spiritual benefit of frequently meeting together in the name of the Lord. My intention is to form a society here. Monday, the 21st. While preaching at Mr. B's, the Lord favored me with sweet liberty, and there was no small moving amongst the people. Several seemed willing to meet in society here also. Tuesday, the 22nd. I received an account of the case of S.D. She is about 16 years of age and has been lately brought under serious and deep concern for the salvation of her soul. A few days after, she was taken ill and was frequently troubled with fits, which, while they were on her, deprived her of her reason. About three days after she was taken ill, she was justified by faith and had peace with God. She continued weekly in body about five weeks, but fasted, prayed, and sang, to the astonishment of all about her. After her recovery, she manifested a sound conversion. She had a settled peace, was conscientiously serious, meek, and patient in all her conduct, and the word of God was precious food to her soul. Wednesday, the 23rd. After preaching with some power on these words, Blessed are they that hear the words of God and keep it. I joined a few in society and then set off for New York. I called on Mr. B in my way, who renewed his former kindness and treated me with great cordiality. On my return to New York, I found Mr. R had been well employed in settling matters pertaining to the society. This afforded me great satisfaction and more especially the revival of religion which has lately taken place in this city. Saturday, the 26th. Having preached a few times in New York, since my return I set off for Staten Island. But the heat was so extremely powerful that I stopped at my old friend J.W.'s, and on the Lord's Day heard Mr. P., a Presbyterian minister, preach twice, but thought he was too metaphysical and superficial. In the evening I preached in Mr. W.'s yard, from Hebrews 5.12, Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles and the oracles of God. My mind is filled with the peace of God, and is drawn out in love to Him and all mankind. Blessed be the Lord. Monday, the 28th. While preaching today on Isaiah 62.6, Mr. P., the minister, made one of the congregation. After service, we had some conversation on religious subjects. He had imbibed that absurd scheme of Mr. B's, namely that we are born again before we repent and believe. How strange that any man should suppose the effect is produced before the instrumental causes exist. But, by the grace of God, none of these things shall move me from the gospel plan of salvation. Glory to God. He blesses me with the graces and comforts of His Holy Spirit in my own soul. The next day, Mr. P. attended preaching again. I had lent him Mr. Fletcher's second check. He approved of the latter part, though not of the first. May the truth of God spread here and in every place. Had some serious conversation with Mr. D. and his wife. They both seem to have desires to be instructed in the ways of God. 
but the people in these parts appear in general to be ignorant of their own hearts, and are in danger of resting in the superficial knowledge of religion without the power. Wednesday, the 30th. Preached at the house of A.W. to more people than were expected, and my soul had near and sweet access to God, being filled with that peace which passeth all understanding. Thursday, July 1st. Set off for New York, and having a tedious passage over the North River, I spent some time in serious conversation with two men in the boat, and hope it was not in vain. Then I came safe to York, and preached from Habakkuk 3, 2. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. On Friday arrived the sorrowful news of the destruction of Mr. Whitefield's orphan house. As there was no fire in the house, it was supposed to have been set on fire by lightning, which had been in the morning, as some say, accompanied with a sulfurous smell. It broke out in a rapid flame about seven or eight o'clock at night, and consumed the whole building, except the two wings. Lord's Day, the 4th. Many people attended preaching both morning and night. In our love feast today, many were touched to the heart, and some were greatly comforted. Lord, let it not be as the morning dew. On Monday, my soul was in a delightful frame. My peace flowed as a river. I had power to resist every temptation of Satan before it could disturb my mind, and my heart was sweetly drawn out in love to all men. Tuesday, the 6th. Having reason to fear that I had been rather too much elevated, my heart was humbled before the Lord, and was now fixed on Him as its all-sufficient good. When shall I appear before Him? Wednesday, the 7th. My soul is happy under a comfortable sense of God. May His grace always enable me to devote myself without reserve to Him. The power of God was present while I preached today, behind the barracks to a number of soldiers and others. Afterward, I met a class and preached again in the evening. But my spirit has been grieved by the faults and deceitful doings of some particular persons. Blessed be God. All are not so. Some are faithful. But what is the chaff to the wheat? One undertook to reprove me, because I went in at a quarter after eight and came out at twenty minutes after nine. What reason have I to be thankful that this is the worst man can reprove me for? Oh, that I had more zeal to preach the word in season and out of season. Friday, the ninth. After intercession, I went to see Mr. L., Mr. S., Mr. W., and myself were charged with winking at the follies of some. We had a little debate on the subject, and Mr. L. was pleased to say he did not know but the church door would be shut against me, and that some persons would not suffer matters to go on so. He moreover told me the preacher's gifts were taken away. How dangerous it is to be addicted to pride and passion, going from house to house, speaking perverse things. Saturday, the 10th. After preaching this evening, I enjoyed a comfortable time in meeting the leaders and band society. My heart was blessed with a lively sense of God's gracious presence. On the Lord's Day, I preached twice with great plainness to a large number of people, and then set off in company with Mr. J. towards Philadelphia. Came safe to the city on Thursday but did not find such perfect harmony as I could wish for. Wednesday, the 14th. Our general conference began, in which the following propositions were agreed to. 1. The old Methodist doctrine and discipline shall be enforced and maintained amongst all our societies in America. 2. Any preacher who acts otherwise cannot be retained amongst us as a fellow laborer in the vineyard, 3. No preacher in our connection shall be permitted to administer the ordinances at this time, except Mr. S., and he under the particular direction of the assistant. 4. No person shall be admitted 
more than once or twice, to our love feasts or society meetings without becoming a member. 5. No preacher shall be permitted to reprint our books without the approbation of Mr. Wesley and the consent of his brethren, and that R. W. shall be allowed to sell what he has but reprint no more. 6. Every assistant is to send an account of the work of God in his circuit to the general assistant. There were some debates amongst the preachers in this conference, relative to the conduct of some who had manifested a desire to abide in the cities and live like gentlemen. Three years out of four have been already spent in the cities. It was also found that money had been wasted, improper leaders appointed, and many of our rules broken. Friday, the 16th. I set off for Chester and had a comfortable time in preaching. Mrs. W. and two young women in her house appeared to be under some religious concern. May the Lord make bare his holy arm and revive his glorious work. I understand that some dissatisfied persons in New York threatened to shut the church door against Mr. R. If they should be bold enough to take this step, we shall see what the consequence will be, and no doubt but the Lord will bring all their evil deeds to light. Oh, that it may be for the salvation of their precious souls. End of Section 7 Recording by Jordan Hazelrig Section 8 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 8. Lord's Day, 18. My soul has enjoyed great peace this week, in which I have rode near 100 miles since my departure from Philadelphia, and have preached often, and sometimes great solemnity has rested on the congregation. On Monday, Brother Y rode in company with me to Mr. S.'s, where I preached with sweet freedom to a few attentive people. We took friendly counsel together, and our time was profitably and comfortably spent. On Tuesday morning, my heart was still with the Lord, and my peace flowed as a river. Glory be given to God. On Wednesday, at Newcastle, the company was but small, though great power attended the word. Perhaps the Lord will yet visit this people, though at present too many of them appear to be devoted to pride, vanity, and folly. But, through abundant mercy, my heart is devoted to God and to His work, all oh, that it may never depart from Him. I received a letter from my dear brother, W., written in Ireland, with his usual plainness and honesty of heart. Thursday, I came to R.T.'s when the Lord enabled me to press home the word on the consciences of the people, many of whom had never heard us before, set off the next day for Susquehanna, and met with I. R., who gave me an account of considerable prospect of the work of God in Kent. In the evening we came, very wet and weary, to I.D.'s. We were kindly entertained, and soon forgot our fatigue and pains. Lord's Day, twenty five i first preached in this neighborhood and then rode hard to reach deer creek in time was very unwell with a violent headache but after preaching to many people and meeting a large class i felt myself much recovered thus the lord graciously helpeth me my soul is filled with peace and drawn out in love to god and man monday twenty six my heart is fixed trusting in the Lord, and fully bent, through grace, to obey his holy will. How sweet is the peace, and how great is the power with which the Lord blesseth me. Part of the forenoon was spent in settling the class. Then Brother W. rode with me to S. L.'s, where I met two more classes, and found them in a prosperous way. Then rode back to H. W.'s in great peace and the next day I found the class increased in number at S. F.'s, preached also in the evening, and found it a comfortable time. 
the young women in the house seemed determined to seek the salvation of their souls wednesday twenty eight r w set off with me for his house but before we rode far a violent clap of thunder which appeared to be just over my head shook every limb in my body and frightened my horse so much that i found it difficult to keep my saddle but my body and mind soon recovered the shock and my soul was comforted thus we see dangers stand thick through all the ground to push us to the tomb but the lord is the preserver of all that put their trust in him glory be given to god for ever thursday twenty nine met the class at j p s in gunpowder neck and found the enemy had attempted to get in amongst them but through their vigilance and the grace of god he was repelled and could gain no admittance on thursday i intended to go to baltimore but was prevented by a lameness in one of my feet so my time was spent at j p s the lord hath done great things for the people in this neighborhood many of them are very happy in religion and so thirsting for full salvation on saturday j k met me i attempted to speak a little in public but was afterward very unwell and had a troublesome pain in my head however i was unable to preach the next day with some clergy monday august two we began our quarterly meeting after our temporal business was done i read a part of our minutes to see if brother s would conform but he appeared to be inflexible he would not administer the ordinances under our direction at all many things were said on the subject and a few of the people took part with him at the conclusion of our quarterly meeting on tuesday we had a comfortable season and many were refreshed especially in the love feast on wednesday i set out for baltimore but was taken very sick on the road however i pursued my way though it was sometimes through hard rain and heavy thunder and preached in baltimore on thursday in mrs tribulet's new house which she freely lent for that purpose there appeared to be a considerable moving under the word after preaching the next morning at the point i went to see a woman once happy in several respects but now under distressing circumstances her husband was driven from her and she was left with four children for three months many people in general attend the preaching in baltimore especially after we have been long enough in town for the inhabitants to receive full knowledge of our being there and i have a great hope that the lord will do something for the souls in this place though the little society has been rather neglected for want of proper persons to lead them i rode to patapsco neck and after preaching reduced the class to some order nathan Burrig told me he had been grieved by some who had manifested too great a forwardness to speak in public i then returned to baltimore and went thence to black river neck where i found contention in the class but through grace was enabled to bring them to peace and order then i went to charles harriman's and settled two classes in that neighborhood while preaching there the lord favored us with a lively and profitable season my mind has lately been much tortured with temptations but the lord has stood by and delivered me oh my god when will my trials end at death lord be ever with me and save me or my soul must perish at last but my trust is still in god that he will ever help me to conquer all my foes preached and met the society on wednesday at joseph Presbury's, and on thursday set off for kent county but was troubled with a very uncommon pain in my head in public worship at mr g s a serious negro was powerfully struck and though he made but little noise yet he trembled so exceedingly that the very house shook i then rode to mr h and was kindly entertained here we saw a little woman with neither hands nor feet yet she could walk card spin sew and knit and her heart rejoiced in god her saviour but what is she at this time friday thirteen the spirit of holy peace reigns in my heart glory be given to god 
i received information to-day of w f who had threatened to stone one of our preachers but was taken sick and died in a few days also of another person who had been under conviction for sin but resisting and shaking it off he left the house and died in the dark speaking evil of the ways of god likewise of mrs h who was under conviction from the spirit of god but going from the house and indulging a trifling spirit she soon after died thus it seems when men slight the mercies of god he visits them with his judgments the congregation to-day at mr g was very large but they looked like fat bulls of bashan though they sat pretty still while i endeavored to prove that the spirit doctrine sufferings and practice of the holy apostles are exemplified in the people of god at this time the lord favored me with freedom and power as also in the evening at mr h on saturday a multitude of people attended the preaching of the word and the lord was with us of a truth lord's day fifteen for some time past the lord has blessed me with abundant peace and love but my soul longs for all the fullness of god as far as it is attainable by man oh when shall it once be when shall my soul be absorbed in purity and love the congregation assembled under a tree at mr g and in the time of the first prayer a woman fell down and lay there all the time of the sermon the people here appear to be much affected with prejudice against i r they will not bear with his rough address but i know not what to do with them if some other preacher could visit them in his stead perhaps the work of god would prosper much better but most of the society appear to be under a genuine work of grace though a few of their cases are doubtful the clerk of the church desired to be present in the class meeting and was considerably affected tuesday seventeen after preaching to a number of people at mr h i was much delighted with the simple account of the work of god related and experienced by t l who i believe is saved from indwelling sin he was born at thornsbury near bristol in england and came over to america about nineteen or twenty years ago he was first brought to god in gunpowder neck and was soon after in great distress for purity of heart he said he prayed and wept till his tears lay in small lakes on the floor but was at last suddenly filled with spiritual glory he was blessed with wonderful communications of peace and love he appeared to be a holy serious happy man and artless without colouring so that there is no room to doubt but it is a genuine work of god wednesday eighteen several friends both men and women accompanied me to the bay and when we came to the waterside we kneeled down and prayed recommending each other to the grace of god thursday nineteen i felt myself unwell but my heart longs to overflow with love to god my resolution is through grace to make a total and perpetual surrender of myself to him and his service at d r on friday many people attended to hear the word which was dispensed with some power but my soul longs and pants for more of god my heart rejoices in god but i am troubled with too much freedom of temper which may proceed from a great flow of animal spirits but it has the appearance of levity i long to be so guarded as to have a solemn constant sense of the omnipresent god resting on my mind saturday twenty one f h invited me home with him and i called to see r d but found him too wise for me to do him much good rode to h w and preached with life and power from the first psalm and afterward met the class preached on the lord's day at h w in the morning at five at s l at ten and at s f in the evening my soul has been kept in tranquillity and peace tuesday twenty four my heart swells with strong desire to live to god and to trust constantly in him that he may direct my paths i i an honest old friend came to hear me 
oh that names and parties were done away that christians were all but one body that pure love might reign alone in every heart lord hasten the happy and desirable period wednesday twenty five my body was very weak but my soul was strengthened and blessed with a delightful sense of god while preaching to a large congregation at mr b and i afterward met the class god is the portion of my soul and to do his will is my constant desire and determination i spoke with two exhorters at mr c and gave them license to act in that character friday twenty seven at mr c we had a comfortable time and the work of god seems to be reviving there satan is still haunting my mind but the lord gives me power to resist him and keeps me in constant peace on saturday all my soul was love no desire for anything but god had place in my heart keep me o lord in this delightful blessed frame this day i met with p e who has set out to preach but i am doubtful of his call d r who lodged with me to-night is under great exercises of mind from a conviction that it is his duty to preach he ventured to open his mind to me on the subject after he was in bed and so exceedingly was he agitated that the bed shook under him while he was relating the exercises of his mind lord's day after preaching at mr o s in the morning and at mr e s in the afternoon i rode thence to town under heavy exercises of mind surely there will be good done here or the place must be given up on monday i spent part of my time in reading poole's account of the downfall of antichrist lord hasten the time while preaching this evening in town there was a gracious moving amongst the people on tuesday i rode to mr d s where a few attended and i trust not in vain then returned to town groaning in spirit i was in company with brother w and brother s on wednesday but was much distressed on account of so few preachers well qualified for the work and so many who are forward to preach without due qualifications my foolish mind felt rather disposed to murmuring pride and discontent lord pardon me and grant me more grace the next day my conscience checked me for the appearance of levity how seriously should we consider the presence of the deity and ever remember that we must render an account of all our conduct friday september three after enjoying a comfortable season with a few friends at mr h s about twelve miles from baltimore i preached at four o'clock at mr a s in middle river neck where there is a good prospect and lodged with m a whose heart the lord hath touched and on saturday returned to town lord's day five in the morning i preached at town and then at the point where the people seemed more attentive and afterward returned to town and preached at night to a large congregation it is a matter of great grief to me to see the inhabitants of this town so much devoted to pride spiritual idolatry and almost every species of sin lord visit them yet in tender mercy to reform and save their souls on monday i went to visit w l in patapsco neck how is the scene changed there he is no more ashamed of the truth as it is in jesus his wife has lately experienced great agonies of soul and was in a wonderful manner delivered being filled with the peace and love of god this by the mercy of god has produced a gracious effect on his heart the next day he accompanied me to g p s and thence to gunpowder neck where we had a comfortable time hitherto the lord hath helped wednesday eight i crossed bush river and then rode to i d my heart was filled with peace and power but what sore conflicts have attended me i am weary of all that is wrong within me lord purify my heart make me wholly thine and fill me with all the fullness of thy love the next day i visited f h who treated me kindly we entered into a close conversation on religious subjects 
but i found he had been reading mr m mystery of errors more than the gospel he has some good qualities but how weighty is his charge he has a family of not less than eighty souls under his care they were collected in the evening to join in prayer and receive a word of exhortation i rode to deer creek on friday and had a refreshing season as also at henry waters in the evening at four o'clock the lord is still my friend and fills me with peace and pure desire monday thirteen found it necessary on a particular occasion to go to pipe creek and while preaching to a large number of people at richard owings the power of the lord was present my mind has been much stayed on god for some time past and my body has felt but little weariness though on some days i have preached four times came to william lynch's and found mr l in spiritual trouble but i hope the lord will soon deliver him and give him the oil of joy for mourning glory to god my mind is kept in sweet peace and deeply engaged in every duty preached on thursday at mr l's and there appeared to be some small awakenings amongst the people thence rode to nathan barrigs he appears to be a man that fears god in some degree but is very stiff and in some things full of self-will my mind was as it were in chains while preaching at mr h s but my soul was greatly blessed while dispensing the word to a large congregation at mr a s in middle river neck there is a prospect of some good being done by the grace of god in this place after preaching on saturday with freedom and satisfaction to a number of people in gunpowder neck i was taken very unwell and after a very restless night with much profuse sweating i rose in the morning exceedingly indisposed and in much weakness of body went through the public duties of the day but the lord was graciously and powerfully with me both in preaching and society meeting monday twenty my soul was refreshed with the love of god how do i long for a mind thoroughly refined filled with perfect purity and constantly devoted to god the prospect and hope of this frequently transports my soul lord hasten the blessed period let all my soul be swallowed up in love i have lately been reading mr w on the ruin and recovery of man he is a judicious writer in the main and generally illustrates his subjects well but some of his sentiments relative to infants i think are very exceptionable tuesday twenty one i crossed the bay in company with a few friends to kent county after a good passage we reached the shore sat down to rest and refresh ourselves and then joined in prayer we walked to john randall's where we were informed of the opposition which one of our preachers met with but the work is the lord's and they that oppose his work oppose his omnipotence on tuesday my soul was kept in peace and rest after preaching with some comfort i was seized with a quartan ague which was attended with much pain in my back and limbs mr kennard asked me home and treated me with much civility and kindness i now read smollett's description of the methodists and cannot wonder that his readers who have no personal knowledge of them should treat the methodists with contempt but the day is coming when every one will appear in his true colors and be constrained to render an account of all his conduct to god a high fever and heavy sweats were my companions in the night and the next morning i was too unwell to speak in prayer but i ventured to ride in a carriage as far as mr henson's in the afternoon thursday twenty three at mr henson's the lord was with me while preaching from acts fourteen ten observing in j r the odious appearance of speaking too freely of absent persons i felt a sense of my own imprudence and saw both the propriety and necessity of retaining every such matter in my own breast till an opportunity may offer of conversing with the person immediately concerned face to face lord pardon me in everything that is wrong in the least degree 
and grant me more fortitude and evangelical wisdom for the time to come friday twenty four my trials and exercises have been somewhat peculiar may the god of mercy communicate more abundant power and love though this was the day in course for my ague to return i preached to a small serious congregation with inward power my ague came on afterward with a severe pain in my back i drove off the cold fit by walking and running but went to bed in a high fever the next morning my frame felt weak but my heart was sweetly resigned saturday twenty five while preaching to a large company at mr gibbs we had a moving melting time after preaching at nine o'clock the next morning at the same place i went to church and thought the minister intended to point at me by speaking against idleness and people who follow an unwarrantable employment and doing what they have no business with but can any employment be more unwarrantable than the charge of souls without any real concern for their salvation and bad as idleness is it is far preferable to leading immortal souls astray the world can judge whether he is most like an idle man who reads a dry harangue every lord's day or he who toils and labors both day and night to save the souls of men but these things i leave with the lord many people attended my preaching in the evening while i took occasion from second corinthians five twenty to show amongst other things the evangelical mission and life of a true ambassador of christ monday we crossed the bay and rode to joseph Presbury's. my ago coming on i went to bed in great torture and thought my frame could not long endure it my body is greatly weakened by this disorder and perhaps i shall be dumb for a season either for my own unfaithfulness or the unfaithfulness of the people may the lord fortify my soul with patience thursday thirty though very weak and low the lord favored me with a good opportunity life and liberty at daniel ruff's friday october one i was exceedingly ill at mr d s and now began to think my travelling would be interrupted this is my greatest trouble and pain to forsake the work of god and to neglect the people whose spiritual interest and salvation i seek with my whole soul the next day finding myself too weak to travel i sent brother e in my place and must content myself to abide here a while where they treat me with the greatest care and kindness my present purpose is if the lord spares and raises me up to be more watchful and circumspect in all my ways o lord remember me in mercy and brace up my feeble soul end of section eight section nine of journal of the rev francis asbury volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen journal of the rev francis asbury volume one section nine lord's day october three every day i have endeavored to use what little strength i had for god and this day i felt something better in my body and quite serene in my mind rode to bush and preached to many people with considerable power but had a violent fever at night which held me nine hours it is my desire to be resigned to the will of god in all things sent brother w in my place to supply the appointments wednesday six my disorder returned and my body was in great pain for many hours felt some patience but not enough oh that this affliction may answer the intended end my will is quite resigned to the will of god so that i cannot ask ease in pain but desire to be truly thankful and leave the disposal of all things entirely with him it is undoubtedly a gracious providence that my lot should be cast in the family of j d during my indisposition to travel i shall never forget the kindness 
or discharge the obligations i am under to mrs sarah dalham who watched and waited upon me day and night god grant that the same measure which she had meted to me may return upon herself and her children on thursday and friday my mind was kept in peace though i could do very little but read the language of my heart is lord thy will be done my disorder has increased and for several days my indisposition has been so great that i kept no journal my friends wept around and expected my dissolution was near but the lord thought on both them and me to raise me up from the borders of death oh that my few remaining days may be spent to his glory that every valuable end may be answered by my future life wednesday twenty seven mr d was so kind as to conduct me in a carriage to my friend barnett preston's at deer creek on friday i found myself much better and my soul was kept in peace and purity may the lord ever keep me near to himself november four our quarterly meeting came on and i attended the private business though in much weakness of body some of my brethren did not altogether please me my hand appears still to be against every man mr rankin conducted the meeting at the close of the whole i discovered the affectionate attachment which subsisted between many of my dear friends and me it cut me to the heart when we came to part from each other they wept and i wept especially brother l and his wife may the gracious lord remember them in mercy and love november six was able to sit up and write to my dear friend mr s y it is but little i can do but thanks be to god for any help heard brother w preach and thought it my duty to blame him for speaking against the knowledge of salvation was better on thursday but threw myself into a violent fever by my own imprudence tuesday nine my disorder seems to be going off though i mend but slowly on wednesday i went to mr d s in a carriage and met with mr r who preached there the next day mr r set off for philadelphia and left me still poorly saturday thirteen though i have not preached for a month yet i ventured to attend the funeral of j gallon a presbyterian but a man who had borne a christian character as they could get no preacher of their own profession they made application to me many people attended on this solemn occasion and it was a very moving time monday fifteen found myself much better in health and concluded to set off on my master's business as soon as i should be properly equipped on thursday my heart was fixed trusting in the lord and as my body was gathering strength i set out on monday for baltimore and on friday reached william lynch's who entertained me with the greatest kindness here i had the pleasure of seeing our new church begun on back river neck the next day he conducted me in his carriage to the point where i was enabled to preach with some power then returned to the neck and met with mr j he heard the word of god with great freedom of mind and i believe his false peace was broken my spirit was greatly refreshed by meeting brother y at baltimore on monday and the next day i was much assisted in preaching to a large number of people in town both rich and poor may the lord arise and show himself gracious to these people through abundant grace i feel nothing contrary to the purest intention nor the least desire for anything but god bless the lord o oh my soul thursday twenty five had occasion to go to annapolis and found some desire to preach there but perceiving the spirit and practice of the people i declined it a tavern keeper offered me the use of his house for preaching but he was a deist and i did not feel free to open my mouth in his house after my return to baltimore mr j the person mentioned a few days ago came and invited me to his house the next morning at breakfast he showed much freedom in conversation and there was great appearance of a change monday twenty nine have been able to officiate at the town and point every day and the congregations rather increase 
lord make me humble and more abundantly useful and give me the hearts of the people that i may conduct them to thee i feel great hopes that the god of mercy will interpose and do these dear people good this day we agreed with mr l to undertake the brickwork of our new building at the point at night i was seized with a violent fever and as many of my friends thought it improper for me to go immediately into the circuit i concluded to abide for a season in town many are under some awakenings here and they are very kind and affectionate to me my heart is with the lord he is my all in all wednesday december one preached at nathan hurrigs and william lynch's at the latter place many more people attended than we could expect considering the conduct of abraham rawling who in his preaching had behaved more like a madman than anything else rode the next day to richard owings where a few attended the word who understood the things of god my soul is in peace but i wish to bear all things with perfect patience and feel less affected by all that men may say of me and every act of disagreeable conduct towards me saturday four i returned to baltimore and the house of mr william moore was crowded with people who attended to hear the word footnote he became a methodist and afterward fell away End of footnote. and the next day i felt great satisfaction in preaching to a large number of people at the point most of them have good attention but some were unruly tuesday seven yesterday i was very ill all the day with a fever but feel something better to-day god is the portion of my soul he favors me with sweet peace and sanctifies all my afflictions lord evermore keep me and conduct me in safety to thy blessed presence above i had a fever and kept my bed on wednesday and should have thought the day had been lost had it not been a season for the exercise of my patience preached on friday with some satisfaction though in great weakness of body having been very ill in the preceding night on saturday my mind was serene though i greatly long to have a deeper sense of god continually resting on my heart my soul pants earnestly for closer communion with the lord and to die to be crucified to every other object lord's day twelve while preaching at the point there was great solemnity very visible in the congregation the power of god was eminently present and one person fell under it such members of people attended to hear the word to-day in town that we knew not how to accommodate them and there appeared to be more seriousness than usual among them tuesday fourteen we had a comfortable time at william lynch's the next day mr chase a church minister was present at preaching we had some conversation afterward in which we did not disagree but poor man one more ignorant of the deep things of god i have scarcely met with of his cloth he knew brother k and appearing to be angry with him he abused him for preaching in the church though very unwell i rode twenty miles on thursday to preach at william worthington's where a few of them felt the power of god mr w and his wife in particular were tenderly affected saturday eighteen though in a high fever i rode twenty miles through the rain to baltimore but the lord preserved me and i was able to preach to a small company at night being unwell on the lord's day i did not attempt to preach till night but then the people were serious and the power of god was present monday twenty mrs hulling introduced me to the family of mrs rogers where they treated me with great kindness and care oh that plenty may not hurt nor ease destroy me lord help me in all things to desire nothing but thee thursday twenty three r o informed me that the work of god was gaining ground in frederick county i preached at john dearer's in the old town and had a wild staring congregation on friday the lord graciously blessed me with sweet peace and much love my heart is greatly affected at times for the town of baltimore and i am almost ready to doubt whether it is my duty to tarry here yet the seriousness of the people appears to increase and a few are concerned for their salvation monday twenty seven my soul was happy in god 
Brother W. brought good accounts from the country, where the congregation are large, and some coming to the Lord. I have great hopes that my acquaintance with the family of Mrs. Rogers will be rendered a blessing to them, and I expect to see the mother and son bow to the cross of Christ. Tuesday, 28. Guys, paraphrase, has lately afforded me great delight. It is a pity that such a man ever imbibed the Calvinistic principles. My soul was kept in peaceful composure today, and at night I made a religious visit, which I hope will not be labor lost. On my return home, I had great hope that Philip Rogers will yet become a disciple of Jesus Christ. I still pray, and long, and wait, for an outpouring of the blessed Spirit on this town. Oh, that the time were come! Lord, hasten it for thy mercy's sake! tuesday january four seventeen seventy four my body has been indisposed for some days past but the grace of god has rested on my soul and i have been enabled to preach several times with freedom power and great boldness the lord being my helper feeling rather better to-day i ventured to ride in a chase ten miles to mr l where we had some agreeable christian conversation return the next day and continued on well sometimes being confined to my bed for a day together yet i preached at other times to large congregations it frequently appears as if almost the whole town would come together to hear the word of the lord surely it will not be altogether in vain the lord giveth me great patience and all things richly to enjoy with many very kind friends who pay great attention to me in my affliction amongst others mr swoop a preacher in high dutch came to see me he appeared to be a good man and i opened to him the plan of methodism friday fourteen though this was the day for the return of my disorder yet i felt much better a blister under my ear has removed the pain in my head a great sense of god rested on my heart while meeting the class to-day there is an apparent alteration in this family and i must conclude the lord directed my steps among them saturday fifteen my body is still weak though on the recovery lord if thou shouldst be pleased to raise me up let it be to do more good i desire to live only for this lord i am thine to serve thee for ever with soul and body time and talents o oh my god now all i am and have is devoted to thee mercifully assist me by thy grace to persevere in all well-doing amen lord's day sixteen while preaching in town this evening two young men in the midst of the sermon came in and broke the order of the meeting on monday my heart felt an uncommon burden on account of the inhabitants of this place and sometimes i despair of ever doing them much good but a constant sense of god resteth on my own soul wednesday nineteen my mind is kept in peace though my body is weak so that i have not strength sufficient for travelling nevertheless i can read and think oh that it may be to the glory of him who in his great wisdom thinks proper to confine me lord ever draw my heart after thee may i see no beauty in any other object nor desire anything but thee my heart longs to be more extensively useful but is at the same time filled with perfect resignation to god in all my affliction therefore i cannot choose for myself but leave all to him a young man who disturbed the congregation on the evening of the last lord's day has seen it expedient to excuse his conduct as almost the whole town thought him culpable thus doth god bring good out of evil and make the fierceness of man turn to his praise lord's day twenty three great numbers of people attended while i preached on the parable of the prodigal son tuesday twenty five this was a day of sweet peace i held a private conference with william moore and captain stone who both appeared to be convinced of sin thursday twenty seven many people attended this evening to hear an account of the rise discipline and practice of the methodists on which subject i enlarged with a warm exhortation and had great liberty and satisfaction 
if my labors should be in vain for the people the lord gives me a gracious reward in my own soul friday twenty eight my heart was fixed on god and a great part of my time spent in reading i also met a class and received seven probationers into the society may the lord give them grace to stand lord's day thirty it appears that the people have a great desire to know the truth for though it rained and froze as it fell yet a great many attended to hear it was a very solemn time at night while i discoursed on the awful day of judgment samuel owings is tenderly affected for the salvation of his soul and william moore and philip rogers seem to be in earnest about this important matter glory to god for these things set out on monday for our quarterly meeting and met the preachers at brother owings they all appeared to have their hearts fixed on promoting the work of god for the ensuing quarter and we consulted together with great freedom and love on the first day i inquired into the moral character of the local preachers appointed them their work and gave them written licenses to officiate the preachers who spoke at this meeting manifested great earnestness and zeal for the salvation of souls and many of the people were much affected all was harmony and love for the next quarter we had our stations as follows p ebird e drumgool and richard owings in frederick circuit brother yerbury and brother rawlings in kent circuit henry waters and brother w in baltimore circuit and myself in baltimore town we appointed our next quarterly meeting to be held in baltimore on the first of may next much fatigued in my feeble frame by various exercises i returned to town and visited mrs moore who was afflicted in body and distressed in mind thursday february three last night while we were all below stairs my bed took fire by some unknown means though it stood three yards from the fireplace we happily came up in due time and finding the room full of smoke we discovered the fire and extinguished it surely there was a kind providence in this this day i wrote a letter to mr o a german minister relative to his settling in baltimore town though the weather was very disagreeable yet many attended at night to hear the word god is still my chief object and my desire is to glorify and serve him on saturday mr s came to consult me in respect to mr o's coming to this town we agreed to promote his settling here and laid a plan nearly similar to ours to wit that gifted persons amongst them who may at any time be moved by the holy ghost to speak for god should be encouraged and if the synod would not agree they were still to persevere in this line of duty lord's day six we had a moving time at the point and after dining with mr swoop the german minister many people attended at mrs tribalet's to hear me preach but a company of men who would wish to support the character of gentlemen came drunk and attempted an interruption however philip rogers once their intimate associate in sin had courage enough to defend the cause of god nevertheless i thought it expedient to dismiss the congregation and know not how this will end but this i know satan and his emissaries are greatly displeased monday seven according to appointment i went to elk ridge and was kindly received by mr i worthington i spent part of three days laboring for the salvation of souls in this place there are many wealthy and wicked people destitute of all true religion numbers attended to hear the word and some were affected lord let it not be as the seed sown by the wayside return to baltimore on wednesday and the next day i advised the widow t to seek redress of a magistrate for the late riot made in her house but they advised her to put up with it for this time as mr m offered the use of his house i met the people there on friday night and found the disturbance had not diminished the congregation but increased it thus satan prepares a weapon to wound his own cause 
after reading to the congregation part of the plain account of the people called methodists i told them we were a united body and as such would defend our own cause that i had qualified myself according to the act of toleration and had a legal right to preach the gospel friday eleven endeavor to raise something by subscription towards building a methodist church but as the whole lieth on my shoulders i find the burden rather too heavy however god is my support and my heart is with him tuesday fifteen a lively sense of god rested on my soul while preaching to a number of attentive people collected at w l s and in meeting the class at night i found the members steady wednesday sixteen returning to the point i received a melancholy account of a poor abandoned wretch who staggered into a brothel at night and was found dead the next morning he was found at the door of mr l and there were reasons to suspect he was murdered thus we see the vengeance of god frequently overtakes impenitent sinners even in this life how awful the thought that a soul in such a condition should be unexpectedly hurried to the judgment seat of a righteous god let every poor drunkard take the warning lest the next time he brutifies his immortal spirit by depriving it of the proper use of its rational powers it should be suddenly driven out of the reach of divine mercy on my return to town at night w m gave me a pleasing account of the unspeakable peace with which god had blessed him but let him that most assuredly standeth take heed lest he fall the next evening i finished reading the plain account of the people called methodists and then exhorted the congregation with much warmth of heart friday eighteen while preaching at the house of mr moore his father and mother were moved by the word of god but after lying down at night to rest my heart was oppressed with inexpressible feelings for the inhabitants of baltimore i am pressed under them as a cart full of sheaves and would rather be employed in the most servile offices than preach to them if it were not from a sense of duty to god and a desire to be instrumental in saving their souls if honor and worldly gain were held out as motives to this painful work they would to me appear lighter than vanity but lord thou knowest my motives and my ends o oh, prosper thou the work of my heart and my hands End of section 9。section 10 of journal of the reverend francis asbury volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by sandra robinson saturday 19 this day was chiefly spent in reading and prayer peace purity and a spirit of warm devotion filled my heart glory to god the author of all my blessings the next day the congregation at the point were but little affected but at night the attention of the people in town was much struck while i preached from matthew three seven monday twenty one i rode eight miles and preached at mr g s rode afterward to middle river and had the satisfaction of seeing our new house raised and covered in an opposer of the truth has been lately and suddenly summoned by the smallpox to answer for his conduct at the bar of almighty god rode to n perigs the next day and found some whose hearts were tender s w gave me an account of the happy departure of his brother john waters from this wicked and dangerous world he had acted in the capacity of a steward among us and was a serious faithful man Quote, happy soul who free from harms rests within his saviour's arms N.P. rode in company with me to W.L.'s, where we spent the evening comfortably. After preaching a few times, I returned on Thursday to town, and was much pleased to hear of the success which W.M. had met with in raising a subscription of more than a hundred pounds for our building. Thus doth the Lord give us favor in the sight of the people. Mr. R. took up two lots of ground for the purpose of building, and Mr. M. seemed determined to prosecute the work at all events. Surely the Lord hath stirred up their minds in this pious enterprise, and will bless them therein. As my body has now gained a little strength, I am determined to rise early and make the most of my precious time. 
Lord's Day 27. I rose with a solemn sense of God on my heart, and had many to hear, both in town and at the point. Tuesday, March 1. Several went with me to John Waters's, where we found a large company of people collected, who appeared both ignorant and proud. While attempting to preach to them from these words, quote, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is, end quote. My mind was oppressed above measure, so that both my heart and my mouth were almost shut. And after I had done, my spirit was greatly troubled. O oh, my soul, if confined to the society of the wicked, what couldst thou find but vexation and grief? But, quote, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, end quote. Having frequently sixteen or twenty miles to ride, and then to preach before dinner, which is often as late as four o'clock, it shakes my constitution and is painful to the flesh. But I cheerfully submit to these things for the sake of precious souls. What did the blessed Jesus suffer for me? The next day, a champion in sin, a man who had been a famous ringleader in absurd and diabolical sports, was deeply wounded by the Spirit of God, while, in the course of my sermon, I was describing the horrible torments to which those would be exposed in hell, who had been instruments in the hands of Satan to train up others in sin and disobedience. He afterward invited me home, and we had some serious conversation. I then returned to Baltimore. Friday, March 4. I was closely employed all this day, and enjoyed peace in my soul. But, oh, how does my spirit pant for more of God! The next morning my mind was somewhat dejected by the weight of my strong desires for more pure and undefiled religion. In reading the works of Mr. Brandon, especially his meditations, my heart was greatly melted. Through grace I feel a fixed determination to live more than ever to the glory of God. On the Lord's day I labored for my Master— both in the town and at the point. Set off the next morning for Gunpowder Neck, and on Tuesday preached at the funeral of W.P., who had waited for the consolation of Israel, and departed in peace, triumphantly declaring, quote, I have fought the good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. End quote. Here we have a lively and steady class. Oh, that they may remain so! The next day many people attended while I preached at the funeral of I.M., who also died in the Lord. My text was, quote, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. End quote. The power of the Lord was present, and it was a melting time. The Spirit of God was present with us also in the upper ferry, while I preached to a large congregation from Psalm 126, 3. Quote, the Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. End quote. Honest, simple Daniel Ruff has been made a great blessing to these people. Such is the wisdom and power of God, that he hath wrought marvelously by this plain man, that no flesh may glory in his presence. Friday 11. On my way to Joseph Presbury's, my horse tired, and fell down with me on his back, but I was not in the least hurt. Calling at Mr. Henderson's, I met with I.R., a Quaker, who said it gave him pain to think that Joseph Pilmore should go home for ordination, and expressed his disapprobation of our going to the church for ordinances, supposing we might have them amongst ourselves. But this was all a farce. He would rather that we drop them all together, and in the course of conversation he labored to overthrow them entirely. But when I told him it might appear to me as a duty to use them, though I should not suppose that all went to hell who did not use them, he asked why we use them if they are not essential to salvation. What weak reasoning is this? Do they think laying them aside is thus essential, or wearing their clothes in such a shape, or using, as they call it, the plain language? Why then do they follow these practices? But what makes them so contracted and bitter in their spirit, as some of them are? There is one that knoweth. After preaching the next day at Brother P's, and having the pleasure to find that the society there had increased both in number and grace, I then returned to Baltimore, and though much fatigued, spoke at Baltimore in the evening. Blessed be God! S.O. seems determined to give up all for Christ, and the little society in town are still pressing on. The Lord has been the keeper of my soul in this journey. My peace has been great, and my intention pure. Monday 14 Set out today with some agreeable company for Mr. W.'s, and though it rained, a small congregation attended. But they discovered very little sensibility in the things of God. My frame seems lately much affected by nervous disorders, but let the will of the Lord be done. 
After feeling much dejection of mind and preaching on Tuesday at the house of J. Owings, on Wednesday I visited Joseph Cromwell, a very stiff old churchman. But as his parson, Mr. E., disagreed with him in the doctrine of predestination, he was much displeased with him and willing to receive us. I preached at his house in the day with some freedom and expounded at night. May the Lord apply the word to their conviction and conversion. Returned on Thursday to Baltimore and was favored with liberty and power while preaching to a considerable congregation at night. Saturday, 19. The Lord blessed my soul with sweet peace in the day and with the aid of His Holy Spirit in preaching at night. My heart is with God. The Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Satan assaulted me powerfully with his temptations on Monday, but by calling on the name of the Lord I was delivered. How faithful and gracious is God! He will not suffer for His people to be tempted above that that they are able to bear, but will with the temptation make a way to escape. Precious truth! Sometimes we are tempted to the uttermost of our strength, but never beyond it. We always stand, at least, on equal ground with Satan, and by faith in Christ we may be more than conquerors. Tuesday, 22. I rode a few miles into the forest and preached at Mr. E.'s. The people were much quickened, and there were great appearances of real good. Wednesday, 23. At the house of W.L., I preached a funeral sermon on the death of his brother Joshua. Many of his friends and neighbors were present. It was a very solemn, awful warning season. May the people retain the impressions that they received, and be found prepared for their own departure. The next day I rode to meet Mr. W., but took cold, as the weather was severe and found myself much indisposed. Mr. W. preached an animating discourse from Revelations 6.17. There is a great probability that his coming will be made a particular blessing to many. Being much indisposed on Friday, Mr. W. preached to a large congregation. There is something very singular in his manner. Nevertheless, the Lord owns and blesses his labors. Though I continued very unwell the next day, I went to church, and heard Mr. Chase deliver a good discourse on retirement and private devotion. And afterward I attempted to preach at the point, but found myself much worse at my return to town. My indisposition and weakness of body have so pressed me down for some time past that I do not expect to abide long in this world of danger and trouble. Neither do I desire it. But come life or come death, let the will of the Lord be done. After the physicians had gone over I I and thought they could do him no more service, we had recourse to that old-fashioned remedy, prayer, and had reason to believe the Lord in mercy heard us. Thursday 31 my illness has been so severe that I have preached but little for some days past, but felt myself rather better today. As Captain Webb had appointed to preach at Mr. W.'s and was accidentally prevented, lest the people should be disappointed, I ventured to go in his stead. But after preaching was taken very ill and obliged to go immediately to bed. Lord's Day, April 3. Though still very unwell, I attempted to preach. How difficult is it for a man who longs for the salvation of souls to be silent? Gratitude urges me to acknowledge the providence of God and the kindness of my friends. The people who have had the chief trouble with me in my late afflictions have shown remarkable care, tenderness, and concern. May the Lord reward their work and labor of love. Wednesday 6 My indisposition has been so great this week that I have been incapable of all public exercises. Severe chills and burning fevers have been my portion both day and night. Oh, that I may wisely and diligently improve these seasons of affliction! When shall I be all glorious within? My soul longs for the complete image and full enjoyment of God. Satan too often takes the advantage of my constitution and, and betrays me into such a degree of cheerfulness as has at least the appearance of levity but my prevailing and earnest desire is to live and act as in the immediate presence of a holy and glorious God. Lord, make me more serious, watchful, and holy. Ventured on Thursday to ride in a carriage twelve miles to town, but was very ill most of the night. On Saturday, Captain W. intended to have sailed in the packet, but when he saw the entertainment he was to have, he returned to abide with us for a short season. In great weakness of body, I met the congregation this evening, without any intention to preach, but seeing a great number of people collected, my spirit was moved within me, and I thought it my duty to exert what little strength I had, and preach to the people. 
but I was indisposed and confined all the next day. However, Captain W. supplied my place. Monday, 11. I was somewhat better, but I find myself assaulted by Satan as well in sickness as in health, in weakness as in strength. Lord, help me to urge my way through all, and fill me with humble, holy love, that I may be faithful until death, and lay hold on eternal life. On Tuesday I ventured to go as far as Mr. L.'s, and my soul was kept in peace, though the next day my spiritual adversity assaulted me in a soft and artful way, but the Lord delivered me. May he ever grant me grace to confide in him and devote my body and soul entirely to his service. Thursday, 14. Rode back to town and was enabled to preach with freedom and comfort from the case of Naaman the leper. My heart is much drawn out after God, with a determination to be more devoted to him and more fervent in prayer. Lord's Day, 17. Both yesterday and today my soul enjoyed more peace and more love. May these graces never be interrupted. A great number attended at the point while I enforced these awakening words. Quote, o earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. End quote. After meeting the class of young men, I returned and spoke in town from Proverbs 24:30. Much was fatigued, but desire to be thankful to God that I am gathering some strength for duty. We have reason to think the spirits of Hartshorn have been serviceable in my disorder. Monday, 18. My soul was in peace, but my body weak. This day the foundation of our house in Baltimore was laid. Who could have expected that two men, once amongst the chief of sinners, would ever have thus engaged in so great an undertaking for the cause of the blessed Jesus? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He hath touched and changed their hearts. He hath moved them to this acceptable undertaking." and he will surely complete it and raise up a people to serve him in this place. Tuesday 19. My soul was in a comfortable frame, but I did not employ all my time in so useful a manner as I might have done. This was partly owing to my bodily weakness. But in class meeting this evening we had a happy and blessed time indeed. Hitherto the Lord hath helped, so my labor hath not been in vain. Wednesday 20. Poor Mr. B. arrived here today from England. In great distress he applied to me for a little money. And is it come to this? Ah, what will be the end of those that forsake God, for wealth, a wife, or anything else? O oh, my soul, keep these things always in remembrance as a perpetual caution, and may the Lord keep me ever humble and dead to all created good. I read the rules and met the society in the evening, and it was a melting happy time. Thursday, 21. My heart was fixed on God and kept in peace. I was able to walk some distance today and believe the Lord is about to restore me to health. May it be to serve Him and Him only. Saturday, 23. Though weak in body, I have been able for a few days past to go through my public exercises and was both instructed and delighted today in reading the Revelation with its comment. There we see the rise and spread of the Christian religion through the extensive and idolatrous empire of the Romans, the wars of the Saracens, the gradual rise and artful progress of popery. What an amazing prophetic history is this, of all people and nations in epitome! How expressive are the differently colored horses and surprising representations seen by St. John! In this book, extraordinary events are foretold, as well as the proper rule of our faith and practice revealed. If this deep book were fully understood, need we go any further after knowledge? Monday, 25. The Lord favored me yesterday with liberty in preaching to large companies both in town and at point, and this day my soul experienced a sweet mixture of peace and joy and grief. We had a very comfortable time at the class in the evening, Wednesday, 27. We were all quickened by the grace of God in class meeting last night. Blessed be God. Calm serenity fills my mind, and my body recovers a little strength. Friday, 29. What a miracle of grace am I! How unworthy, and yet how abundantly blessed! In the midst of all temptations, both from without and from within, my heart trusteth in the Lord. I was greatly delighted today in reading Dr. Guy's On the Reign of Christ, which on earth will be spiritual and in glory personal and eternal.
Oh, the beauties and joys of which I have some prospect in that celestial world! It seems rather strange that till lately I could discover no beauties in the revelation of St. John, but now I think it is the grand key of all mysteries, whether pure or impure, opening to view all the revolutions, persecutions, and errors of the Church from that time to the end of the world, and then it favors us with a glimpse of what shall remain for ever. In preaching tonight from these words, quote, Bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. End quote. I took occasion to show one that bodily exercise, or what is called religious actions, cannot change a sinful heart or purchase love. Two, wherein godliness consisteth, namely in repentance, faith, love to God and man, meekness, resignation, chastity, and the pure spiritual worship of God. Three, wherein this is profitable, namely, in all states, in all commerce, in the felicity of the possessor, in the general benefit of others, and finally in eternal glory. My mind has been grieved by some who have spoken evil of ministers, but I must be sure to take care of my own soul, that is more to me than all the world and all the men in it, and blessed be God, he fills me with peace and purity. Lord, grant that this may be my portion, increasing for ever." Lord's Day, May 1. Preached twice and met two classes. In the morning at the point I had some feeling, but found myself rather shut up at night in town. Monday 2. My soul loveth the Lord God. What a great and blessed portion is he for worthless men. This evening was spent in company with two German ministers who are very friendly and intend to be present at our quarterly meeting tomorrow. Tuesday 3. Our quarterly meeting began. I preached in the morning, and in the afternoon we settled our temporal business with great order and much love. When inquiry was made relative to the conduct of the preachers, there were some complaints of a few who had been remiss in meeting the societies and catechizing the children. The next day several of us spoke in public, and then we parted in peace. Had a friendly intercourse with Mr. O. and Mr. S., the German ministers, respecting the plan on church discipline which they intended to proceed. They agreed to imitate our methods as nearly as possible. Friday 6. I preached from Matthew 12.50, but felt my mind dejected. Not meeting the success in this town that my soul ardently longs for, I rather feel a desire to depart and to try some other people, but let the will of the Lord be done. My heart has been deeply affected by reading the life of Colonel Gardiner. Blessed be God for so many who experience the same work of grace which we preach, and at the same time are not of us. This is a great confirmation of the work of God. And, quote, whosoever doeth the will of my Father, who is in heaven, end quote, of every denomination, quote, the same shall be my brother, and sister, and mother, end quote. Saturday 7. My soul longeth for God, my heart and my flesh cry out for him, O oh, that I were wholly devoted to my God. Lord's Day 8. Several appeared to feel something of the power which attended the word, both at the point and in town. On Monday my soul was at peace, and God was the object of my love. Mr. C. attended our class meeting and expressed his approbation. The Lord was with me, and we were greatly blessed. Mr. W. arrived today from Virginia. He gave us a circumstantial account of the work of God in those parts. One house of worship is built and another in contemplation. Two or three more preachers are gone out upon the itinerant plan, and in some parts the congregations consist of two or three thousand people but some evil-minded persons have opposed the act of toleration and threatened to imprison him. May the Lord turn their hearts and make them partakers of his great salvation. Wednesday 11. I went to Mr. L's and preached to a large congregation, then called it N.P.'s, and preached a funeral sermon on the death of his sister, who was once happy in religion. Returned to town on Thursday and preached with freedom to an attentive audience. Friday 13. I packed up my clothes and books to be ready for my departure, and had an agreeable conversation with Mr. O. The next day some of my friends were so unguarded and imprudent as to commend me to my face. Satan, ready for every advantage, seized the opportunity and assaulted me with self-pleasing, self-exalting ideas. But the Lord enabled me to discover the danger, and the snare was broken. May he ever keep me humble and little and mean in my own eyes." Lord's Day 15. About to take my leave for a season, I went to the point and enlarged on these words. Quote, I am afraid of you. 
lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain, end quote. and trust some felt at last the worth and weight of divine truths. My subject at night in town was this, quote, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, end quote. In preaching from these words, my mind was under some embarrassment. Perhaps my foolish heart desired to end with honor, and the Lord in mercy prevented it. May I ever be contented with that honor which cometh from God only. End of section 10 Section 11 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Heenan. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 11. Monday, 16. When the time of parting came, I felt some unwillingness to leave my kind and valuable friends. However, I took horse and rode sixteen miles to Mr. G.'s, where a large company attended to hear the word. Many were also present at Mr. C.'s. In examining the leaders, I found them steady, but refused to give a license to an exhorter who had been too unwatchful. After a long prejudice, Mr. I.G. invited me to his house and treated me kindly. In preaching at Mr. B.'s, my heart was troubled within me for the dullness and unbelief of the people. Wednesday, 18. Rode to Susquehanna, and many of the leading men were present, with a large congregation. Simple D.R. has been an instrument of real and great good to the people in these parts. Thursday, 19. I am happy in God after all my labors. But when amongst my friends... My mind inclines to a degree of cheerfulness bordering on levity. Oh, for more watchfulness! A more constant, striking sense of an omnipresent God. Preached today in the market house at Charlestown. The congregation was somewhat large, and many of them very attentive. The company was large at Bohemia on Friday, and my own heart was deeply affected, and much drawn out while speaking from Revelations 3, 3. At Newcastle on Saturday, Satan was there, diverting the people by a play. However, several came to hear me enforce these words, Be not ye partakers with them. Monday, 23. After preaching yesterday at Newport and Red Clay Creek, I rode today to Chester, and the weary spoke from Galatians six fourteen. Here my old friends Mr. M. and Mr. S. from New York met me and the next day we rode to Philadelphia. Hitherto the Lord hath helped. Wednesday, 25. Our conference began. The overbearing spirit of a certain person had excited my fears. My judgment was stubbornly opposed for a while, and at last submitted to. But it is my duty to bear all things with a meek and patient spirit. Our conference was attended with great power, and, all things considered, with great harmony. We agreed to send Mr. W. to England, and all acquiesced in the future stations of the preachers. My lot was to go to York. My body and mind have been much fatigued during the time of this conference, and if I were not deeply conscious of the truth and goodness of the cause in which I am engaged, I should by no means stay here. Lord, what a world is this! Yea, what a religious world! O oh, keep my heart pure! and my garments unspotted from the world. Our conference ended on Friday with a comfortable intercession. Lord's Day 29 This was a day of peace, and the Lord favored me with faith and energy while preaching to the people. I visited Mr. W., who is going to England, but found he had no taste for spiritual subjects. Lord, keep me from all superfluity of dress, and from preaching empty stuff to please the ear, instead of changing the heart. Thus has he fulfilled as a hireling his day. We had a very solemn love feast today, and on Monday my friends and I set off in the stage for New York, where we arrived on Tuesday evening about eight o'clock. We had some trifling company on the way, who talked much but to little purpose. My old friends in York were glad to see me. 
but I still fear there is a root of prejudice remaining in the hearts of a few. May the Lord prepare me for all events, that I may act and suffer in all things like a Christian. Captain W. preached a good sermon in the evening. June 1. Considering my bodily weakness and the great fatigue through which I have gone, it seems wonderful that my frame should support it and be still so capable of duty. My mind is also kept in peace. My heart was much drawn out both towards God and the people while preaching this evening from Samuel 7, 12. But too much of the old spirit is still discoverable in my few prejudiced friends. Mr. C., not contented with his unkind and abusive letter, is still exerting all his unfriendly force. I feel myself aggrieved, but patiently commit my cause to God. Therefore, their contention may subsist among themselves. I shall not contend with them. Thursday 2. In the public exercise of the evening, my heart was warmed with affection for the people. And except a very small number of dissatisfied, restless spirits, the hearts of the people are generously opened towards me. My heart is still fixed on God, and determined through grace both to serve Him and promote the prosperity of His cause. Friday 3. Christ is precious to my believing heart. Blessed be God for this. It is infinitely more to me than the favor of all mankind and the possession of all the earth. The next day my soul was also sweetly drawn out in love to God, and found great freedom and happiness in meeting the leaders and the bands. I told them that the Spirit and providence of God would certainly assist in purging the society, that the time would come when such as were insincere and half-hearted would have no place among us. Lord's Day 5 Attended the old church as usual, but clearly saw where the gospel ministry was. The Spirit of Grace mercifully assisted me in the public duties of this day. On Monday I preached with great plainness and power in the meadows, but while preaching on Tuesday evening my ideas left me, though I felt myself spirited in addressing the people by way of exhortation. Wednesday 8 The fire of divine love glowed in my heart. My soul was in peace. My affections were pure and withdrawn from earthly objects. But I fear, lest self-complacency should have any place in me. May the Lord keep me in the spirit of humility, prayer, and loving zeal. Thursday 9 While reading a sermon of Mr. Brandon's on Quench Not the Spirit, in company with a few friends, both they and I were much quickened. Blessed be God! My soul is kept in peace and power and love had great liberty this evening in pointing out the causes why we have not more of the spirit of devotion, of neglect or dullness in prayer, of too much heart attention to the world, of the want of more faith in the realities of eternity and the promises of God, of not looking more earnestly to God in humble expectation of receiving His grace, etc. Lord's Day 12 Both my body and mind are weak. As Mr. R. was thought by many to be a great preacher, I went in the afternoon to hear him. He was very stiff and studied in his composition, and dwelt much on their favorite doctrine of imputed righteousness. He appeared to have very little liberty, except in a short application. With great enlargement of heart, I spoke in the evening from these words, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. In meeting the society at night, I spoke plainly of some who neglected their bands and classes, and informed them that we took people into our societies that we might help them to become entire Christians, and if they willfully neglected those meetings, they thereby withdrew themselves from our care and assistance. The next day many people attended the preaching at the Meadows. Tuesday 14 My heart seems wholly devoted to God and he favors me with power over all outward and inward sin. My affections appear to be quite weaned from all terrestrial objects. Some people, if they felt as I feel at present, would perhaps conclude they were saved from all indwelling sin. O oh my God, save me and keep me every moment of my life. 
The next day my soul was under heavy exercises, and much troubled by manifold temptations. But still, all my care was cast on the Lord. I find it hurtful to pour too much on myself. True, I should be daily employed in the duty of self-examination, and strictly attend both to my internal and external conduct. But at the same time, my soul should steadily fix the eye of faith on the blessed Jesus, my mediator and advocate at the right hand of the Eternal Father. Lord, cause thy face to shine upon me, and make me always joyful in thy salvation. Thursday 16 My soul was more and more delighted in God. I felt myself uneasy today on account of riding out, though I was conscious it was intended for my health. Yet to some it might have the appearance of pleasuring, and encourage them to seek their carnal pleasure in such things. Saturday 18 The Lord was my helper, and my mind was in peace. Lord's Day 19 This was a blessed and delightful day to my soul. The grace of God was eminently with me in all my public duties. Heard Mr. E. at St. Paul's Church preach from these words, Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. He spoke well on man's fallen state and the new creation and brought good reasons to prove that we must be renewed in order to dwell with God. But he did not insist on the necessity of repentance and faith in order to obtain this change. Monday 20 Mr. S., Mr. W., and Mr. T. bore me company as far as Kingsbridge, on my way to New Rochelle. Was much indisposed when I reached the house of my friend Mr. D. Nevertheless, thought it my duty to preach to the people. The Lord is doing something for several souls in this place. Though they have had but very few sermons for twelve months, yet the class is lively and engaged with God. Thursday 23 After preaching as often as I could to many people who attended at New Rochelle, I set off for York, and was met at Kingsbridge by Mr. S. and Mr. J. But on my arrival in the city I found myself very unwell, and had a painful, restless night. Friday 24 Found myself better, and was much refreshed by letters from Mr. L. and Mr. S. Y. in Maryland. But one of these letters informed me that Mr. S. E. was very officious in administering the ordinances. What strange infatuation attends that man! Why will he run before Providence? Saturday 25 my fever was very high last evening, so I took an emetic this morning. I found liberty in my own soul, and great meltings amongst the people, while preaching on the Lord's Day. Though my disorder has a tendency to oppress my spirits, yet, blessed be God, I am favored with power to conquer every spiritual foe, and my heart is sometimes wonderfully raised, as on the wings of faith and love. Monday 27 R. S., who accompanied me a few miles into the country today, was very near being drowned. He went into a stream of water to wash his horse and chase, but accidentally got out of the horse's depth, and they must all have been unavoidably lost, had not two men swam in and dragged them to the shore. Thus the Lord preserveth both man and beast. I went to bed this evening in much pain, and had an uncomfortable night. Tuesday, 28. Many of my good friends kindly visited me today, and in the afternoon I took another emetic. My heart is fixed on God as the best of objects, but pants for more vigor, and a permanent, solemn sense of God. Rose the next morning at five, though very weak, and spent a great part of the day in reading and writing. Many people attended the public worship in the evening though I was but just able to give them a few words of exhortation. Seeing the people so desirous to hear, now I am unable to say much to them, Satan tempts me to murmuring and discontent. May the Lord fill me with perfect resignation. Thursday 30 My body was very weak and sweated exceedingly. If I am the Lord's, why am I thus? But in his word he hath told me, if I be without chastisement, then am I a bastard, and not a son. 
Oh, that this affliction may work in me the peaceable fruits of internal and universal righteousness. An attempt to speak a little in exhortation this evening greatly augmented my disorder. Friday, July 1. In prayer today with I.B., a soldier in the 23rd Regiment, the Lord greatly refreshed and strengthened my soul. My mind was strongly impressed with a persuasion that God, through mercy, would restore me to health. If so, I am determined, by His assistance, to be more than ever intent on promoting His cause and His glory. Gave an exhortation at night, and met the leaders. But the next day I was much indisposed. Nevertheless, I spent part of my time in reading the afflicted condition of the Waldenses, when so wickedly persecuted by the Dominicans, with the rise of those brutish men. Lord's Day 3 Poor Mr. H. came to me in great distress. He is a native of Stowbridge, where, as he supposes, he has a wife now living, and he has been so unwatchful as to suffer his affections to stray. May the Lord deliver him out of this dangerous snare of Satan. If not, he may be undone. I spoke with freedom this morning from Job 10, 2, and spent part of the day in reading of the holy war which was carried on against the Waldenses and Albiginses by the devil, the Pope, and their emissaries. Though my body is still weak, my soul is strong in the Lord, and joyful in his salvation. And at night I was able to preach with spirit, and found myself happy in addressing a large and attentive audience. Monday 4 I spent part of this day in visiting a few friends, and found my heart much united to I.S., a musician of the 23rd Regiment was much better tonight than I had been for some time, and enjoyed a good night's rest. Tuesday 5 In reading the life of Calvin, it appeared that many in his day had opposed the doctrine of predestination, and all who opposed it were spoken of by him and his followers as bad men. My fever returned this evening, and it was a painful, restless night. But the will of the Lord be done. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Found very great lassitude of body the next day also, but my soul hungered and thirsted for more of God. In reading Clark's life of origin, I felt a strong desire to imitate that great and good man, as far as he went right. Thursday 7 My disorder was much abated, and I had power to speak plainly and pointedly to both saints and sinners. Lord's Day 10 my bodily weakness has been such for a few days past as to prevent my officiating much in public. However, I ventured to preach twice today, but in the evening was so weak that I could scarce stand in the pulpit. But while preaching on the parable of the prodigal son, the Lord greatly refreshed and strengthened me, though I went to bed very ill at night. Satan tempted me today to think much of my gifts. Alas, what poor creatures we are! and to what dangers we are exposed. What are all our gifts, unless they answer some good purpose? Unless properly improved, they neither make us holier nor happier. We have nothing but what we have received, and unless we are humble in the possession of them, they only make us more like devils, and more fit for hell. How wonderfully is the language and behavior of Mr. L. changed towards me! Before I was everything that was bad, but now all is very good. This is a mistake. My doctrine and preaching are the same, and so is my manner. But such is the deceitfulness of the man. His favorite, Mr. Blank, is now gone. Had I preached like an archangel, it would have been to no purpose, while I thought it my duty to oppose him. Monday 11 My soul is not so intensely devoted to God as I would have it though my desires for more spirituality are very strong. Lord, when shall my poor heart be as a rising, active, holy flame? Blessed be God! My illness is more moderate today than it has been for some days past. On Wednesday, a letter from S.O. informed me that the house in Baltimore was then ready to be enclosed. He also expressed a great desire to persevere. May the Lord give him grace so to do. 
Thursday, 14. My mind is in peace. I have now been sick near ten months, and many days closely confined. Yet I have preached about three hundred times, and rode near two thousand miles in that time, though very frequently in a high fever. Here is no ease, worldly profit, or honor. What then but the desire of pleasing God and serving souls could stimulate to such laborious and painful duties? Oh, that my labor may not be in vain, that the Lord may give me to see fruit of these weak but earnest endeavors many days hence. After preaching this evening with some warmth of heart, I was very close and pointed in meeting the society. Saturday, 16. My heart was much taken up with God. Letters from my dear friends, Mr. F. and Mr. R., gave me great satisfaction. In meeting the band society, I showed them the possibility of using all the means, and without sincerity and spirituality, they might still be destitute of true religion. Monday, 18. The Lord assisted me in yesterday's duties, and He is the keeper and comforter of my soul today. A poor, unhappy young woman who had abandoned herself to the devil and wicked men, being at the point of death, and expecting to go shortly and render an account of herself to God, sent for me to visit her. I felt some reluctance, but considering the danger her soul was in, thought it my duty to go. She was very attentive while I spoke plainly to her, and made prayer to God in her behalf. Strange infatuation, that men will not seriously think of preparing for death, till it comes upon them. If we were sure of dying in a few hours, most men would think it their duty to labor for a preparation. But when no man is sure of living a few hours, very few think seriously about it. So does the God of this world blind the minds of mankind. Thursday 21 My heart enjoys great freedom, with much peace and love both towards God and man. Lord, Ever keep me from all sin, and increase the graces of thy Holy Spirit in my soul. A letter from Mr. R. brought melancholy tidings of A.W. Alas for that man! He has been useful, but was puffed up, and so fell into the snare of the devil. My heart pitied him, but I fear he died a backslider. Lord's Day 24 Ended the parable of the prodigal son. Does it not appear from this parable that some, who, comparatively speaking, have all their lifetime endeavored to please God, and are entitled to all his purchased communicative blessings, are nevertheless not favored with such rapturous sensations of divine joy as some others? I remember when I was a small boy and went to school, I had serious thoughts, and a particular sense of the being of a God, and greatly feared both an oath and a lie. At twelve years of age, the Spirit of God strove frequently and powerfully with me. But being deprived of proper means and exposed to bad company, no effectual impressions were left on my mind. And, though fond of what some call innocent diversions, I abhorred fighting and quarreling. When anything of this sort happened, I always went home displeased. But I have been much grieved to think that so many Sabbaths were idly spent, which might have been better improved. However, wicked as my companions were, and fond as I was of play, I never imbibed their vices. When between thirteen and fourteen years of age, the Lord graciously visited my soul again. I then found myself more inclined to obey, and carefully attended preaching in West Bromwick, so that I heard Stillingfleet, Bagnell, Ryland, Anderson, Mansfield, and Talbot, men who preach the truth. I then began to watch over my inward and outward conduct, and having a desire to hear the Methodists, I went to Wensbury and heard Mr. F. and Mr. I., but did not understand them, though one of their subjects is fresh in my memory to this day. This was the first of my hearing the Methodists. After that, another person went with me to hear them again. The text was, The time will come, when they will not endure sound doctrine. My companion was cut to the heart, but I was unmoved. The next year Mr. M. R. came into those parts. I was then about fifteen, 
and, young as I was, the word of God soon made deep impressions on my heart, which brought me to Jesus Christ, who graciously justified my guilty soul through faith in his precious blood, and soon showed me the excellency and necessity of holiness. About sixteen, I experienced a marvelous display of the grace of God, which some might think was full sanctification, and was indeed very happy, though in an ungodly family. At about seventeen, I began to hold some public meetings, and between seventeen and eighteen began to exhort and preach. When about twenty-one, I went through Staffordshire and Gloucestershire in the place of a traveling preacher, and the next year through Bedfordshire, Sussex, etc. In 1769 I was appointed assistant in Northamptonshire, and the next year traveled in Wiltshire. September 3, 1771, I embarked for America, and for my own private satisfaction began to keep an imperfect journal. Today Dr. O. preached a pertinent discourse on the shortness of time. The Lord favored me with great liberty in the evening, while preaching to a large congregation from Genesis 19:17, And I was enabled to speak plainly and closely in meeting the society at night. End of section 11. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 12 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 12. Tuesday, 26. My soul is in peace, but I long to be more spiritual, to be wholly devoted to God. Some circumstances make me fear that we have a few bad characters in the society here. These are the people that injure the cause of God. Like Judas, they betray the Lord with a kiss. It is not easy to conceive how such characters counteract the most faithful preaching. If their conduct is not fully known to the preachers, it is so known to many of their acquaintances that Satan takes the offered advantage and hardens the hearts of many against all the power of religion. Of all characters, that of a designing sinner under the fair appearance of religion is the most odious. Oh, that the Lord may strip all such unsound professors, in every place, of their covering, and show them to his servants in their own proper colors, that Israel may be able to put away the accursed thing from among them, and so increase both in strength and number. Wednesday, 27. I rose early this morning to see my Christian brethren, the soldiers, go off, but was much affected at parting with those worthy men, I.S. and I.B. May the Lord go with them. Thursday, 28. The Lord shows me the snares of Satan, and enables me to avoid them. He favors me with the light of his countenance, and fills me with holy love. Surely we stand in jeopardy every hour. This day the thunder and lightning struck four people dead on the spot. Awful scene. And will man still venture to be careless and wicked? I made some improvement on the subject in the evening. Friday 29 I rose unwell this morning and received a melancholy account that the daughter of I.S. was beat overboard. Poor man! He has lost both his children by going to sea. I was much blessed at intercession today, but shut up in preaching at night. My soul is determined to live more to God. Lord's Day 31 We had a feeling time this morning while I preached from Psalm 50, 13. After the various duties of the day, I met the society and showed them the utility of our economy, the advantages of union, and the fearful end of leaving our fellowship. August 1. Some of my good friends accompanied me as far as Kingsbridge on my way to New Rochelle. I visited my little flock with some satisfaction. Here are some of the offspring of the French Protestants who, on account of their religion, fled from Rochelle in France, and God has mercifully remembered them unto the third and fourth generation. 
I have great discoveries of my defects and weaknesses. My soul is not so steadily and warmly devoted to the Lord as it might be. Lord, help me, and supply me with grace always. In preaching from Ephesians 2, 12, 13, I had great freedom. It seems strange that sometimes, after much premeditation and devotion, I cannot express my thoughts with readiness and perspicuity, whereas at other times proper sentences of scripture and apt expressions occur without care or much thought. Surely this is of the Lord, to convince us that it is not by power or might, but by His Spirit the work must be done. Nevertheless, it is doubtless our duty to give ourselves to prayer and meditation, at the same time depending entirely on the grace of God, as if we had made no preparation. Rose early the next morning, but found myself weak both in body and mind. In this tabernacle I groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with the house which is from heaven. My soul longs to fly to God, that it may be ever with Him. O oh, happy day that shall call a poor exile home to his father's house! But I must check the impetuous current of desire, for it is written, He that believeth shall not make haste. After preaching to a large auditory in the evening at P. B.'s, I rested in peace visited Mr. B., a partial friend, the next day, and had some serious, weighty conversation with him. I then went to Mr. D.'s very unwell, and in trouble and pain spoke from Job 21, 15. After a very restless night, I rose the next morning much indisposed, and was obliged to go to bed again. However, on Friday 5, I set off for New York, and there met with W. W. S., Saturday 6. My mind is calm and comfortable, but grieved by the imprudence of some and the loose conduct of a few others. Though much afflicted, I met the band leaders and body bands, and we had a singular blessing. Lord's Day 7. We had a solemn, happy love feast. Though very weak, I made out to preach in the evening with some enlargement of heart. Brother W. has much courage in preaching. Tuesday 9. My soul was assaulted by trials of a very severe kind, but the Lord was my keeper. I have been reading Newton on the prophecies. He is pretty clear in his views and affords a good key for many passages, but confines himself too much to the literal meaning of the revelation. Wednesday 10. My frame is much afflicted but it is worse to be afflicted in mind by the misconduct of professors. It grieves me much to see the deceit of a few persons who have crept in among us. It is a thousand pities that such, whose hearts are not right with God, should ever thrust themselves in amongst the people of God. They are too apt to make all they are connected with as a rope of sand. I clearly see that professors who are rotten at heart are a hindrance and curse to the rest. May the Lord thoroughly purge his floor. Wednesday 10 I was very low, but met my class, and preached in the evening. There appeared to be but little depth of religion in the class. It is a great folly to take people into society before they know what they are about. What some people take for religion and spiritual life is nothing but the power of the natural passions. It is true, real religion cannot exist without peace and love and joy. But then, real religion is real holiness. And all sensations without a strong disposition for holiness are but delusive. Thursday 11 My soul is in peace, and longs to be more devoted to God. My heart was enlarged and happy in exhorting the people this evening. Friday 12 this was a day of trouble and dejection of mind. But, committing my cause to God by faith and prayer, I have a hope that He will always stand by and deliver me. My soul was greatly straightened in public speaking. I received several letters today, some of which revived my spirits, but one from Mr. R. gave me pain. Satan makes use of all his cunning and tricks, but the Lord will rebuke him. My duty is clear to bear all things patiently, and silently commit my cause to God. 
even in this city there are some restless minds who are not much disposed to spiritual union. Going into the pulpit this evening, I found an inflammatory letter without a name. My trials are multiplied and weighty, but glory to God. He strengthens and comforts me by an abundant manifestation of his love. Oh, how is my soul taken up with God! He is all in all to me. And if he is for me, I need not care who is against me. Lord's Day 14 Mr. P. Y. visited and dined with the rector today, and what the event will be, I know not. Attending a church as usual, I heard Dr. Blank blow away on, This is the day that the Lord hath made. He makes a strange medley of his preaching. Though he delivers many good things, yet, for want of some arrangement of his ideas, all appears to be incoherency and confusion. The Spirit of the Lord was with me while declaring his counsel to a large listening audience. Oh, that I could bring them to the arms of Christ by thousands! Monday 15 I felt some conviction for sleeping too long and my mind was troubled on account of a conversation which had passed between Mr. R., Mr. S., and myself. But the great searcher of hearts knoweth my intentions, and to him I submit all future events. Mr. L. waited on Mr. P. Y., and told him he appeared to be more taken up in reading Mr. Berridge's Christian World Unmasked than the Bible. Mr. Berridge kept his room in a very gloomy state of mind about five years ago and now he has come forth with his facetious pen to dictate to the Christian world. But Mr. Fletcher, in his fifth check, has fully answered all his witty arguments. Mr. Berridge was a good man, no doubt, but unfortunately drank deep into the principles of antinomianism. Wednesday 17 My mind is free, and my soul delighteth in God. He taketh such possession of my heart as to keep out all desire for created objects. In due time, I humbly hope, through Jesus Christ, to enter into the full fruition. O oh, blessed day, when my soul shall be swallowed up in God! In hope of that immortal crown, I now the cross sustain, and gladly wander up and down, and smile at toil and pain. Friday 19 I was very unwell and in much pain of body spoke to the people at night. Thus it seems at present, weakness and pain are a part of my portion. Oh, that my soul may be made perfect through sufferings! Lord's Day 21 My body is afflicted, and my way is rough. Nevertheless, I cheerfully submit to the will of God. And though very unwell, I met a class and preached at night. Monday 22. My heart panteth for God, even for the living God. A letter came to hand today from E.B., giving an account of the work of the Lord in Gibraltar, and inviting me to go. But my way is not open. Tuesday 23. A degree of the peace and happiness of heaven possessed my soul today. And although it was a rainy evening, Many people attended while I preached from 2 Kings 5, 14, 15, 16. Wednesday 24 My mind is much exercised about going to Gibraltar. May the Lord direct my steps. On Friday at intercession, my heart was greatly moved by the power of God. Lord's Day 28 My soul was expanded and filled with love, while preaching from Isaiah 55, 1. Mr. P. Y. attended at the church today, but was not invited to preach. Monday 29. I visited Second River, where a number of low Dutch people attended the word, which was delivered with a blessing. J. K., one of our local preachers, has been made useful to the inhabitants of this neighborhood. Thursday, September 1. My system gathers strength, and though variously and sorely exercised, the Lord is graciously with me, blessing both my soul and my labors. I clearly see that I must be cut off from every creature to do the will of God with an undivided heart. May the Lord sanctify me wholly for himself, 
and every moment keep me from all appearance of evil. Saturday 3 Calm serenity sat on my mind, and all my soul was fixed on God, and sweetly inclined to do His will in all things. In the afternoon I felt unwell, but met the leaders and bands. The next day, though my body was very feeble, I went through my public duties. Monday 5 I visited Mrs. D., who hardly escaped falling into ruin, both of body and soul. She opened the matter to me and found deliverance. A solemn report was brought to the city today that the men of war had fired on Boston. A fear rose in my mind of what might be the event of this. But it was soon banished by considering, I must go on and mind my own business, which is enough for me, and leave all those things to the providence of God. Tuesday 6. I rose very early this morning in great peace, and determined not to let an hour of the day slip without earnest prayer to God. Went the next day to hear Mr. P. Y. preach at Flatbush. He spoke pretty well, though very tenderly, on the fall and recovery of man. And the report of his great abilities exceeds the reality. We returned just time enough for preaching. I spoke with great liberty from Second Kings 5, 17, 18, 19, but afterward found myself very unwell. Thursday 8 I am both grieved and ashamed that my soul is not more steadily and fervently devoted to God. And shall I ever live at this poor dying rate, my love so faint, so cold to thee, and thine to me so great? No, I will both labor and strive to be more swallowed up in the holy will of God. My determination is strong. May divine grace make it stronger and stronger every day. Friday 9. My soul was happy in God, yet I felt some grief on account of the weakness and deceit of a few who profess religion. Saturday 10. God is still my principal object. Tidings came today of some dissatisfaction between Mr. Plank and the people in Philadelphia. But my duty is before me. I have my own business to mind. Lord's Day 11. Dr. Blank went on with his trumpery in his old strain, and the great Mr. P. Y. had crowds to hear him in the French church. We also had a crowded audience and solemn time in the evening. A young woman of our society, who was seated in the congregation last Lord's Day, is now a corpse. How short, how precarious is life, and yet what awful and weighty things depend upon it. On Monday evening I spoke on the occasion from Job 19, 26 We have lost a promising disciple of twenty-two years of age, but her flesh resteth in hope. When will the Savior extend the arms of his mercy to make me perfectly and eternally free? I heard the celebrated Mr. P. Y. again today. He insisted on eternal election, the gift of the Father to the Son, the renewal of the little flock by grace, and the Father's good pleasure, from Luke 12:32. He detained us two hours, and had many devoted admirers. He spoke to the sinners with great words, but to little purpose. Wednesday 14 My mind is in great peace, and my body in better health. And though my heart cleaveth to the Lord, yet I long, Oh, I greatly long to be more swallowed up in the will of God. Thursday 15 All my desire is unto the Lord, and to the remembrance of His name. To please Him is my chief delight, but there is more in view for which I pant. A heart in every thought renewed, and full of love divine, perfect and right and pure and good, a copy, Lord, of Thine. Friday 16. I rose this morning dejected in mind, but my purposes to be wholly given up to God are stronger than ever, and I hope to live to Him in a more devoted manner than heretofore. Peace and power and love filled my soul, while speaking at night from Hosea 12. Glory be given to God. Saturday 17. 
My affections are raised from earth and all its objects. My treasure is above, and there also is my heart. In meeting the bands, I showed them the impropriety and danger of keeping their thoughts or fears of each other to themselves. This frustrates the design of bands, produces coolness and jealousies towards each other, and is undoubtedly the policy of Satan. Lord's Day 18 Losing some of my ideas in preaching, I was ashamed of myself, and pained to see the people waiting to hear what the blunderer had to say. May these things humble me, and show me where my great strength lieth. In meeting the society, I urge the necessity of more private devotion, and of properly digesting what they hear. Set off the next morning for New Rochelle, and found E.D. in distress of soul. This is an agreeable family, and the children are both affectionate and obedient to their parents. I hope she and the rest of them will become true Christians, and be finally bound up in the bundle of life. I preached from 2 Timothy 4, 2 and many strangers were present. Satan is frequently assaulting me with his temptations, but the Lord enables me to discover and resist his first attacks. Tuesday 20 Christ was precious. At P.B.'s I spoke too plainly for some who were present. The next evening, at F.D.'s, we had a heart-affecting time, and I trust it will not be forgotten by all. Thursday, 22. The Lord has graciously visited E.D. and turned all her mourning into joy. Her soul is happy in the love of God. May the Lord carry on His work of grace through this family and neighborhood, turning all their hearts unto Himself. The power of God was present in the congregation tonight, while I took my leave for a season from Isaiah 66, 2. Friday, 23. I set off for New York and met some of my good friends at Kingsbridge. They brought me a letter from T.R. who thought himself injured, but I am determined to drop all disputes as far as possible. Mr. P.Y. is going on in York with his antinomianism unmasked. How prone is man to do what is wrong, and what watchfulness and diligence are necessary for a man to be right both in sentiment and practice. Lord's Day 25 According to the particular request of Sister G, I preached her funeral sermon, from Isaiah 49, 10. She had been brought up a Calvinist, but when she found peace with God, she renounced all her Calvinistic principles, which she said had been a check to her industry in seeking the Lord. In the time of her last illness, she manifested a great degree of patience, and expressed a strong desire for entire purity of heart. A little before her death, she was filled with perfect love, and seemed to want more strength and language to praise God. However, she did it to the uttermost of her power. Monday 26 My soul is sweetly drawn out after God, and satisfied with Him as a sufficient portion. But oh, how I long to be more spiritual! Come, and possess me whole, nor hence again remove. Settle and fix my wavering soul with all thy weight of love. Thursday 29 W.L. gave me an account of the manner of Mr. R.'s treating him, because he would not go to Schenectady. But my mind is bent on loving God, and doing His will in all things. I have had frequent calls of late to visit the sick. May it prove a blessing both to them and me. My heart was warm while addressing the congregation this evening and I hope it was not labor lost. At two o'clock in the night, we were all alarmed by a fire which burned down a house in Pexlip. What a resemblance of the general judgment! But, if the cry of fire alarms us, how much more shall we be alarmed by the archangel's trumpet? When all the ungodly shall have ten thousand times more cause to fear than the loss of houses and goods and life, how will they endure the cutting anguish? But they are after the flesh. Therefore they mind the things of the flesh, and them only. Lord's Day, October 2 Though I have lately heard several preachers of some fame, I am fully of the opinion that there is room enough for us to preach repentance, faith, 
and all the work of God on the soul of man. They almost leave this field entirely our own. We had a solemn love feast today, though some imposed on us who will not meet in class. Monday 3 My soul was in peace, but assaulted by Satan. The next day Mr. P. sent for me and requested permission to preach in our house. I told him that as he had refused it at first, our people did not take it well. Wednesday 5 I rose early this morning and found my soul devoted to God. But it troubles my mind that I am not more so. Lord, come and save me now with all thy great and glorious salvation. Oh, hasten the time. Jesus, see my panting breast. See, I pant in thee to rest. Gladly would I now be clean. Cleanse me now from every sin. Friday 7 Mr. P. Y. had appointed to preach in our house, and a very large congregation attended on the occasion. He spoke on the chaff and wheat from Matthew 3, 12, and perhaps felt himself under some obligation to come as near to our doctrine as his principles would admit of, and thereby gave tolerable satisfaction. Saturday 8 My heart was enlarged towards God. I saw a letter from Mr. P. filled with his usual softness. Poor man, he seems blind to his own conduct. We had a very happy time in meeting the bands this evening. End of Section 12 Recording by Brian Keenan Section 13 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jordan Hazelrig. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 13. Lord's Day, the 9th. The Lord assisted me in my public exercises both morning and night, and going to church today, as usual, I heard a stranger preach. But he was a workman that needed to be ashamed. Attended Mr. P. on Monday, and found him very affectionate. The elders of the French church wept over him with much tenderness. Several friends, with myself, conducted him across the river. Then, after singing a parting hymn, he prayed very feelingly, and we took our leave of each other. I afterward went to preach in the swamp, where we had many people and a good time. Tuesday, the 11th. Last night my soul was greatly troubled for want of a closer walk with God. Lord, how long shall I mourn and pray and not experience all that my soul longeth for? And this day... My mind is in nearly the same frame. Wednesday, the twelfth. The Lord blessed me with great peace. I am brought a letter from New Rochelle, containing an agreeable account of the work of God there. With much enlargement of heart, I preached tonight from First Kings nineteen, eleven, and hope it was made a blessing to many present. Thursday, the thirteenth. My soul is not so intensely stayed on God as it might be. Oh, that he would bring me nearer to himself, and so transform me into his divine likeness, that there may be no diversity of will, but that it may be my meat and drink to promote his glory from moment to moment in all I do. I had much company in the course of this day. Friday, the 14th. My heart was much devoted to God, but having been here now four months, preaching or exhorting every day, and twice on the Lord's Day, besides society meetings, it seemed to be too much for both the people and the preacher. We have now more unity in the society here than we have had for some time past. But we want more of the life and power of religion amongst us. Lord's Day, 
the 16th. Yesterday, Satan assaulted me powerfully, but the Lord was my keeper, so that I may with great propriety adopt the language of the poet, In all my temptations he keeps me, to prove his utmost salvation, his fullness of love. This day the Spirit of Grace assisted me in my public exercises. Mr. S. T., once a silversmith of this city, preached a good sermon at church, though his voice was so low that he could scarce be heard. Monday, the 17th. Many people attended preaching in the swamp, and my soul was greatly blessed in the discharge of my duty. But, oh, my heart is bowed down within me, and I feel strongly determined to be more watchful and diligent in pleasing God. Tuesday, the 18th. My heart was much taken up with God. I drank tea this afternoon with an old Moravian, who belonged to the fraternity in Fetter Lane, at the time when Mr. Wesley was so intimate with them. Wednesday, the 19th. Captain W. informed me by letter the house in Baltimore was so far finished that he had preached in it. With great liberty and satisfaction, I both met class and preached in the evening, and feel more encouragement to hope for the people here. Thursday, the 20th. Notwithstanding all my grievous temptations, God is still the object of my faith, my hope, my love, my joy. Oh, that he may fill me always with filial fear, and give me grace to die to all but him. My soul abounds with sweet peace, and an exhortation which I gave this evening was made a blessing, I trust, to several that heard it. Friday, the 21st. A solemn, comfortable sense of God rested on my mind, and he has kept me from what I hate. And though Satan made some attempts upon my soul, yet the Lord gave me power to withstand him. The next day we had a refreshing time in band meeting. Lord's Day, the 23rd. Dr. M. from D. preached today at church on fellowship with God. He spoke well on that subject as far as it relates to the fruits and effects of the Spirit but was deficient in respect to the witness, supposing that some may be in favor with God and not know it. Our carnal hearts are too prone to draw destructive conclusions from such a doctrine as his. Dr. O, as usual, made a mighty clutter in the pulpit about Noah's Ark. Our congregation was large, and we were not left without a blessing. Monday, the 24th. I still look to Jesus the author and finisher of my faith, and trust in him for supplies of strength and consolation. But, oh, when shall my attention be so fixed that nothing may divert it a single moment from its beloved object? We are informed that three of our preachers are coming over from England and that we may look for them every day. Tuesday, the 25th. This morning my spirit wrestled with principalities and powers, but in the duty of prayer the Lord delivered me. After preaching at night from Matthew 24:12, a man from Morristown came to me to inquire into my principles, and told me the Lord was bringing souls to himself in his neighborhood, and that more than one hundred were converted there. Wednesday, the 26th. My soul is in peace but longs to be more spiritual. After meeting a class and preaching in the evening, I found myself indisposed with a cold and fever. The next day my disorder continued, attended with a sore throat, so that it was with difficulty and pain I spoke to the people. Friday, the 28th. I do not sufficiently love God, nor live by faith in the suburbs of heaven. This gives me more concern than the want of health. Tis worse than death, my God to love, and not my God alone. I was not able to preach, and was obliged to go to bed early, 
but could not sleep. On Saturday, as my disorder continued, I felt a strong desire for more patients. Mr. J., his wife and daughter, are all very ill, brought on chiefly through fatigue. Lord's Day, the 30th. I kept close house till evening, and oh, what happiness did my soul enjoy with God. So open and delightful was the intercourse between God and my soul that it gave me grief if any person came into my room to disturb my sweet communion with the Blessed Father and the Son. When my work is done, may I enter into that fullness of joy which shall never be interrupted in the blissful realms above. In the evening I ventured to preach from 1 Corinthians 1, 21, and spoke with a great freedom and plainness, and felt better afterward than could have been expected. Found myself something better on Monday, and met two classes. Tuesday, November 1st. My soul was in a lively frame, and sweetly inclined to live to God and to do all his holy will. Many people appeared to feel the word while I preached in the evening from Luke 8:18. 8, Wednesday, the 2nd. My friends in this city concluded to write to Mr. R., requesting that I might continue some time longer in New York and the country adjacent, supposing it would endanger my life to go into the low countries. But to stay or go, I submit to Providence. As my legs, hands, and feet were swollen, it was thought proper to consult a physician, who sent me a certain mixture of bitters. Thursday, the 3rd. My mind was much taken up with God, but I must lament that I am not perfectly crucified with Christ. I visited Mr. J., who appeared to be near death, and am ready to say, Art thou he? Oh, how changed! The next morning, about eight o'clock, he died, being about forty-two years of age, leaving a wife and six children behind him. At present a spirit of harmony subsisteth amongst our leaders, but I want to see them also deeply engaged to take the kingdom of heaven by violence. Lord's Day, the 6th. Both my body and mind were afflicted today. In the morning I showed the congregation the danger of settling on their lees, as all do who rest in dead formality or trust in any past experience. In the evening I addressed the people on the heartfelt inquiry of the trembling jailer, What must I do to be saved? Monday, the 7th. My body was weak, and my mind was much tempted. Lord, support and comfort me under every trial. I met the class of Mr. J., deceased, found much love amongst them, and by general consent appointed R.S. to act as their leader. I found much satisfaction in preaching the next evening, but had sore conflicts with Satan in the course of the day. Wednesday, the 9th. My soul is strengthened with might and filled with peace. But I see the propriety and great necessity of living every moment more and more to God. We are informed from Philadelphia that it is eight weeks since the preachers sailed from England, though they are not yet arrived. Friday, the 11th. My heart is grieved, and groaneth for want of more holiness. A letter from E.D. at New Rochelle informs me of a gay young woman and one or two more who are turning to God through Christ Jesus. They call aloud for preachers to come amongst them. On Saturday we had a blessed time in band meeting, though my mind had been somewhat depressed by finding one or two of my best friends drawn into a measure of party spirit. Lord's Day, the 13th. Dr. E. at St. Paul's was on his old tedious subject of the Lord's Supper. He cannot be at any great loss in saying the same thing over and over again so frequently. Many people attended at our church in the morning, and in the evening there were about a thousand who seriously listened, while I preached from Psalm 1.12. Monday, the 14th. 
I set off for New Rochelle, but by the disagreeable gait of the horse was exceedingly wearied on my arrival. Nevertheless, I gave an exhortation to some serious people who were collected there. The next day my mind was troubled by turning on political subjects, which are out of my province. Alas, what a small matter may interrupt our communion with God, and even draw away our affections from Him. Though we had a profitable time, while I preached from Psalm 1, too. Wednesday, the 16th. I went to P.B.'s, where we had many people in some power. There is a very perceivable alteration in the people of these parts. They both hear and understand, in some measure, the things of God, and can feel His awful truths. I had some conversation with a certain Mr. B., a sensible man, though he is tainted with the indolent spirit of Quakerism. Thursday, the 17th. All my desire was after God, and Him alone. Though my spirit was grieved by some involuntary thoughts which crowded in upon me, but in the midst of all there was a calm and settled peace. Friday, the 18th. Unguarded and trifling conversation has brought on a degree of spiritual deadness. But, by the grace of God, I will rouse myself and endeavor to be more watchful and spiritual in all my ways, and in all things please him whom my soul loveth far above every other object. Saturday, the 19th. I set off with an intention to go to York, but at the bridge was informed that Mr. D., had come to the city. Therefore I returned to Mr. B.'s and preached twice there the next day, as also once at Mr. D.'s, and am persuaded that the power of God attended the word at both places. We have here a small class of about thirteen persons, most of whom enjoy peace and consolation in Christ Jesus. I met them on Monday, and we were greatly comforted together. Thursday, the 24th. My heart is weaned from visible objects, and, by grace, raised to its best beloved above. But, oh, I greatly long for more solid, lasting union, to be inwardly adorned with all the virtues and graces of evangelical religion. We were this day informed of the death of Mr. O. May the Lord help me to be faithful, lest I should not live out half my days. I set off the next day for New York and met Brother S. at Kingsbridge. When we got within about ten miles of York, we found that about fifteen minutes before, a man had been robbed of his money and his coat from off his back. One of the rogues pursued us, but we were too far before him. We reached our church just as Mr. D. began to preach. Monday, the 28th. After taking my leave of my good friends in New York the last evening, from Philippians 1, 27, Captain W. and myself set off this morning for Amboy. We met with a person who came a passenger with us from England in the character of a gentleman, by the name of Wilson, but now he calls himself Clarkson, and since then he has called himself Lavingston. He has been apprehended for passing a counterfeit bill, for which he was both imprisoned and whipped. When he saw me, he knew me, and I knew him. But he was in such perplexity that he couldn't eat no breakfast, and went off in the first wagon he could meet with. To what fears and anxiety are poor sinners exposed? And if the presence of a mortal man can strike such terror into the minds of guilty sinners... What must they feel when they stand without a covering before a heart-searching and righteous God? On Tuesday, we arrived at Burlington, very weary, and we were saluted with the melancholy news that two unhappy men were to be hung on the Monday following, one for bestiality and the other for abusing several young girls in the most brutish and shocking manner. Alas, for the dignity of human nature... The next day I visited them, and found one of them, who was a papist, a little attentive. But he wanted to know if he might not trust for pardon after death. The other was a young man who appeared to be quite stupid. 
Both Captain W. and I spoke freely and largely to them, though there was very little room to hope that we should do them any good. Here Mrs. H. gave an account of the triumphant death of her sister, whose heart the Lord touched about two years ago under my preaching. In preaching this evening, I showed the people the emptiness of mere externals in religion and the absolute necessity of the inward power and graces thereof. Friday, December 2nd My soul enjoys great peace, but longs for more of God. We visited the prisoners again, and Captain W. enforced some very alarming truths upon them, though very little fruit of his labor could be seen. Mr. R. came to Burlington today, and desired me to go to Philadelphia. So, after preaching in the evening from Proverb 28.13, I set off the next morning for the city, and found the society in the spirit of love. Lord's Day, the 4th. I preached twice with some freedom, and went to hear Mr. S. But it was the same thing over again. The next day my mind was in a sweet, calm frame, and I felt a strong determination to devote myself wholly to God in His service. I spoke my mind to Mr. R., but we did not agree in judgment, and it appeared to me that to make any attempt to go to Baltimore would be all in vain. Tuesday the 6th. Visited some of my friends in the city, and wrote a letter to Mr. Wesley, which I read to Mr. R., that he might see I intended no guile or secret dealings. It is somewhat grievous that he should prevent my going to Baltimore, after being acquainted with my engagements in the importunities of my friends there. However, all things shall work together for good to them that love God. The next day, Mr. R. appeared to be very kind. So I hope all things will give place to love. Lord's Day, the 11th. Mr. R. preached a closed sermon on the neglect of public worship. At church, Mr. S. had the same thing over again, but the power of the Lord attended our preaching in the evening from Second Thessalonians 1, 7, and 8. Tuesday, the 13th. Yesterday my heart was fervently engaged in acts of devotion, and with some enlargement of heart I gave an exhortation at a private house near my lodging. But today my cry is, Oh, for more spirituality, more purity of heart. Lord, form me by the power of divine grace, according to all thy righteous will, that my soul may enjoy thee in glory forever. Though concurring circumstances required me to speak this evening in a manner unprepared, yet we were blessed with a comfortable season. Wednesday, the 14th. Mr. R. was sick, and Captain W. was busy, so I spent my time in study and devotion, and enjoyed a blessed sense of the divine presence. But what need can there be for two preachers here to preach three times a week to about sixty people? On Thursday night, about sixty persons attended to hear Captain W. preach. This is indeed a very gloomy prospect. But my heart delighteth in God. He is the object of my hope, and I trust he will be my portion forever. Lord's Day, the 18th. My soul was happy while preaching in the morning. Mr. S. gave us an old piece at church, and Mr. R. was very furious in the evening. Monday, the 19th. My body was indisposed, but my soul enjoyed health. The Lord gives me patience and fills me with His goodness. In meeting Sister T's class, we had a mutual blessing. Oh, that I could all invite His saving truth to prove. Show the length and breadth and height and depth of Jesus' love. Wednesday, the 21st. I began to read Neal's History of the Puritans. The Lord keeps me from all impure desire and makes me to abound with divine peace. In prayer meeting this evening, all present were greatly blessed. Friday, the 23rd. 
Mr. Neal, in his history, is tolerably impartial, though he seems rather inclined to favor the nonconformists. But how strange that the Reformation should be carried on in such a reign as that of Henry the Eighth, and in time of Edward the Sixth, while he was but a child. The good bishops, no doubt, carried the matter as far as they could, but it was not in their power to disentangle themselves and the nation from all the superstition of popery. But Queen Elizabeth and her friends bore hard for the supremacy. It seems the dispute began at Frankfurt, and Calvin was in the consultation. In the evening I preached from these words, Neither give place to the devil, and believe it was good for some that they were present. Took my lodging the next day at Mr. W.'s. The next day, as the snow was near two feet deep, I did not go out, but had a comfortable time at home. End of Section 13 Recording by Jordan Hazelrig Section 14 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jordan Hazelrig. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 14. Thursday, the twenty-ninth. My soul is happy in the love of God. He gives me grace to die daily to the world and all the desires of the flesh. Dr. S. delivered a good discourse from Isaiah 26, 20 and 21 on the solemn occasion of a fast and preparation for the Lord's Supper. I spoke at night from John 1, 12 and 13. Monday, January 2nd, 1775. I see the great necessity of always beginning to glorify God with fresh vigor of soul. So prone is man to grow languid in devout exercises that without fresh and powerful exertions he will soon sink into dead formality. At Mr. B.'s, where we dine today, I was much grieved at the manner of Mr. R.'s conversation. But let it be a caution to me to be prudent and watchful. The next day my soul was greatly alive to God. And the people here are so kind to me that it fills me with astonishment and gratitude. Thursday, the 5th. For several days my throat has been much disordered, but it is now something better. Glory to God! He sweetly draws my heart into close and comfortable communion with himself. In reading the history of the Puritans, I am surprised at the conduct of Archbishop Laud, a monster of a man indeed. Friday, the 6th. Find myself free, through grace, from all impure affections. But I am troubled on account of my disposition to trifle in conversation. Yet it is the will of God to save me from this also. May the happy hour speedily arrive when I shall be altogether such as my Lord would have me to be. Saturday, the 7th. I had some conversation with that pious good woman, the widow of G.T. She greatly lamented the condition of her son, who was in the Jersey College, a youth of about seventeen years of age, but under no deep impressions for the salvation of his soul. How grievous must this be to a pious parent! While carnal parents regard only the worldly prosperity of their children, truly religious parents are chiefly concerned about the eternal salvation of their souls. I was informed today that poor A.W. is living with his wife and appears to be industriously inclined. Lord's Day, the 8th. The Lord was pleased to bless my soul with that peace which passes understanding. A letter from my friend W.L. informed me that three of my friends were coming to conduct me, if possible, to Baltimore. But it is a doubt with me if I shall, with consent, be permitted to go. May the Lord give me wisdom, 
patience, and faith, that in all cases I may know how to act or suffer according to his will and my duty. Thursday, the 12th. The conduct of Mr. Blank is such as calls for patience. He has reported that I was the cause of A.W.'s becoming a preacher, whereas when he was appointed it was by the conference. At the time when I wanted him to travel was a year before his appointment, when his heart was right with God. Moreover, at the last conference I was doubtful of him, and so expressed myself both by word and letter. Friday, the 13th. As my throat was worse, I stayed at home and took physic. Part of my time was spent in reading the history of the Puritans, and I found my affections pure, and fixed on their proper object. Though Satan did not fail to assault me with many temptations. Lord's Day, the 15th. I visited the Quaker meeting but wondered to see so many sensible men sit to hear two or three old women talk. In the latter part of the day, I was much indisposed and kept at home. But the next morning I found myself something better, and earnestly longed for purity of heart and perfect resignation to all the will of God. Wednesday, the 18th. In the night my throat was bad, attended with a smart fever, My mind is variously exercised at different times, sometimes thinking that my affliction is judicial, other times thinking that natural causes produce natural effects. But, blessed Jesus, I must be still and know that Thou art God. From this time to Lord's Day, the 23rd, I had a putrid sore throat, and two persons set up with me every night but I found relief from purges and a mixture of nitre and fever powder. Mr. Blank keeps driving away at the people, telling them how bad they are with the wonders which he has done and intends to do. It is surprising that the people are not out of patience with him. If they did not like his friends better than him, we should soon be welcome to take a final leave of them. From the 23rd of January till the 1st of February, my affliction was so severe that I was not able to write. There were several small ulcers on the inside of my throat, and the pain of the gatherings was so severe that for two weeks I could not rest of nights. My friends were very kind, and, expecting my death, they affectionately lamented over me. But on the 29th of January... I was happily relieved by the discharge of near a pint of white matter. For a while my mind was in great heaviness, but after some severe conflicts with the powers of darkness, I was calmly resigned to the will of a wise and gracious God. O Lord, how wonderful are Thy works! It is my desire to know the cause of this affliction, that if it is in my power I may remove it. Is it that I may know more of myself and lie in the dust, or for my past unfaithfulness? But whatever may be the cause, I humbly hope that all the painful dispensations will work together for my good. In the course of this affliction, I found that when my spirit was broken and brought to submit with cheerfulness to the will of God, then the disorder abated, and I began to recover. Though Satan was very busy, and, like Job's impious wife, suggested to my mind that I should curse God and die. Nevertheless, through grace, I am more than a conqueror, and can give glory to God. The gargle which I used first to scatter, if possible, the inflammation, was sage tea, honey, vinegar, and mustard. Then that which was used to accelerate the gathering was mallows with a fig cut in pieces, And lastly, to strengthen the part, we used a gargle of sage tea, alum, rose leaves, and loaf sugar. On Monday the 30th, some letters came from Baltimore, earnestly pressing me to go. And Mr. R. was so kind as to visit me, 
when all was sweetness and love. Wednesday, February 1st. I am once more able to write and feel a solemn, grateful sense of God's goodness resting on my soul. My all of body, soul, and time are His due and should be devoted without the least reserve to His service and glory. Oh, that He may give me grace sufficient. Thursday, the 2nd. I am still getting better, but not able to speak in public. Though the word of the Lord is like fire within me, and I am almost weary of forbearing. The next day my mind was much taken up with God, and several of my friends, who were so kind as to visit me, were melted in conversation and prayer. Saturday, the 4th. My mind was filled with pure evangelical peace. I had some conversation with Captain W., an Israelite indeed, and we both concluded that it was my duty to go to Baltimore. And I feel willing to go, if it is even to die there, but at present am not permitted. I was confined to the house all the next day. But, oh, how painful are these dumb Sabbaths to me! However, it is my duty to submit to the providence of a wise God. Monday, the 6th. My body is but weak, and my mind is somewhat distressed, lest I should be too much concerned about the ark of the Lord, and wish to take the cause out of his hand. How frail a creature is man! How little can he penetrate into the design and works of God! Tuesday, the 7th. Mr. T.R. took me in a chaise to dine with Mr. R.N. and Mr. R.A., my mind is somewhat troubled with temptations, but still I have peace. I am weak in body, and want more patience and resignation to submit to the will of God, till he is pleased to restore me. What is life? Lord, help me to be always ready to end it here. Wednesday, the 8th. From the state of my body today, I feel great expectation of being restored to health. But, oh, how my soul longeth for more spiritual health. This day I wrote to Mr. R. at Baltimore to come for me. Thursday, the 9th. My body continues to recover, but I discover many weaknesses and failures in my inner man. When shall my soul be adorned as a bride for her bridegroom? When shall all within and all without be holiness to the Lord? Notwithstanding my illness, I have read Neal's History of the Puritans, consisting of four volumes, in about two months. Friday, the 10th. How great a blessing is health! Though of late it is but seldom enjoyed by me, but, through mercy, my body now feels like being restored and I am afraid of being thereby too much elated. The Lord shows me the excellency of affliction, and enables me to exercise resignation in all conditions of life. I am now reading Mosheim's ecclesiastical history, but as a writer he is too dry and speculative. Tuesday, the 14th. My heart pants to labor for God to be once more employed in building up his spiritual house. Oh, that he may strengthen me, set me to work, and greatly bless my poor endeavors. Preaching the glorious gospel seems to be my proper employment, and when I am long detained from it, I appear to be out of my element. But hope, a blessed hope, revives, that before long I shall be of some service in the Church of Christ. Thursday, the 16th. My mind has been kept in great peace, but I am somewhat troubled on account of my defects in usefulness and spirituality. May the Lord make me more serious and more spiritual in all my internal and external actions. And though my mind was much taken up with God on Friday, yet I was too free in conversation. 
My earnest desire is to have full power over every thought, word, and action. I now ventured to preach from Psalm 126, 3. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. R.S. wrote me a letter with his usual kindness, and informed me that Mr. D. concurred in sentiment relative to my going to Baltimore. And it is thought by many that there will be an alteration in the affairs of our church government. Lord's Day, the 19th. Mr. R. preached his farewell sermon from Deuteronomy 30, 19. He has now been here ten months. Monday, the 20th. Most of this day was spent in private devotion and reading. I am full of humble expectation that the Lord will restore me to better health and greater usefulness. May my eye be single, aiming at nothing but the glory of God, that my whole body may be full of light. Wednesday, the 22nd. I received a letter from Miss G. at Antigua, in which she informed me that Mr. G. was going away. And as there are about three hundred members in society, she entreats me to go and labor amongst them. And as Mr. Wesley has given his consent, I feel inclined to go and take one of the young men with me. But there is one obstacle in the way, the administration of the ordinances. It is possible to get the ordination of a presbytery, but this would be incompatible with Methodism, which would be an effectual bar in my way. It appears very strange that after so much affliction my heart should be so languid and dull. This day Mr. R. N. set off for New York. Thursday, the 23rd. Mr. R. F. and Mr. R. A. came to town. I preached in the evening from Romans 1, 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, etc. And showed first of what he was not ashamed, the experience, precepts, and blessings of the gospel, to preach it in his purity, to suffer for it. Secondly, why he was not ashamed of this, because it is the power of God to salvation from the guilt, power, and remains of sin. The power of God is displayed in preaching the simple truths of the gospel. Thirdly, to whom it became so, to them that believe, first, the threatenings, precepts, and invitations, and then in Jesus Christ for this present salvation. Saturday, the 25th. I packed up my clothes in order to depart on Monday morning for Baltimore, and while giving a few words of exhortation in the evening, we found it a solemn, feeling time. We also had a very powerful season the next evening, while I preached to a full house on the awful subject of the rich man and Lazarus. Monday, the 27th. My dear children in the Lord, P.R. and S.O., with several other kind friends, accompanied me out of town. We stopped at Chester, where I preached from these piercing words of our Lord, Thou knowest not the day of thy visitation. There are but little hopes of this place at present. Though if they do not fill up the measure of their iniquity, the time to favor them may come. The Lord hasten it before the present generation drops into eternity. As it is some time since I have been accustomed to labor and fatigue, my body was exceedingly weak and weary at night. Tuesday, the 28th. Stopping at Wilmington to preach in the evening, a barber came to shave me, who once professed religion, and had been a soldier in the 23rd Regiment. But now he is a deserter, both from God and man. On our way to Susquehanna on the next day, we accidentally called on Mr. I. H., whose heart was much affected while we prayed with him and his family. When we came to the ferry, we had an agreeable time several joining us while we called on the Lord by prayer in our room. Thursday, March 2nd. 
We called at the house of Mr. J.D. and rested about an hour. Sister D. has treated me with all the tenderness of a mother towards a son. And may he that will not forget a cup of water given in his name abundantly reward her. We then pursued our journey to Baltimore, and my heart was greatly refreshed at the sight of my spiritual children and kind friends there, for whose welfare my soul had travailed both present and absent. The next day I had the pleasure of seeing our new house, and my old friends, with some new ones added to their number. Here are all my own with increase. Lord's Day, the 5th. Both in town and at the point, large numbers attended to hear the word. The power of God was present, and I had an inward witness that it was the will of God I should, at that time, be amongst those people. N. I. is come home to God, and R. M. is on his way. Monday, the 6th. My mind was peaceful and calm. The next day, I set out in a carriage for Mr. T's, about nine miles from town, and found a large congregation, many of whom came from Elk Ridge. On Wednesday, I returned to town, and was powerfully assaulted by Satan. But glory to God, he is my sun and my shield. He discovers to my mind the temptations, and keeps me from their power. May I ever feel my obligations, and delight in giving all my strength and time to his service. Thursday, the ninth. My spirit was grieved within me to see the wickedness of mankind in this town, to see how they oppose the truth of God. The power of Satan is only checked in a small degree, but when shall he be quite cast out? Before he will suffer his kingdom to be entirely overthrown, he will, no doubt, do all he can in stimulating his trusty servants to defend his cause. Preaching on Friday at W.L.'s, the wealthy Mr. C.R. was present, and who can tell but the Lord may reach his heart. Saturday, the 11th. My body is somewhat unwell, but my soul is in health and peace. Though I have some cause of lamentation, for being too free in conversation with my friends. Lord's Day, the twelfth. Much of the power of God was felt at the point, and a divine energy went forth amongst the people that night in town, while I discoursed from that awakening scripture, Romans 2, 8, 9, and 10. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish, upon every soul of man that doeth evil, etc. Christ was precious to my soul, which was filled with divine peace. I saw Brother S. and entered into a free conversation with him. His sentiments relative to Mr. R. corresponded with mine, but all these matters I can silently commit to God, who overrules both in earth and heaven. Monday, the 13th. After preaching at O.C.'s about five miles from town, in a comfortable frame of mind, I returned. The next day I parted with Brother S. and felt my mind depressed by temptations. But a holy flame glowed in my heart, while discoursing at night on the cloud of witnesses. Believing that some souls were benefited, I commended myself to the divine protection and slept in peace. Though it rained on Thursday evening, yet many attended whilst I enforced the apostolic injunction, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. It is to be feared that many Christians do not lay aside every weight which impedes their spiritual progress. If they did, they would not halt and go on as if they were weary, but be enabled to run, and that with patience the race that is set before them. Friday, the 17th. The glory of God and the salvation of men were my principal objects. I went to preach at the point, but they were training the militia so that the town seemed all in confusion. 
Saturday, the 18th. Peace and pure desires filled my soul, and Christ was the object of my love. Glory be to thee, O Lord. The next day the Spirit of the Lord God was with me in preaching at the point, and with great pathos I was enabled to deliver the truth at night in town. Many of the audience felt the weight of God's word. May they yield to the sacred touch and be saved. On Monday and Tuesday, I made a small excursion into the country and labored to bring souls to Christ at Mr. R's and Mr. T's. It seemed C.D. has not lost all the concern he felt some time ago. I afterward returned safe to town in the evening and spent a part of the next day in reading Taylor's treatise on holy living. This book was made a blessing to me above seven years ago. I preached in the evening from 1 Samuel 10:6, The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. Here I took occasion to show, Roman numeral 1, the operations of the Spirit on the heart of man to convince, convict, convert, and sanctify. Roman numeral 2, the effects of these operations. Subpoint 1. A strong inclination to speak for God. This is the duty of every Christian. Subpoint 2. A great change in judgment, desire, spirit, temper, and practice. I found myself much indisposed when I returned to my lodgings, and the disorder of my body depressed my spirits. Friday, the 24th. I ventured to Patapsco Neck, and had a full house at Captain R.'s, whose wife is brought by grace to the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. Lord's Day, the 26th. My heart was delightfully taken up with God. In the time of preaching at the point this morning, my spirit was tender, and many of the audience were much melted. I also found myself greatly drawn out in preaching at night in town. Tuesday, the 28th. Mr. O., the Dutch minister, accompanied me to I.O.'s, where we had a blessed and refreshing season. The next day, at town, I met with Brother W. from Virginia, who gave me a great account of the work of God in those parts, five or six hundred souls justified by faith, and five or six circuits formed, so that we now have fourteen circuits in America and about twenty-two preachers are required to supply them. Thus we see how divine providence makes way for the word of truth, and the Holy Spirit attends it. May it spread in power and cover these lands. Brother W. is a very singular man, but honest in his intentions, and sincerely engaged for the prosperity of the work. I dined with Mr. O., the minister mentioned above, and spent the afternoon with him and Mr. S., another minister of the same profession. They both appear to be sincerely religious, and intend to make proposals to the German Synod this year to lay a plan for the reformation of the Dutch congregations. Friday, the 31st. This was a day of joy and great consolation to my soul. I clearly saw the propriety and necessity of devoting every faculty in every hour to God. Lord's Day, April 2nd. Many people attended to hear the word, and there appeared to be much feeling amongst them. I had a desire to hear from myself, Mr. Blank, the Presbyterian minister. His discourse was quite systematical and amusing, but if he had studied to pass by the consciences of his hearers, he could not have done it more effectually. Monday and Tuesday I spent comfortably in laboring on a short tour in the country, and was graciously assisted in Tuesday night at town. Wednesday, the 5th. I experienced the benefit of visiting the sick, and found much satisfaction in my own soul, while speaking plainly to a carnal young man. The next day Satan assaulted me with great violence. 
but he found my heart fixed on God. Friday, the 7th. After visiting two sick persons, I went to Brother L's and was enabled to speak freely and feelingly to a large number of rich and poor assembled there. On Saturday I returned and found that a young man who had turned his back on the gospel and devoted himself to sin had been suddenly snatched away by death. How awful! Does not this appear like the judicial hand of God? Does it not seem as a powerful warning to surviving sinners, especially such as answer his character? And yet it is to be feared many will not bear the rod, nor regard him that appointed it. Lord's Day, the ninth. Though my body was weak, and my mind grieved by the wickedness of the wicked, yet I was enabled to speak powerfully both at the point and town. The blessing of the Lord attended us, both at Mr. E.'s on Monday and at O.C.'s on Tuesday. Here I met with Brother S., and found we were of one heart and of one mind. Lord, grant that all the preachers may be thus united in sentiment and affection. Thursday, the 13th. Had some conversation with Mrs. J. from Philadelphia. She appeared to be in distress about her soul, and said she was convinced of her lost estate the last Lord's Day. Saturday, the 15th. God is my portion, and my all-sufficient good. He fills me with pure spiritual life. My heart is melted into holy love, and altogether devoted to my Lord. Many came to hear the word of life in the evening, and my soul was supplied with strength. End of section 14 Recording by Jordan Hazelrig Section 15 of the Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. Section 15. Lord's Day, 16. The Spirit of God attended our endeavors both in town and point. My heart was greatly enlarged in town especially. There is a very apparent alteration in this place. There is not so much drunkenness and neglect of the ordinances as in former times, and the people are much more inclined to attend the places of public worship. So that on the whole I entertain a lively hope that the Lord will yet raise up for himself a large society in the town of Baltimore on monday my frame was weak and weary nevertheless i had to preach once in town and once in the country about seven miles off wednesday nineteen having preached at several places in the country i returned to town and find that the lord assisteth me from time to time he frequently revives both body and soul when i am almost ready to give over tuesday twenty just before preaching at the point, six men were accidentally shot in the militia exercise. I will not venture to assert that Captain collected them for exercise because it was preaching night. However, I visited one of the wounded and prayed with him. Saturday, 22. I dined with Captain R., who appeared to be under some small awakenings. Afterward came to town where Brother R. and I met, like Jacob and Esau, and all was love and peace. In the evening, Mr. R. preached a good sermon on John 12.36. While ye have the light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of the light. Lord's Day 23 Our congregations were large, amongst whom were Mr. G., Mr. C., and others. In the evening, Mr. R. preached an alarming sermon. On Monday, I visited a sick woman who soon after went into eternity and then I went to Mr. E.'s, where many found it beneficial to them that they were present to hear the word of the Lord. By particular invitation, I lodged on Tuesday night at Captain R.'s, and in the course of a free conversation, he told me that he was brought under his first conviction at Mr. T.'s, from Proverbs 28.13. Saturday 29. 
i have not been unassisted in the public exercises of this week and now find my soul in a peaceful frame though not without a serious concern for the cause of the country lord turn aside thy displeasure and mercifully interpose lord's day thirty i preached three times and the cup of my blessing was full what shall i render unto the lord for all his benefits but we have alarming military accounts from boston new york and philadelphia surely the lord will overrule and make all these things subservient to the spiritual welfare of his church on monday i visited the country and having preached at a few places returned on tuesday night to town and found all the people all inflamed with a martial spirit thursday may four my soul longs for a perfect conformity to the image and will of god in all things i desire nothing but him and he causeth my heart to overflow with peaceful joy i preached at the point this evening but have more hope for the inhabitants of the town than for those of the point oh that i could learn the holy art of doing more good for precious souls it troubles me to think of being so unprofitable friday five at the appointed time for preaching we had an awful storm of thunder and lightning which killed three horses however i began in the midst of it and spoke with liberty of spirit and confidence in god saturday six i was grieved to-day that i did not feel myself more steadily devoted to god in the evening i k preached a good and profitable sermon but long and loud enough lord's day seven i preached twice and held a love feast but heaviness is brought upon my mind by some that would once comparatively speaking have plucked out their eyes and had given them to me but now they slight me cursed is the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm whose heart departeth from the lord may my heart trust in the lord monday eight several friends set out in company with me to the quarterly meeting when we came to j g s he did not appear to be so open and free as he was about a year ago prayer is almost neglected and both his children and servants are almost like wild untaught indians ah what is all the substance of this world without the love and fear of god i proceeded the next morning to meet the preachers and stewards at ten o'clock we held our love feast though my mind was under some exercises so that i spoke but little however at four o'clock i preached from isaiah forty one thirteen with great enlargement and to a large concourse of people but was confined in the evening to the company of men who were destitute of religion and full of sin and politics my brethren and myself were glad to have prayer in the morning and leave them if there were no other hell than the company of wicked men i would say from such a hell good lord deliver me tuesday eleven was appointed as a general fast i preached on the occasion and the lord made it a solemn heart affected time so that we did not conclude till about three o'clock the next day i reached bohemia but as it was late some of the congregation had departed i therefore exhorted those that were left and then proceeded to newcastle lord's day fourteen both last night and this day i hope my skirts were clear of the blood of the people in this little town whether they reject or accept an offered salvation after stopping to preach at chester the next day i then went on to philadelphia tuesday sixteen i had some friendly and close conversation with the preachers in which we spoke plainly of our experience and doctrines mr r a preached in the evening from wednesday till friday we spent in conference with great harmony and sweetness of temper if the lord spares me i am now about bending my course toward norfolk to preach the glad tidings of salvation to perishing sinners there monday twenty two i have preached the last evening with some sweet enlargement i left philadelphia this morning and set off for norfolk preached at night to a few people in chester and was conducted the next morning in a friend's chase to cecil courthouse where i embarked for norfolk monday twenty nine with a thankful heart i landed in norfolk after having been much tossed about by contrary winds in the bay my accommodations on board the vessel were also very indifferent so that it was a disagreeable and fatiguing passage 
but in hope of that immortal crown i now the cross sustain and gladly wander up and down and smile at toil and pain here i found about thirty persons in society after their manner but they had no regular class meetings however here are a few who are willing to observe all the rules of our society their present preaching-house is an old shattered building which has formerly been a playhouse surely the lord will not always suffer his honor to be trampled in the dust no i entertain a hope that we shall have a house and a people in this town my heart is filled with holy thoughts and deeply engaged in the work of god on tuesday evening about one hundred and fifty souls attended to hear the word and about fifty at five o'clock on wednesday morning which by the presence of the lord was found to be a good time i then went over to portsmouth and found my spirit at liberty in preaching to a number of souls there friday june two the lord is pleased to show me the danger which a preacher is in of being lifted up by pride and falling into the condemnation of the devil how great is the danger of this a considerable degree of ballast is highly necessary to bear frequent and sudden puffs of applause lord fill me with genuine humility that the strongest gusts from satan or the world may never move me saturday three my body is weak but my soul is in sweet pacific frame i see the need of constant watchfulness and entire devotion to god my heart was stayed on god while preaching in the evening from psalm sixty eight eighteen lord's day four many seemed willing to hear both morning and evening at norfolk but in the afternoon at portsmouth the congregation though large seemed to have very little sensibility on monday i found myself better than could be expected after preaching three times and meeting the society the day before may the lord brace up my feeble frame and by his grace i am determined to use it for his glory and the service of his church the congregation were attentive in the evening while i enlarged on the fruits of the spirit tuesday six i went to the farthermost part of portsmouth parish through such a swamp as i never saw before and partook of a blessing with the people some of whom are of a simple heart after having preached at mr f s in st bride's parish then at mr m s and mr r s i returned to portsmouth on thursday evening and found my soul in peace i have lately read mason on self-knowledge this book with franks on the fear of man and thomas akimpus are most excellent books for a christian wednesday fourteen i have continued laboring with different degrees of encouragement between norfolk and portsmouth but have not met with the success which my soul longs for our friends set a subscription on foot to-day for building a house of worship and i have raised only about thirty-four pounds had they the same spirit of liberality which they have in baltimore they might easily accomplish it thursday fifteen i found thirteen serious souls in society about six miles from town on suffolk road but poor brother o is subject to great heaviness through manifold temptations the congregation here were small however some of them were much affected i gave a close and pointed exhortation in the evening at portsmouth and there was a melting of heart amongst the people i preached again the next day and met both the classes and felt my hopes for portsmouth begin to revive monday nineteen yesterday's labor of preaching three times etc was not too much for me and this day my soul enjoyed delightful communion with god satan assaults but he that is for me is stronger than he that is against me be thou my strength be thou my way protect me through my life's short day in all my acts may wisdom guide and keep me saviour near thy side tuesday i preached at new mail creek and joined two persons at through the small society there went thence to northwest woods and preached at the house of mr a and after preaching at two or three more places i returned on thursday to portsmouth monday twenty six the god of hope fills me with joy and peace in believing about seventy souls sat under the word this evening and some of them were very deeply affected but too often it is as the morning cloud and as the early dew how irrational it is that rational beings should employ their thoughts with readiness on every trifling subject 
but when they can hardly be brought to think seriously on the things of eternity although the holy spirit awakens their sensibility and alarms their fears oh the strange perverseness the deadly depravity of man tuesday twenty seven preached at five in the morning but am depressed in spirit to see such an insensibility to the things of god amongst the people surely i am now in a dry and barren land but hope it will not be so long tuesday twenty nine i preached at mr b s a new place and a large company was collected the lord stirred the hearts of the people under the preaching of the word at h s and on friday i returned and preached at night in portsmouth after i had met the classes and put them into bands the next day i then set off for craney island but found the weather excessively hot such as i had never known in england on my return some of the members appeared a little refractory in submitting to discipline but without discipline we should soon be as a rope of sand so that it must be enforced let who will be displeased lord's day july two our congregations consisted of many people from the country as well as the towns and i knew by experience that where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty monday three was spent in writing to the preachers and reading and i was much contracted in my ideas while preaching at night but all my soul is taken up with god so that my desire is unto the lord and the remembrance of his name give me thyself from every boast from every wish set free let all i am in thee be lost but give thyself to me friday seven the last three days i have labored at different places in the country and preached this evening in portsmouth though i feel some concern for the souls of my fellow men yet not enough if we could but see by faith the danger to which poor unpardoned sinners are continually exposed if we could but have a realizing view of that unquenchable fire into which they must be plunged dying in the present state how could we rest day or night from using all possible endeavours to prevent their eternal damnation o oh, unbelief thou most destructive sin how dost thou destroy the vigour of christians endeavours as well as the souls of the unregenerate tuesday eleven after preaching at five o'clock in norfolk i went to portsmouth met the classes and read and explained the rules telling them that every civil society has its proper rules and persons appointed to see them kept and that every member forfeited his right to membership if he wilfully transgressed them if men see the necessity of being thus subject to order for the sake of temporary advantages how much more cheerfully should we be subject for the eternal advantages which attend the salvation of our souls friday fourteen i returned to town after a short tour and preaching several times in the country in this tour i lodged at the house of brother o mentioned some time ago a man of gloomy spirit but solid piety in his house there is a true spiritual church three souls all of one mind and sincerely intent on seeking and serving the lord i met the classes in town and found my soul sweetly staying on the lord though my animal spirits flagged by reason of the extreme heat friend l is opposed to our rules but no man can expect to abide with us unless he is so satisfied with our rules as to manifest a proper respect and conformity he may be as i hope he is a well-meaning man but he is deficient in religious judgment tuesday twenty i have now been a few days doing my master's business in the country but have taken cold and am afflicted with a severe headache so that i am almost ready to lie by however the next day i found myself something better and came to portsmouth met the classes and preached my heart and my flesh cry out for god fulfil fulfil my large desires large as infinity give give me all my soul requires all all that is in thee lord's day twenty three there appeared to be many wild people in the congregation though the grace of god is sufficient to make them tame but the almighty dealeth with man as with a rational creature therefore we may go on in our folly like the wild ass's colt till we drop into endless perdition unless we yield to the sacred touch of grace and become workers together with god wednesday twenty six 
i preached to a small company at brother w's and before the congregation was dismissed an honest christian who had been justified about twelve months before rose up and spoke a few broken words which affected the people more than all that had been said what an excellent thing is simplicity of the heart how ready is god to own and bless it it would be well for professors of some standing to inquire impartially if they have not lost their first simplicity old professors are very apt to become wise in their own esteem and fools in god's esteem i have constant inward fevers and drag a cumbersome body with me but my soul is united to jesus though i ardently wish to feel more fervent love to my god and saviour calling at brother o's in this little excursion i found his wife exceedingly happy in the love of god and i know not but she is sanctified wholly friday twenty eight at my return to town i found the people in some commotion their trading to the west indies was prohibited however the little society seemed determined to cleave to the lord the next day i went down the river to mr e s and preached perhaps to but little purpose to a company of ignorant careless people lord's day thirty i was greatly assisted in my public exercises both in norfolk and portsmouth if it were in my power and consistent with the will of god every soul of them should be brought to christ but alas these are vain thoughts for the almighty has an infinitely greater desire for their eternal welfare but the whole of the matter is this they will not come to christ in the way he has appointed that they might have life and thus many will eternally perish in their sins friday august four i spent the preceding part of this week preaching in the country as usual and with various prospects of success but came back to-day met the classes which appeared to be much more engaged for heaven and preached in the evening saturday five my spirit was a little dejected but blessed with the peace of god i had some conversation with mr s who said that the people should be kept in society if they did not meet in the class and intimated that instead of preaching the gospel i had been exposing their faults so this is part of what i have gained by my labor but i let him know that our rules were intended for use monday seven i received a letter from mr t r in which he informed me that himself mr r and mr d had consulted and deliberately concluded it would be best to return to england but i can by no means agree to leave such a field for gathering souls to christ as we have here in america it would be an eternal dishonor to the methodists that we should all leave three thousand souls who desired to commit themselves to our care neither is it the part of a good shepherd to leave his flock in time of danger therefore i am determined by the grace of god not to leave them let the consequence be what it may our friends here appear to be distressed above measure at the thought of being forsaken by the preachers so i wrote my sentiments both to mr t r and mr g s tuesday eight i set out on my little country tour and after preaching at mr b s brother w s and a few other places returned on friday to portsmouth and preached in the evening though much indisposed this week we had such thunder and lightning as never i knew before thus by going from one climate to another we may meet with things of which we had very little idea then how will it be when we change worlds instead of climates and how surprised will impenitent sinners be when they go from earth to hell that god whose power produces the thunder and lightning of which the inhabitants of some parts of the earth have very little conception is undoubtedly able to produce the unquenchable fire of which many impenitent sinners have very little belief lord's day thirteen my own soul was enlarged in preaching but the people were too little affected on monday i spoke both morning and evening but we were interrupted by the clamor of arms and preparations of war my business is to be more intensely devoted to god then the rougher the way the shorter our stay the tempests that rise shall gloriously hurry our souls to the skies wednesday sixteen preaching at mr h s about sixteen miles from town i met with mr p from north carolina who invited me to go and form a circuit in currituck county 
where they have very little preaching but what they pay for at the rate of three pounds per sermon i accepted the invitation and appointed the tenth of september for the time to visit them a letter from brother g s which came to hand on friday gave an account of about two hundred souls brought to christ within the space of two months glory to god for the salvation of sinners surely i am in a dry and barren place and there is but little prospect of doing good though the spirit of holiness possesses my own heart but oh how it pants for more faith and love how it longs to be more useful in the church of christ saturday nineteen my body is weak but this does not concern me like the want of more grace my heart is too cool towards god i want it to feel like a holy flame i am also sometimes afraid that i shall never do any more good lord's day twenty i preached three times as usual and heard a sermon on the dignity of human nature vain philosophy every imagination of the thoughts of the heart in an unrenewed man is only evil continually then what is the dignity of depraved human nature received a letter from mr t r expressing a change in his intention of returning to england wrote to mr b's on tuesday where many of the people were much affected under preaching lord water the seed sown that sooner or later it may bring forth fruit to thy glory the weather is now so hot that my body is greatly enfeebled and my mind almost unfit for every exercise but i desire in patience to possess my soul i went to mr e s on saturday but there was little prospect of doing them any good i took my leave of them my body was fatigued my soul was tempted and cast down but in meeting the people at night in town my spirit was refreshed End of section fifteen section sixteen of journal of the rev francis asbury volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson journal of the rev francis asbury volume one section sixteen lord's day twenty seven the spirit of the lord wrought powerfully in our congregation and some were deeply affected on monday i set off for mill creek to hold our quarterly meeting we found it a peaceful comfortable time mr s discovered his independent principles in objecting to our discipline he appears to want no preachers he can do as well or better than they but it is likely self-sufficiency is the spring of all this after preaching at a few other places on the way i returned to portsmouth on friday and on saturday we had a most remarkable storm the wind at northeast and blew several vessels on shore and among others the mercury man-of-war houses were blown down docks torn up bridges carried away abundance of trees broken torn up by the roots and several tracts of land overflowed with water what a peculiar blessing is true religion who in the lord confide and feel his sprinkled blood in storms and hurricanes abide firm as the mount of god a more awful scene than this will be unfolded when god shall judge the world by the man christ jesus how then will poor sinners quake and tremble when the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat o they that were wise that they understood this that they would consider their latter end monday september fourth i was taken very ill with the fall fever and being able to take but little nourishment was much reduced however i put my trust in the lord and committed all my concerns to him but was not able to keep my journal till the twenty-fifth instant and then felt myself but very little better tuesday twenty six brother w died the lord does all things well perhaps brother w was in danger of being entangled in worldly business and might thereby have injured the cause of god so he was taken away from the evil to come wednesday twenty seven my body is still very weak and there is too much weakness in my soul which passionately longs for more spirituality and more of god in christ jesus come o my god thyself reveal fill all this mighty void 
thou only canst my spirit fill come o my god my god thursday twenty eight i ventured to preach a funeral sermon at the burial of brother w he has been a very useful laborious man and the lord gave him many seals of his ministry perhaps no one in america has been an instrument of awakening so many souls as god has awakened by him friday twenty nine my body recovers a little health and strength lord help me so to use my strength for thee as never to provoke thee in thy displeasure to deprive me of either my life or my strength wrote to mr t r informing him of brother w s death lord's day october one preached in portsmouth for the first time since my illness and the hearts of many were touched tuesday three my heart is fixed trusting in the lord i sincerely desire to be entirely his to spend the remnant of my days and strength altogether for god a company of marines have been ashore at norfolk ransacked the printing office and taken the printers and press with them the inhabitants soon after embodied and got under arms the people are also repairing the fort which if put in order may sink all the ships that shall attempt to come into the harbor but if it is thought expedient to watch and fight in defense of our bodies and property how much more expedient is it to watch and fight against sin and satan in defense of our souls which are in danger of eternal damnation but small dangers at hand have a greater effect on fallen man than the greatest dangers which are thought to be at a distance but alas the one may be as near as the other saturday seven i ventured though weak on a small excursion into the country this week and preached several times lord's day eight was greatly enlarged in preaching both at norfolk and portsmouth and i ventured to hope some good was done but martial clamors confuse the land however my soul shall rest in god during this dark and cloudy day he has his way in the whirlwind and will not fail to defend his own ark wednesday eleven satan assaults me but cannot break my peace my soul is stayed on the lord and i find great sweetness in reading the bible in comparing spiritual things with spiritual other books have too great a tendency to draw us from the best of books i therefore intend to read more in this and less in all others friday thirteen preached at mr f s where i always find consolation in my soul then i returned to portsmouth and found my spirit at liberty in preaching at night well may the kingdom of heaven be compared to a net which is cast into the sea and gathereth all both good and bad we had collected twenty-seven persons in our little society here when i first came but i have been obliged to reduce them to fourteen and this day i put out a woman for excessive drinking here we see the necessity and advantage of discipline no doubt but satan will use all his endeavors to thrust in some who are unsound and insincere so that they by their ungodly conduct may help to bring reproach on the spiritual church of christ and unless the discipline of his church is enforced what sincere person would ever join a society amongst whom they saw ungodliness connived at friday twenty having spent several days preaching in different parts of the country i returned to portsmouth and was comforted we have a few as faithful and happy souls in this place as perhaps in any part of virginia and unless divine justice has determined destruction on these two towns i hope the lord will undertake for them and increase their number lord's day twenty two a painful swelling in my face prevented my preaching this morning but it broke and gave me ease before night so i exhorted in the evening monday twenty three as i expect to go to brunswick shortly my heart rejoices in hopes of seeing good days and many souls brought to god in those parts two gospel preachers may say with the poet the love of christ our hearts constrain and strengthens our unwearied hands we spend our sweat and time and pains to cultivate emmanuel's lands preaching at mr b s to-day some who had treated me with unkindness were now affected and wept much at the thoughts of parting the word went with power to the hearts of many at mr h s on tuesday as it did also the next day at the widow eyes 
where they prevailed on me to tarry all night and preach again for them on the thursday which i did here is a prospect of doing good and a preacher is acceptable for they have no minister in the country except one who is occasionally hired at the extravagant rate before mentioned i explained something of our discipline and method of support to mr p and he seemed desirous that we should go amongst them i then went to the northwest woods and preached at the funeral of a certain mr m who had desired that we should perform his last office for him many people were present who seemed serious and some of them were much affected on friday i returned to portsmouth saturday twenty eight i feel determined by the grace of god to use more private prayer and may the lord make me more serious more watchful and more holy lord's day twenty nine there was great tenderness of heart amongst the people at norfolk while i enlarged on these words of our lord i will not leave you comfortless i will come unto you it was also an affecting time at portsmouth while preaching from deuteronomy thirty nineteen monday thirty i am now bound for brunswick some that have been displeased with my strictness and discipline were now unwilling to let me go but i fear they will not soon see me again if they should even say blessed is he that cometh in the name of the lord i am deficient in many things but my conscience beareth me witness that i have been faithful to these souls both in preaching and discipline after taking leave of my friends i set out for brunswick and having preached at mr b s in the way lodged at mrs w s wednesday november one after we had passed southampton court house we were stopped by one who had an order from the committee to examine strangers when we had given him an account of ourselves he treated us with great kindness and invited us to dine with him which we did my body is a little fatigued but my soul is blessed with health and vigor hitherto hath the lord helped thursday too by the good providence of god i entered brunswick circuit at the house of mrs m and am now within a few miles of dear brother g s god is at work in this part of the country and my soul catches the holy fire already friday three god is my rest and my portion my soul delighteth in him my heart is elevated in flames of sacred fire both in private and public prayer let others stretch their arms like seas and grasp in all the shore grant me the visits of thy face and i desire no more lord's day five rode about ten miles to s y's chapel and met brother g s my spirit was much united to him and our meeting was like that of jonathan and david we had a large congregation and i was much comforted amongst them monday six i moved on towards our quarterly meeting but in forty meharing river the water was so deep as almost to swim my horse and carriage on tuesday our quarterly meeting began at which there might be seven hundred people what great things hath the lord wrought for the inhabitants of virginia great numbers of them manifest a desire to seek salvation for their souls at this meeting we admitted f p t f and j h y as travelling preachers i had great satisfaction in preaching both tuesday and wednesday and was much pleased with the manner and matter of the christian's testimony in the love feast having a correspondent witness of the same in my own breast thursday nine spent this day profitably and comfortably with brother g s happy are they who can open their minds freely to each other as we have done friday ten i preached at b j s and the power of the lord was present melting the hearts of the audience and in class meeting both believers and penitents were all in tears i have now a blooming prospect of usefulness and hope both to do good and get good my heart goes out in grateful thanksgiving and praises to god lord's day twelve was much shackled in my ideas and tempted against the place and people while preaching at i m s but on monday i found an attentive feeling people at i j s the preaching appeared to be very seasonable as the baptists are creeping in amongst our societies in these parts my soul possesses more and more of the divine life and love and is strongly bound to jesus christ my lord but still i hunger and thirst for more of the grace of god tuesday fourteen 
preached at mr c s and mr b s and met with a few inquisitive people it is a just observation that those matters which are the least disputed in religion are the most essential and those who are the most fond of controverted trifles have the least real religion satan will help us to the shell if we will be satisfied without the kernel wednesday fifteen the congregation at mr h s was but small though i hope it was not labor in vain the next day there was a good prospect at mr f s and a class of about fifty simple faithful souls the word was blessed on friday by friend s s and on saturday i came to s y s a serious sensible man lord's day nineteen i began and ended the day with god i had much liberty at the chapel in discoursing on the subject matter manner and end of the apostles preaching monday twenty my soul is pure and peaceful and blessed with a more solid sense of god than heretofore at v w s we had a blessing both in preaching and class meeting wednesday twenty second after preaching i met with brother i l and mr k who were on their way to portsmouth but could not pass the guards lord help thy people to redeem their time for the days are evil i see the necessity of living to god and improving our present privileges thursday twenty three my soul was blessed with a delightful sense of the goodness of god this morning and after i had preached at w s brother r l gave an exhortation then rode to f s s and went to bed with a fever on me and in the morning felt so much pain that i thought of not going to the courthouse however i went and found a large congregation and believe it was a profitable season thus we see the propriety of dragging a feeble body to duty as far as it can bear and if there be a willing and sincere mind god will either give us strength for a profitable performance of duty or accept of what we are able to do at this time the lord rewarded my weak endeavors with liberty power and consolation so i kept on my way and preached the next day at b s s and on the lord's day at i m s to about four hundred souls there one person was struck with convulsive shakings after preaching at l s on monday i met the class but had not a satisfactory confidence in the testimony of some of the members my own soul was in a comfortable frame and felt a strong desire to glorify god more than ever my mind was also strongly impressed with a desire to warm and stir up the people to work out their salvation in these dangerous and difficult times tuesday twenty eight the rain detained me in the house to hold close and sweet communion with my god but the next day i found many collected at mr b s here mrs j t met me and entreated me to go into their parish pursued my way on thursday to mr p m s and found an unsettled society and on friday preached to a dry congregation at mr p s and the next day went on to petersburg here i was unexpectedly pleased with the sight of some of my friends from norfolk i preached twice in petersburg on the lord's day and though many of the people seemed like gallio to care for none of those things yet i hope there will be some faithful souls found there monday december four i am frequently checking myself for the want of more solemnity in my conversation but still my heart is with the lord in the heavenly lamb thrice happy i am and my heart doth rejoice at the sound of his name preached at i r s on tuesday and rode in company with a few friends to g b s and preached in the evening we had a melting time in preaching the next day but especially in the class meeting satan still assaults me with his temptations but the lord is on my right hand that i may not be moved if i trust in him we must expect to be tempted as our lord was while we are within the reach of the fallen spirits but it is our duty to keep ourselves that the wicked one touch us not and if we yield in the least degree even in desire or temper we must expect to suffer for it thursday seven i saw brother i k whose heart seems to be yet in the work of god we had a good time to-day at t a s both in preaching and class meeting my soul resteth in the love of god and all my powers are engaged to do his will i also found my soul devoted to god in faith and prayer the next day 
and after preaching at f a s met the society which consisted chiefly of penitents saturday nine found a few simple souls at mr e s and we were comforted together a man came to the house at night asked for me gave a curse and went away lord's day ten rode to friend l's and preached twice in their new house thirty feet by twenty four my own heart was enlarged and many of the people were moved and melted under the word we have about sixty persons in society here friend l who had been ill for some time departed from this vale of woe full of faith and love and joy about one o'clock on monday morning what a noble and delightful employment is ours to be nursing immortal souls for the realms of eternal glory and now and then we have the inexpressible comfort of seeing a soul depart in peace triumphing over the power of death is there joy among the angels of god over one sinner that repenteth and is there not joy among them over one soul that has finally escaped the snare of the devil doubtless there is and we will participate of their joy lord help me in all humility and love in all purity and faithful obedience to devote all my days to thee that i may finally join all the glorious company of heaven and praise thee eternally there i left my circuit and came back to preach at friend l's funeral there were many people and a great melting among them but i found myself very unwell at night through much exercise and went to bed in a high fever my mind was also dejected and tempted so that i have not had such a day these six weeks lord give me patience that in the midst of all i may possess my soul friday fifteen i was able to preach at n n s and met with brother i k and his wife who were married yesterday found a happy people at mr t s on monday and was greatly blessed with the people on tuesday at mr b s wednesday twenty i have now been twelve years a preacher three years in a local capacity and nine years in the travelling connection about four years and eight months in england and about four years and four months in america thursday twenty one by a mistake of brother g's i rode twelve miles to r j s and then had to ride thirteen miles more to o s and met the people at night End of section sixteen Section 17 of the Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. Section 17. Monday, 25 being christmas day i preached from first timothy one fifteen this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that christ jesus came into the world to save sinners my spirit was at liberty and we were much blessed both in preaching and class meeting hitherto the lord hath helped me both in soul and body beyond my expectation may i cheerfully do and suffer all his will endure to the end and be eternally saved wednesday twenty seven we have awful reports of slaughter at norfolk and the great bridge but i am at a happy distance from them and my soul keeps close to jesus christ and as we know not what a day may bring forth i can say with st paul for me to live is christ but to die is gain found a warm and lively society about fifty souls at w f s on thursday but the company was small at friend s s on friday lord's day thirty one being the last day of the year we held a watch night at s y s chapel beginning at six and ending at twelve o'clock it was a profitable time and we had much of the power of god monday january one seventeen seventy six i am now entering on a new year and am of late constantly happy feeling my heart much taken up with god and hope thus to live and thus to die or if there should be any alteration may it be for the better and not for the worse this is my earnest desire and prayer to god my residue of days or hours thine wholly thine shall be and all my consecrated powers a sacrifice to thee till jesus in the clouds appear to saints on earth forgiven 
and bring the grand sabbatic year the jubilee of heaven on wednesday my soul was in a sweet and humble frame and my heart was expanded both in preaching and meeting the class i returned to o m s for lodging and the next day after preaching spoke to about thirty lively souls at w s wednesday ten mr and mrs j met me at friend b s and gave me a long narrative of a great work under brother g s we held a watch night and mr j and i stood about two hours each there appeared to be a great degree of divine power amongst the people mr j accompanied me to w p s where i preached and then pursued my way to mr p s in chesterfield a good old saint of god the lord was with us there and afterward went on to petersburg and was glad to see my friends though they were in some trouble about the times to the great loss of many individuals we are informed that norfolk was burnt by the governor lord's day fourteen i found myself at liberty in preaching in the morning and then went to hear parson h who preached a good sermon he came in the evening and heard me preach on the jubilee leviticus twenty four nine and ten brother g s then met the class with great animation monday fifteen we had many people at friend l's i have been reading Pierdot's connections and my soul possesses peace and purity in christ my redeemer wednesday seventeen the lord is graciously working on the hearts of the people at f a s but the baptists endeavor to persuade the people that they have never been baptized like ghosts they haunt us from place to place o oh, the policy of satan some he urges to neglect the ordinances altogether others he urges to misunderstand them or make additions to them christ speaking of children says of such is the kingdom of heaven but the practice of the baptist says they may be of the kingdom of glory but they cannot be of the kingdom of grace but knowing that they who seduce souls must answer for them i shall not break my peace about it but leave them to god i look on them as objects of pity rather than objects of envy or contempt the people also appeared to be much alive on thursday at the widow a's had a blessing in class meeting and find my heart quite given up to god friday nineteen thanks be to god for his unspeakable love my soul enjoys it in a greater and greater degree many people attended to hear the word to-day at widow l's the society consisted of about sixty souls who appeared to be very lively and spiritual lord's day twenty one it was a powerful time while i preached from isaiah sixty three four the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed is come brother j who was obliged to fly from portsmouth distressed by the late fire met me here on monday we were all deeply affected with a sense of our unworthiness at friend p s while i discoursed on the barren fig tree tuesday twenty three my soul was happy in god and sweetly engaged in prayer and reading several people were affected under the word at mr l s wednesday twenty four i received a letter from mr t r informing me that he had administered on brother w s will and desiring me to pay attention to his affairs in these parts and then return to philadelphia by the first of march virginia pleases me in preference to all other places where i have been but i am willing to leave it at the call of providence we were much comforted together at r j s on thursday but the thought of having my mind taken up with brother w s affairs gives me some concern i want no temporal business of any kind tuesday thirty the weather has been very cold though i have attended every place in course and both the people and myself have been frequently blessed i have been reading burnett's history of his own times and am amazed at the intrigues of courts and the treachery of men there is reason to fear the same causes produce the same effects at this time for there is no probability of peace and a great army is expected from england in the spring may the lord look upon us and help us monday february five having attended the several appointments in the way i came to s wise and met the preachers collected for the quarterly meeting 
with mutual affection and brotherly freedom we discoursed on the things of god and were all agreed after mr j had preached he and mr c administered the lord's supper there was much holy warmth of spirit in our love feast on thursday i intended to have set off for philadelphia but my horse is lame so i must patiently submit to the providence of god saturday ten went to o m s and had the pleasure of seeing and encouraging some of my friends from portsmouth monday twelve rode about forty miles to mr j s i found him a man of an agreeable spirit and had some satisfaction in conversing with him he has agreed if convenient to attend our next conference the people were much affected at white oak chapel on friday and after preaching i returned very weary to mr j s all my desire is for the lord and more of his divine nature impressed on my soul i long to be lost and swallowed up in god my soul and all its powers thine holy thine shall be all all my happy hours i consecrate to thee me to thine image now restore and i shall praise thee evermore saturday seventeen mr j went with me to captain b s and opened their new chapel with a discourse from these words in all places where i record my name i will come and bless thee i spoke at night and we found the lord with us lord's day eighteen i preached twice at petersburg the last subject was the rich man and lazarus which struck the people with great solemnity and many seemed to feel the power of god on monday there were two baptist preachers amongst the congregation after the sermon was ended they desired to speak with me so we conversed about three hours on experimental practical and controversial divinity but ended where we began i thank the lord my mind was kept in peace and coolness no doubt but satan is very active in promoting religious controversies many take a controversial spirit for the spirit of religion while others dispute away what little religion they have only by pride cometh contention the wisdom that cometh from above is pure and peaceable wednesday twenty one deep seriousness sat on the minds of the people under the preaching of friend ells and my preaching for five times together has been attended with blessed effects but let all the glory be given to god i am only as a pen in the hand of a writer my soul longs for more spirituality and to be totally dedicated to god friday twenty three i set off for philadelphia and after meeting with various occurrences heavy rains and much fatigue reached leesburg on thursday twenty nine on friday march one my soul seemed to fix again on its centre from which it had been measurably removed by a variety of difficulties and found sweet peace with god a company of lively people attended the word at t a s where i met with brother w w the attention of the audience was also much engaged on the lord's day at the courthouse while i discoursed with great affection and clearness of ideas i afterward visited a poor unhappy man imprisoned for murder but found him very ignorant though he was brought under some concern before we parted left leesburg on monday four and by the good providence of god arrived safe at baltimore on thursday but found the people greatly alarmed by the report of a man of war being near many of the inhabitants were moving out of town brother w preached in the evening thursday seven my heart mounts heavenward on wings of strong desire for more of god and the peace of god which passeth all understanding keepeth my spirit in his knowledge and love here i met with brother r and found him under some exercises of mine towards mr t r however the temptation was removed before we parted on friday the town was all in commotion it was reported that the man of war was in the river which excited the serious attention of all the inhabitants so that some were moving off while others were getting under arms alas for fallen man he fears his fellow-creatures whose breath is in their nostrils but fears not him who is able to destroy body and soul in hell if fire and sword at a small distance can so alarm us how will poor impenitent sinners be alarmed when they find by woeful experience that they must drink the wine of the wrath of god poured out without mixture 
Lord's Day 10. The congregations were but small, so great has the consternation been. But I know the Lord governeth the world. Therefore these things shall not trouble me. I will endeavor to be ready for life or death, so that if death should come, my soul may joyfully quit this land of sorrow and go to rest in the embraces of the blessed Jesus. O oh, delightful felicity! There is no den of war, no unfriendly persecutors of piety, no enchanting world with concealed destruction, no malevolent spirit to disturb our peace, but all is purity, peace, and joy. Adapting my discourse to the occasion, I preach this evening from Isaiah 1, 19 and 20. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Monday, 11. Pursued my way as far as Mr. H. Goose, and was treated with great kindness. May this family evince that all things are possible with God, though their salvation should be attended with as much apparent difficulty as the passage of a camel through the eye of a needle. If they prove faithful stewards, they will. I preached here the next day to a large congregation, amongst whom were some of my old friends from the Forks, and the Lord gave us a blessing together. Wednesday 13. Came to J.D.'s and found his pious wife under hysterical complaints and full of doubts about the state of her soul. Preached the next day at a place by the way, with holy warmth of affection to a considerable number of people. Tuesday, 19. Under the divine protection I came safe to Philadelphia, having rode about 3,000 miles since I left at last. But heaven is my object, not earth. This brings my mind and makes my burden light. The things eternal I pursue, a happiness beyond the view, of those that basely pant for things by nature felt and seen, their honors, wealth, and pleasure mean I neither have nor want. Here I met with Mr. T. R. in the spirit of love, and received a full account of what related to the unhappy Mr. D. I also received an affectionate letter from Mr. Wesley, and am truly sorry that the venerable man ever dipped into the politics of America. My desire is to live in love and peace with all men, to do them no harm, but all the good I can. However, it discovers Mr. Wesley's conscientious attachment to the government under which he lived. Had he been a subject of America, no doubt but he would have been as zealous an advocate of the American cause. But some inconsiderate persons have taken occasion to censure the Methodists in America on account of Mr. Wesley's political sentiments. Wednesday 20. By the power of God my soul is kept in the midst of all company, sweetly reposed on Jesus Christ. My desire is, with the most fervent love, to devote myself to him that died for me. Thursday, 21. A perfect calm pervaded my soul, and I found myself at full liberty, preaching from Second Corinthians 6, 2. Friday, 22. How changeable are all things here, and especially in these precarious times. But my determination is to cast all my care on the Lord and bear with patience whatsoever may occur. May the Lord make me more indifferent, both towards persons and things, and only intent on doing His will. On Saturday I visited Mrs. M., above eighty years of age, and very infirm. She is a friend to all gospel preachers, and opens her house to make them welcome. If she should at last receive the Lord into her heart, it will be well. Lord's Day 24 Brother W. preached in the morning. Mr. S. at the Episcopal Church was very severe upon the Quakers, but to little purpose. Two of their leading men, J.D. and A.B., came very kindly to see Mr. T.R. Monday, 25. I had an opportunity of speaking to J.W. relative to his leaving the work, and he manifested some inclination to return. My soul was greatly blessed in meeting Sister W.'s class and all present seemed to partake of the same blessing. The opening heavens around me shine with beams of sacred bliss. If Jesus shows his mercy mine and whispers, I am his. 
Tuesday, 26. My soul was blessed with divine serenity and consolation. May I ever be able to conduct myself with evangelical prudence and so keep under my body that I may always be the temple of God, by the Spirit that dwelleth in me. The next day also my soul enjoyed the same delightful sense of the divine favor, and was fixed on God as on its center, though in the midst of tumult. Glory to God! I can leave all the little affairs of this confused world to those men to whose province they pertain, and can comfortably go on in my proper business of instrumentally saving my own soul and those that hear me. Friday, 29. Have been graciously assisted every time I have attempted to preach this week, and found a particular blessing today in speaking at the funeral of Sister L., an old follower of Christ. Saturday, 30. I persuaded J. W. to decline his thoughts of studying and settling, and return to his circuit. We had a powerful time in prayer meeting this evening. Monday, April 1. My soul panted after God. We had a sudden and dreadful alarm of fire, which threatened a storehouse, malt house, and brew house. It was not extinguished without great difficulty, and until much damage had been done. Man can neither defend his person nor his property in many cases, and yet how unwilling to commit himself and his property in a proper manner to God. Tuesday, April 2. My mind felt some dejection, but my peace was not interrupted. Amongst others in the congregation this evening, there was a woman of ninety years of age. The next day I was much employed in reading, and severely tempted by Satan, but was kept from all injury by the power of God. Friday, 5. I heard a Moravian preach, but it was only a historical faith and this being good friday i preach from these pathetic words of christ father if it be possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not as i will but as thou wilt what mortal can form any idea of the blessed saviour's feelings at the time when his agony was so great as to express from his sinless body great drops of blood and water was it ever heard before that any man sweat blood if Jesus found the punishment due to sin to be so severe, how will poor sinners themselves bear the eternal damnation of hell? Lord's Day 7 The Lord graciously assisted me in my public exercises both morning and evening, and on Monday my soul was in a pure and spiritual state. Tuesday 9 We had a large congregation, and my heart was greatly expanded, while I discord on the cloud of witnesses from Hebrews 12, 1. The power of God was eminently displayed in the minds of several, and one in particular was struck with deep conviction. Thursday 11. My soul was all on stretch for God, both yesterday and today. I, B, came to see me and appeared to be in some distress. I prayed with him more than once, and he roared out for very anguish of spirit. Instead of being surprised that an awkward sinner should weep and cry aloud for mercy, we ought to be infinitely more surprised that an unforgiven sinner should manifest but little or no concern. If a man expected to lose all his property and be put to bodily torture, could he be unconcerned? But what is all this to the loss of God in heaven and the torture of unquenchable fire? Truly, if it were not for unbelief, we should see sinners on every side weeping and roaring aloud both day and night. Saturday, 13. Was desired to visit a prisoner under sentence of death. I found he was an Englishman, had been an old soldier, and had experienced the pardoning love of God in Ireland about twenty years ago, under Mr. B. Thus we see that although a soul has been blessed with the favor of God, yet unfaithfulness may provoke the Almighty to give up such a person to work all kinds of sin with greediness then let him that standeth take heed lest he fall on the lord's day my mind was shut up in preaching and i felt the want of more faith for philadelphia monday fifteen i am not without a comfortable sense of the favour and presence of god but labour under a lassitude of both body and mind i went to the jail to visit the prisoners again but could not obtain admittance 
Mrs. E., formerly the wife of G.T., attended our class meeting today, and my soul was much blessed amongst them. Tuesday, 16. My heart was sweetly enlarged towards God, both in my private exercises and my public preaching. A friend from New York informed us that troops were raised and entrenchments made in that city. O oh Lord, we are oppressed. Undertake for us. I received a letter from friend E. at Trenton, complaining that the societies in that circuit had been neglected by the preachers. Wednesday, 17. My soul loves God and all mankind, but I cannot please all men. However, my conscience is void of offense both towards God and towards man. On Thursday, we heard of a skirmish between Philadelphia Fleet and the Glasgow Man of War. What will be the end of these things? Lord, think upon us for good and show us mercy. Preaching this evening, the powers of my soul were at full liberty, and I trust it was made a blessing to many. Friday, 19. Satan has been thrusting at me, but by grace I am still kept, and my soul is employed in the holy and heavenly exercises with constant and delightful communion with God. Oh, how I long to find every power of soul and body one continual sacrifice to God. If so poor a worm as I, may to thy great glory live, all my actions sanctify, all my words and thoughts receive. Claim me for thy service. Claim all I have and all I am. With great warmth of affection, I went through the public exercises of the evening. On the Lord's day, my soul was given up to God, and it appeared to be a searching time in the public congregation. End of section 17. Section 18 of the Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by C. L. Whatley. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 18. Monday the 22nd. I found Christ in me the hope of glory, but felt a pleasing, painful sensation of spiritual hunger and thirst for more of God. On Tuesday, I rode to Burlington, and on the way my soul was filled with holy peace and employed in heavenly contemplations, but found to my grief that many had so imbibed a martial spirit that they had lost the spirit of pure, undefiled religion." I preached from Romans thirteen eleven, but found it was a dry and barren time, and some who once ran well now walk disorderly. On Wednesday, I rode to Trenton and found very little there but spiritual coldness and deadness, had very little liberty in preaching among them. Thus has the Lord humbled me amongst my people, but I hope through grace, to save myself and at least some that hear me. Thursday, the 25th. I rode about eleven miles and preached to a people who were but very little moved. But at I.B.'s, the next day, there was more sensibility amongst the congregation. And though very unwell, I found my heart warm and expanded in preaching to them. It is my present determination to be more faithful in speaking to all that fall in my way about spiritual and eternal matters. The people were very tender at Friend F.'s on Saturday, and on the Lord's Day I spoke feelingly and pointedly to about three hundred souls at the meeting house. Afterward, I returned through the rain to Trenton and was well rewarded in my own soul while preaching to the congregation at night. I felt every word which seemed to cut like a two-edged sword and put me in mind of some of my former visits. May the Lord revive his work amongst them again and make the time to come better than the former time. Monday the 29th. Satan beset me with powerful suggestions, striving to persuade me that I should never conquer all my spiritual enemies, but be overcome at last. 
However, the Lord was near and filled my soul with peace. Blessed Lord, be ever with me, and suffer me not to yield to the tempter, no, not for a moment. Tuesday the 30th went about nine miles to our quarterly meeting at Hopewell, and we had much of the power of God in our love feast, in which many declared their experience. I lectured in the evening at I.B.'s, though very weary, but my heart was with God, and I know we cannot tire or wear out in a better cause. On Wednesday, I rode back to Trenton, where I preached to about a hundred souls, and then went about thirty miles more to W.B.'s. Thursday, May 2nd. Some melted under the word at Mount Holly, though at first they seemed inattentive and careless. The grace of God kept my spirit this day in sweet seriousness without any mixture of sourness. Saturday the 4th. At New Mills, I found Brother W. very busy about his chapel, which is 36 feet by 28, with a gallery 15 feet deep. I preached in it from Matthew 7, 7, with fervor, but not with freedom, and returned to W.B.'s the same night. Lord's Day the 5th. I preached at New Mills again, and it was a heart-affecting season, then returned to Philadelphia, but went under a heavy gloom of mind, and found my spirit much dejected and shut up. Monday the 6th. My mind was in a dissipated frame today, and we were alarmed with the report that ships of war were then in the river. However, I was blessed in meeting a class at night. My mind was more composed and comfortable the next day, but not so spiritual and heavenly as I desire it should be. Come, Lord, from above, the mountains remove. Overturn all that hinders the course of thy love. My bosom inspire, enkindle the fire, and wrap my whole soul in the flames of desire. Preached at night from a text which corresponded with my own feelings. These are they which came out of great tribulation, etc. Wednesday the 8th. My spirit is much assaulted by Satan, but the Lord is my keeper. About ten o'clock today, tidings arrived that there had been a skirmish off Christiana between thirteen rogalies and the Roebuck man of war. That after an encounter of three or four hours, the man of war withdrew, as it was thought, much shattered. At this news, the inhabitants of the city were all in commotion, and the women especially were greatly shocked. Lord, what a world is this! Give me wisdom and patience, that I may stand still and see the salvation of God. Thursday the ninth. My mind was free, and in meeting two classes, we had much of the solemn power of God. At night, I preached from these words, which are so applicable to the circumstances of the people. We have no continuing city here. Many people seem to feel the weight of this divine truth so suitable to their present condition. Friday the 10th. My soul is in sweet peace, and I only want to fill my heart continually, flaming with pure love to God, carrying every desire and every thought towards heaven. Brother B. L. arrived here today, and we are now informed that some men were killed in the galleys, and the man of war was much damaged. Lord's Day the Twelfth Divine grace assisted and comforted me in all the exercises of the day, and although I spoke in strong and plain terms at night, yet the very soldiers bore it well. But the next day I was seized with a severe chill and was carried to my lodging very sick. I was in a heavy sweat till four o'clock the next morning, but nevertheless set out the next day, if possible, to reach the conference, and came to Chester that night. Wednesday, the 15th. I am still afflicted, but not forsaken. The Lord fills me with peace and consolation.
attempted to reach a quarterly meeting, but when I got to the place was obliged to go to bed. Though the next day week as I was, I went and held a love feast and afterward preached, and the Lord gave me strength in my inward man. Saturday the 18th. My poor frame is much afflicted and shattered, but my mind is full of divine tranquility, ardently desirous to submit to the providence of God with inflexible patience. How amazing is the goodness of God! He raiseth up the best of friends, such as love for Christ's sake, to show the kindest care for me in my affliction. Inasmuch as they have done it unto me, one of the least of his servants, they have done it unto Christ. And may he crown their kindness with an eternal reward. Was very unwell all the Lord's day, but my great desire to be at conference induced me to make an attempt on Monday to travel. But by the time I had rode three miles, I found if I traveled, it would be at the hazard of my life and was therefore obliged to decline it, though the disappointment was very great. Let it be, Lord, not as I will, but as Thou wilt. Brother W. went to a Quaker meeting and began to speak, but some of the friends desired him to sit down. Tuesday, the 21st. My disorder seemed to be broken, but I was taken with a bleeding at the nose. The devil still bends his bow and makes ready his arrows on the string, but the Lord suffers him not to wound me. Thursday, the 23rd. Visited Mrs. G., an old disciple of Mr. Whitefield's, but now she entertains the Methodists. And on the Lord's Day, I ventured to preach to a small company of people. Monday, the 27th. Expecting the preachers were on their return from the conference, I appointed preaching at my lodgings, but had to preach myself to a small, attentive, tender company, and felt much quickened in my own soul. At night, Brother R. arrived and informed me that I was appointed for Baltimore, to which I cheerfully submit, though it seems to be against my bodily health. Wednesday, the 29th. My whole soul is devoted to God and desires nothing but more of Him. Brother R. and I both spoke to the congregation collected at night, and the power of God was eminently present. On Thursday, I wrote a letter to Mrs. W., who has departed from God, and feel great hopes it may be the means of restoring her. Friday the 31st. Though far from being in a good state of health, I set off for my appointment and reached I. Dollams at night. Lord's Day, June 2nd. Went to the chapel and preached after Brother S.S., and the people appeared to be deeply affected. But Brother S. does not seem to enter into the Methodist plan of preaching. He uses a few pompous swelling words which pass for something great with short-sighted people, but are not calculated to do them much spiritual good. On Monday, my soul enjoyed the peace of God, but I am frequently ashamed before the Lord for indulging too great a flow of spirits in the company of my friends, though I purpose through grace to begin anew. Lord, succor me by thy mighty power. We had a melting time amongst the people on Monday at I.D.'s. Tuesday, the 4th. Went to the widow P.'s, and after I had done preaching, met a small class of about thirteen souls who appeared to be sincere. My body is still very weak, but it is my determination to spend all the little remains of my strength for God and the salvation of precious souls. Wednesday the 5th. Some felt the word of truth at the widow bees while I was showing what it is to walk after the flesh, but there appears to be a general flatness amongst the members of the class. They are neither so attentive nor so tender as they were two years ago. 
What a pity that the nearer souls approach to eternity, the more unfit they should be to enter into that unchangeable place. Help me to watch and pray, and on thyself rely. Assured, if I my trust betray, I shall forever die. Satan hunts my soul continually and attacks me at times with the most powerful temptations, but he does not get any advantage nor break my peace, but on the contrary drives me nearer to my almighty protector, and I feel all my powers more abundantly given up to God to serve him with all sincerity, fervency, and diligence. Thursday the 6th was greatly blessed in meditation and prayer on my way to Mr. Harry Goes, and there met with my good friend, Mr. Philip Rogers, and his wife. The next day, my spirit was in heaviness through manifold temptations. I see the need of always standing, sword in hand, against my adversary, the devil. Our Lord displayed both great wisdom and great mercy when he commanded us to watch and pray always. May I show mercy on my own soul by always attending to this command. Lord's Day, the Ninth Yesterday I preached with some satisfaction at Mr. Giles's, and rode today about twelve miles to the Forks, where I preached from Colossians one twenty-eight, and then met part of several classes— my feeble body was much fatigued with the exercises of the day, but my soul was delightfully taken up with God. On Monday, the congregation at A.G.'s appeared as if they both understood and felt the two-edged sword of the word. I see the need of having my thoughts constantly employed on the things of God that no vacant moment may be left for Satan to fill up. Tuesday the 11th, rose with a deep sense of God resting on my mind, and set off for Mr. L's, which is about twenty miles from the house where I lodged. But by losing our way, we made it about thirty miles, and did not reach the place till about two o'clock. The Lord then rewarded me for my toil, while I was preaching to a serious tender people, and I afterward endeavored to unite the society which Satan by his diabolical wiles had divided. On Wednesday, the congregation at Io's were so impenetrable that neither promises nor threats could move them. Nor did the people at Mr. W.'s seem to have much more sensibility, though I was greatly affected myself while preaching to them from Second Corinthians 6, 2. The Lord has blessed me of late with much assistance in preaching and with purity of heart. Thursday the 13th. Both the people and myself were moved by the word at J.C.'s. My feeble frame is much fatigued with preaching twice a day, but it must drag on as long as it can, for it is my meat and drink, yea, it is the life of my soul to be laboring for the salvation of mankind. I desire nothing but God, and to spend the remainder of my strength in suffering and laboring for Him." Who that knows God would be weary of such a master? And who that knows the worth of souls would be weary of striving to save them? Saturday the 15th After preaching in the Dutch church and meeting the class, I rode about five miles through a heavy rain, and the wind was so powerful that it blew down trees, barns, and houses so that it was with difficulty I could urge my way through the woods, but at length came safe to the widow M's and enjoyed a comfortable hour in preaching from Luke fourteen eighteen and 19. On my coming to Baltimore, I met Mr. T. R. and heard him preach. On Monday, I rode to W.R.'s, where we had a large company of people, and amongst the rest were two Baptist preachers. All this day my soul was happy in God. Tuesday, 
the eighteenth. Though temptations hung upon my spirit, yet I found myself greatly enlarged at Mr. E.'s while enforcing these striking words. The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, watching unto prayer. Returned on Wednesday to Baltimore and spent some time with Mr. Otterbein. There are very few with whom I can find so much unity and freedom in conversation as with him. At night, the words were a blessing to myself and no doubt to others while I expatiated on Second Corinthians 4, 5. I can rejoice in God and cast all my care upon him. Thursday, the 20th. Went to Nathan Perrig's and was fined five pounds for preaching the gospel, but found my soul at liberty both in preaching and class meeting. We then went to W.L.'s and found N.L. under uncommon exercises of mind. Saturday, the 22nd. Returned to Baltimore, and although my peace is not broken, neither is any wrong temper or desire indulged, yet I lament the want of more spirituality. My soul, like the rising flame, would continually ascend to God. Lord's Day, the 23rd. After preaching at the point, I met the class and then met the black people, some of whose unhappy masters forbid their coming for religious instruction. How will the sons of oppression answer for their conduct when the great proprietor of all shall call them to an account? We had a serious audience in the evening at town. Monday, the 24th spoke plainly on the nature of our society and the necessity of discipline, which perhaps was not very pleasing to some who do not choose to join. I told them we could not, would not, and durst not allow any the privileges of members who would not come under the discipline of the society. I desire to know no man after the flesh. My soul is in peace. Tuesday, the 25th. I.F., who has lately come from Virginia, gave me an agreeable account of the glorious spreading of the work of God in Virginia and North Carolina. The Lord is fulfilling His promises and pouring out His Holy Spirit on the people. Satan is still busy in his attempts to disturb if he cannot destroy me, but my soul stays and waits and hangs on God, who makes me more than conqueror over all the assaults of the enemy. I preach today at the house of blank, a man who has much talk and but little religion. The whole congregation appeared to be very stupid. Rode thence to K's and found a simple-hearted people. Here I met with poor M, who is keeping a school, which may perhaps be his last and best shift. Wednesday, the 26th. This was a general fast day, and my heart was fixed on God. I preached at three o'clock at Mr. S.'s, and the power of God was displayed among the poor part of the congregation. I.F. then met the class like another G.S. Thursday, the 27th. This was a day of trials. Satan drew my thoughts into a train of reasoning on subjects which were out of my reach, for secret things belong to God, but things which are revealed belong to us and our children. Thus, while I was soaring out of the region of my duty, I became inattentive to what immediately concerned me, and oversetting my chaise broke it very much. Though blessed be God, my body was preserved. May the Lord keep my soul united to himself as its proper center. However, I was greatly blessed in speaking to the people, and the power of God rested on the congregation. Friday, the 28th. Going to my appointment, it rained much, and I got wet, which brought on a sore throat, and laid me up till July 9th. For the greatest part of the time, I could neither eat 
drink nor sleep till the tumor broke. But glory to God, I possessed my soul in patience under the whole of the affliction, though my heart complains of its own ingratitude to my gracious Lord, who not only supported both soul and body under all my trouble, but provided tender friends who treated me with the greatest affection. As a kind father dealeth with an afflicted son, so the Lord dealeth with me. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? I will render thanksgiving and praise and devote both body and soul to the Most High. During this affliction, my abode was at Mr. G's. I have now come to a determination, God willing, to go to the warm springs and make a trial of them for the recovery of my health. Perhaps my strength may be thereby so restored for future services that upon the whole there may be no loss of time. R. W., W. L., and I. F., will supply the circuit in the meantime. Thursday, July 11th. My body is in some small measure restored, and God himself is the portion of my soul. May he ever keep me from every desire which does not directly or indirectly lead to himself. Saturday, the 13th. My heart has been humbled and melted under a sense of the goodness of God. This day, I set out for Baltimore on my way to the springs, but by the time I reached the town, I felt a great disposition to weariness in my shattered frame and my soul, which seemed to sympathize with the body, had not such a lively and steady sense of God as at other times, though there was no desire after anything else. I ventured to preach both this evening and the next day, and humbly hope the word was made a blessing to many. Monday, the 15th. We set off for the springs. Mr. D. overtook us in the evening, and that no opportunity might be lost, I lectured at night in the tavern where we lodged, and both the tavern keeper and his wife appeared to have some thoughts about their souls. On Tuesday, we reached Frederick, and collecting as many people as we could by a short notice, I preached from Second Corinthians 6, 2, and found my spirit at liberty. My body complains of so much traveling, for which it is almost incompetent. But the Spirit of the Lord is the support and comfort of my soul. I was thrown out of my chaise the next day, but was providentially kept from being much hurt. When we came to Hagerstown, it seemed as if Satan was the chief ruler there. The people were very busy in drinking, swearing, drumming, etc. My mind was disburdened and much comforted after I had delivered myself from Mark one sixteen, though it seemed to answer but little purpose to the people. It is one thing for the preacher to do his duty, and another thing for the audience to do theirs. Thursday the 18th. After riding 40 miles today, we reached the Springs. And at first we found it difficult to obtain lodgings, but after a while I procured a good lodging with Mr. M. Here was work enough for a preacher, if he desired to be faithful. My soul was happy, and I felt myself totally delivered from the fear of man, determined by the grace of God to discharge my duty. Friday the 19th. My soul was in peace, but the burden of the Lord rested upon me. I could not be satisfied till I declared to the people their danger and duty, which I did from Isaiah 55, 6, and 7. They all behaved with decency, though it is more than probable that some of them had enough of my preaching. Saturday the 20th. We had a meeting in the evening which we intend to have every evening at Mr. Goh's and Mr. Merriman's alternately, for prayer and exhortation, 
at which about twenty people attended, my spirit was grieved within me at the conduct of poor sinners, but in Jesus my Lord I had peace. Lord's Day, the 21st. A church minister attended the public exhortation in the morning, and in the afternoon a dissenting minister preached from these excellent words, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. His discourse was very methodical, but dry and full of academic stiffness. It is very unlikely to bring souls either to faith or repentance. I preached in the evening from Acts 13.26, but my spirit was so stirred up within me by a desire that the people who were in their houses might hear that by speaking too loud, I hurt myself. We afterward had a good time in our prayer meeting. End of section 18 Recording by C. L. Whatley Section 19 of the Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by C. Whatley. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 19. Monday the 22nd. My soul enjoys sweet communion with God. But I am obliged to exercise patience in bearing with the manners of poor, blinded, hardened sinners. Oh, might they at last with sorrow return, the pleasure to taste for which they were born. Our Jesus receiving our happiness prove the joy of believing the heaven of love. Tuesday the 23rd. The peace of God abideth constantly with me. I preached again by the side of a hill near the bath, and the word had a melting influence on some of the congregation. The dissenting minister attended our prayer meeting in the evening and prayed with us. By the blessing of God, my body began to feel the benefit of the waters. May the Lord bless these means for the entire restoration of my health, and in all my ways may I acknowledge Him and ever study to serve Him with all I have and all I am. Reading the lives of Halliburton, Walsh, and Durante has had a great tendency to quicken my soul. Our not growing in grace is seldom for the want of knowledge concerning our duty, but generally for want of using proper means to bring the knowledge we have into spiritual use. Our dull spirits must have line upon line and precept upon precept. Wednesday the 24th. The congregation was rather increased. Many were affected, and one man fell down. It clearly appears that I am in the line of my duty in attending the springs. There is a manifest check to the overflowing tide of immorality, and the prejudices of many people are in a great degree removed, so that I hope my visit to this place will be for the benefit of the soul's of some, as well as for the benefit of my own body, though preaching in the open air to a people who are almost strangers to a praying spirit is more disagreeable to my feelings and a much greater cross than traveling and preaching in a circuit. Friday the 26th. My confidence was strong in the Lord and accompanied with sweet consolation. My company and myself were quickened in our own souls by a diligent use of the means, and the hearts of several others were under some religious impressions. But the zealous conversation and prayers of Mr. Go seemed to move and melt the hearts of the people more than my preaching does. Lord, send by whom thou wilt, only send to the conviction and salvation of immortal souls. I have found both reproof and instruction in reading the life of Mr. Walsh. At this time, Christ is all in all to me. My heart is sweetly occupied by his gracious spirit. But alas, I am not watchful enough to keep up the spirit of prayer. The praying spirit breathe, the watching power impart. From 
all entangled that's beneath, call off my peaceful heart. Saturday the 27th. There were many to hear the word at three o'clock, and the Lord was with us in the evening when we were assembled for prayer and exhortation. Lord's Day the 28th. My soul is kept in the love of God, but longs for an increase of the divine gift. The workers of iniquity are not so bold as they were. Some of them have had convictions, but lost them. Others seem stiffly to oppose the influences of divine grace. Mr. H., who is commonly called the high priest on account of his height, preached today, and I stood clerk for him. But he seemed much dashed, and it was with difficulty he proceeded in his discourse, which was very dry. While I was preaching, my heart was drawn out in compassion to the people, and as the word was pointedly applied to their consciences, I believe some good was done. So much public speaking is almost more than my frame can at present bear, but the spirit within me constraineth me. I feel indeed the want of retirement in this place, yet I make a substitute of family exercises and find communion with God. My soul has lately been much drawn out towards God in reading the life of Mr. Brainerd and longs to be like him and every other faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Monday, the 29th. My present mode of conduct is as follows to read about a hundred pages a day, usually to pray in public five times a day, to preach in the open air every other day, and to lecture in prayer meeting every evening. And if it were in my power, I would do a thousand times as much for such a gracious and blessed master. But in the midst of all my little employments, I feel myself as nothing, and Christ to me is all in all. Tuesday the 30th. My spirit was grieved to see so little of the fear of God and such a contempt of sacred things as appeared in many of the people in this place. An enmity against God and his ways reigns in the hearts of all the unawakened from the highest to the lowest. The Reverend Mr. W. attended in the congregation to hear the word preached today. Wednesday the 31st spent some time in the woods alone with God, and found it a peculiar time of love and joy. Oh, delightful employment! All my soul was centered in God. The next day I unexpectedly met Brother W., and while preaching at three o'clock to an increased company, the word produced great seriousness and attention, and we had a happy, powerful meeting in the evening at Mr. G.'s. But my mind is in some degree disturbed by the reports of battles and slaughters. It seems the Cherokee Indians have also begun to break out, and the English ships have been coasting to and fro, watching for some advantages. But what can they expect to accomplish without an army of two or three hundred thousand men? And even then there would be but little prospect of their success. Oh, that this dispensation might answer its proper end, that the people would fear the Lord and sincerely devote themselves to his service. Then, no doubt, wars and bloodshed would cease. Friday, August 2nd. My soul was in a serious, solemn frame, but earnestly desired to be more universally devoted to God. Brother W. preached today and seemed a little abashed but the Lord was with us in our evening exercises. How difficult it is to be much amongst men of the world and not imbibe their spirit in a greater or less degree. I am afraid my friends begin to grow somewhat languid in their spirits. How watchful, devout, and heavenly should we be to keep up the power of inward religion in the midst of such a company of sinners of diverse principles and manners. For my own part, I have had cause to lament the want of more watchfulness. Lord, help us to be faithful in all things, to all persons, and in all places. Lord's Day, the fourth. My heart was fixed, trusting in the Lord. Brother W. preached much to the purpose, though there were some little inaccuracies in his language. I preached in the afternoon, and Brother W. again at night and it appeared to be a time of power. 
Monday the 5th. Having withdrawn to the woods for the purpose of self-examination and pouring out my heart in prayer to God, I found myself much melted. Glory to God for a comfortable sense of the divine favor. But alas, how serious, how solemn should I be when so many immortal souls on every side are posting down to everlasting fire. On Tuesday, but few of the gentlemen attended to hear, but I was enabled to deliver my message faithfully and freely, and the common people heard me gladly. The next day also many attended, and I hope my labor will not be altogether in vain. Thursday the 8th. My heart was sweetly resigned to the will of my Lord. I was willing to do or suffer whatsoever he might see proper to require of me. Met with a man today who came from a place about eighteen miles from the springs. He never heard a Methodist before, nor saw one, yet he appeared to be a Methodist in principle, experience, and practice. He was brought to the knowledge of himself and of God by the means of sore afflictions of body, prayer, and reading. Thus we see the Lord works where and in what manner he pleases. My spirit has been much united to the faithful people of God of every denomination, and at this time I felt a spirit of unity with Mr. H., a German minister, though the Germans in general who dwell in these parts seem very insensible to the things of God. On Thursday night we had a mixed company of Germans and English. Mr. H. preached in German and I in English. Our exercises in the evening were as usual. Many have been much affected lately under the word which I have delivered from time to time for God. Lord's Day, the 11th. A fine, sensible, polite gentleman delivered a discourse on the new birth. He described it by its effects, but appeared to be at a total loss in the respect to the manner in which it is wrought. I had spoken in the morning, and in the evening preached again, pressing religion on the young people especially, and showing the superior advantages and satisfaction arising from it even in this life. Monday the 12th. I rode seventeen miles to see a saint indeed, a woman confined to her bed for fifteen years and quite happy in the love of God, though she had never seen a Methodist or any other truly religious people. Where are the freethinkers? Is this priestcraft? How can that be priestcraft which no priest ever had a hand in? No. This is the effect of divine power and goodness, and so is all real heartfelt religion. But if poor, impenitent sinners will not give all diligence to know the comfort of enjoying religion, they will, they must, though much against their will, know in due time the misery of rejecting it. After I had preached with some divine assistance to about one hundred people collected from the country parts around, we returned and had a comfortable time in our evening meeting. The house in which we live at the springs is not the most agreeable. The size of it is twenty feet by sixteen, and there are seven beds and sixteen persons therein, and some noisy children. So I dwell amongst briars and thorns, but my soul is in peace. Tuesday the 13th I found the parson had been encouraging the gentleman to oppose me, and intimating that it was very improper to permit me to preach. My soul is amongst lions, but the God of Daniel is with me. I attempted to preach in the day, but my mind was shut up, though my spirit was revived in the evening lecture. Is it strange to see a priest conducting a persecution against the people of God? When did a persecution take place in which men of that character had no hand? But although Satan may be permitted to transform himself into an angel of light for a season, yet he will not always have his own way in this matter. Thursday the 15th. My throat grew worse, and it was a rainy day, so I was obliged to be dumb. But having faithfully declared to them from time to time the whole counsel of God, 
both in his promises and threatenings, I felt myself contented as having delivered my own soul. Friday the 16th. My throat growing worse, they put a blister behind my ear, but my conscience was pure, and I quietly submitted to the will of heaven. May the Lord keep me pure in heart and humble at his feet, till he shall make up his jewels and bring them into his glorious presence, where sorrow and sighing shall be done away. Glory to God, nothing has lately broken the peace of my tranquil breast. Lord's Day, the 18th. Found myself better and felt the desire to preach, which I did, after having heard Parson W., and found myself at liberty while showing, one, the natural state of the Gentile world, two, their spiritual state, three, the means and manner of their change, and lastly, I applied it to the Christian world, so called, heathens in their hearts and practices, and showed how vain it is to substitute heathen morality or religious forms and ceremonies for true religion. My friend, Mr. B. and his wife from Portsmouth arrived here today. Thursday the 22nd. My soul has been daily grieved by the practices of poor blinded sinners, but the Lord has supported and comforted me. I have not spared but preached plainly and pointedly every day this week, and today Mr. S., a German minister, went with me about nine miles to a German settlement where we both preached in our proper tongues. Friday the 23rd. I had some serious conversation with the Quaker on the subject of the Holy Scriptures as the grand criterion of all inward and outward religion, but to deny this is to oppose the present dictates of the Holy Ghost to its former dictates, which would be a most dangerous absurdity. How strange, how presumptuous to exalt the dignity of modern speakers beyond that of the prophets and apostles, who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and have given us a sure word of prophecy, whereunto we do well that we take heed. Second Peter 1.19 but we must come to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8.20 We are sure that the sacred scriptures are of God, and we are as sure if any man speak contrary to them, he is not of God. Lord's Day, the 25th I have had strong confidence towards God but my heart has not been so constantly and fervently employed in the spirit of prayer as it might have been. After preaching today, I fell in with one of the wildest antinomians I had ever met with. He undertook to prove that love is not love, and said, They that are born of God do not sin, but that they may sin in all manner of ways and frequently do so. But what was the most surprising, he said, he valued not my God in Christ, for they could neither save nor damn him. Such language is enough to make a man shudder in repeating it. Tuesday the 27th. Having taken my leave yesterday, in discoursing on the parable of the sower, I this day turned my back on the springs as the best and the worst place that I ever was in good for health, but most injurious to religion. We then rode about twenty-five miles and called to see friend R., but had to lodge on the boards. The next day a minister attended to hear the word at Dr. C.'s and gave us a kind invitation to his lodging. Saturday the 31st. I met Brother L. and Brother F. at Mr. G.'s. Thus hath the Lord preserved me, through various trials, and his providence hath conducted me back in safety. I enjoy more health and perhaps possess more grace than before I went to the springs. Now, O Lord, only make and keep me pure, and let me be holy and only thine. My soul was enlarged in preaching today, and many were melted under the word. I strove to prevail with Brother F. to go to Baltimore, but could not. Lord's Day, September 1st. 
I rode to Gunpowder Neck and preached twice. My soul was exceedingly happy in God, both in preaching and meeting the class, as it also was the next day at I.D.'s, but alas, we hear of bloodshed and slaughter. Many immortal souls are driven to eternity by the bloody sword. This is a grief to my soul. Lord, scatter them that delight in war and thirst for human blood. It is well for the righteous that this is not their home. No, they are blessed with a pacific spirit and are bound for a kingdom of peace where no horrid alarum of war shall break our eternal repose. No sound of the trumpet is there where Jesus' spirit o'erflows, appeased by the charms of thy grace, we all shall in amity join, and kindly each other embrace, and love with a passion like thine. FRIDAY THE SIXTH Having been much fatigued by long rides, and preaching and meeting classes every day, though for the most part both the people and myself were much quickened, I came today to my old and faithful friends, H.W., and the people felt the two-edged sword of the word. Glory to God! I find a constant sense of His divine love, though still blame myself for being too free in conversation when amongst my friends. Lord's Day, the 8th. The congregation at Bush Forest Preaching House appeared to be very insensible, and it seemed as if they had opposed the truth so long that they could feel it no more. But at Deer Creek, my heart was warm and the people were moved. On Monday, I also preached twice, but on Tuesday, it seemed as if my labor was too much for my strength. I have scarce had time to enter a few lines in my journal, but have been almost constantly employed in writing from place to place and speaking to the people. Wednesday the 11th. The people were serious at WB's. Here I saw the son of the famous Dr. F., but how unlike his father, both in respect to grace and good sense. My soul now hangs on the Lord and dwells in the element of purity, desirous of nothing but to enjoy more of God and to be entirely dedicated to His service. On Thursday, I found a loving, simple people at TB's and was comforted in meeting the class, though I had been undesignedly led to reach beyond their capacity in my preaching. Friday the 13th. I came to Mr. G's and met with Brother I. M. from New York, who brought painful accounts of bloodshed and slaughter. On Saturday, I felt unwell and was apprehensive that my return to Baltimore might bring on my old complaints. We had a large company and a refreshing season at Mr. G's, where Brother F. exhorted after I had preached. Monday the 16th. This was an abasing season. My soul was cast down and deeply humbled under a consciousness of my spiritual wants. I did not enjoy such a cheerful sense of the divine goodness as at other times, but ardently panted for more of the Spirit of Christ. Tuesday the 17th Both rich and poor came out to hear the word at Elk Ridge, and some of the young and gay were made to weep. It will be well for them if they prefer Jesus Christ and His cross to all the wealth and vanity of this world. I went home with Caleb Dorsey, who was once convinced of sin, but has now grown worse than ever. He had about forty souls in his family, untaught as the Indians in the forest. They seem to roll in plenty, but there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. At Mr. R.'s on Wednesday, we had but a few to hear, but many or few, it makes no difference with me. The Lord filled me with divine consolation while I was dispensing the word of life to them. Friday the 20th. Returned to Baltimore and found that a work which had cost some thousands of pounds was burnt down. How easily can divine providence strip us of all our earthly objects. Are not such occurrences loud calls from a gracious God? 
Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I have been much enlarged in preaching and favored with peculiar nearness to God at certain times for this week past, but have been also sorely tempted by the enemy and found it required great exertions of faith and prayer to conquer every motion. Glory to God for His grace bestowed on me through Jesus Christ. We have now several exhorters raised up in different parts of the country. This evening, Mr. R. A. came to town. Lord's Day, the 22nd. My labor was great. I preached twice and met the white people and the black people separately at the point, and after preaching in town met a class. All this I could submit to with cheerfulness, but my spirit was grieved for the want of more holiness and more of God. O oh, grant that nothing in my soul may dwell but thy pure love alone. O oh, may thy love possess me whole, my joy, my treasure, and my crown. Strange flames far from my heart remove, my every act, word, thought be love. Monday the 23rd. My soul has been much harassed by Satan, though I found great freedom in preaching to a number of souls at the point. On Tuesday, also, my spiritual exercises were great and painful. Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. Rode to Mr. E's and found the accuser of the brethren had taken advantage of the society by tempting them one against another. But most of them and the congregation seemed to feel the power of the word preached. Wednesday, the 25th. Though unwell, I returned to town, preached to a large and serious congregation, and endeavored to secure, in a proper manner, our little building at the point. Having preached at NPs on Thursday, I found W.L. very sick on Friday, but the small company which was collected for worship were deeply affected under the word. And blessed be my all-sufficient deliverer, my soul was in a great measure disburdened of its temptations and restored to delightful access to God, especially in the exercise of prayer. O oh my God, keep me always near to Thee, always humble and watchful. Saturday the 28th. At Mr. G's, I met the preachers I.M. and T.F., and we had a great melting in public worship. My own soul also partook of the blessing. End of section 19. Recording by C. Watley. Section 20 of the Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by C. Whatley. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 20. Lord's Day, the 29th. There were five or six hundred people at the forks to whom I discoursed on the judgments of God, and showed who are the provoking cause, not religious people, as the ignorant say, but those who transgress the laws of God in defiance of his justice. Thus it was with the antediluvians, with the Egyptians, with the apostate Israelites in the wilderness, with the inhabitants of Jerusalem after the coming of Christ, and thus it is with us. After preaching, we held a love feast, and the power of God was present with us. Then went to Mr. G. Wise and preached to a large company there, after which I went home with Mr. C., but found that my labor was too much for my strength and had brought on a fever. Monday the 30th rode nine miles, and preached at Mr. M.'s, then six miles farther, and preached and met the society at Mr. G. R.'s, and the Lord was with us. I now find myself better both in body and mind, and know the truth of our Lord's words 
My grace is sufficient for thee. Friday, October 4th. Having traveled through the barrens and preached at several places, I came to Brother C's and met with W.L., and after preaching in a cold, open house, I rode to Mr. R.'s and was happy in the company of my good friends. On Saturday, I lodged at the house of N.J., a happy, simple soul, the glory of his family. Lord's Day, the 6th. We had a great meeting at the Widow M's. I preached at eleven o'clock to six or seven hundred souls, and then we held a love feast in which many spoke of the goodness of God. We had five or six preachers and exhorters, so we also held a watch night from six o'clock till ten. And then I felt as if it would have been no burden to have tarried in religious exercises all the night. The next evening, likewise, we had a very solemn watch night at W.R.'s. Wednesday, the 9th. Having received a letter from Mrs. M. of Middle River Neck requesting me to go and preach a funeral sermon at the burial of her sister, I set out this morning in compliance with her request. We found it a serious, awful season, and after all was over, she offered me some money. But being in a place where I could receive my six pounds per quarter, which was sufficient for keeping me in clothes and a horse, I thankfully refused to take it. She was capable of making an excellent, useful Christian, and appeared to be under religious impressions. Thursday the 10th. At the head of the river, I found a few poor, cold-hearted, contentious people. But in the time of my preaching from Galatians 5, 24, 25, most of them seemed much affected. Saturday, the 12th. At Mr. G's, I met Brother R. N., who was just recovering from a late illness. And the next day, we rode in company to the point where he preached a very profitable sermon, and the Lord applied the words to the hearts of the people while I preached at night in town. Monday, the 14th. My soul enjoyed the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Mr. R. went with me to T. W.'s, and as he was unwell, it fell on me to preach. I was greatly drawn out in my affections and ideas, and it was a tender, melting time. On Tuesday, I preached with holy warmth at Mr. S.'s, though I had caught a cold and found myself much indisposed. Wednesday, the 16th. Met with Brother W. E., and as I found myself unwell, I requested him to take my place for a day, but could not prevail. So I patiently submitted to go on and think hard of nothing that may occur. If Jesus Christ suffered so much in purchasing salvation for men, we may be willing to suffer a little in carrying the glad tidings amongst them. Friday the 18th. My body continued unwell, and my labor has been tiresome to the flesh. But my soul has been much blessed with an uninterrupted peace and sweet communion with God. This is the time for suffering and toil, but a rest remaineth for the people of God. And what are all my sufferings here? If, Lord, thou countest me meet, with thy enraptured host to appear and worship at thy feet." I went to the point and delivered my message to the congregation with much freedom. But the next day, my spirit was grieved to find that the love of some was waxing cold. When Christ cometh, will he find faith on the earth? What an ungrateful creature is man to taste and see that the Lord is good and then turn again to folly. Lord's Day, the 20th. My spirit was much refreshed in preaching and meeting the little flock at the point. And while I was preaching with peculiar sympathy in town, a poor sinner was so affected that he groaned as in an agony. If sinners could know as much of hell as the damned do, they would both groan and roar aloud. 
It is the blindness of their minds that keeps them so easy. On Monday, W. L. I. F. Brother S. and myself held a watch night at the point, and my soul was much quickened, though many of the people appeared to be dull. Thursday, the 24th. At the funeral of Mr. T.'s son, I preached to about a thousand souls and gave him such a character as I thought he deserved. Some were affected, but the funeral parade engaged the attention of too many. I spent about three hours in the different exercises suitable to the occasion, found myself pure from the blood of the people, and took nothing from my services. Friday, the 25th. Being a day of rest from public exercises, I spent it in prayer, meditation, and reading, partly in Whitby's notes and partly in the life of Salon, the Athenian philosopher. Saturday, the 26th. Meeting with two of the preachers, we took sweet counsel together. And after I had preached the next day at Gunpowder Neck, we held a love feast. There was a great melting among the people, which I hope will be the first fruits of a gracious harvest. Monday, the 28th. The people were too destitute of spiritual life at Mr. D's. But I found some faithful, lively souls the next day at Susquehanna. Saturday, November 2nd. For a few days past, I have been variously exercised in preaching at different places. Some congregations were warm and earnest in religion. Others were dull and seemed to have but little relish for divine things. Today, I came home to H.W.'s, and except the time employed in public and private exercises, I was taken up in reading Whitby's comments. He is steady to his purpose in confuting Sassinianism and Calvinism. Lord's Day, the third. Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. I know they that wait upon him shall renew their strength. He hath drawn me by the cords of his love, and blessed me with sweet communion. In preaching and meeting class at Deer Creek, I felt so much of the worth of immortal souls more than usual, that I seemed as one awaking out of sleep. Tuesday the 5th. My spiritual trials have been heavy, but the Lord supported and gave me peace. Lord, sanctify me wholly and keep me in the dust. Thursday the 7th. Have read Whitby's first volume as far as the end of the Acts. I preached and met class today at T.B.'s. And the next day at the Forks, I found a people that walk closely with God. Leaving them for the present, I went to meet Mr. R. N., who was then recovered from his illness. On the Lord's Day, we were employed in public exercises at the Widow B.'s. On Monday, we had a heart-affecting time in prayer meeting at Deer Creek. And Tuesday the 12th, we held our quarterly meeting. We had a very solemn time at the love feast in which many spoke freely and feelingly of what God had done for their souls. After the preaching was ended and the temporal business all settled, we then laid a plan for regulating the public exercises of the local preachers and concluded the whole in much love and good order. But these public times interrupt my private devotions and communion with God. It would be very disagreeable to live so always. One of the preachers brought an account of an apparition that appeared to a lad and gave a particular account of being murdered by his fellow soldier, requesting that the lad's father might lodge an information against the murderer, which was done. I was informed that the American and English armies were cannonading within a mile of each other near New Rochelle. How much better it would be for mankind to seek peace and pursue it. Wednesday the 13th was spent comfortably in company with the preachers. We had a public meeting in which we all prayed and exhorted, and the Lord gave us his blessing, 
Brother K and I spent Thursday at Mr. G's, and on Friday I went to Baltimore. Saturday, the 16th. The Spirit of the Lord applied the word to the hearts of the people while I preached in town with much animation. Lord's Day, the 17th. It was difficult to reach the hearts of the congregation at the point, but we had great satisfaction in the class meeting. Though my body was weak and there were symptoms of a fever, yet I was enabled to preach with spiritual life and power at night in the town. Monday, the 18th. My body was disordered, and my spirit sensibly felt the burden of the flesh, but under all my weakness and pains, my soul was exceedingly happy in God. On Tuesday, I was still unwell and took a vomit. By Thursday, I had got clear of my fevers, and on Friday met the preachers W.W., W.L., and C.P., but my throat was now sore and my mind a little uneasy on account of the disappointment in the circuit. Lord's Day, the 24th. I felt unwell, but went to the point in the morning where my mind was interrupted by the frequent coming of the people almost to the very end of the sermon. After the preaching was over, I told them that I had rather they would stay at home than come in such an irregular manner. The congregation were very serious in the evening at town, but I felt much exhausted. Monday, the 25th. My soul was calm and comfortable. I have applied myself much to reading Whitby, but he has so much to say about different men's opinions that it makes the labor of reading him too dry and tedious. Now I began to read the Christian library. On Tuesday, intended to go to Mr. T's, but as there was a heavy rain, I thought it unsafe to venture so soon after my recovery. My soul has had complete victory over all sin and been blessed with peaceable and calm fellowship with the Father and the Son. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gifts. Wednesday, the 27th. I went to Mr. R.'s, where we held a watch night. My ideas were much contracted in preaching, but we had several exhorters present, and they all spoke. A great part of what they said was very simple, though well-intended, no doubt. The society were greatly melted at Mr. P.'s on Thursday, and on Friday I went to a place of W.M.'s cultivation and I found a society of about thirty serious, steady people. Saturday, the 30th. Returning to Baltimore, I preached from Romans 8, 38, 39. The congregation was small, but there was power in the word. It was now reported that the British troops were on their march to Philadelphia. Troubles may be at hand. But my design is, through grace, so to improve my time as to be always prepared for the worst. Poor sinners have cause to tremble at the approach of death, but even in that dreaded hour the righteous can rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Lord's Day, December 1st. Preached as usual at both town and point but some of the people seem destitute of spiritual feelings. There is no small danger of their being given up to hardness of heart. If the word preached does not prove the savor of life unto life, it will prove the savor of death unto death, so that people may hear the word of God and resist the operations of his spirit till they and their seats have an equal degree of spiritual sensibility when the word of God is preached. Monday the 2nd. In reading Whitby on 1 Corinthians 4, 4, I observe these words. Here also note in St. Paul another sense of justification, as it relates to our absolution from condemnation and our approbation as righteous at the last day, which will be, saith he, according to our works. Second Corinthians 5, 10, 
and our fidelity and execution of the trusts committed to us, verse 2. We are commanded to follow Jesus Christ, and he, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. So it is our duty to follow the example of Moses, who had respect unto the recompense of reward, Hence it appears we are justified by the merits of Christ through faith in the day of conversion and by the evidence of works in the day of judgment. Happy is the Christian who abounds with them. Tuesday the 3rd I was informed that proposals were in agitation for settling Mr. S. E. and allowing him a maintenance. But none of these things shall give me much distress. My soul quietly resteth in the Lord. I have some desire to know the issue of what relates to Philadelphia at this critical juncture. But there is a God who overruleth all these matters. Thursday the 5th My soul was much enlarged today in preaching at N.P.'s. I afterward went in company with Mr. O to Brother L's, and on Friday, N. P., W. M., and myself held a watch night. Saturday, I returned to Baltimore in a spiritual frame of mind and preached from John eight twelve, He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. Lord's Day, the 8th. My present practice is to set apart about three hours out of every twenty-four for private prayer, but Satan labors much to interrupt me. Nevertheless, my soul enjoys a sweet and peaceful nearness to God for the most part in these duties. I found some at the point mourning for an interest in Jesus Christ. May the Lord whom they seek come suddenly into the temple of their disconsolate hearts. Monday the ninth. My ideas were clear and my heart was warm. While I was treating on the regal dignity of Christ, the nature of his government, and the privileges of his subjects. Tuesday the tenth. With the snow full in my face, I set out for Mr. T's. The flesh was reluctant for a while, but was brought to submit. When the mind is reconciled to duties and difficulties, then that which was hard becomes easy. Thursday the 12th I was greatly assisted and blessed in my own soul while preaching about two hours at a watch night at Mr. Peace. We have many alarming accounts of martial preparations, but I leave the troubles of tomorrow till tomorrow comes. My desire is to live more to God today than yesterday, and to be more holy this hour than the last. Lord's Day, the 15th. The troubles of the time seem so to engross the attention of the people that the congregation were very dull while I preached at night in Baltimore from Micah 6, 9. The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? It seems Mr. R. N. is going to New York. Thursday the 19th Received a narrative of the work of God in Virginia written by Mr. J. to be sent to Mr. Wesley. The Lord has been displaying the power of His grace in a marvelous manner through many parts of Virginia. An extract of the narrative is here subjoined. End of section 20 Recording by C. Whatley End of the Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1
in a letter to a friend. Dear Sir, You were pleased when in Virginia to desire a narrative of the work of God in these parts. I shall give you matter-of-fact in a plain, artless dress, relating only what I have myself seen and heard, and what I have received from men on whose judgment and veracity I can fully depend. That you may have a full view of the whole, I shall go back as far as my first settlements in this parish. August ninth, 1763, I was chosen rector of B. in the county of D. in Virginia. Ignorance of the things of God, profaneness, and irreligion then prevailed among all ranks and degrees, so that I doubt if even the form of godliness was to be found in any one family of this large and populous parish. I was a stranger to the people. My doctrines were quite new to them, and were neither preached nor believed by any other clergyman, so far as I could learn, throughout the province. My first work was to explain the depravity of our nature, our fall in Adam, and all the evils consequent thereon, the impossibility of being delivered from them by anything which we could do, and the necessity of a living faith in order to our obtaining help from God. While I continued to insist upon these truths, and on the absolute necessity of being born again, no small outcry was raised against this way, as well as against him that taught it. But by the help of God, I continued to witness the same both to small and great. The common people, however, frequented the church more constantly, and in larger numbers than usual. Some were affected at times, so as to drop a tear. But still, for a year or more, I perceived no lasting effect. Only a few were not altogether so profane as before. I could discover no heartfelt convictions of sin, no deep or lasting impression of their lost estate. Indeed, I have reason to believe that some have been a good deal alarmed at times. But they were shy of speaking to me, thinking it would be presumption, till their convictions wore off. But in the year 1765 the power of God was more sensibly felt by a few. These were constrained to apply to me, and inquire, what must they do to be saved? And now I began to preach abroad, as well as in private houses, and to meet little companies in the evenings, and converse freely on divine things. I believe some were this year converted to God, and thenceforth the work of God slowly went on. The next year I became acquainted with Mr. M. R., rector of a neighboring parish, and we joined hand in hand in the great work. He labored much therein, and not in vain. A remarkable power attended his preaching, and many were truly converted to God, not only in his parish, but in other parts where he was called to labor. In the years 1770 and 1771, we had a more considerable outpouring of the Spirit, at a place in my parish called White Oak. It was here first I formed the people into a society, that they might assist and strengthen each other. The good effects of this were soon apparent. Convictions were deep and lasting. Not only knowledge, but faith, and love, and holiness continually increased. In the year 1772, the revival was more considerable, and extended itself in some places for fifty or sixty miles round. It increased still more in the following year, and several sinners were truly converted to God. In spring 1774, it was more remarkable than ever. The word preached was attended with such energy that many were pierced to the heart. Tears fell plentifully from the eyes of the hearers, and some were constrained to cry out. A goodly number were gathered in this year, both in my parish and in many of the neighboring counties. I formed several societies out of those which were convinced or converted, and I found it a happy means of building up those that had believed, and preventing the rest from losing their convictions. In the counties of Sussex and Brunswick, the work, from the year 1773, was chiefly carried on by the labors of the people called Methodists. The first of them who appeared in these parts was Mr. R. W., who you know was a plain, artless, indefatigable preacher of the gospel. He was greatly blessed in detecting the hypocrite, raising false foundations, and stirring believers up to press after a present salvation 
from the remains of sin. He came to my house in the month of March, in the year 1773. The next year others of his brethren came, who gathered many societies both in this neighborhood and in other places, as far as North Carolina. They now began to ride the circuit, and to take care of the societies already formed, which was rendered a happy means both of deepening and spreading the work of God. I earnestly recommended it to my societies to pray much for the prosperity of Sion and for a larger outpouring of the Spirit of God. They did so, and not in vain. We have had a time of refreshing indeed, a revival of religion, as great as perhaps ever was known, in country places, in so short a time. It began in the latter end of the year 1775, but was more considerable in January 1776, the beginning of the present year. It broke out nearly at the same time at three places, not far from each other. Two of these places are in my parish, the other in Amelia County, which had for many years been notorious for carelessness, profaneness, and immoralities of all kinds. Gaming, swearing, drunkenness, and the like were their delight, while things sacred were their scorn and contempt. However, some time last year one of my parish, now a local preacher, appointed some meetings among them, and after a while induced a small number to join in society. And though few, if any of them, were then believers, yet this was a means of preparing the way of the Lord. As there were few converts in my parish the last year, I was sensible a change of preachers was wanting. This has often revived the work of God, and so it did at the present time. Last December one of the Methodist preachers, Mr. S., preached several times at the three places above mentioned. He confirmed the doctrine I had long preached, and to many of them not in vain. And while their ears were opened by novelty, God set his word home upon their hearts. Many sinners were powerfully convinced, and mercy, mercy was their cry. In January, the news of convictions and conversions was common, and the people of God were inspired with new life and vigor by the happiness of others. But in a little time they were made thoroughly sensible that they themselves stood in need of a deeper work in their hearts than they had yet experienced. And while those were panting and groaning for pardon, these were entreating God, with strong cries and tears, to save them from the remains of inbred sin, to sanctify them throughout, in spirit, soul, and body, so to circumcise their hearts, that they might love God with all their hearts, and serve Him with all their strength. During this whole winter, the Spirit of the Lord was poured out in a manner we had not seen before. In almost every assembly might be seen signal instances of divine power, more especially in the meetings of the classes. Here many old start-houted sinners felt the force of truth, and their eyes were open to discover their guilt and danger. The shaking among the dry bones was increased from week to week. Nay, sometimes ten or twelve have been deeply convinced of sin in one day. Some of these were in great distress and when they were questioned concerning the state of their souls, were scarce able to make any reply but by weeping and falling on their knees before all the class, and earnestly soliciting the prayers of God's people. And from time to time he has answered these petitions, set the captives at liberty, and enabled them to praise a pardoning God in the midst of his people. Numbers of old and gray-headed, of middle-aged persons, of youth, yea, of little children, were the subjects of this work. Several of the latter we have seen painfully concerned for the wickedness of their lives and the corruption of their nature. We have instances of this sort from eight or nine years old. Some of these children are exceeding happy in the love of God, and they speak of the whole process of the work of God, of their convictions, the time when and the manner how they obtained deliverance with such clearness as might convince an atheist that this is nothing else but the great power of God. Many in these parts who had long neglected the means of grace now flocked to hear, not only me and the traveling preachers, but also the exhorters and leaders. And the Lord showed he is not confined to man, 
for whether there was preaching or not, his power was still sensible among the people. And at their meetings for prayer, some have been in such distress that they have continued therein for five or six hours. And it has been found that these prayer meetings were singularly useful in promoting the work of God. The outpouring of the Spirit which began here soon extended itself, more or less, through most of the circuit, which is regularly attended by the traveling preachers, and which takes in a circumference of between four and five hundred miles. And the work went on, with a pleasing progress, till the beginning of May, when they held a quarterly meeting at B's Chapel, in my parish. This stands at the lower line of the parish, thirty miles from W's Chapel, at the upper line of it, where the work began. At this meeting, one might truly say, the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain of divine influence poured down for more than forty days. The work now became more deep than ever, extended wider, and was swifter in its operations. Many were savingly converted to God, and in a very short time, not only in my parish, but through several parts of Brunswick, Sussex, Prince George, Lunenburg, Mecklenburg, and Amelia counties. Second day of the quarterly meeting, a love feast was held. As soon as it began, the power of the Lord came down on the assembly like a rushing mighty wind, and it seemed as if the whole house was filled with the presence of God. A flame kindled and ran from heart to heart. Many were deeply convinced of sin. Many mourners were filled with consolation, and many believers were so overwhelmed with love that they could not doubt but God had enabled them to love him with all their heart. When the love feast was ended, the doors were opened. Many who had stayed without then came in, and beholding the anguish of some and the rejoicing of others, were filled with astonishment, not long after with trembling apprehensions of their own danger. Several of them prostrating themselves before God, cried aloud for mercy, and the convictions which then began in many have terminated in a happy and lasting change. The multitudes that attended on this occasion, returning home all alive to God, spread the flame through their respective neighborhoods, which ran from family to family, so that within four weeks several hundreds found the peace of God. And scarce any conversation was to be heard throughout the circuit but concerning the things of God, either the complaining of the prisoners groaning under the spirit of bondage unto fear, or the rejoicing of those whom the spirit of adoption taught to cry, Abba, Father. The unhappy disputes between England and her colonies, which just before had engrossed all our conversation, seemed now in most companies to be forgot, while things of far greater importance lay so near the heart. I have gone into many, and not small companies, wherein there did not appear to be one careless soul and the far greater part seemed perfectly happy in a clear sense of the love of God. One of the doctrines, as you know, which we particularly insist upon, is that of a present salvation, a salvation not only from the guilt and power, but also from the root of sin, a cleansing from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, that we may perfect holiness in the fear of God, a going on to perfection, which we sometimes define by loving God with all our hearts. Several who had believed were deeply sensible of their want of this. I have seen both men and women who had long been happy in a sense of God's pardoning love, as much convicted on account of the remains of sin in their hearts, and as much distressed for a total deliverance from them, as ever I saw any for justification. Their whole cry was, Oh, that I now the rest might know, believe, and enter in, now, Savior, now the power bestow, and let me cease from sin. And I have been present when they believed that God answered this prayer, and bestowed this blessing upon them. I have conversed with them several times since, and have found them thoroughly devoted to God. They all testify that they have received the gift instantaneously, and by simple faith. We have sundry witnesses of this perfect love who are above all suspicion. I have known the men and their communication for many years, and have ever found them zealous for the cause of God, men of sense and integrity, 
patterns of piety and humility, whose testimony, therefore, may be depended on. It has been frequently observed that there was never any remarkable revival of religion, but some degree of enthusiasm was mingled with it, some wildfire mixed with the sacred flame. It may be doubted whether this is not unavoidable in the nature of things. And notwithstanding all the care we have taken, this work has not been quite free from it. But it never rose to any considerable height, neither was of long continuance. In some meetings there has not been that decency and order observed which I could have wished. Some of our assemblies resemble the congregation of the Jews at laying the foundation of the second temple in the days of Ezra. Some wept for grief, others shouted for joy, so that it was hard to distinguish one from the other. So it was here. The mourning and distress were so blended with the voice of joy and gladness that it was hard to distinguish the one from the other, till the voice of joy prevailed, the people shouting with a great shout, so that it might be heard afar off. To give you a fuller insight into this great work of God, I subjoin an extract from two or three of my letters. End of section 21. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 22 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 22. To the Reverend Mr. M. R., May 2, 1776. Reverend and dear brother, Yesterday I preached at B.'s Chapel to a crowded and attentive audience. Afterward the Methodists held their love feast, during which as many as pleased rose, one after another, and spoke, in few words, of the goodness of God to their souls. Before three had done speaking, although they spoke but few words, you might see a solemn sense of the presence of God visible on every countenance, while tears of sorrow or joy were flowing from many eyes. Several testified to the consolation they had received. Some believed they were perfected in love. When the passions of the people were rising too high, and breaking through all restraint, the preacher gently checked them by giving out a few verses of a hymn. When most of the congregation went away, some were so distressed with the sense of their sins that they could not be persuaded to leave the place. Some lively Christians stayed with them, and continued in prayer for the space of two hours, till fifteen mourners were enabled to rejoice in God their Savior. And some careless creatures of the politer sort, who would needs go in to see what this strange thing meant, felt an unusual power, so that, like Saul among the prophets, they fell down on their knees, and cried for mercy among the rest. Oh, may they still continue to pray, till God has given them another heart. May 3, 1776 Last night three or four score of my neighbors met together to keep a watch night, at which it is the custom to spend three or four hours in religious exercises, and to break up at twelve. Such was the distress of those that were convinced of sin, that they continued in prayer all night, until two hours after sunrise. Here also fourteen or fifteen received a sense of pardon, so that in two days thirty of my own parish have been justified, besides others of other parishes. Indeed, I do not take it for granted that all are justified who think they are so. Some, I fear, are mistaken. But I shall judge better of this when I see the fruits. May 7, 1776 The work of God still increases among us. I believe within these eight days, more than forty here have been filled with joy and peace in believing. Of these I have had an account, but there may be many more. And several, who have been justified some time, believe God has blessed them with perfect love. I have no doubt but the work now carrying on is genuine. Yet there were some circumstances attending it which I disliked, such as loud outcries, tremblings, fallings, convulsions. But I am better reconciled, since I read President Edwards on that head, who observes, 
that wherever these most appear, there is always the greatest and the deepest work. There is another thing which has given me much pain, the praying of several at one and the same time. Sometimes five or six or more have been praying all at once, in several parts of the room, for distressed persons. Others were speaking by way of exhortation, so that the assembly appeared to be all in confusion, and must seem to one at a little distance more like a drunken rabble than the worshippers of God. I was afraid this was not doing all things in decency and order. Indeed, Dr. Edwards defends this also. But yet I am not satisfied concerning it. I had heard of it, but never saw it till Sunday evening. But this is a delicate point. It requires much wisdom to allay the wild and not damp the sacred fire. The first appearance of anything of the kind at my chapel was last Saturday night. I was not there, but a young man who studies at my house was. He is grave, prudent, and solidly religious, without the least tincture of enthusiasm. He met the society there in the afternoon, and would have returned home, but that many who were in great distress begged him and some others to stay and pray with them. They continued in prayer the whole night, during which about twelve were set at liberty. But notwithstanding all they could do, there were often two, three, or more, speaking at one time. I heard of this the next day, when I was at church, and hastened thence to the chapel. Some hundreds were assembled there, and were in much confusion when I went in. I went into the pulpit, and began to sing, adding short exhortations and prayers. The confusion ceased, several spirits were revived, and some mourners comforted. Since that evening, this kind of confusion has never been known in my neighborhood. It continued longer in other places, but for some time has been totally gone. But as this abated, the work of conviction and conversion usually abated too. Yet, blessed be God, it still goes on, though not with such rapidity. I have heard but of two or three that found peace for three weeks, whereas some time ago, seldom a week passed, but I could hear of eight or nine, sometimes between twenty and thirty, at one meeting. I have chiefly spoken of what was done in my parish, but that you may know a little of what was done elsewhere, I subjoin an extract from the letters of two local preachers in the county of Sussex. July 29, 1776 Reverend Sir, with unspeakable pleasure I acquaint you of the glorious revival of religion in our parts. It broke out at our last quarterly meeting, and has since wonderfully spread throughout the circuit. The time seems to be coming, when we shall not need to teach every man his neighbor to know the Lord, for they daily know him, from the least to the greatest, from little children to men of fourscore. Above seven years have I been exhorting my neighbors, but very few would hear. Now, blessed be God, there are few that will not hear. It is no strange thing for two or three to find the Lord at a class meeting. And at a Sunday meeting, although there was no preacher, ten, fifteen, yea, near twenty have been converted. At a place near me, thirty have found the Lord within eight days. It is common with us for men and women to fall down as dead under an exhortation, but many more under prayer, perhaps twenty at a time. And some that have not fallen to the earth have shown the same distress, wringing their hands, smiting their breasts, and begging all to pray for them. With these the work is generally quick, some getting through in less than a week, some in two or three days, some in one, two, or three hours. Nay, we have an instance of one that was so indifferent as to leave her brethren at prayers and go to bed. But all at once she screamed out, under a sense of her lost estate, and in less than fifteen minutes rejoiced in God her Saviour. And, blessed be God, many of these retain a sense of his favour. Many, who a few weeks ago were despisers and scoffers, are now happy in the Lord. Many old Christians, who were always full of doubts and fears, now walk in the light of his countenance. Some have a clear witness in themselves that they have given their whole hearts to God. Oh, may God carry on his work among us, 
until we are all swallowed up in love. T.S. Mr. S. lives twenty-two miles from me. The writer of the following letter, about thirty. July 29, 1776 Reverend Sir, On June the ninth we had a large congregation. I spoke on No Man Can Serve Two Masters. Several appeared to be much distressed, two women in particular. We spent above an hour in prayer for them, and they arose in peace. When we met the class, we suffered all that desired it to stay. The leader only put a question or two to each member. This was scarce ended when the fire of God's love was kindled. Praises hung on the lips of many, and several cried out, What must we do to be saved? Thus it swiftly went on, every now and then one rising with faith in Jesus. Surely this was one of the days of heaven. Such a day I never expected to see in time. While we were met, one I.W. was observed to be looking through the crack of the door, which being opened, he came with it, and being unable to stand, fell on the floor quite helpless. But in two or three hours he rose and praised a pardoning God while one of the class who had been justified some time received a blessing greatly superior to anything he had known before. We have reason to believe that on this day fifteen were enabled to believe in Jesus. Saturday, June 15. I was speaking to the class, and one found peace to her soul. Sunday, 16, I spoke from, This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith to four or five hundred people. This was also a day of Pentecost. Convictions seized on numbers, who wrestled with God till their souls were set at liberty. A young woman told me, she heard that many people fell down, and she would come to help them up. This she said in scorn. She came accordingly. The power of God soon seized her, and she wanted helping up herself but it was not long before the Spirit of grace helped her, by giving her faith in Christ. We believe twenty souls found peace this day. Oh, may we see many such days! July 7. I spoke to a large congregation. Afterward I was going to give out a hymn, when one was so powerfully struck that he could not hold a joint still, and roared aloud for mercy. I immediately went to prayer the cries of the people all the time greatly increasing. After prayer, B.T., lately a great opposer, jumped up and began to praise God, with a countenance so altered that those who beheld him were filled with astonishment. Our meeting continued from twelve at noon till twelve at night, during which God raised up about fifteen more witnesses. The Thursday following, six of those who were convinced on Sunday found peace in believing. We hear of many others converted in the neighborhood, several of whom were strong opposers, and some hoary-headed ones who had been strict Pharisees from their youth up. Sunday, 21. We had a large and attentive auditory, and the power of the Lord prevailed. The next day I was much tempted to doubt whether I was sent of God to preach or not. I prayed earnestly to the Lord that He would satisfy me, and that he would keep all false fire from among us. Afterward I preached. While I was speaking, a mother and her daughter were so struck with conviction that they trembled every joint. But before I concluded, both found peace. Glory be to God. I am, etc., J.D. God has made examples of several opposers, examples not of justice, but of mercy. Some of them came to the assembly with hearts full of rancor against the people of God, so that, had it been in their power, they would have dragged them away to prison, if not to death. But unexpectedly their stubborn hearts were bowed down, being pierced with the arrows of the Almighty. In a moment they were filled with distress and anguish, their laughter turned into mourning, and their cursing into prayer. And frequently, in less than a week, their heaviness has been turned into joy. Of this sort are several of our most zealous and circumspect walkers at this day. A goodly number of these are rich in this world, yet they are now brought so low 
that they are willing to be taught by all, and to be the servants of all. A gentleman of this parish, in particular, had much opposed and contradicted. He was fully persuaded that all outward appearances, either of distress or joy, were mere deceit. But as he was walking to his mill, about half a mile from his house, deep conviction fell upon him. The terrors of the Lord beset him round about, and distress and anguish got hold upon him. When he came to the mill and found no one there, he took that opportunity of prostrating himself before God, and of pouring out his soul in his presence. As his distress was great, his cries were loud, and his prayer importunate. The Lord heard him, and set his soul at liberty before he left the place. And the power which came upon him was so great that it seemed as if his whole frame were dissolving. Upon the whole, this has been a great, a deep, a swift, and an extensively glorious work. Both the nature and manner of it have been nearly the same, wherever its benign influence reached. Where the greatest work was, where the greatest number of souls have been convinced and converted to God, there have been the most outcries, tremblings, convulsions, and all sorts of external signs. I took all the pains I could that these might be kept within bounds, that our good might not be evil spoken of. This I did, not by openly inveighing against them in the public assembly, but by private advices to local preachers and others, as opportunity would permit. This method had its desired effect, without putting a sword into the hands of the wicked. Wherever the contrary method has been taken, where these things have been publicly opposed, when they have been spoken against in promiscuous congregations, the effect has always been this. The men of the world have been highly gratified, and the children of God deeply wounded. The former have plumed themselves as though they were the men who kept within due bounds, and those that had made so much ado about religion were no better than hot-brained enthusiasts. I cannot but think this has a great tendency to hinder the work of God. Indeed, if we thought that God wrought everything irresistibly, we should not fear this. But we know the contrary. We know that as some things promote, so others hinder his work. I grant, means should be used to prevent all indecency, but they should be used with great caution and tenderness, that the cure may be effected, if possible, without damping the work of God. With regard to the inward work, there has been a great variety as to the length and depth and circumstances of the convictions in different persons but all in general have been at first alarmed with a sense of the multitude and heinousness of their sins, with an awful view of the wrath of God, and certain destruction if they persisted therein. Hence they betook themselves to prayer, and, as time permitted, to the use of all other means of grace. Although deeply sensible of the vileness of their performances, and the total insufficiency of all they could do to merit the pardon of one sin, or deserve the favor of God. They were next convinced of their unbelief, and that faith in Christ is the only condition of justification. They continued thus waiting upon the Lord, till he spoke peace to their souls. This he usually did in one moment, in a clear and satisfactory manner, so that all their griefs and anxieties vanished away, and they were filled with joy and peace in believing. Some indeed have had their burdens removed, so that they felt no condemnation, and yet they could not say they were forgiven. But they could not be satisfied with this. They continued instant in prayer, till they knew the Lamb of God had taken away their sins. Most of these had been suddenly convinced of sin, but with some it was otherwise. Without any sense of their guilt, they were brought to use the means of grace by mere dint of persuasion and afterward they were brought by degrees to see themselves, and their want of a Savior. But before they found deliverance, they have had as deep a sense of their helpless misery as others. One in my parish was a remarkable instance of this. He was both careless and profane to a great degree, and remained quite unconcerned, while many of his companions were sorrowing after God, or rejoicing in his love. One of his acquaintance advised him to seek the Lord, 
he said. I see no necessity for it as yet. When I do, I will seek him as well as others. His friend persuaded him to try for one week, watching against sin, and going by himself every day. He did so, and though he was quite stupid when he began, yet before the end of the week he was thoroughly sensible of the load of sin, and is now happy in God. If you ask, how stands the case now with those that have been the subjects of the late work? I have the pleasure to inform you, I have not heard of any one apostate yet. It is true, many, since their first joy abated, have given way to doubts and fears, have had their confidence in God much shaken, and have got into much heaviness. Several have passed through this, and are now confirmed in the ways of God. Others are in it still, and chiefly those over whom Satan had gained an advantage by hurrying them into irregular warmth, or into expressions not well guarded. I have seen some of these in great distress, and just ready to cast away hope. I have a great deal upon my hands at present, and have little time either to write or read. The difficulties and temptations of the lately converted are so many and various, that I am obliged to be in as many places as I can, for now is the critical hour. A man of zeal, though with little knowledge or experience, may be an instrument of converting souls. But after they are converted, he will have need of much knowledge, much prudence and experience, to provide proper food and physic for the several members, according to their state, habit, and constitution. This, at present, seems in a great measure to devolve upon me. And though I have been twenty years in the Lord's service, yet I find I am quite unequal to the task. However, I will do what I can, and may the Lord bless my endeavors. The enemy is busy night and day in sowing the tares of division among the wheat, and in some places he has prevailed so far as to plunge some of them in the water. In other places little feuds and animosities arise to grieve the preachers and damp the spirits of the people. On these occasions they commonly apply to me, and all is well, at least for a season. When I consider what it is to watch over souls, and how much labor and pains it implies to discharge it in any degree, I cannot but cry out with the Apostle, Who is sufficient for these things? However, upon the whole, things are in as flourishing a condition as can reasonably be expected, considering what great numbers, of various capacities and stations, have been lately added to the societies. But after all, a great part of Virginia is still in a very dark and deplorable condition. This province contains sixty-two counties, and the late work has reached only seven or eight of them. Nor has it been universal even in these, but chiefly in the circuit which is regularly visited by the preachers. In this alone very many hundreds have in a few months been added to the Lord and some are adding still. May he continue to pour out his Spirit upon us, and increase the number of the faithful every day. Our highest gratitude is due to our gracious God, for he hath done marvelous things. In a short time he hath wrought a great work. And let who will speak against it, it is evident beyond all contradiction, that many open and profligate sinners of all sorts have been effectually and lastingly changed into pious, uniform Christians, so that every thinking man must allow that God hath been with us of a truth, and that his glory dwells in our land. I am your sincere friend and brother in Christ, September 10, 1776, D.J. to Mr. T.R. End of Section 22 Recording by Brian Keenan Section 23 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 23. The following letter, which relates to the same work, was written some time after. 
to the Reverend Mr. Wesley, June 24, 1778. Reverend and dear sir, you have the narrative of the Reverend Mr. J. I send this as a supplement to it. At our little conference held in Philadelphia, May 1775, Mr. S. was appointed assistant for Brunswick Circuit in Virginia. He found there about eight hundred joined together, but in a very confused manner. Many of them did not understand the nature of meeting in class, and many of the classes had no leader. He resolved to begin in good earnest, and the preachers with him were like-minded. Their constant custom was, as soon as preaching was over, to speak to all the members of the society, one by one. If the society was large, one preacher spoke to a part, and he that came next to the rest. By this means they learned more of our doctrine and discipline in a year than in double the time before. The fruit soon appeared. The congregations swiftly increased, and many were pricked to the heart. Many that were a little affected desired to see the nature of meeting in class. And while one was speaking either to those that were groaning for redemption, or those who had found peace with God, these were frequently cut to the heart, and sometimes enabled on the spot to praise a pardoning God. Nay, sometimes four, five, or six found peace with God before the meeting was over. The work of God thus increasing on every side, more preachers were soon wanting, and God raised up several young men who were exceeding useful as local preachers. After Mr. S. had been about eight months in the circuit, Mr. J. desired his parish might be included in it, that all who chose it might have the privilege of meeting in class and being members of the society. He soon saw the salutary effects. Many that had but small desires before began to be much alarmed and labored earnestly after eternal life. In a little time, numbers were deeply awakened and many tasted of the pardoning love of God. In a few months Mr. J. saw more fruit of his labors than he had done for many years, and he went on with the preachers hand in hand, both in doctrine and discipline. When Mr. S. took an account of the societies, before he came to the conference in 1776, they contained 2,664 persons, to whom 1,800 were added in one year. Above a thousand of these had found peace with God, many of whom thirsted for all the mind that was in Christ. And divers believed God had circumcised their heart, to love Him with all their heart, and with all their soul. This revival of religion spread through fourteen counties in Virginia, and through Butte and Halifax counties in North Carolina. At the same time, we had a blessed outpouring of the Spirit in several counties bordering upon Maryland. Our conference was at Baltimore Town on the 22nd of May. Here I received a letter from Mr. J., part of which I insert. May 11, 1776 I praise God for His goodness, in so plentifully pouring out of His Spirit on men, women, and children. I believe threescore, in and near my parish, have believed, through grace, since the quarterly meeting. Such a work I never saw with my eyes. Sometimes twelve, sometimes fifteen find the Lord at one class meeting. I am just returned from meeting two classes. Much of the power of God was in each. My dear partner is now happy in God her Savior. I clap my hands exulting, and praise God. Blessed be the Lord, that ever he sent you and your brethren into this part of his vineyard. Many children, from eight to twelve years old, are now under strong convictions and some of them are savingly converted to God. I was much comforted this morning at the W.O. Chapel. The people there are of a truly teachable spirit, those particularly who profess to have obtained the pure love of God. They are as little children. When you consider how the work is spreading on every side, you will readily excuse me from being at your conference. Monday, June 24 I left Leesburg, in company with W.B., a truly devout man who now rests from his labors, and came to Petersburg on Saturday the 29th, where I preached about three in the afternoon, and then rode on to Mr. B.'s, 
about ten miles farther. A little company was waiting for me, and God was with us of a truth. Sunday 30. I was comforted by the sight of my dear brother S., but I was weak in body, through riding so far in extreme heat, and much exercised in mind, and did not know how I should be able to go through the labor of the day. We went to the chapel at ten, where I had liberty of mind, and strength of body beyond my expectation. After preaching I met the society, and was more relieved, both in body and mind. At four in the afternoon I preached again, from, I set before thee an open door, and none can shut it. I had gone through about two-thirds of my discourse, and was bringing the words home to the present. Now, when such power descended, that hundreds fell to the ground, and the house seemed to shake with the presence of God. The chapel was full of white and black, and many were without that could not get in. Look wherever we would, we saw nothing but streaming eyes, and faces bathed in tears, and heard nothing but groans and strong cries after God and the Lord Jesus Christ. My voice was drowned amidst the groans and prayers of the congregation. I then sat down in the pulpit, and both Mr. S. and I were so filled with the divine presence that we could only say, This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Husbands were inviting their wives to go to heaven, wives their husbands, parents their children, and children their parents, brothers their sisters, and sisters their brothers. In short, those who were happy in God themselves were for bringing all their friends to Him in their arms. This mighty effusion of the Spirit continued for above an hour, in which time many were awakened, some found peace with God, and others His pure love. We attempted to speak or sing again and again, but no sooner we began than our voices were drowned. It was with much difficulty that we at last persuaded the people, as night drew on, to retire to their own homes. Tuesday, July 2 I rode with Mr. S. to Mr. J.'s, who, with Mrs. J., received us with open arms. I preached the next day, not far from his house, to a deeply attentive congregation. Many were much affected at the preaching, but far more at the meeting of the society. Mr. J. himself was constrained to praise God aloud, for his great love to him and to his people. Sunday 7 I preached at W.'s chapel, about twenty miles from Mr. J.'s. I intended to preach near the house, under the shade of some large trees. But the rain made it impracticable. The house was greatly crowded, and four or five hundred stood at the doors and windows, and listened with unabated attention. I preached from Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones, and there was a great shaking. I was obliged to stop again and again, and beg of the people to compose themselves. But they could not. Some on their knees, and some on their faces, were crying mightily to God all the time I was preaching. Hundreds of negroes were among them, with the tears streaming down their faces. The same power we found in meeting the society, and many were enabled to rejoice with joy unspeakable. In the cool of the evening I preached out of doors, and many found an uncommon blessing. Every day the ensuing week I preached to large and attentive congregations. Indeed, the weather was violently hot, and the fatigue of riding and preaching so often was great. But God made up all this to me by His comfortable presence. Thursday 11 I preached to a large congregation at the preaching house near Mr. J.'s. After preaching at several places on Friday and Saturday, on Sunday 14 I came to Mr. B.'s, where I preached and met the society. The congregation was, as before, abundantly larger than the chapel could contain. And we had almost such a day as fourteen days ago, only attended with a more deep and solemn work. What a work is God working in this corner of Mr. J.'s parish! It seemed as if all the country, for nine or ten miles round, were ready to turn to God. In the evening I rode to Mr. S.'s, and found a whole family fearing and loving God. 
Mr. S., a sensible and judicious man, had been for many years a justice of the peace. By hearing the truth as it is in Jesus, he and his wife first, and then all his children, had attained that peace that passeth all understanding. He observed how amazing the change was which had been lately wrought in the place where he lived. That before the Methodists came into these parts, when he was called by his office to attend the court, there was nothing but drunkenness, cursing, swearing, and fighting. Most of the time the court sat. Whereas now nothing is heard but prayer and praise, and conversing about God and the things of God. Monday, 15. I rode towards North Carolina. In every place the congregations were large, and received the word with all readiness of mind. I know not that I have spent such a week since I came to America. I saw everywhere such a simplicity in the people, with such a vehement thirst after the word of God, that I frequently preached and continued in prayer till I was hardly able to stand. Indeed, there was no getting away from them, while I was able to speak one sentence for God. Sunday, 21. I preached at Roanoke Chapel to more than double of what the house would contain. In general, the white people were within the chapel, and the black people without. The windows being all open, everyone could hear, and hundreds felt the word of God. Many were bathed in tears, and others rejoicing with joy unspeakable. When the society met, many could not refrain from praising God aloud. I preached to a large company in the afternoon, and concluded the day with prayer and thanksgiving. Tuesday, 23. I crossed the Roanoke River, and preached at a chapel in North Carolina. And I preached every day to very large and deeply attentive congregations, although not without much labor and pain, through the extreme heat of the weather. On Tuesday, 30, was our quarterly meeting. I scarce ever remember such a season. No chapel or preaching house in Virginia would have contained one-third of the congregation. Our friends, knowing this, had contrived to shade with boughs of trees a space that would contain two or three thousand persons. Under this, wholly screened from the rays of the sun, we held our general love feast. It began between eight and nine on Wednesday morning, and continued till noon. Many testified that they had redemption in the blood of Jesus, even the forgiveness of sins, and many were enabled to declare that it had cleansed them from all sin. So clear, so full, so strong was their testimony, that while some were speaking their experience, hundreds were in tears, and others vehemently crying to God for pardon or holiness. About eight our watch night began. Mr. J. preached an excellent sermon. The rest of the preachers exhorted and prayed with divine energy. Surely, for the work wrought on these two days, many will praise God to all eternity. T.R. End of section 23. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 24 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 24. Thursday, January 2, 1777. My soul has had to wrestle with principalities and powers, but by the grace of God, in obstinately resisting the tempter, I have come off more than conqueror and am now in peace. I was unable to speak plainly and closely at Mr. G's. Lord's Day, 5. After preaching and meeting the society, I think the people were left more in earnest for the salvation of their souls than they were before. On Monday the Lord was the portion and comfort of my soul, and I enjoyed a very agreeable and happy season with the little flock at W.W.'s. Tuesday, 7. The camp fever now rages much, of which several have died. Thursday, 9. 
I have met with a few faithful, happy souls, both yesterday at Susquehanna and today at E.W.'s. My own soul lives constantly as in the presence of God, and enjoys much of His divine favor. His love is better than life. My Jesus to know, and feel His blood flow, tis life everlasting, tis heaven below. Lord's Day 12 There was but little appearance of feeling while I preached in the day from John 1, 14, but my soul was much blessed in the evening at W.E.'s, and it was a solemn time amongst the people. Monday 13 We have constant rumors about the disagreeable war which is now spreading through the country, but all these things I still commit to God. Matters of greater perpetuity call for the exertion of my mental powers. My soul is in a tranquil frame, but thirsting for more of God. After preaching at S.L.'s, I met the Society, which seemed but slow in their spiritual progress. Both the audience and myself were much more engaged the next day at I.P.'s. Thursday, 16 A certain person passed great encomiums, and sounded my praise as a preacher to my face. But this is a dangerous practice, for it is easier for a preacher to think too much of his gifts than too little. St. Paul, describing the true Israelite, saith, Whose praise is not of men, but of God. Saturday, 18 I have heard much of many attending on the Lord's days to hear T.C., but for my part I see but little fruit. My heart was warmly engaged today at Mr. F.'s, and as some preachers met me in the evening, we held a watch night at H.W.'s. There was a great number of people, and it was a solemn, profitable time. Lord's Day, 19 In preaching at N.P.'s from Zephaniah 1.12, I was particularly led, in the close of the sermon, to address the younger part of the congregation in such a manner as greatly affected the parents who were present. Monday 20 It is now a time of great and spreading sickness, but in this very time the Lord keeps me in health and safety, for which my heart is drawn out in grateful acknowledgments. There were more people than could have been expected to hear the word at Mrs. P.'s. Tuesday 21 A messenger from Mr. G.'s met me at the Widow B.'s, informing me that Mr. R. A. and Mr. G. S. were there waiting to see me. After preaching, I set out, and met my brethren the same night, and found them inclined to leave America and embark for England. But I had before resolved not to depart from the work on any consideration. After some consultation, it was thought best that Mr. R. A. should go to Mr. R. N. and request his attendance here. On Thursday, Brother S. preached a very argumentative and melting sermon. I intended to have gone forward on my circuit, but was prevented by the rain. Friday, 24. My heart has checked me for not being more watchful in company and conversation. But today my soul was greatly drawn out after God. How often do we grieve the Holy Spirit, and deprive ourselves of divine consolations, by not steadily attending to the duties of watching and prayer. Lord, help me to be more attentive and more faithful. Lord's Day 26 After lecturing in Mr. G.'s family, I rode to the Forks and preached there. Then through rain and cold and dirt, to meet the congregation at Mr. C.'s, and afterward returned to Mr. G.'s and lectured in the evening. And the Lord was with me to support and comfort me through all the exercises of the day. Monday, 27. My spirit was assaulted by Satan, and felt itself in a heavy frame, but in the Lord I have help. As Brother G.S. is willing to take this circuit for the present, my intention is to move towards Annapolis and its adjacent parts. May divine providence direct my steps. I have had an agreeable conversation with my friend, Mr. O.E. Friday, 31 I was moved to speak in alarming terms at W.L.'s, but am not yet so steadily and spiritually devoted to God as my soul earnestly desires to be. Probably the Lord will be pleased to make me perfect through sufferings, but our light affliction, which is but for a moment, 
is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, if faithful to the grace of God. Who suffer with our Master here, we shall before his face appear, and by his side sit down. To patient faith the prize is sure, and all that to the end endure the cross shall wear the crown. Saturday, February 1 My soul is determined to labor more for the spirit of devotion. I found myself at liberty in preaching at the point, on casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Lord's Day, too. The audience at the point were cold and unaffected, and at town on Monday evening they were dispersed by the alarm of fire in the time of preaching. Tuesday, 4. After a season of temptations and spiritual exercises, I found my mind disburdened, and a holy, awful nearness to God. On Thursday I set out for Risterstown in order to meet Brother G.S., and calling in at Mr. W.'s, where Brother K. was then speaking. I also spoke a few words, and found my soul refreshed. I met with Brother G.S. the next day, and saw an affecting letter from Mrs. T. of Philadelphia, in which, after she had given some account of the abounding wickedness of that city, she informed us of the declension of a few religious persons, of the fidelity of others, of the camp fever that was then prevailing there, and that many died thereof, sometimes twenty, thirty, and even forty in a day. An awful account, indeed. So it seems as if the Lord intends to bring us to our proper reflections and duties by the sword, the pestilence, and famine. Alas, who can stand before the displeasure of the Almighty? How much better would it be for men to please God, and live in love to Him and one another? that they might partake of his blessing, instead of his curse. Lord, grant thy people wisdom and protection in all times of danger. Monday, 10. I went to the quarterly meeting and met with Brother R. A. and Brother R. N. In our love feast several people were happy, but my mind was under a cloud and some severe exercises. However, I earnestly desire an increase of patience and communion with God. O oh, my Lord, scatter every cloud, and cause thy face to shine with beams of divine love upon my soul. Thursday, 13. Mr. R. N. went to Baltimore, and on Friday I felt a desire to be laboring for the salvation of souls. I cannot be idle, but must be occupied till my Lord shall come. O oh, happy day, when the weary shall be at rest! Lord, hasten thy work in me, and then hasten thy coming to judgment, or by death. Saturday, 15. I have been reading some of both Greek and Hebrew, but my soul longeth to feel more deadness to everything but God, and an increase of spiritual light, life, and love. I now parted with dear brother G.S. On the Lord's Day, I found freedom and warmth in preaching to a larger congregation than could have been expected at the Widow M's. Monday, 17. Rode to Mrs. R's, and was grievously troubled with inward temptations. Oh, when shall I rest with my Jesus in eternal glory? Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. Tuesday, 18. It was a cold winter's day, but I rode twenty-three miles to Mr. G.'s, and found one had been brought to God since my departure the last time. Several seemed to melt while I was discoursing on the vision of the dry bones. Thursday, 20. The weather was exceedingly severe, and I had twenty-five miles to ride, which almost benumbed both body and soul. But my mind was so exercised, by the way, with various and heavy temptations, and such a deep sense of my demerit and unprofitableness, that I thought my suffering was much less than my desert. Satan frequently assaults me on every side, and with every species of temptations. Surely it is through great tribulation we must enter into the kingdom of God. The righteous have great cause to rejoice that a rest remaineth for them. Saturday, 22. The burden of my ardent desire was 
to be more assimilated to my spiritual head, and to be more abundantly devoted, both day and night, to the pure and uninterrupted service of my God. I would be thine, thou knowest I would, and have thee all my own, thee, O oh, my all-sufficient good, I want, and thee alone. Lord's Day 23 After riding twenty miles to I.W.'s, I spoke from these words, How long halt ye between two opinions? Many of the people displayed, by their looks, the carelessness of their hearts. But a few from among them have been brought to Christ, and some more are coming. On Tuesday we had severe weather, with a cold and dirty house. But my soul was much blessed in my little sufferings. On Wednesday I was kindly entertained by old Mr. M. and his wife, though a troublesome little Irishman seemed much inclined to altercation. But, as Solomon says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. So by coolness and meekness the ferocity of his temper was in a great degree subdued. I have had some doubts of late whether I am in my proper route to bring souls to God. However, the event must make it manifest. Friday, 28. My heart was unfettered and quite happy in God, while publishing glad tidings to poor sinners at Mr. H.'s, from Acts 13, 38-39. I had appointed the next day to enter Annapolis, but a great snow prevented me. Meeting with Brother H., who was about to enter upon the circuit, we took some sweet counsel together relative to the work of God, and I gave him a plan which comprehended the greater part of the circuit, reserving for myself Annapolis and a few places adjacent. My soul is now kept in peace and love. Lord's Day, March 2 Though the weather was very cold, several members of the convention attended to hear the word at the Widow D's, and I afterward preached in the playhouse, now converted into a church. In the beginning of the ensuing week, I was requested to preach in the assembly room, but some of the members opposed it. So I returned to the playhouse, and found my ideas contracted while preaching to a deistical audience, from Romans 8, 7, 8. Lord, if thou hast called me to preach to these souls, grant me divine assistance. But how difficult it is to declare the plain truth to ungodly and sensual men in such a manner as not to be dismayed at their countenance. Our sufficiency is of God. Wednesday, 5. I had some hope for a poor, ignorant people at Broadneck, on the other side of the Severn. My clothes were wet through in riding twenty miles the next day to Mr. P's, but I received no injury. Here I met with Mr. O and William M., and my soul was blessed with delightful communion with God. Lord's Day, 9. Preached at Mr. W.'s, and on Monday my heart was inflamed with divine love, and the people were much melted, while I was discoursing at Mr. R.'s from Amos 5, 6, though my soul had been bowed down by the weight of temptations. And, by the grace of God, I was ashamed before him, being base, unworthy, and contemptible in my own eyes. May the grace which thus abases me in due time exalt me, and bring me to glory. Tuesday, 11. I met with a dull congregation at Mr. G.'s, and went home with Mr. T., who appeared to be the only thoughtful man amongst them. I was much indisposed on Wednesday, and on my way to Annapolis stopped at Mr. M. R.'s, where a certain Mr. R. was taken sick. After I had conversed with him about his soul and the things of eternity, his conduct proved that God hath a witness for himself in every breast, for, awaking in the night, he uttered expressive groans, and called upon the name of the Lord. But alas, when men should attend to the voice of divine grace, which speaketh in silence, though frequently with great power, to every conscience, they shake off the disagreeable sensation, and plunge into business and sensual pleasures. And when death comes, they plunge into hell. Thus it was with the rich man mentioned by our Lord in the parable. And thus it is with many every day. Unhappy creatures! How rich, how honorable, how easy, how happy once, avails them nothing there. 
There they must dwell in eternal poverty and nakedness, exposed to the beating storms of the divine displeasure. Then how much better is it to choose affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season? Thursday, 13. At WMC's, many were much wrought upon by the Spirit of God under the Word. A.W. especially was so deeply affected that she had scarce power to contain herself. I saw a fresh proof that the life of man is quite uncertain. A tobacco house was blown down and killed a negro man. My heart was deeply engaged in prayer, especially for the inhabitants of Annapolis. My confidence in God was so great that I could trust him with my body and soul, and all my little concerns. He makes me a partaker of his spiritual kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Friday, 14. My natural timidity depressed my mind at the thought of preaching in Annapolis, where many people openly deny the Holy Scriptures, as well as the power of inward religion. But the Lord inspired me with a degree of evangelical courage, and I felt a determination to adhere to the truth and follow Jesus Christ, if it should be even to prison or to death. Saturday, 15. Preaching in a private house in Annapolis, I found my spirit at liberty in a good degree. May the God of Daniel stand by me, that I may never be ashamed to preach the pure gospel, or even afraid to suffer for it. Lord's Day, 16. After preaching at the Widow D's, I rode back to Mr. H.'s, and was not very agreeably entertained by a company of gay, worldly people. And as they must either imbibe something of my spirit, or I something of theirs, if we were long together, I thought it most expedient to depart in peace as soon as it was convenient, and was much assisted and comforted in preaching from Acts 17, 30, 31, but felt myself weary and unwell at the close of the day. Monday, 17. Preaching when the House of Assembly was adjourned, many of them came to hear for themselves. The Lord was with me, and I found my heart melted and expanded with love to the souls of the people. But by imprudently venturing out when warmed by preaching, I have brought on a sore throat. On Tuesday I went to get a sight of the poor prisoners, but could not obtain admittance. At Broad Creek on Wednesday, there was a large company of wild and ignorant mortals who, after preaching, were communicating their thoughts to each other. Some said they did not like the doctrine. Others said it was the truth, the very truth. Wednesday, 19. I wrote to Major R's, who treated me with great kindness, and seemed desirous of knowing the truth. But the spirit of the times has engrossed too much of his attention. Our Lord has told us that some, when they have heard, go forth, and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life. Luke 8, 14 No doubt but this description comprehends a vast multitude of mankind. They do not consider religion as the one thing needful. Thursday, 20 By the providence of God, my throat was no worse, but my mind was under some dejection. However, we had a powerful and profitable watch night at Mr. P.'s, and on Friday there were many attentive people at Mr. R.'s. Saturday, 22. As sure as we draw nigh to God in sincerity, he will draw nigh to us. I have given myself to private prayer seven times a day, and found my heart much drawn out in behalf of the preachers, the societies, especially the new places, and my aged parents. And while thus exercised, my soul has been both quickened and purified. Let the glory be given to God. But alas, after all, my heart is not so filled with generous gratitude as it should be. Eternal are thy mercies, Lord. Eternal truth attends thy word. Thy praise shall sound from shore to shore, till suns shall rise and set no more. Lord's Day 23 my mind was delightfully fixed on God. 
a few people who, in dullness and religious stupidity, exceeded all I had ever seen, came to hear me today. But would they sincerely seek after God, they should find the way to heaven. For the prophet saith, A fool shall not err therein. Thursday, 27. I have been variously exercised with the carelessness of the people, and the troubles of the times, though my soul has had intimate access to God. I received a letter from Brother S., intimating that, according to rule, the time was drawing near for us to return. But St. Paul's rule is that our spiritual children should be in our hearts, to live and die with them. 2 Corinthians 7, 3 Then, doubtless, we should be willing to suffer affliction with them. May the Lord give me wisdom sufficient to direct me in this and every intricate case. Lord's Day 30 the congregation was large at Mr. D.'s, and some of them felt the power of the word. Though, in the afternoon, at a schoolhouse near Annapolis, there was very little appearance of spiritual feeling. On Monday I was under some exercise of mind in respect to the times. My brethren are inclined to leave the continent, and I do not know but something may be propounded to me which would touch my conscience. But my determination is to trust in God— and be satisfied if the souls of my fellow men are saved. A genteel woman met me today, on the road to IH's, and asked me if I should not preach in town. But I had not the presence of mind to tell her I had no place there to preach in. Wednesday, April 2 Having received information that some of my brethren had determined on their departure, I wrote to Brother S. that as long as I could stay and preach without injuring my conscience— it appeared as my duty to abide with the flock. But I must confess Satan has harassed me with violent and various temptations. However, my dependence is on the Lord, that he will always enable me to do what is right in the sight of God and man. I had about twenty-two miles to ride today, and to call by the way to preach. Though both hungry and weary, yet my soul was much blessed in dispensing the word. Thursday, 3. My soul had peace, and my body had rest. But Satan was still at hand. We had a comfortable watch night at Mr. P's. On Friday, my heart was dissolved into tenderness while preaching at Mr. R's. Saturday, 5. Mr. M gave me an awful account of a man struck instantly dead at Deer Creek. The very relation of his crime is enough to make a man shudder. He had been cursing the Holy Spirit. This is a striking proof that God is not an inattentive spectator of the actions of men, though most men live as if they thought he were. No, for God shall bring every work into judgment, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ecclesiastes 12.14 Much temptation has urged me to much prayer so that I have lately retired as often as ten or twelve times a day to call upon my God. When the tempter finds that his violent assaults only drive us nearer to God, perhaps he will not be so maliciously officious. Monday, 7. Satan seemed determined, if possible, to distract, if he could not destroy me. Even blasphemous thoughts have been darted into my imagination. But I know where my help is to be found. Let our imaginations be ever so horrid, and haunt us ever so frequently, provided we hate them, and constantly resist them. They are not imputed to us, but we may still rejoice in God in the midst of them all. It is enough for the servant to be as his Lord, who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Glory to God, he hath promised that we shall not be tempted above that we are able, though sometimes it may be to the extent of our ability, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that we may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 I have now read Newton on the prophecies three times over. Tuesday, 8 There was a large company of wild-looking people at Mr. G's on the fork of Patuxent River, and there was much such a congregation the next day at Mr. C's. Thursday, 10. My soul was much refreshed in speaking to the people at C.B.'s, 
and on Friday I met with Mr. H. N., and received a letter from Mr. R. N., in which, after he had given me an account of the circuits and societies, he assigned his reasons for not traveling much for about the space of two months past. Lord's Day 13 After preaching at Mr. D.'s, I found much freedom in preaching to a large company at Annapolis, and had an invitation to go into Worcester County. End of section 24. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 25 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 25. Monday, 14. This was a day of rest to my fatigued frame, and of consolation to my immortal part. On Tuesday there was great decency in the congregation at Annapolis, though Satan, by his emissaries, had raised an opposition. But Israel's God is above them all. Wednesday, 16. God was with us, and the people were happy at Mr. M's. On my way I called and dined with Mr. R, who gave great attention to my explanatory and pointed conversation on the new birth. Riding after preaching to R.P.'s, my chase was shot through, but the Lord preserved my person. The war is now at such a height that they are pressing men for the sea service. Thursday, 17. One of our society died of a disorder in the throat and lungs, with only one day's illness. Such is the precarious tenure of life. But blessed are they that die in the Lord." May I always have my loins girded about, and my light burning, waiting for the will of my Lord. God has displayed great wisdom and goodness in hiding future events from man, that we may live without that painful anxiety which we should be apt to feel if we knew the hour of our death, and that we may be always ready to meet the unknown period. Saturday, 19. My soul was much blessed at R.S.'s, in preaching from the divine expostulation, Why Will Ye Die? Mr. I.D. invited me to lodge at his house, and treated me with great kindness. Lord's Day 20 After preaching at Mr. W.'s, I rode about twenty miles to lodge with a friend. But seeing a boy plowing by the roadside, my conscience smote me for breaking the Sabbath, by riding when there was no real necessity for it. Monday 21 my heart was comforted in the company of an old friend. But on Tuesday, Satan raged against my soul, as if he would immediately destroy it. But my divine protector is too strong for him. The Lord visited and blessed my soul in the evening, while I was describing the faithful and wise servant. Wednesday, 23. I found myself very unwell on my going to T.W.'s, but my spirit was at liberty in preaching. Though still unwell, I rode twenty miles to I.W.'s on Thursday, and was blessed with a tranquil mind by the way. Satan cast several infernal darts at my soul, but I was enabled to repel them by the shield of faith and the power of prayer. Saturday, 26. A very genteel, polite company assembled at Annapolis, and though I spoke with great plainness, they bore it well. Lord's Day 27. After meeting the congregation at the Widow D's, I found a large company at Annapolis, who gave good attention to me, but I fear they were not disposed to give their hearts to God. My mind has been grieved at some who call themselves friends to religion and to the Methodists. But alas, how blind and ignorant is the unchanged mind of man! How little does he consider what will please or displease his Maker! I still desire to have every action, word, thought, and desire entirely devoted to God. Lord, hasten the much-wished-for hour. Thou my life, my treasure be, my portion here below. Nothing would I seek but Thee, Thee only would I know. Monday, 28. 
About two hundred careless-looking people came to hear the word at Pig Point. They seemed entire strangers to such a doctrine, so some laughed and others wept. I rode fifty miles in going and coming to preach that sermon, but hope it was not altogether labor lost. Friday, May 2 At Mr. R.'s I spoke closely and pointedly for the last time during this visit, then rode through the rain and darkness to Mr. W.'s, and felt my heart sweetly melted with gratitude and thanksgiving to God. On Monday I went to S.T.'s and met my brethren at the Frederick Quarterly Meeting, where we were favored with the divine blessing. Wednesday, 7. A letter came to hand from Mr. J., which gave us hopes that there would be another revival in Virginia. He also advised us to take no immature steps which might have a tendency to alter our plan. After preaching the next day at R.S.'s, T.D. invited me to his house. I found that he and his wife were seeking to be justified by the deeds of the law, and I labored with undissembled freedom to convince them of their error. But it appeared to be labor in vain. Saturday, 10. At Annapolis the congregation was small, and so was my power to preach. My soul has been kept in a calm and comfortable frame, but panting for more constant fervor towards God. Lord's Day, 11. Many attended at the Widow D's to hear what I would say on my departure. I spoke from Acts 13, 46, and many seemed much affected. The congregation was also large at Annapolis, where I spoke in plain terms to the rich and the gay on our Lord's awful account of the rich man and Lazarus. They behaved well, and some were desirous to know if I intended to come again. Monday 12. Set out for our yearly conference, and having preached at Mr. P.'s, by the way, came safe to Mr. G.'s, and was glad to see the preachers who were there. We had some weighty conversation on different points, and among other things it was asked whether we could give our consent that Mr. R. should baptize, as there appeared to be a present necessity. But it was objected that this would be a breach of our discipline, and it was not probable that things would continue long in such a disordered state. The next day, with great harmony and joint consent, we drew a rough draft for stationing the preachers the ensuing year. And on Friday, we conversed on the propriety of signing certificates, avouching good conduct for such of the preachers as chose to go to Europe. But I cannot see the propriety of it at this time. We also conversed on such rules as might be proper for the regulation of the preachers who abide on the continent. And it was judged necessary that a committee should be appointed to superintend the whole. And on Monday we rode together to attend the conference at Deer Creek. So greatly has the Lord increased the number of traveling preachers within these few years, that we have now twenty-seven who attend the circuits, and twenty of them were present at this conference. Both our public and private business was conducted with great harmony, peace, and love. Our brethren who intend to return to Europe have agreed to stay till the way is quite open. I preached on the charge which our Lord gave his apostles. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. Our conference ended with a love feast and watch night. But when the time of parting came, many wept as if they had lost their firstborn sons. They appeared to be in the deepest distress, thinking, as I suppose, they should not see the faces of the English preachers any more. This was such a parting as I never saw before. Our conference has been a great time, a season of uncommon affection. And we must acknowledge that God has directed, owned, and blessed us in the work. A certificate, as mentioned above, had been acceded to, and signed in the conference. Lord's Day 25 My soul was quickened in preaching at the Bush Chapel. I lodged at Mr. D.'s, and the next day collected my writings and letters, in order to preserve them. On Tuesday went to Mr. G.'s, and on Wednesday began to read regularly Mr. Wesley's notes. Thursday, 29. We had a profitable meeting at Gunpowder Neck. And on Friday, I returned to preach at Mr. G.'s, where we had a small but warm congregation. 
Saturday, 31. The spirit of grace was with me, but I long for a more active life, to be constantly employed in bringing souls to God. Lord's Day, June 1. The Lord enlarged my heart, and opened a door of utterance, while preaching to a numerous congregation at the Forks. And there were some among them who had for a long time been detained by prejudice from hearing us. But I could not find the same liberty at Mr. G.'s in the latter part of the day. Tuesday 3. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God, though I have been at times sorely beset by temptations. But shall I ever yield to the tempter and sin against my Lord? No. In the strength of Jesus, no. Thursday 5. Having been ten days off and on at Mr. G.'s, I set out today for I.C.'s and preached by the way at P.H.'s. On Friday I laid aside my wig and began to use the cold bath for my health, and rode as far as Mrs. R.'s, who was a mother in Israel, and both a friend and mother to me. After many heavy trials my soul was comforted, but earnestly desirous of more purity and fellowship with God. Saturday 7 Some seemed to feel the weight of divine truths at Risterstown, and on the Lord's Day my heart was melted and expanded towards the people at Brother C.'s. Monday 9 I met Brother G.S. at Mr. C.'s and preached on Acts 16, 30, 31, then called to see a sick person and returned to Brother C.'s. Wednesday 11 I preached in town on these affecting words, How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? And on Thursday, entering my circuit at Mr. P.'s, we had a heart-affecting season, and a few joined the society. Friday, 13. We had great harmony and love in our increasing society at ours. Lord's Day, 15. There was a large, attentive audience in a schoolhouse on Elk Ridge, where I preached with usual energy and affection on Amos 4.11 and hope the time of favoring the souls of both rich and poor is now approaching. But after so great a blessing, Satan, as if moved with envy, attempted to wound me with his fiery darts. This was probably permitted by my gracious Lord, lest I should be exalted above measure. Brother G. S. came to accompany me into Virginia to fetch our clothing and books. Monday 16 We set out and rode to S.T.'s, where we received this strange relation. A person in the form of a man came to the house of another in the night. The man of the house asked what he wanted. He replied, This will be the bloodiest year that ever was known. The other asked how he knew. His answer was, It is as true as your wife is now dead in her bed. He went back and found his wife dead. But the stranger disappeared. On Monday we went to Brother A.M.'s, and on Wednesday to B.F.'s, a kind man, but his ideas of religion were confused. Thursday we rode to Leesburg, and found that Brother B.L.E. had just departed from this world of trouble and danger. My spirit was much drawn out towards God and the souls of the people, while preaching on Matthew 24, 45, etc. Tuesday we went on to Frederick, where I showed the people the danger of postponing their duties to God, from Amos 4.11. The next day we rode forty-five miles to Risterstown, and came in about seven o'clock. Wednesday, 25. By invitation, I visited I.D., who was very ill, and hope it will be followed by the operations of the Holy Spirit, and prove a permanent blessing to his soul. Then rode on to I.W.'s, and found myself unwell, but happy in God. Friday, 27. I went to Mr. H.'s and intended to preach in Annapolis, but there was no house open for me. The next day, two of the members of the assembly promised to use their influence in procuring me a house to preach in, but expected they could not succeed. Alas, what have I done? Whose ox or ass have I taken, or whom have I defrauded? but the Lord permits it to be so, 
Therefore I peaceably submit, and will not fear the face of man, nor even a prison, while employed in the cause of God and of truth. However, contrary to my expectation, I preached in the church, though the congregation was small, and the soldiers made a great noise before the door. I then concluded to preach the next time in the commons. But the rain which fell the next day prevented me, and there were but few people at Mrs. D.'s. Tuesday, July 1. The Lord blessed me with joy and peace in believing, and I was enabled to cast all my care upon him. On Tuesday I went to Mr. P.'s, about twenty miles, and have been much delighted in reading Dr. Watts's treatise on the rest of separate spirits, and Mr. Baxter's Saint's Rest. In these books we find the marrow of Methodism, that is, pure religion, and sound doctrine which cannot be condemned. Wednesday 2. Satan still manifesteth a desire to sift me as wheat, but the Lord supports me and fills me with peace. A lowering cloud hangs threatening over our heads, but all my trust is in the Lord, who hath stood by and preserved me for many years, and will stand by me still. Thursday 3. I rode about twelve miles and preached a funeral sermon on the death of Mr. W. It was a very affecting time, both to me and the congregation. But after I had read the rules in the society, I told them my doubts, and communicated my ideas of the approaching troubles, which produced a great melting amongst them. Saturday 5. I had some conversation with Mr. M. Y., but it was to no purpose, for he was still inflexible. Perhaps I have been too forward in taking his part before, and now he requites me for it. Lord's Day 6. There was a very serious congregation in the forenoon, where I enforced our Lord's affectionate declaration, Matthew 23:37. But in the latter part of the day, about eleven miles distant from the other place, the people seemed to be stupid and inattentive. As I have thought bacon was prejudicial to my health, I have lately abstained from it, and have experienced the good effects of this economy. My soul has been kept in great purity, and ardent pantings after more of God. Monday 7. In the evening D.R. and Brother H. came and brought me some account of the preachers, whom I love in the bowels of Christ, with much affection. We spent the next day together in love and to edification, and on Wednesday they set out for Virginia, and I for Annapolis. My spirit was somewhat dejected, by the way, with a fear that the people would reject the gospel of Jesus Christ to their own destruction. But these matters must be left to the Lord, who will judge the world in righteousness. I met a very insensible company at Mr. C.'s, and labored to fasten the truth on their hearts, from Malachi 3, 7, but it appeared to be labor in vain. Thursday 10. They received me at Mr. H.'s better than I expected, and some were touched by the power of grace. There was an opportunity on Friday of speaking, at least to the judgment of some rich and honorable men, on Psalm 4, 6, 7. There be many that say, Who will show us any good? Lord, Lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Thou hast put gladness in my heart, more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. My heaviness of spirit was almost removed, and my soul was free and happy in God. Lord's Day 13 Though I spoke closely and plainly at Mrs. D.'s, yet the audience did not seem properly to understand me. I had intended to preach in the commons this afternoon, but the rain prevented it, so I preached to a few desirous souls at Mr. H.'s. But my spirit is grieved within me to see such multitudes of people in these parts so forgetful of God, and filled with the spirit and conversation of this world. Poor souls, if they were only convinced of their sinful and lost estate, their disposition and conversation would be immediately changed. My work at present is very heavy. It is chiefly among unawakened people. I have devised what I could to bring them to God, and know not what new method to take. 
May the Lord take the work into his own hand. Monday, 14. There were forty or fifty, chiefly women, to hear the word at Annapolis, to whom I showed, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Though I spoke freely, yet but few of them seemed to feel it. On Tuesday my soul was under deep exercises. I am often purposing to pursue, with greater ardor, the summit of holiness, but still come short. Wednesday, 16. At a place ten miles from Annapolis, there was some melting of heart under the word. I afterward met the class, and then returned with my mind fixed on God, and sweet nearness of soul to Him. Thursday, 17. The Spirit of the Lord was with me in preaching at Mr. P.'s, and there was a great moving among the society. Blessed be God for all things. My body has been in tolerable health, and my soul frequently refreshed with the dew of heavenly grace. My meditations in the Hebrew Bible have afforded me great pleasure. This is the book I study for improvement. Lord's Day 20 Both at the schoolhouse where I called on the people to consider their ways, from Haggai 1, 5, and at Mr. R's, where I showed them, from Ezekiel 33, 31, how many of old time heard the word of the Lord, but did it not. There was very little appearance of anything more than attention, though I never labored more earnestly to do good. It seems as if a judicial stupidity in spiritual things prevails among them. Monday, 21. Heard Mr. Rankin preach his last sermon. My mind was a little dejected, and I now felt some desire to return to England, but was willing to commit the matter to the Lord. There was a large congregation, and some prospect of good things at Mr. S.'s, where I told the people, from the authority of Jesus Christ, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Luke 13:3. Wednesday, 23. God was still my object and my hope, but I have lamented my backwardness in doing good by private conversation, which is in a great measure owing to the natural bashfulness of my disposition. After visiting some poor people to pray and talk with them on the important subject of their salvation, I rode to seas at the head of South River, but it is a miserable, stupid, careless neighborhood, so I bid it farewell. Thursday, 24. There were many gay and giddy-looking folks to hear the word of the Lord, and a few of them were serious and affected. Poor souls, they are real objects of pity. Both their education and the circle of their acquaintance have a tendency to make them forget their latter end, and to bend all the strength of their minds to present objects. Friday, 25. We kept our general fast as appointed by conference, and my soul was enabled to cast all its little cares, both spiritual and temporal, on him that careth for me. May the Lord direct me how to act, so as to keep myself always in the love of God. I have lately been reading an account of Theodosius and his sons, with several of the ancient fathers, which also communicates much information relative to the eastern and western empires for about three hundred years, so long were idolatry and Arianism kept out of the Church of Christ. And while Chrysostom was bishop, an Arian church was burnt at Constantinople. But since that time, absolute, unconditional predestination has made its way into the Church, which nullifies all laws, human and divine. For if men cannot do otherwise than they do, why should any law inflict punishment for their crimes? Must quadrupeds be punished because they do not fly? How easily might men, believing this doctrine, ascribe their envy, malice, and most cruel inclinations to the effect of divine predestination, and conclude that their most malignant dispositions were eternally decreed, and therefore not to be conquered, but complied with, though they should produce the most pernicious and destructive consequences in human society. 
End of section 25. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 26 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 26. Saturday, 26. My soul was composed and in pursuit of more of God. Having read the conquest of Rome by Alaric, and the rending of the Western Empire by the Goths, I was led to observe how part of the revelation of St. John was then fulfilled. But much more of this is yet to come. Lord's Day 27 After explaining the parable of the sower at Mrs. D's, I preached at Annapolis to a large company, some serious and some gay and trifling, on these compassionate words of Christ, How often would I have gathered thy children together, and ye would not. Monday, 28. As the rain prevented my attending the appointment, I visited the jail, and found an unhappy mortal under sentence of death, who was very ignorant, but so susceptible of religious advice that he was melted into tears, and shook like a leaf. Tuesday, 29. The Lord discovered to my view a greater depth of holiness, and my soul thirsted for it. I met with Brother H., who had been to Virginia, but having some scruples of conscience about taking the test oath, was obliged to return. May the Lord direct us all how to pursue the most wise and prudent measures. The next day I preached at Magotty, where the work of God goes on successfully. Thursday, 31. At Mr. P.'s there were about a hundred souls who seemed much alive to God. Here I appointed a quarterly meeting at Love Feast on my return from Baltimore and Frederick next Saturday fortnight. Friday, August 1. The Lord gave me spiritual peace, but my soul was on stretch for a greater degree of holiness and deeper communion with God. I pant to feel thy sway, and only thee to obey. Thee my spirit gasps to meet, this my one, my ceaseless prayer. Make, O oh, make my heart thy seat, O oh, set up thy kingdom there. I have now finished reading sixteen volumes of the Universal History. Lord's Day 3 In the forenoon the poor rich sinners were very attentive in the schoolhouse on Elk Ridge, and it is possible the Lord may raise a people among them to fear and love him. But at Mr. R.'s in the afternoon, the congregation was very dull, though I spoke strong words from the Almighty's awful declaration concerning the ungodly. These shall go away into everlasting punishment. Monday 4. Rode thirty-seven miles to the Frederick Quarterly Meeting without breaking my fast, and was under the necessity of preaching when I arrived. The next day our meeting began with a love feast, and we had a powerful melting time. Friday 8 Having visited my friends in Baltimore, I rode to Mr. G's, met Mr. R, and had some agreeable conversation on the work of God in different parts of America. Went the next day to the Forks, where I met with Brother G S in great harmony, and found divine assistance in dispensing the word. Monday, 11. We settled all our little affairs in the spirit of love, and Brother S. partly agreed to go with me to the quarterly meeting. But, alas, though my confidence in Christ was not shaken, yet I felt myself less than the least in the company, and unworthy of the favor of both God and man. How merciful is God in giving us such abasing views of ourselves, which have a powerful tendency to drive us closer to Him, and keep us always in the dust. Tuesday, 12. After I had publicly declared to the righteous, The God whom we serve is able to deliver us, we then had a solemn, comfortable love feast, and having done our business, I returned to Mr. G's, where many people attended to receive the word of truth. And we have reason to believe the work of God is now reviving. 
Wednesday 13, was spent at Mr. G.'s, and after some conversation I found Brother S. was not to go with me, because Mr. R. did not choose to spend a quarter in Baltimore Circuit. Indeed, he has not taken a regular circuit since we have been in America, so I was obliged to go into a new circuit with a young exhorter who had deserted me once before. But all contentions wound my spirit, so I passively submitted. Thursday, 14. My mouth was opened, and my heart was enlarged at W.L.'s, and I hope the word was made a blessing to many souls. Friday, 15. Rode to Curtis's Creek to hold a quarterly meeting there, and the next morning we began with a love feast. It was a time of great power, and exceeded all we had ever seen in these parts. There was something very admirable in the Christian simplicity of the people, who spoke the language of warm and artless love. Brother S. preached a moving sermon on the barren fig tree, and many sinners wept. Lord's Day 17 The rain prevented my going to the ridge, and Brother S. from going to Baltimore. So we had a very melting time in discoursing on the subject of the Canaanitish woman. And, I believe, Brother S. was persuaded that he ought to be in this circuit with me. Monday, 18. This was a day of much temptation, but my deliverer was at hand. At C.S.'s I found a few from the ridge, who informed me that some attended yesterday in the rain. Hence I conclude, many of them had a desire to be saved, and that it is best for a preacher to attend his appointments, if the apparent risk is not too great. I preached to the people with much affection. Many felt the weight of the word, and a young woman was convinced of sin. Tuesday, 19. The Pacific Spirit of Grace had possession of my willing heart. After preaching at Mr. G.'s to a few souls as dull as usual, I crossed the river in the rain, and though I expected to feel the consequence, yet suffered no injury. Wednesday 20 How unlike real Christians are some that bear the name! The Lord hath enabled me, of late, to be faithful to the families which have come in my way. And we must overcome our natural bashfulness and backwardness to assist the precious souls of our fellow men, who are on the brink of endless ruin, and see it not. On Thursday, both the public congregation and the class were powerfully melted at Mr. C.'s. Lord's Day 24 I was much fatigued by riding twenty-five miles and preaching twice. A report that a British fleet was sailing up the Chesapeake Bay has induced many people to quit Annapolis. Lord, give thy people faith and patience, sufficient for their day of trial. Monday, 25 My soul confided in God, but was sweetly distressed with an ardent desire for more complete holiness. I have lately read Walker's sermons with much pleasure. We had an awful storm this evening at nine o'clock. The thunder, lightning, and sweeping winds were all in commotion. With reverence I turned my mind on the dread majesty and power of God, who, by the elements in which we live, contends with man. Such a scene as this was enough to strike the boldest sinner with terror, and make him even shudder at a wicked thought. And how dare wicked men sin at any time before a God so terrible? Is he less present at one time than another? No, verily. But they desire not the knowledge of God. Their surprise must be great beyond all expression, when disembodied they suddenly find themselves, by woeful experience, acquainted with nothing pertaining to their offended God, but His inexorable justice and vengeful power, of which the awful scenes we now behold in the contending elements are but a faint resemblance. Then how much better is it to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season? Happy the man whose hopes rely on Israel's God. He made the sky, and earth, and seas, with all their train. His truth forever stands secure. He saves the oppressed, he feeds the poor, and none shall find his promise vain. 
Tuesday, 26. T.W. informed me that they had made choice of me to preach in the Garrison Church. But I shall do nothing that will separate me from my brethren. I hope to live and die a Methodist. Wednesday, 27. Though it rained, I rode twenty-five miles to Magadi, but was tempted and shut up in my mind while endeavoring to announce, If God be for us, who can be against us? But the next day my soul was happy at Mr. P's, and I admitted four persons into the society on trial. The militia were now collecting from all quarters. On the Lord's day my soul was much drawn out and blessed in preaching on First John 2, 1617. Perhaps it will not be in my power to preach much longer with a clear conscience. But if it should be so, my greatest concern would be for the people of God. For many of the poor sinners seem deaf to all entreaties, and I seem to be only a witness for God against them, that their damnation may be just, if they will not obey the gospel. Monday, September 1 The Lord refreshed my own spirit, while I encouraged the few faithful souls who were present, from the words of our Lord, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Brother D.R., who had returned from Virginia, met me today. Wednesday 3 My soul was watered with the peaceful influence of divine grace. But what I enjoyed was a stimulus urging me to groan for more. I spent much of my time in reading Law's serious call, and Baxter's call to the unconverted, and think the latter is one of the best pieces of human composition in the world to awaken the lethargic souls of poor sinners. My mind was under heavy exercises, so I fasted and preached with much freedom at Mr. T's, but it brought on a smart fever. Though I was much indisposed, necessity was laid upon me to preach twice on Thursday, which increased my fever, and with indifferent lodging and the noise of children, the night was very uncomfortable. Lord's Day 7 after being blessed with a warm and comfortable season while preaching to a large company at Mr. H.'s, I then rode to the Widow P.'s, where the word went to the hearts of the people with divine energy, while I exposed to their view the polluted state of the natural man, and pointed out the sovereign remedy. Tuesday, 9. My mind was so intensely bent on seeking after more of God, that I devoted three hours to the exercise of private prayer, and found myself much drawn out by the Spirit of grace, in holy wrestling and communion with God. Being informed that Sister S. had slept in the Lord, I congratulated her felicity. Happy soul! She is taken away from the evil to come, and gone to Abraham's bosom, where the wicked cease from troubling, and where the weary are at rest. I have endeavored to banish all anxiety from my mind, and devote much of my time to prayer, and have reaped the gracious benefit thereof in my soul. On Wednesday I went to Magadi and had a large congregation, but found that some of our members had begun to backslide, and that the society stood in need of purging. Thursday 11 By particular request I preached a funeral sermon at the burial of Mr. W. R. There were a great many people, and some of them were cut to the heart while I enforced Ecclesiastes 9, 10. But afterward at Mr. P.'s my mind was somewhat embarrassed. Friday 12 In performing the last office for L.S., who was a Christian indeed, I declared, for the comfort of true believers, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Some attended on this occasion who had never heard a Methodist before, and the Lord gave me utterance and power. Monday, 15. We have great commotions on every side. But in the midst of war, the Lord keeps my soul in peace. My heart was warm in preaching at C.S.'s, though the congregation seemed dull. The two following days I had communion with God, but not in such a degree as I wished to experience. I long to comprehend the length 
and breadth, and depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that I may be filled with all the fullness of God, to live the life of heaven above, all the glorious life of love. Thursday, 18. At Mr. W.'s I met with Brother S.S., S., who informed me that the preachers in Virginia intended to abide there a while longer. Brother S. preached twice, and there was some small moving amongst the people. Lord's Day 21 There was nothing remarkable under the word at Mr. T.'s, but there was a large company and some melting of heart at Mr. P.'s. Monday 22 I met with Brother G.S., who informed me that my brethren, Mr. Rankin and Mr. Rhoda, had left the continent. So we are left alone. But I leave myself in the hand of God, relying on His good providence to direct and protect us, persuaded that nothing will befall me but what shall conduce to His glory and my benefit. There was both attention and concern in the congregation, which was pretty large, at Captain S.'s. Lord's Day 28 Brother G. S. was unwell with an ague. At Risterstown I urged the necessity of family duty, and showed them how they should train up their children in the ways of the Lord. Monday, 29. My soul was stayed upon God, and resigned to His unerring wisdom. I wished to be so subject to my Redeemer, as to move in conformity to His divine will, and in all my ways to acknowledge Him as my God and my guide. I spent part of my time the next day in reading Mr. Baxter's Gildas Salvianus, and esteem it as a most excellent book for a gospel preacher. Saturday, October 4. I rode thirty miles to G.B.'s to meet Brother P.D. My mind was spiritually employed in reading, meditation, and communion with God. Lord's Day 5. The congregation at G.B.'s were dull but at B.G.'s there was a melting. Tuesday 7. The word seemed to be made a peculiar blessing to the believers at I.H.'s, and the next day at Mr. K.'s the power of God was present, while I feelingly urged the people from Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy, and find grace to help in time of need. My spirit was also divinely animated in preaching afterwards at R.O.'s, though I rode twenty miles between the two sermons. Several old professors felt the reviving influence of the grace of God, and I was in hopes they would press on their way with renewed vigor. Such is the languid disposition of the human soul, that even pure minds require a constant stimulation to keep them in the way of duty. This is one reason why God permits our minds to be tempted by Satan, and our bodies to be afflicted with diseases. Saturday, 11. I attended and spoke at the half-yearly meeting of the Germans. And on the Lord's Day, after preaching at Mrs. D.'s, I returned to the meeting of the Germans, where Brother G.S. and myself both spoke. Monday, 13. Commotions and troubles surrounded me without, but the peace of God filled my soul within. We seemed to be in a strait, but my heart trusted in the Lord. These distressing times have lately induced many people to pay a more diligent attention to the things of God. So I have hopes that these temporal troubles will prepare the way for spiritual blessings. Wednesday 15 a heavy gloominess hung on my mind. Brother G. S. and I rode to Mr. H.'s, and after I had enforced these words, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Then Brother S. exhorted, and the hearts of the people melted under the power of the word. We likewise saw the merciful hand of God displayed the next day, at Mr. W.'s, on the bank of the Potomac. Lord's Day, 19 As I was unwell, Brother S. preached in the morning on Thy Kingdom Come, and there was a moving in the congregation. 
He also preached in the afternoon at Mr. B.'s, but it was to a large company of stupid souls. Monday, 20. After I had preached, Brother S. met the class, and it was a very powerful season. He also met a class afterward at Mr. S. R.'s, and we were favored with a similar blessing. This has been a day of spiritual and peaceful exercises to my soul. At Mr. H.'s on Tuesday, we were blessed with an extraordinary visitation of grace. Thursday, 30. We have been detained by heavy rains at W.S.'s for three days. The times still wear a gloomy aspect, but our trust is in the providence of a superintending God. We have been greatly blessed, and seen great displays of the divine goodness since we have been together. And we have been made a blessing to each other. We now left Mr. S.'s and rode to Rocky Creek. Lord's Day, November 2. I cried in the morning to a large congregation at Mr. J. N.'s, We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And in the afternoon at the sugar loaf, why will ye die? And my soul was enlarged and blessed both times. I then rode to G. G.'s, which made about twenty miles in the day. Monday, 3. Our quarterly meeting began, and Brother S. preached on the subject of the barren fig tree. On Tuesday we held our love feast at nine, and I preached at twelve. Our brethren O. G., C., S. G., and S. D. all spoke. There were many friends from Virginia, and the congregation was very large. It was a powerful, melting time, and concluded in the spirit of love. Wednesday, 5. After riding thirty-seven miles, I came to Baltimore, but was very weary, though my mind was calmly stayed on God. Friday, 7. Went to Mr. G.'s, and on Saturday preached on Third John 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Lord's Day, 9. After preaching with freedom of spirit and speech at the Forks, I returned to Mr. G.'s and declared, Ye are the salt of the earth. My soul has been kept by the grace of God, and calm on tumult's wheels I sit. Monday, 10. We set out for the quarterly meeting at Deer Creek. On Tuesday, our love feast began at 10, and at half-past two I began the public exercise from Hebrews 13, 17, 18. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy, and not with grief. For this is unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience, and all things willing to live honestly. The preachers were stationed without any trouble, and all was done in harmony and love. Wednesday, 12. I rode back to Mr. G.'s in order to attend a quarterly meeting on Curtis's Creek. The Lord has lately kept my soul in tranquil peace, not much disturbed by Satan. I now purposed, by the grace of God, as often as time will permit, to read six chapters every day in my Bible. Saturday, 15. Great numbers of people attended at the quarterly meeting. Preaching on Acts 14.22, I endeavored to imitate the apostles, confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. The power of divine grace was greatly felt in the love feast, and all our business was well conducted. Lord's Day 16 Having first preached at the Widow H.'s, I rode to Baltimore and preached there. On Tuesday I was blessed in a visit to Mr. G.'s. Wednesday 19 Rode to Risterstown and found that God was my sufficient portion and my exceeding great reward. I wanted nothing pertaining to this world more than I possessed, neither clothing, nor money, nor food. Blessed be God for his parental love and tender care towards me. Nothing on earth I call my own, a stranger to the world unknown. 
I all their goods despise. I trample on their whole delight, and seek a country out of sight, a country in the skies. End of section 26. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 27 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 27. Friday, 21. I have endeavored to improve my time to the best advantage in reading, and have seen so much beauty and holiness that I have thirsted and longed for more. My desire is, like Abraham, the father of the faithful, to maintain a constant walk with God. Lord's Day 23 At Mr. S.'s I exposed the unjust plea which many make against serving God, from Matthew 25, 24. Then he which had received the one talent came, and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strewed. Thus do thousands charge God foolishly. We cannot repent and bring forth fruits meet for repentance. We cannot cease from evil and learn to do well. We cannot deny ourselves and take up our cross. We cannot come to Christ that we may have life. At least we cannot do these things now, we must wait God's time. But God requireth these things now. Therefore, those who say they cannot do them, practically say he is a hard master. At Risterstown in the afternoon, my heart was expanded, and my mouth was opened, while I declared, He that, being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. On Monday I parted with W.G. and S.S. Wednesday, 26. I came to Mr. G.'s on my way to the eastern shore. On Saturday I intended to have crossed the bay, but was prevented by the weather. My soul has lately felt much of the power of God, and I have been enabled to trust Him with myself and all my concerns. Monday, December 1. I left Mr. G.'s, and, after crossing the bay, came in safety at night to Mr. H.'s. Having been absent more than four years, though I was the first of our preachers who carried the gospel into this neighborhood. My heart was thankful to God for His providential and gracious preservation of me. The next day I went to the island and preached with some warmth, and then returned. The two following days we had profitable times both in preaching and class meetings. Thursday 4. Preaching and meeting the class at Mr. G.'s, I found the Lord had carried on a good work in the souls of many. Blessed be God! My soul was in a comfortable frame, and my body was the better for exercise. Lord's Day 7. Though I spoke with feeling and warmth, yet the people were dull both at F.T.'s and Mr. H.'s. But my own soul was kept in solemn nearness to God and filled with peace and love. And I am persuaded that my appointment to this circuit is by divine providence. Thursday, 11. Early in the morning I felt a strong desire for more of God. At Mr. W.'s my soul was much refreshed in preaching and class meeting. As the congregations are generally large, and most of the people attentive, we have a much greater prospect of doing good in this circuit than in some others. Saturday, 13. I have been blessed with faith and hope and love. Lord, if troubles are near, be thou nearer still to protect and comfort me. So shall I not fear what man can do unto me. Lord's Day, 14. We had a good time in the forenoon, and I found the class in better condition than I expected. In the afternoon the Lord blessed me with freedom and solid peace, while preaching at I.S.'s on Ezekiel 33, 11. There is a great prospect of saving souls in this neighborhood, if preaching can be continued. 
Monday, 15. There was a simple, loving people assembled at Mr. S.'s, and many were powerfully wrought on while I enforced the divine command, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 7.33 For some days past my spirit has been rather hurried, and sometimes tempted by Satan, but wonderfully supported by the grace of God. An agreeable prospect opens to my imagination, if Providence should permit me to spend the winter in this circuit. Tuesday, 16. At Mr. W.'s I met with B.S., who once preached the gospel, and a blessing attended his labors. Thursday was a public fast day, and my soul was kept in a degree of peace, but struggled much for a more constant, fervent spirit of devotion. Having preached at Mr. G.'s, I rode to T.W.'s, and lectured in the evening, with satisfaction, from the first psalm. On Saturday I was much embarrassed in preaching at Mr. H.D.'s, and under a heavy cloud rode to H.N.'s. But on the Lord's Day my heart was enlarged and inflamed with love, while preaching to a large audience on Second Thessalonians 1, 6 through 8. Monday, 22. I preached a funeral sermon near the Nine Bridges, and met with a young minister who had been under divine impressions. My heart at that time was much united to him, but he afterward became a lawyer. Tuesday, 23. Rode through Chestertown about thirty miles to Mr. H.'s, and enjoyed some rest from a part of my labor. In reading Josephus, I have been led to reflect on the disorder and confusion which have always overspread the earth, in a greater or less degree, ever since the introduction of sin. Blessed be God! My mind is kept free from all tormenting fear, and although my spiritual trials are various and great, His grace is always found sufficient for me. The next day, I exhorted the people who came together, and we spent some time in prayer. Thursday, 25. Mr. W. read a good sermon, suitable to the day, at church. Many people attended at the preaching house, where I declared from 1 Timothy 1, 15, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The language of my heart on this Christmas day was, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides thee. The next morning also I was in the spirit of devotion, and enjoyed the peace of God which passeth all understanding. Having preached a funeral sermon in the forenoon, I addressed the congregation at Mr. H.'s from John 1, 45, 46. Thursday, January 1, 1778 Though the weather has been very cold for several days, I have had to ride, sometimes a considerable distance, and preach every day. This day, I preached a funeral sermon on the death of a daughter of her who was buried last Friday. My text was, This year thou shalt die. Death, like a cruel conqueror, spareth none on whom he seizeth but sendeth them to the shades of eternity, without respect to age or condition. Friday 2 I experienced much of the love of Jesus Christ shed abroad in my heart, and through his meritorious mediation found a delightful nearness to God. Indeed, I have found great happiness during this Christmas season, and have endeavored to redeem my time by diligent industry. May the Lord keep me steadfast and faithful to the end, and bless me with an abiding witness that I love him with all my heart. The people were lively today at Mr. C.'s, and especially in the class meeting. Lord's Day 4 The word of the Lord went to the hearts of the people with cutting power, both at Frederick in the forenoon and at Mr. H.N.'s in the afternoon but my own mind has been under exercises from Satan. On Monday my spirit was grieved for want of more spirituality and more of God. The congregation at Mr. S. N.'s was large but dull. But the people seemed quickened both at Mr. A.'s on Tuesday and at Mr. H.D.'s on Wednesday. 
Thursday, 8. I enjoyed sweet communion with God this morning, and was enabled to rest my soul on Him as my never-failing support. God was powerfully with us at Mr. S.W.'s on Friday, and the people felt the weight of divine truths. Lord's Day 11 By reason of the snow, the congregations were small, but the Lord gave us His blessing. My soul has possessed a holy calm, and I found the Lord constantly with me, in a greater or less degree. I have just finished the last volume of Whiston's Josephus, and am surprised that, at the age of seventy, Mr. Whiston should spend so much of his time in such a dry, chronological work. How much better was Mr. Baxter employed, when he thought himself near to eternity, meditating and writing on the saint's everlasting rest. Tuesday, 13. A solemn, comfortable sense of God rested on my soul this morning, and at Mr. T.'s there was a good congregation of poor, but serious and desirous people. At the Widow J.'s on Wednesday there was a general melting, and six were received into the society on trial. So there is some ground to hope that this place, which has appeared to be barren, will yet bring forth the fruits of righteousness. Many were also much affected at Mr. V.'s. After the service was ended, two men in arms came up, but they went away without making known their design. Friday, 16. I found great liberty of spirit and speech at Mr. G.'s, and there met with Brother G.S. Lord's Day, 18. After discoursing at Mr. A.N.'s on the parable of the sower, I thought it proper to remove the preaching to another house, for his religious sentiments did not agree with ours. Tuesday, 20. My soul was kept humble and watchful, and I have been enabled to put my whole trust in God on all occasions. Brother L. sent me some account of the work of God, and I am strongly persuaded that he will defend his own cause and his own people. Wednesday, 21. The house was not sufficient to contain the congregation at the Widow W.'s, and the word went with power to the hearts of the people. Thursday was a very cold day, yet many, both rich and poor, attended at I.K.'s. And the Lord enabled me to show them plainly to what lengths a man may go in the externals of religion, and be but almost a Christian. Friday, 23 my heart was fixed on God. I have lately found more sweetness and delight than ever before in reading the Old Testament. And having met with Luther's comment on the Galatians, I have begun to read that. After riding eight miles to Mr. H.'s, I found that I had eight miles farther to ride to preach a funeral sermon at Mr. F.'s, and the Spirit of the Lord rested upon my soul. Then rode five miles more, in great peace and love, to lodge at Mr. M.'s. Lord's Day 25 Many attended at Mr. R.'s in the forenoon, and God gave me power to speak to their hearts. I then rode ten miles farther to the meeting-house, and preached to about three hundred solemn and attentive people. Tuesday 27 Both my body and mind were under a heavy gloom. Attempting to preach in Quaker Neck, my mind was shut up, and I had no power to speak to the people. This is very painful and disagreeable, but it ought to be borne with patience. Physic is necessary sometimes, as well as food. Wednesday, 28. My soul had peace, and enjoyed sweet rest in God, after all my trials. May I ever glorify Him, even in the fires. Dark prospects, in temporal matters, present themselves to my view. But the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and he hath promised to be a wall of fire round about his church, and the glory in the midst of her. I preached a funeral sermon at the meeting-house on 1 Corinthians 15.20. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. There were many people on this solemn occasion, and my heart was enlarged towards them. Lord's Day, February 1. 
we had a good time at Frederick in the forenoon, and I found myself at liberty in the afternoon at Mr. H.'s. My heart feels nothing contrary to love and purity, and the effect thereof is abundant peace. Troubles stare me in the face, but I have confidence towards God, and without perplexing myself with anxious care, will leave all events to Him. Monday, too. There was some appearance of a revival at Mr. S.'s, and the Lord blessed my soul with liberty, peace, and love. On Tuesday we had a love feast at L.A.'s, and many delivered their affectionate testimony of God's goodness and love in Christ Jesus. Wednesday 4 I received a strange account, which had been attested on oath by the people who lived in the house, but am at a loss to know what judgment to pass upon it. The fact was this. A wicked young fellow, whose friends countenanced the truths of the gospel, was disposed, it seems, to curse the preacher. But, being deterred from doing it openly, he went to the place of worship with a design to curse him in his heart. It seems he was struck with terror, and soon after died. His own brother said, The devil pulled his heart out. Lord's Day 8 after preaching at Mr. F.'s in the forenoon, I met the congregation at Mr. S.'s, who is a striking instance of the power and goodness of God. Some time ago he was, like Saul, an opposer of the truth, but grace hath changed his heart. Thursday 12 The Lord hath supported me in preaching at every place, and this day I came to T.W.'s and met Brother G.S., the martial, threatening aspect of the times has had a great tendency to keep me close to God, and my soul has experienced the benefit. Saturday 14 I had much peace, but too much company. My time was not spent to the greatest advantage. But the next day I felt the power of divine truths in my own heart, while preaching at E.W.'s from 1 Peter 1, 13-15. Monday, 16. Our quarterly meeting began in Mr. W.'s barn, and numbers attended from different parts. On Tuesday morning we held our love feast, and the Lord was with us. My heart was powerfully drawn out in preaching on the last three verses of the 48th Psalm. Wednesday, 18. I set my face unto the Lord God, to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting. And although Brother S. had manifested a desire to leave the continent, he now agreed to abide in the country with me a while longer. Lord's Day 22 Though the weather was disagreeable, yet many people attended at E.W.'s, and there appeared to be a promising prospect, amongst the young people especially. I have great hopes that the Lord will show mercy, and make his power known in the family of the W.S., Monday, 23. Satan has made several violent pushes at my soul, but he has not been able even to break my peace. The word was powerfully applied to the hearts of the people at Mr. G's today. Wednesday, 25. After preaching with holy warmth at Mr. L. N.'s, I met the class, in which were some faithful souls, but others that could hardly bear plain dealing. But we must deal plainly and honestly, though affectionately and tenderly, with all that come in our way, and especially with such as put themselves under our pastoral care. If we seek to please men, unless it is for their good to edification, we are not the servants of Christ. Thursday, 26. I spoke closely and pointedly to many poor ignorant people at the widow I.P.'s and on Friday met a dull congregation at Mr. C.'s. Monday, March 2 Rode to I.K.'s on Cedar Creek, an old Presbyterian who keeps his coffin ready-made. But both the congregation and the class seemed very blind and ignorant in spiritual things. Thursday, 5 Returned to T.W.'s with a cold in my head and an inflammation in my throat, 
which detained me till the Lord's day. But my time was chiefly spent in prayer and reading Flavel's and Hartley's works, though no book is equal to the Bible. I have also received much instruction and great blessings of late in reading Mr. Wesley's works. There is a certain spirituality in his works, which I can find in no other human compositions. And a man who has any taste for true piety can scarce read a few pages in the writings of that great divine without imbibing a greater relish for the pure and simple religion of Jesus Christ, which is therein so scripturally and rationally explained and defended. Monday, 9. S.S. came in from the upper circuit, but on Tuesday both he and G.S. left me. However, I was easy, for the Lord was with me. And if he will be with me, and bring me to my father's house in peace, he shall be my God forever. Yea, let him do with me as seemeth good in his sight. Only let him not take his Holy Spirit from me, and he shall be mine, and I will be his, in time and through eternity. Friday 13 I was under some heaviness of mind. But it was no wonder. Three thousand miles from home. My friends have left me. I am considered by some as an enemy of the country. Every day liable to be seized by violence and abused. However, all this is but a trifle to suffer for Christ and the salvation of souls. Lord, stand by me. Lord's Day 15 My temptations were very heavy, and my ideas were greatly contracted in preaching. Neither was my soul happy, as at many other times. It requires great resignation for a man to be willing to be laid aside as a broken instrument. But in all my temptations he keeps me, to prove his utmost salvation, his fullness of love. Monday 16 I applied myself to the Greek and Latin Testament, but this is not to me like preaching the gospel. However, when a man cannot do what he would, he must do what he can. Wednesday 18 To make the best of my time in this partial confinement, I have attended closely to my studies, spent some time in instructing the children, and intend to lecture frequently in the family. This day I received information that Brother W. was cast into prison at Annapolis. Saturday, 21 My spiritual exercises have been various. I have frequently been under powerful temptations, but at other times my soul has been serene and comfortable. Much of my time is spent in study, and my desire is to glorify God in all I do, and spend all I gain in his service. Lord's Day 22 A large congregation attended at E.W.'s while I enforced the important inquiry, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? A warm, affectionate zeal glowed in my heart, and some of the people were affected. On Monday, I met with Brother C.X. and sent him into the upper circuit, intending myself to abide here for a season till the storm is abated. Wednesday 25 Blessed be God! His providence hath cast my lot in a quiet, agreeable family, where I can make the best improvement of my time in study and devotion. Brother C. R. came from below, and we had a meeting at E. W.'s, where some were deeply cut to the heart by the two-edged sword of the word. Friday, 27. The grace of God is a sufficient support, while I bear the reproach of men, and am rewarded with evil for all the good which I have done, and desire to do for mankind. I want for no temporal convenience, and endeavor to improve my time by devotion and study. But all this cannot give full satisfaction, while it is not in my power to labor more for God in seeking the salvation of souls. But I am strongly persuaded that divine providence will bring about a change before long. Thursday, April 2 This night we had a scene of trouble in the family. 
my friend Mr. T. W. was taken away, and his wife and family left in great distress of mind. The next day I sought the interposition of God by fasting and prayer. End of section 27. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 28 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 28. Saturday 4. This was a day of much divine power and love to my soul. I was left alone, and spent part of every hour in prayer, and Christ was near and very precious. The next day I preached with great solemnity at E. W.'s on Second Corinthians 6.20, and on Monday found freedom to move. After riding about fifteen miles, I accidentally stopped at a house where a corpse was going to be buried, and had an opportunity of addressing a number of immortal souls. I then rode on through a lonesome, devious road, like Abraham, not knowing whither I went. But weary and unwell, I found a shelter late at night, and there I intended to rest till Providence should direct my way. This was something like the faithful saints of old times, mentioned Hebrews 11. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, and in mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth, though it must be acknowledged their trials far exceeded. Tuesday 7. My soul was kept in peace, and I spent much of my time in reading the Bible and the Greek Testament. Surely God will stand by and deliver me. I have none other on whom I can depend and he knows with what intention and for what purposes I came into this distant and strange land, and what little I have suffered for his cause. At night a report was spread which inclined me to think it would be most prudent for me to move the next day. Accordingly I set out after dinner, and lay in a swamp till about sunset, but was then kindly taken in by a friend. My soul has been greatly humbled and blessed under these difficulties and I thought myself like some of the old prophets, who were concealed in times of public distress. Thursday 9 I promised God that if He would lift me up, I would be wholly His, and spend as much time in returning thanks as I have spent in seeking His protection, which has been some part of every hour. My soul has been much comforted in reading J. Aline's letters, which he wrote in prison. I felt strong confidence in God that He would deliver me, being conscious that I sought neither riches nor honor, and that what I suffered was for the sake of His spiritual church and the salvation of my fellow men. I was informed that Brother J. H. was apprehended last Lord's Day in Queen Anne. May the Lord strengthen and support him, while he suffers for righteousness' sake. He shall be faithfully remembered by me in my addresses to the throne of grace. This evening I was called upon to visit a person in distress of mind, and the Lord gave him rest for his soul. Perhaps Providence cast my lot in this place for the assistance of this man. Friday 10 My heart was kept pure, and panting after God, though I was in some sense a prisoner, and under the necessity of being concealed, rather than sacrifice the peace of my conscience, and offend my God. O oh, my Lord, guide thy poor pilgrim through the rugged ways of this ungodly and dangerous world. And if I suffer with Christ here, may I finally reign with him in glory. Who suffer with our Master here, we shall before his face appear, and by his side sit down. To patient faith the prize is sure and all that to the end endure, the cross, shall wear the crown. My practice is to keep close to God in prayer, and spend a part of every hour, when awake, in that exercise. I have lately begun to read Mr. Wesley's notes again, 
and have always found both them and his sermons to be made an especial blessing to my soul. My exercises are very deep and various. The Lord makes great discoveries of my defects and shortcomings in many points. He melts my heart into humility and tenderness. He graciously draws me nearer and nearer to himself, and fills me with the spirit of holy love. Saturday, 11. God was my portion, and my soul rested in him. But I was at a loss to know what to do. My time was useless in respect to others, though I carefully improved it for my own spiritual advantage, which, for some years past, had been in a degree neglected, on account of my great attention to the souls of others. And I know not what to determine, whether to deliver myself into the hands of men, to embrace the first opportunity to depart, or to wait till providence shall further direct. The reason of this retirement was as follows. From March 10, 1778, on conscientious principles I was a non-juror, and could not preach in the state of Maryland, and therefore withdrew to the Delaware state, where the clergy were not required to take the state oath. Though, with a clear conscience, I could have taken the oath of the Delaware state had it been required, and would have done it had I not been prevented by a tender fear of hurting the scrupulous consciences of others. St. Paul saith, When ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. 1 Corinthians 8, 12 Lord's Day 12 This was one of my dumb and silent Sabbaths, and was spent in fasting and prayer, that the Lord may turn again my captivity. My soul was greatly humbled, and not a little comforted in waiting before God. I lament that part of the Lord's flock is carried away captive, but hope that those who remain in Zion will be holiness to the Lord, and found among the living in Jerusalem. Monday 13 I formerly thought it would be death to me to keep silence from declaring the word of God, but now I am in a measure contented, and hope to see a day of liberty once again. It appears to be the will of God that I should be silent for a season, to prepare me for further usefulness hereafter. Therefore my time shall be employed to the best advantage. Tuesday 14 I am not yet forsaken of all, but am happy in the family where I stay, and my soul is fixed on God. I have a private chamber for my asylum, where I comfort myself in God, and spend my time in prayer and Meditation and Reading The next day Brother J. F. held a public meeting. He appeared to be a well-meaning good man, and who hath despised the day of small things? Thursday 16 My soul was blessed with peace, but I earnestly desire to be more spiritual in all my thoughts, words, and actions. Friday 17 Being Good Friday, I devoted myself to fasting and prayer. How many such days have I spent in addressing large congregations on the mournful subject of our blessed Lord's crucifixion? But I am now deprived of the privilege of making a public improvement of the day. I must sit down and weep when I remember Zion and the years of God's right hand. Oh, how I long to see His goings in the sanctuary, as in times past! Return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel, and cause us to rejoice according to the days in which we have seen trouble. I now enjoy a favorable opportunity of taking a circumstantial review of my past life. But, alas, how am I ashamed and covered with blushing before God! My soul is bowed in awful reverence and melting humility before the mercy seat. My intention has been pure as far as I can judge. But on account of my imperfections, if there were no mediator, there could be no hope of mercy. But, blessed be God, I can come with humble boldness to the throne of grace, knowing that we have a high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. I hope to learn obedience by the things I suffer, 
and walk more watchfully and piously before God for the time to come. Saturday, 18. I labored to make the best use of my precious time, and hope to be better prepared for future service on earth, or for eternal service in heaven. I bear our dear, suffering friends on my heart. Lord's Day, 19. Another solitary Sabbath. Ezekiel's portion is mine, to be dumb for a season. But the Lord gives me patience, and supports me under it. The family amongst whom my lot is cast use me with great kindness. And may the Lord show kindness to them according to all that they have done unto me. Monday 20 Reading the Revelation, with Mr. Wesley's notes, was made a particular blessing to my soul but my conscience checked me severely for not reading more frequently that part of the sacred canon, seeing such a blessing is pronounced on them that read and understand it. But I intend for the future, if time and health will permit, to read one chapter in it every day. Tuesday, 21 I purposed in my own mind to spend ten minutes out of every hour when awake in the duty of prayer. May the Lord help me to pay all the vows which my heart hath uttered, and my mouth hath spoken in the time of trouble. Wednesday, 22 I finished Mr. Wesley's notes on the New Testament, and began to read Doddridge's Rise and Progress, but am not so decorated with holy love as the temple of God should be. I am reconciled to my condition, and in faith and prayer Commit all events to my divine protector. This is an excellent season for dressing my own vineyard. Thursday, 23. God was near, and my heart was exceedingly humbled before him. I finished Doddridge, and was pleased, instructed, and affected thereby. I think an abridgment of this book would be of great service to our societies. Friday, 24. I began reading Honest John Bunyan's Holy War, and my soul was kept in peace, but earnestly desirous of every branch and degree of perfect love. Holiness is far preferable to the greatest wisdom. Lord's Day 26 I was still confined and obliged to keep silence, but spent much of the day in reading the Revelation, with Mr. Wesley's notes upon it. As this revelation was given on the Lord's Day, what can be a more proper subject for meditation on that day? Devoting much of my time to the exercise of prayer, I pray frequently for my dear parents and friends, as well as for myself. Wednesday, 29 Ventured to leave my asylum, and under the special providence of God came safe to my old abode, where I purpose spending these perilous days in retirement devotion, and study. I want for nothing but more holiness, and wonder at the love and care of Almighty God towards such a dead dog as I am. My spirit was greatly comforted by Psalm 106, 10. He saved them from the hand of him that hated them, and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Friday, May 1 The minds of the people are so confused and filled with the spirit and troubles of the times, that it does not appear to me as if God required me to treat with them on spiritual and eternal subjects, till they can, with some considerate calmness, pay attention to those momentous matters. I have lately been grievously haunted by the temptations of Satan, but my desire is to die rather than live to sin against God. Lord, stand by me in the day of trial and every moment support my feeble soul. On Saturday also my mind was much harassed by my spiritual adversary, and my study and devotion were interrupted, so that I could do but little either for God or myself. Lord's Day 3 My mind was strangely twisted and tortured, not knowing what to do. It seems I know not how to fight, nor how to fly but I am persuaded there will be a speedy change in the wheel of providence, either prosperous or adverse. Others are now free, but I am bound. 
reading at present no other books on the Lord's Days, I have lately read the Revelation, with Mr. Wesley's notes, three times through. Monday 4 Satan hath a desire to destroy, or at least to disturb my soul. But I pray mightily to God against him. O oh, that he may rebuke the tempter, and make a way for my escape. On Wednesday my temptations were so violent that it seemed as if all the infernal powers were combined to attack my soul. Like Elijah, when persecuted by Jezebel, I was ready to request for myself that I might die. However, about noon the storm abated, and my soul was calm. I had felt as though I could neither pray nor read. But the Lord blessed my troubled soul while endeavoring to pray with Brother E. W. My temptations have been such as I never experienced before in the course of my life. But God will help me, and I shall yet praise Him. Both Friday and Saturday my spiritual enemies were upon me, but my soul had more strength from the Lord. My practice is to spend some part of every hour in prayer. Lord, what is man, that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him? On Saturday Brother W. came home, as an answer to prayer. On the Lord's Day I read the Revelation three times over and experienced great sweetness in my soul, both in reading and family exercises. Monday, 11 My mind was deeply exercised, not knowing what to do. If the Lord delivers me, I shall be bound to praise Him. If I had a thousand hearts and tongues, and a million of years to live, all would be insufficient for paying the mighty debt of praise. Time and language and numbers all fail in point of praise and adoration for the unmerited mercies of a gracious God. Praise ye the Lord, ye immortal choirs, that fill the realms above. Praise him who formed you of his fires, and feeds you with his love. Tuesday 12 My exercises were still grievous but I am persuaded that all these trials will contribute to the spiritual advantage of my soul. Temptations and prayer, as one observes, qualify a gospel minister for his work. But I am ready to ask, as one of old, Lord, are there few that be saved? May God vouchsafe to help and deliver his few afflicted people. Wednesday 13 I met a small congregation and my soul was blessed in speaking to the people, as it usually is on such occasions. O oh my God, when wilt thou turn again my captivity? Surely Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. Thursday 14 I still attend to prayer, study, and teaching the children, but cannot be fully satisfied without preaching the gospel, which appears to be my peculiar province though I find more relish for the word of God and greater sweetness in reading it than ever before. Friday 15 My soul was for the most part in peace, though at times my own trials and the trials of others produced strong agonies of mind. But strengthened with divine might, I am able to oppose the tempter in his most violent assaults, and am brought off more than conqueror. The study of the Holy Scriptures affords me great pleasure. Lord, help me to dig into the gospel field as for hidden treasure. Saturday 16 It may be observed that two of our preachers have been apprehended, rather than do violence to conscience, and the men by whom they were both taken were dangerously wounded within a few weeks after they had laid hands upon them. I am now resigned to my confinement and am persuaded that God, by His providence, will show me when and which way to go. Lord's Day 17 As a congregation was collected to hear the word, I ventured to preach, and found my soul much drawn out both in speaking to God and the people. Perhaps this was a token of future enlargement and usefulness. Monday 18 
my spirit was oppressed by heavy temptations. The preachers and people began to convene for the quarterly meeting, which was to begin the next day. Tuesday, 19. Brother C. X. began our quarterly meeting, and then I preached with tender sensibility and warm affection a humiliation sermon on Joel 2, 16-18. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thy heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land, and pity his people. The hearts of the people were greatly melted under the word, and the power of the Lord was with us in the afternoon also. We were quiet and undisturbed, and I hope the word will take root in the hearts of some who were present. On Wednesday there was so much company about me that I could not keep in my usual and desirable track of walking with God. Thursday, 21. My mind was somewhat dissipated. A young woman, who had been awakened by the instrumentality of Captain W., but deprived of the means of grace for about four years, and had thought she could never be happy unless amongst the Methodists, was now brought to God by faith in Jesus Christ, and found peace in her soul. Another person was also brought into deep distress for an interest in Christ about the same time. Our family meetings are now attended with great power. Friday, 22. Satan worried my mind with his temptations. But at night we joined the two families together for worship, and the Spirit of the Lord was with us in power. Saturday, 23. I set this day apart for fasting and prayer, especially in behalf of Brother T.W. My soul was comforted to hear that Mrs. P., near seventy years of age, knew by experience that she could be born again, though she was old. This week the Lord has given me two, as the children of my bonds. Monday, 25. T.W. went back to have his case determined. He left his family in much distress of mind. I endeavored to minister some comfort to them. But in respect to myself, everything appeared to be under a cloud, so that I knew not, as yet, what the Lord would be pleased to do with me. I now began to read Barclay's Apology, and to make some strictures. Friday, 29. I spent much of the forenoon in prayer, and read through the book of Job, but was sorely tempted by the devil. My spiritual trials have been heavier and more grievous of late than I have ever experienced before in all the course of my pilgrimage. They seem to indicate to me that I shall lose my soul, or lose my life, or live for some peculiar usefulness in the Church of Christ. On Saturday, Mr. H. Y. came to see me, and I ventured to set out for Mr. W.'s. But having been so long unaccustomed to riding, my body was exceedingly fatigued. However, my soul was much refreshed in meeting the people there. Lord's Day 31 My body was indisposed, but many people came together to hear the word of God. And as there had been some little disorders among them, I discoursed on Second Timothy 2, 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And... Let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We had a profitable time, and in the afternoon I went to hear Mr. C., who appeared to be a well-meaning, though a weak man. Monday, June 1 I rode about twenty miles and came home very unwell, and continued for several days afflicted with a fever and boils. But my soul was peaceably stayed on the Lord in the midst of various and heavy trials, both of body and mind. 
Lord's Day 7. Being Whit Sunday, I went to the barn, weak as I was, and preached on Romans 8, 7 through 9. My heart was enlarged, and the people were greatly melted and alarmed, and many of them felt the gracious drawings of the Father. But, alas, I am as gold in the furnace, though I must not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try me, as though some strange thing had happened unto me. In my patience may I possess my soul, and the Lord in his own time will deliver me. Surely, when this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall there be an eternal day without a cloud, ease without pain, and joy without any mixture of sorrow. I preached again in the afternoon, and found great liberty in my spirit. Peradventure, the Lord will, in this barren place, raise up a seed to serve him. Wednesday 10 I had both great peace and heavy trials, but have cause to complain of the want of more seriousness and devotion to God. I find the more pious part of the people called Quakers are exerting themselves for the liberation of the slaves. This is a very laudable design, and what the Methodists must come to, or, I fear, the Lord will depart from them. But there is cause to presume that some are more intent on promoting the freedom of their bodies than the freedom of their souls, without which they must be the vassals of Satan in eternal fire. Saturday 13 For a few days past my mind has been variously agitated at certain times by that restless fallen spirit, who so often attempts to break my peace. But my soul has been kept by the same omnipotent, gracious arm which has been so frequently displayed in my behalf. I went to R. W.'s, where all our souls were under the softening influence of divine grace in the class meeting. With animation of spirit, I preached twice on the Lord's Day to large congregations. As the gospel of Jesus Christ meets with indulgence in this free state, I entertain a hope that it will prove a general blessing to the inhabitants thereof, and that Delaware will become as the garden of the Lord, filled with plants of his own planting. Monday 15 The congregation was large at Mr. K.'s, but showed too much appearance of spiritual insensibility. I have lately been surprised, and self-reproved, for not feeling the same earnest desire that the word might profit the hearers, after it was delivered, as I have felt before the preaching began. My soul was deeply engaged with the Lord, at this time, that the word might prove a permanent blessing. On Tuesday I heard Mr. T. preach a funeral sermon, which was well put together, but not calculated to reach the hearts of the people. End of section 28 Recording by Brian Keenan Section 29 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 29 Thursday, 18 My trials, as usual, have been great, but the Lord has not left me comfortless. About this time it was currently reported that a treaty of peace was like to take place. I thought this would have been a singular blessing— especially as it would have given the gospel a free course through the land. But my hope is, through grace, that I shall be found prepared for all changes and circumstances. Lord's Day 21 I was enabled to press upon the consciences of the people, with great pungency, the awful declaration of God in Amos 4.11. I have overthrown some of you, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Some felt the word preached, and at the class meeting the hearts of the society were melted. Saturday 27 We have had some refreshing times, both in our public and society meetings, 
through the course of this week, and my own soul has sometimes been greatly drawn out in affectionate devotion, but at other times sorely tempted by the enemy. We have had a very alarming draught in this part of the country. Last Friday we fasted and prayed that the Lord might water the earth, but though we had a fine shower, it did not seem to cover much more than the two adjacent farms. Lord's Day 28 In the forenoon I preached under an oak, on Him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. But the people seemed unmoved, though in the afternoon they were a little roused by that awful threatening Psalm 9.17, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Yet there seems to be a judicial hardness of heart amongst many of the people. There was a large congregation at Mr. S.'s on Monday, but they also were under the influence of a spiritual stupor. My mind has been much agitated, and at present my prospect of success is but gloomy. Sometimes I have been afraid that I have done wrong in retiring from the work, though, as far as I can judge, the glory of God and the prosperity of His Church were my chief objects. Tuesday 30 Brother F. G. came to see me, and on Friday the Lord sent us a plentiful rain after the threatening drought. Saturday, July 4 I lamented my want of more spiritual life and divine animation. Neither did I find myself so quietly and perfectly resigned to the present dispensations of providence, as is necessary to keep my soul in undisturbed peace, and promote my advancement in all the beauty of holiness. Lord's Day 5 The Lord favored me with great assistance in preaching three times today, and at Mr. C. Wise in the forenoon we had a very solemn season. Tuesday 7 It has been matter of grief to me that I have not been more holy and heavenly in all the powers of my soul, and it will be very wonderful if my soul should be saved after so many external trials and such internal assaults from the banded powers of darkness. Death and destruction seem to threaten me on every side, but thou knowest the pains thy servants feel, thou hearest thy children's cry and their best wishes to fulfill. Thy grace is ever nigh. Wednesday 8 My exercises were heavy, but I had some liberty in preaching, and there were some happy souls who possessed the spirit of prayer. Friday 10 Satan so beset me by different means that it seemed as if I could do little else but endeavor to pray. Saturday 11 I rode to W. and found that Mr. C. had taken away about half the society, and was gone to set up a church for himself. But I met those who were willing to abide with us, and preached twice on the Lord's Day, perhaps to some purpose. Monday 13 Preaching in Slaughterneck, there appeared to be some impediment in the family. I therefore removed the preaching, and found the children were openly wicked. We shall now meet the people at Mr. S. Wise, whose family appears serious, and I hope the work of God will go on in this neighborhood. The people were all attention at R.D.S.'s on Wednesday, but not much affected. On Thursday I preached at B. Wise, and then returned to Brother T.W.'s. Saturday, 18. I laid a plan for myself to travel and preach nine days in two weeks. This was one step towards my former regularity in what appears to me as my duty, my element, and my delight. On the Lord's Day I met a class in the morning, and then preached twice, with earnestness and affection, to large, attentive, and serious congregations. My spirit was afterward refreshed in the company of some of my old friends. Monday 20 My company being gone, my soul returned to its usual exercises, and I was led to reflect on the fluctuating state of human life, a continual circle in which the soul can find no permanent center to fix upon. We shall never have perfect rest till we come to the holy mountain of the Lord. 
Tuesday, 21. My soul keeps close to God in prayer, meditation, and reading. My internal exercises are very great, and I see no other way to conquer and escape but by resisting my malignant foe. On Thursday I went about twenty miles to preach at one T.D.'s in Sussex. There were about two hundred people who appeared to be kind and willing to receive instruction, and I was enabled to fix their attention, though they were ignorant and wild. I then rode ten miles on my way back to visit I.B., who was in deep distress of soul. On Saturday my mind was sweetly stayed on God, after riding about fifty miles since Thursday, seeking to bring poor wandering souls to the fold of Christ. I hope to travel and preach as long as I live. Lord's Day 26 My own soul was much enlarged while enforcing Romans 10, 15, 16, though the hearts of the audience appeared to be proof against the power of the word. Thus it is that the preaching of the gospel is too often as seed sown in stony ground. The hearers do not prepare their hearts by prayer and meditation and the Almighty does not destroy their moral agency, to save them by irresistible grace, and therefore the word which was intended to be a savor of life unto life, proves, by their abuse of preventing grace, a savor of death unto death. Monday 27 I am still in possession of the inestimable pearl. Christ abides in me, the hope of glory. In the heavenly Lamb, thrice happy I am, and my heart doth rejoice at the sound of his name. The congregation today at K's were dull and insensible, but in the class meeting at S's we had a melting time. It was currently reported about this time that some of the British troops were so blocked up that there was very little probability of their escape. And thus it is with the fallen spirits of mankind having forfeited the favor and protection of their offended Creator, they are environed by the invisible, malignant angels, who kept not their first estate, desirous to involve the human race in their own condemnation and misery. But God, moved with compassion towards our helpless race, has made it possible that we may escape through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. But, O oh, melancholy thought, Men are more inclined to listen to the voice of their enemies than to the voice of their divine friend. Instead of putting on the whole armor of God and resisting the devil that he may flee from them, they arm themselves against all the warnings of their gracious Creator and resist the motions of His Holy Spirit till they have filled up the measure of their iniquity and have their portion appointed with devils and damned spirits. On Wednesday my soul was deeply exercised in seeking after more of the divine nature. I long to be made perfect in love, to have all my heart wrapped up in Christ Jesus, to have my conversation in heaven, and to be completely prepared for every duty and every suffering that may lie before me. We had a lecture in the evening at T.W.'s, and the hearts of some were moved and melted by the power of God. I began to think it is my duty to abide for a season in this state, and have great hopes that the Lord will pour out His Spirit and favor us with a revival of pure and vital piety. Saturday, August 1 I went into the fork, and on the Lord's Day preached at Mr. R.'s and at Mr. L.'s. The congregations were attentive and affected, so that, although they are rude and unpolished, Yet God is able, even of these unseemly stones, to raise up children unto Abraham. Being informed that Mrs. P. was dangerously ill, I rode about twenty miles to see her, arrived at the house about nine o'clock, and found her confident and happy in the love of God, a miracle of saving grace. But the power and the glory of this and of every other good work belongs unto the Lord. Tuesday 4. We had a large congregation, and the presence and power of God were with us, while I enforced, on a funeral occasion, 
Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Thursday 6 After proclaiming the great salvation at Jay's, I rode back to visit Mrs. P. again, and found her still happy in God, and patient under her affliction. Lord's Day 9 Having been informed that some of the people were in danger of being led aside by impressions and dreams, and a weak-headed man having already drawn off a few simple souls, I thought it expedient to urge upon them Isaiah 8.20, To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. While in theory, experience, and practice we keep close to the written word of God, we are safe. And if an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, saith St. Paul, let him be accursed. Galatians 1, 8 Dreams may arise from various causes, and even diabolical impressions may sometimes resemble those made by the Spirit of God. And it is evident that all such impressions as have a tendency to affect divisions, to interrupt the peace of the church, to draw us off from any revealed duty, or to make us contented in a lukewarm and careless state, cannot come from God, because they are contrary to the revealed dictates of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of Truth cannot contradict itself. Therefore, all impressions, dreams, visions, etc., should be brought to the standard of the Holy Scriptures, and if they do not perfectly correspond therewith, they should be rejected. Monday, 10. At Mr. S.'s there was an ignorant, hardened company, who had heard much preaching, but, I fear, to bad purpose. May the hammer of the word, in the hand of omnipotent mercy, break these rocks into pieces. In the evening I returned to R.W.'s, and was under painful exercises of soul the next day. Such views of my want of more of the divine nature— and such a clear discovery of the wickedness and obstinacy of the people were opened to my mind, that my spirit was brought down to the dust before the Lord, and my heart poured out streams of humble, earnest prayer. The words of the Apostle are continually verified. We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Acts 14.22 such gracious discoveries as break up the great deep of the human heart are painful but profitable. Blessed be God for illuminating, quickening, sanctifying, and strengthening grace. Thursday 13 A sense of the divine presence penetrated my soul, and I was deeply humbled before the Lord, but was at the same time in the furnace of temptations, and by all my prayers and efforts could not obtain deliverance from them. No doubt but it was then needful that I should be in heaviness through such manifold temptations. But the Lord knoweth how and when to deliver. On Friday my soul was in peace, and I felt willing to die rather than ever yield to temptation and sin against my God. Lord's Day 16 After preaching at Mr. B.'s in the Fork, I enforced Acts 13, 40, 41, at R.L.'s, where many people were affected, and about twelve were taken as probationers into the society. On Monday, at Mr. F.'s, I spoke with spiritual enlargement to a poor, ignorant congregation, and there were many persons much affected on Tuesday at T.'s. It seemed as if the Lord was working on their willing hearts, to prepare them for His church militant below and for his church triumphant above. Though my body is feeble, and the weather is very warm, yet the Lord supports me, and makes my labors successful. How do thy mercies close me round? Forever be thy name adored. I blush in all things to abound. The servant is above his Lord. Thursday, 27. After preaching at the widow Jay's, I returned to Mr. W.'s, and was visited by my old friends W.L. and W.M. 
Lord's Day 30. For several days past I was extremely ill with a vomiting, etc., and was frequently delirious. It was a very heavy season of affliction, but the Lord looked upon me in my trouble, and this day he granted me some relief. Glory be given to God. My fever was greatly abated. Lord's Day, September 6. I am still unable to preach the glad tidings of salvation to my fellow men, and my mind has been variously exercised through the past week, sometimes grieved at spending my time to so little purpose, at other times deeply engaged for more inward religion and for more of God. Lord's Day 13 Another week has passed without public labor, except one prayer meeting but my soul has enjoyed a great degree of divine peace and consolation. Especially on last Thursday, my soul was favored with deep communion with God. How earnestly do I long for a more holy and a closer walk with God, to have every thought devoted to my blessed Jesus. I ventured to preach today on Hebrews 13.13, 13, when my spirit was at liberty, and the people were affected. Tuesday, 15. This was a day of peculiar temptations. My trials were such as I do not remember to have experienced before, and for some time it seemed as if I scarcely knew whether to fight or fly. My usefulness appeared to be cut off. I saw myself pent up in a corner, my body in a manner worn out, my English brethren gone, so that I had no one to consult and every surrounding object and circumstance wore a gloomy aspect. Lord, must I thus pine away and quench the light of Israel? No. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though in the paths of death I tread, with gloomy horrors overspread, my steadfast heart shall fear no ill. For thou, O Lord, art with me still. Thy friendly crook shall give me aid and guide me through the dreadful shade. Wednesday, 16. My body felt better, and my mind had rest. I could repose myself in Christ Jesus, and felt a lively hope that, through all my difficulties, the Lord will finally conduct me to eternal rest. Thursday, 17. While riding on the road, my soul was deeply affected with a powerful, solemn sense of a present and gracious God. What ecstatic sensations must be enjoyed in heaven, where a much deeper sense of the divine presence is eternally enjoyed, without interruption or cessation. Well might St. Paul say, to die is gain. Here our communion with the deity is but partial and very imperfect. We dwell in shells of infirmity, exposed to the assaults of wicked spirits, and surrounded with countless numbers of amusing, empty objects, by which means we are in continual danger of forgetting God, or of being too well satisfied without the fruition of Him. I called to see Mr. S. and his wife, who was sick, and I introduced a conversation on the benefit of affliction, as a proper means to excite our consideration, and humble us for our past sins. But she began to say, whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth, and seemed inclined to presume that she was in a state of acceptance. This I did not believe, and therefore broke off the conversation abruptly, and went to prayer. They were both extremely affected, and especially Mrs. S. The Lord had touched and broken her heart, so that her thoughts of herself and of the nature of religion were greatly changed and I left her roaring and crying for mercy. Lord's Day 20 There was a great melting in the congregation, and a pleasing prospect of a gracious work of God, while I attempted to describe the solemn grandeur of the Judgment Day, and the woeful end of the unregenerate, from Second Thessalonians 1, 7-10. Thursday 24 my frame has been indisposed all this week, so that I am almost a stranger to the enjoyment of health for any length of time. 
I have been reading the life of Mr. Blank, but think it quite too pompous. The praise bestowed on him is too much to bestow on mortal dust. What is man, that such flowers should be strewed on his grave? May I ever be contented with the honor which cometh from God only. My soul at present is filled with his Holy Spirit. I have a glorious prospect of a boundless ocean of love, and immense degrees of holiness opening to my view. And now renew my covenant with the Lord, that I may glorify him with my body and spirit, which are his. Seven times a day do I bow my knees, to utter my complaints before him, and to implore an increase of his grace. But after all, and in the midst of all, I can feelingly say, I am an unprofitable servant. But though unworthy, utterly unworthy, I am blessed with the sweet gales of God's love. Blessed breezes, how they cheer and refresh my drooping soul. What the Lord has for me to do, I know not. But wait to know, and gladly to obey every dictate of his unerring pleasure. Friday 25 My soul was still happy in my God, and I am powerfully persuaded that I shall yet live to be more useful than ever in the Church of Christ. Saturday 26 On my way to the fork, I was in spiritual travail for the souls of the people, and there was some melting at Mr. R.'s, but a much more powerful moving at L.'s, while I discoursed on Second Corinthians 5.11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God, and I trust also we are made manifest in your consciences. I returned to my lodging, blessing and praising God that he had enabled me to deliver my own soul, and given me some cause to hope that my labor was not in vain. Wednesday 30 the malicious enemy of mankind still haunts, and powerfully tempts me, but my never-failing friend makes me victorious. My soul is in constant search after more of God, and sweetly sinks deeper and deeper into the abyss of his fullness. I am much employed in the spirit and duty of prayer, but earnestly desire to be more so. My desire is that prayer should mix with every thought, with every wish, with every word, and with every action, that all might ascend as a holy, acceptable sacrifice to God. End of section 29. Recording by Brian Keenan.